Preface of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Preface Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus was the son of a Roman knight who commanded a legion on the side of Otho at the battle which decided the fate of the empire in favour of Vitellius. From incidental notices in the following history, we learn that he was born towards the close of the reign of Vespasian, who died in the year 79 of the Christian era. He lived till the time of Hadrian, under whose administration he filled the office of secretary, until, with several others, he was dismissed for presuming on familiarities with the Empress Sabina, of which we have no further account than that they were unbecoming his position in the imperial court. How long he survived this disgrace, which appears to have befallen him in the year 121, we are not informed, but we find that the leisure afforded him by his retirement was employed in the composition of numerous works, of which the only portions now extant are collected in the present volume. Several of the younger Pliny's letters are addressed to Suetonius, with whom he lived in the closest friendship. They afford some brief but generally pleasant glimpses of his habits and career, and in a letter in which Pliny makes application on behalf of his friend to the Emperor Trajan for a mark of favour, he speaks of him as a most excellent, honourable and learned man, whom he had the pleasure of entertaining under his own roof, and with whom, the nearer he was brought into communion, the more he loved him. The plan adopted by Suetonius in his Lives of the Twelve Caesars led him to be more diffuse on their personal conduct and habits than on public events. He writes memoirs rather than history. He neither dwells on the civil wars which sealed the fall of the Republic, nor on the military expeditions which extended the frontiers of the empire, nor does he attempt to develop the causes of the great political changes which marked the period of which he treats. When we stop to gaze in a museum or gallery on the antique busts of the Caesars, we perhaps endeavour to trace in their sculptured physiognomy the characteristics of those princes who, for good or evil, were in their times masters of the destinies of a large portion of the human race. The pages of Suetonius will amply gratify this natural curiosity. In them we find a series of individual portraits sketched to the life, with perfect truth and rigorous impartiality. La Arp remarks of Suetonius, He is scrupulously exact and strictly methodical. He omits nothing which concerns the person whose life he is writing. He relates everything, but paints nothing. His work is, in some sense, a collection of anecdotes, but it is very curious to read and consult. Combining as it does amusement and information, Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars was held in such estimation that so soon after the invention of printing as the year 1500, no fewer than 18 editions had been published, and nearly 100 have since been added to the number. Critics of the highest rank have devoted themselves to the task of correcting and commenting on the text, and the work has been translated into most European languages. Of the English translations, that of Dr. Alexander Thompson, published in 1796, has been made the basis of the present. He informs us in his preface that a version of Suetonius was with him only a secondary object, his principal design being to form a just estimate of Roman literature 
and to elucidate the state of government and the manners of the times, for which the work of Suetonius seemed a fitting vehicle. His translation, however, was very diffuse, and retained most of the inaccuracies of that of Clark on which it was founded. Considerable care, therefore, has been bestowed in correcting it, with the view of producing, as far as possible, a literal and faithful version. To render the works of Suetonius, as far as they are extant, complete, his lives of eminent grammarians, rhetoricians, and poets, of which a translation has not before appeared in English, are added. These lives abound with anecdote and curious information connected with learning and literary men during the period of which the author treats. T. F. End of Preface Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 1, Paragraphs 1 to 19. Julius Caesar, the divine, lost his father when he was in the sixteenth year of his age, and the year following, being nominated to the office of high priest of Jupiter, he repudiated Cossutia who was very wealthy, although her family belonged only to the equestrian order, and to whom he had been contracted when he was a mere boy. He then married Cornelia, the daughter of Cinna, who was four times consul, and had by her shortly afterwards a daughter named Julia. Resisting all the efforts of the dictator Scylla to induce him to divorce Cornelia, he suffered the penalty of being stripped of his sacerdotal office, his wife's dowry, and his own patrimonial estates, and, being identified with the adverse faction, was compelled to withdraw from Rome. After changing his place of concealment nearly every night, although he was suffering from a quartan ague, and having effected his release by bribing the officers who had tracked his footsteps, he at length obtained a pardon through the intercession of the Vestal Virgins and of Mamercus Emilius and Aurelius Cotter, his near relatives. We are assured that when Scylla, having withstood for a while the entreaties of his own best friends, persons of distinguished rank, at last yielded to their importunity, he exclaimed, either by a divine impulse or from a shrewd conjecture, your suit is granted, and you may take him among you. But know, he added, that this man, for whose safety you are so extremely anxious, will some day or other be the ruin of the party of the nobles, in defence of which you are leagued with me, for in this one Caesar you will find many a Marius. His first campaign was served in Asia on the staff of the praetor Marcus Thermus, and being dispatched into Bithynia to bring thence a fleet, he loitered so long at the court of Nicomedes as to give occasion to reports of a criminal intercourse between him and that prince, which received additional credit from his hasty return to Bithynia under the pretext of recovering a debt due to a freedman, his client. The rest of his service was more favourable to his reputation, and when Mytilene was taken by storm, he was presented by Thermus with the civic crown. He served also in Cilicia under Servilius Isauricus, but only for a short time, as upon receiving intelligence of Scylla's death he returned with all speed to Rome in expectation of what might follow from a fresh agitation set on foot by Marcus Lepidus. Distrusting, however, the abilities of this leader, and finding the times less favourable for the execution of this project than he had at first imagined, 
he abandoned all thoughts of joining Lepidus, although he received the most tempting offers. Soon after this civil discord was composed, he preferred a charge of extortion against Cornelius Dolabella, a man of consular dignity who had obtained the honour of a triumph. On the acquittal of the accused, he resolved to retire to Rhodes, with the view not only of avoiding the public odium which he had incurred, but of prosecuting his studies with leisure and tranquillity under Apollonius, the son of Molon, at that time the most celebrated master of rhetoric. While on his voyage thither in the winter season, he was taken by pirates near the island of Pharmacusa, and detained by them, burning with indignation, for nearly forty days, his only attendance being a physician and two chamberlains. For he had instantly dispatched his other servants and the friends who accompanied him to raise money for his ransom. Fifty talents having been paid down, he was landed on the coast, when, having collected some ships, he lost no time in putting to sea in pursuit of the pirates, and having captured them, inflicted upon them the punishment with which he had often threatened them in jest. At that time Mithridates was ravaging the neighbouring districts, and on Caesar's arrival at Rhodes, that he might not appear to lie idle while danger threatened the allies of Rome, he passed over into Asia, and having collected some auxiliary forces and driven the king's governor out of the province, retained in their allegiance the cities which were wavering and ready to revolt. Having been elected military tribune, the first honour he received from the suffrages of the people after his return to Rome, he zealously assisted those who took measures for restoring the tribunician authority, which had been greatly diminished during the usurpation of Scylla. He likewise, by an act, which Plotius, at his suggestion, propounded to the people, obtained the recall of Lucius Cinna, his wife's brother, and others with him, who, having been the adherents of Lepidus in the civil disturbances, had, after that consul's death, fled to Sertorius, which law he supported by a speech. During his quaestorship, he pronounced funeral orations from the rostra, according to custom, in praise of his aunt Julia and his wife Cornelia. In the panegyric on his aunt, he gives the following account of her own and his father's genealogy on both sides. My aunt Julia derived her descent by the mother from a race of kings, and by her father from the immortal gods. For the Marcii Reges, her mother's family, deduced their pedigree from Ancus Martius, and the Julii, her father's, from Venus, of which stock we are a branch. We therefore unite in our descent the sacred majesty of kings, the chiefest among men, and the divine majesty of gods, to whom kings themselves are subject. To supply the place of Cornelia, he married Pompeia, the daughter of Quintus Pompeius, and granddaughter of Lucius Scylla, but he afterwards divorced her upon suspicion of her having been debauched by Publius Clodius, for so current was the report that Clodius had found access to her disguised as a woman during the celebration of a religious solemnity that the Senate instituted an inquiry respecting the profanation of the sacred rites. Father Spain fell to his lot as quaestor, when there, as he was going the circuit of the province by commission from the praetor for the administration of justice, and had reached Gades, seeing a statue of Alexander the Great in the temple of Hercules, he sighed deeply, as if weary of his sluggish life, for having performed no memorable actions at an age at which Alexander had already conquered the world. He therefore immediately sued for his discharge, with the view of embracing the first opportunity which might present itself in the city of entering upon a more exalted career. In the stillness of the night following, he dreamt that he lay with his own mother, but his confusion was relieved, and his hopes were raised to the highest pitch 
by the interpreters of his dream, who expounded it as an omen that he should possess universal empire, for that the mother who in his sleep he had found submissive to his embraces was no other than the earth, the common parent of all mankind. Quitting therefore the province before the expiration of the usual term, he betook himself to the Latin colonies, which were then eagerly agitating the design of obtaining the freedom of Rome, and he would have stirred them up to some bold attempt, had not the consuls, to prevent any commotion, detained for some time the legions which had been raised for service in Cilicia. But this did not deter him from making, soon afterwards, a still greater effort within the precincts of the city itself. For only a few days before he entered upon the Edile ship, he incurred a suspicion of having engaged in a conspiracy with Marcus Crassus, a man of consular rank, to whom were joined Publius Scylla and Lucius Autronius, who, after they had been chosen consuls, were convicted of bribery. The plan of the conspirators was to fall upon the Senate at the opening of the new year, and murder as many of them as should be thought necessary, upon which Crassus was to assume the office of dictator, and appoint Caesar his master of the horse. When the commonwealth had been thus ordered according to their pleasure, the consulship was to have been restored to Scylla and Autronius. Mention is made of this plot by Tanusius Geminus in his History, by Marcus Bibulus in his Edicts, and by Curio the Father in his Orations. Cicero likewise seems to hint at this in a letter to Axius, where he says that Caesar had in his consulship secured to himself that arbitrary power to which he had aspired when he was aedile. Tanusius adds that Crassus, from remorse or fear, did not appear upon the day appointed for the massacre of the Senate, for which reason Caesar omitted to give the signal which according to the plan concerted between them he was to have made. The agreement, Curio says, was that he should shake off the toga from his shoulder. We have the authority of the same Curio and of Marcus Actorius Naso for his having been likewise concerned in another conspiracy with young Cnaeus Piso, to whom, upon a suspicion of some mischief being meditated in the city, the province of Spain was decreed out of the regular course. It is said to have been agreed between them that Piso should head a revolt in the provinces, whilst the other should attempt to stir up an insurrection at Rome, using as their instruments the Lambrani and the tribes beyond the Po. But the execution of this design was frustrated in both quarters by the death of Piso. In his aedileship he not only embellished the Comitium and the rest of the Forum with the adjoining halls, but adorned the capital also with temporary piazzas constructed for the purpose of displaying some part of the superabundant collections he had made for the amusement of the people. He entertained them with the hunting of wild beasts and with games, both alone and in conjunction with his colleague. On this account he obtained the whole credit of the expense to which they had jointly contributed, insomuch that his colleague Marcus Bibulus could not forbear remarking that he was served in the manner of Pollux, for as the temple erected in the forum to the two brothers went by the name of Castor alone, so his and Caesar's joint munificence was imputed to the latter only. To the other public spectacles exhibited to the people, Caesar added a fight of gladiators, but with fewer pairs of combatants than he had intended, for he had collected from all parts so great a company of them, that his enemies became alarmed, and a decree was made restricting the number of gladiators which any one was allowed to retain at Rome. Having thus conciliated popular favour, he endeavoured, through his interest with some of the tribunes, to get Egypt assigned to him as a province by an act of the people. The pretext alleged for the creation of this extraordinary government 
was that the Alexandrians had violently expelled their king, whom the Senate had complimented with the title of an ally and friend of the Roman people. This was generally resented, but notwithstanding there was so much opposition from the faction of the nobles that he could not carry his point. In order, therefore, to diminish their influence by every means in his power, he restored the trophies erected in honour of Gaius Marius on account of his victories over Jugurtha, the Cimbri, and the Teutoni, which had been demolished by Scylla. And when sitting in judgment upon murderers, he treated those as assassins who, in the late prescription, had received money from the treasury for bringing in the heads of Roman citizens, although they were expressly accepted in the Cornelian laws. He likewise suborned someone to prefer an impeachment for treason against Gaius Rabirius, by whose especial assistance the Senate had, a few years before, put down Lucius Saturninus the seditious tribune, and being drawn by lot a judge on the trial, he condemned him with so much animosity that upon his appealing to the people no circumstance availed him so much as the extraordinary bitterness of his judge. Having renounced all hope of obtaining Egypt for his province, he stood candidate for the office of chief pontiff, to secure which he had recourse to the most profuse bribery. Calculating on this occasion the enormous amount of the debts he had contracted, he is reported to have said to his mother when she kissed him at his going out in the morning to the assembly of the people, I will never return home unless I am elected pontiff. In effect, he left so far behind him two most powerful competitors, who were much his superiors both in age and rank, that he had more votes in their own tribes than they both had in all the tribes together. After he was chosen praetor, the conspiracy of Catiline was discovered, and while every other member of the Senate voted for inflicting capital punishment on the accomplices in that crime, he alone proposed that the delinquents should be distributed for safe custody among the towns of Italy, their property being confiscated. He even struck such terror into those who were advocates for greater severity by representing to them what universal odium would be attached to their memories by the Roman people, that Decius Silenus, consul-elect, did not hesitate to qualify his proposal, it not being very honourable to change it, by a lenient interpretation, as if it had been understood in a harsher sense than he intended and Caesar would certainly have carried his point, having brought over to his side a great number of the senators, among whom was Cicero, the consul's brother, had not a speech by Marcus Cato infused new vigour into the resolutions of the Senate. He persisted, however, in obstructing the measure, until a body of the Roman knights, who stood under arms as a guard, threatened him with instant death if he continued his determined opposition. They even thrust at him with their drawn swords, so that those who sat next him moved away, and a few friends, with no small difficulty, protected him by throwing their arms round him and covering him with their togas. At last, deterred by this violence, he not only gave way, but absented himself from the Senate House during the remainder of that year. Upon the first day of his praetorship, he summoned Quintus Catulus to render an account to the people respecting the repairs of the capital, proposing a decree for transferring the office of curator to another person. But being unable to withstand the strong opposition made by the aristocratical party, whom he perceived quitting in great numbers their attendance upon the new consuls, and fully resolved to resist his proposal, he dropped the design. He afterwards approved himself a most resolute supporter of Cecilius Metallus, tribune of the people, who, in spite of all opposition from his colleagues, had proposed some laws of a violent tendency, until they were both dismissed from office by a vote of the Senate. 
He ventured, notwithstanding, to retain his post and continue in the administration of justice, but finding that preparations were made to obstruct him by force of arms, he dismissed the lictors, threw off his gown, and betook himself privately to his own house, with the resolution of being quiet in a time so unfavourable to his interests. He likewise pacified the mob, which two days afterwards flocked about him, and in a riotous manner made a voluntary tender of their assistance in the vindication of his honour. This happening contrary to expectation, the Senate, who met in haste on account of the tumult, gave him their thanks by some of the leading members of the House, and sending for him, after high commendation of his conduct, cancelled their former vote, and restored him to his office. But he soon got into fresh trouble, being named amongst the accomplices of Catiline, both before Novius Niger the Quaestor, by Lucius Vetius the Informer, and in the Senate by Quintus Curius, to whom a reward had been voted for having first discovered the designs of the conspirators. Curius affirmed that he had received his information from Catiline. Vetius even engaged to produce in evidence against him his own handwriting given to Catiline. Caesar, feeling that this treatment was not to be borne, appealed to Cicero himself whether he had not voluntarily made a discovery to him of some particulars of the conspiracy, and so balked Curius of his expected reward. He therefore obliged Vetius to give pledges for his behaviour, seized his goods, and after heavily fining him, and seeing him almost torn in pieces before the rostra, threw him into prison, to which he likewise sent Novius the Quaestor, for having presumed to take an information against a magistrate of superior authority. At the expiration of his praetorship, he obtained by lot the father Spain, and pacified his creditors, who were for detaining him, by finding sureties for his debts. Contrary, however, to both law and custom, he took his departure before the usual equipage and outfit were prepared. It is uncertain whether this precipitancy arose from the apprehension of an impeachment, with which he was threatened on the expiration of his former office, or from his anxiety to lose no time in relieving the allies, who implored him to come to their aid. He had no sooner established tranquillity in the province than, without waiting for the arrival of his successor, he returned to Rome with equal haste to sue for a triumph and the consulship. The day of election, however, being already fixed by proclamation, he could not legally be admitted a candidate unless he entered the city as a private person. On this emergency he solicited a suspension of the laws in his favour, but such an indulgence being strongly opposed, he found himself under the necessity of abandoning all thoughts of a triumph, lest he should be disappointed of the consulship. Of the two other competitors for the consulship, Lucius Lucius and Marcus Bibulus, he joined with the former, upon condition that Lucius, being a man of less interest but greater affluence, should promise money to the electors in their joint names upon which the party of the nobles, dreading how far he might carry matters in that high office, with a colleague disposed to concur in and second his measures, advised Bibulus to promise the voters as much as the other, and most of them contributed towards the expense, Cato himself admitting that bribery under such circumstances was for the public good. He was accordingly elected consul jointly with Bibulus. Actuated still by the same motives, the prevailing party took care to assign provinces of small importance to the new consuls, such as the care of the woods and roads. Caesar, incensed at this indignity, endeavoured by the most assiduous and flattering attentions to gain to his side Cnaeus Pompey, at that time dissatisfied with the Senate for the backwardness they showed to confirm his acts after his victories over Mithridates. 
he likewise brought about a reconciliation between Pompey and Marcus Crassus, who had been at variance from the time of their joint consulship, in which office they were continually clashing. And he entered into an agreement with both, that nothing should be transacted in the government which was displeasing to any of the three. End of Julius Caesar, Part 1 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part Two of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 2, Paragraphs 20-33 to 33. Having entered upon his office, he introduced a new regulation that the daily acts both of the Senate and people should be committed to writing and published. He also revived an old custom that an officer should precede him and his lictors follow him on the alternate months when the fasces were not carried before him. Upon preferring a bill to the people for the division of some public lands, he was opposed by his colleague, whom he violently drove out of the forum. Next day the insulted consul made a complaint in the Senate of this treatment, but such was the consternation that no one having the courage to bring the matter forward or move a censure which had been often done under outrages of less importance, he was so much dispirited that until the expiration of his office he never stirred from home and did nothing but issue edicts to obstruct his colleagues' proceedings. From that time, therefore, Caesar had the sole management of public affairs, insomuch that some wags, when they signed any instrument as witnesses, did not add, in the consulship of Caesar and Bibulus, but of Julius and Caesar, putting the same person down twice under his name and surname. The following verses likewise were currently repeated on this occasion. Non bibulo quid quam nuper, sed caesare factum est, nam bibulo fieri consule nil memini. Nothing was done in Bibulus's year, no, Caesar only then was consul here. The land of Stellas, consecrated by our ancestors to the gods, with some other lands in Campania left subject to tribute for the support of the expenses of the government, he divided, but not by lot, among upwards of twenty thousand freemen, who had each of them three or more children. He eased the publicans, upon their petition, of a third part of the sum which they had engaged to pay into the public treasury, and openly admonished them not to bid so extravagantly upon the next occasion. He made various profuse grants to meet the wishes of others, no one opposing him, or if any such attempt was made, it was soon suppressed. Marcus Cato, who interrupted him in his proceedings, he ordered to be dragged out of the Senate House by a lictor and carried to prison. Lucius Lucullus, likewise, for opposing him with some warmth, he so terrified with the apprehension of being criminated, that, to deprecate the consul's resentment, he fell on his knees. And upon Cicero's lamenting in some trial the miserable condition of the times, he the very same day, by nine o'clock, transferred his enemy, Publius Clodius, from a patrician to a plebeian family, a change which he had long solicited in vain. At last, effectually to intimidate all those of the opposite party, he by great rewards prevailed upon Vetchus to declare that he had been solicited by certain persons to assassinate Pompey, and when he was brought before the rostra to name those who had been concerted between them, 
after naming one or two to no purpose, not without great suspicion of subornation, Caesar, despairing of success in this rash stratagem, is supposed to have taken off his informer by poison. About the same time he married Calpurnia, the daughter of Lucius Piso, who was to succeed him in the consulship, and gave his own daughter Julia to Cnaeus Pompey, rejecting Servilius Scipio, to whom she had been contracted, and by whose means chiefly he had but a little before baffled Bibulus. After this new alliance, he began, upon any debates in the Senate, to ask Pompey's opinion first, whereas he used before to give that distinction to Marcus Crassus, and it was the usual practice for the consul to observe throughout the year the method of consulting the Senate which he had adopted on the Calends, the first, of January. Being therefore now supported by the interest of his father-in-law and son-in-law, of all the provinces he made choice of Gaul as most likely to furnish him with matter and occasion for triumphs. At first, indeed, he received only Cisalpine Gaul, with the addition of Illyricum, by a decree proposed by Vatinius to the people, but soon afterwards obtained from the Senate Gallia Comata also, the senators being apprehensive that if they should refuse it him, that province also would be granted him by the people. Elated now with his success, he could not refrain from boasting a few days afterwards in a full senate house that he had, in spite of his enemies and to their great mortification, obtained all he desired, and that for the future he would make them, to their shame, submissive to his pleasure. One of the senators observing sarcastically, "'That will not be very easy for a woman to do,' He jocosely replied, Semiramis formerly reigned in Assyria, and the Amazons possessed great part of Asia. When the term of his consulship had expired, upon a motion being made in the Senate by Gaius Memmius and Lucius Domitius, the praetors, respecting the transactions of the year past, he offered to refer himself to the house but they, declining the business, after three days spent in vain altercation, he set out for his province. Immediately, however, his quaestor was charged with several misdemeanours for the purpose of implicating Caesar himself. Indeed, an accusation was soon after preferred against him by Lucius Antistius, tribune of the people. But by making an appeal to the tribune's colleagues, he succeeded in having the prosecution suspended during his absence in the service of the state. To secure himself, therefore, for the time to come, he was particularly careful to secure the goodwill of the magistrates at the annual elections, assisting none of the candidates with his interest, nor suffering any persons to be advanced to any office who would not positively undertake to defend him in his absence, for which purpose he made no scruple to require of some of them an oath and even a written obligation. But when Lucius Domitius became a candidate for the consulship and openly threatened that upon his being elected consul he would effect that which he could not accomplish when he was praetor and divest him of the command of the armies, he sent for Crassus and Pompey to Lucca a city in his province, and pressed them for the purpose of disappointing Domitius to sue again for the consulship, and to continue him in his command for five years longer, with both which requisitions they complied. Presumptuous now from his success, he added at his own private charge more legions to those which he had received from the Republic among the former of which was one levied in Transalpine Gaul, and called by a Gallic name a lauder, which he trained and armed in the Roman fashion, and afterwards conferred on it the freedom of the city. From this period he declined no occasion of war, however unjust and dangerous.
attacking without any provocation as well the allies of Rome as the barbarous nations which were its enemies, insomuch that the Senate passed a decree for sending commissioners to examine into the condition of Gaul, and some members even proposed that he should be delivered up to the enemy. But so great had been the success of his enterprises that he had the honour of obtaining more days of supplication, and those more frequently, than had ever before been decreed to any commander. During nine years in which he held the government of the province, his achievements were as follows. He reduced all Gaul, bounded by the Pyrenean forest, the Alps, Mount Gibena, and the two rivers, the Rhine and the Rhone, and being about 3,200 miles in compass, into the form of a province, excepting only the nations in alliance with the Republic, and such as had merited his favour, imposing upon this new acquisition an annual tribute of forty millions of sesterces. He was the first of the Romans who, crossing the Rhine by a bridge, attacked the Germanic tribes inhabiting the country beyond that river, whom he defeated in several engagements. He also invaded the Britons, a people formerly unknown, and, having vanquished them, exacted from them contributions and hostages. Amidst such a series of successes, he experienced thrice only any signal disaster, once in Britain, when his fleet was nearly wrecked in a storm, in Gaul at Jagovia, where one of his legions was put to the rout, and in the territory of the Germans his lieutenants Titurius and Arunculius were cut off by an ambuscade. During this period he lost his mother, whose death was followed by that of his daughter, and, not long afterwards, of his granddaughter. Meanwhile the Republic being in consternation at the murder of Publius Clodius, and the Senate passing a vote that only one consul, namely Gnaeus Pompeius, should be chosen for the ensuing year, he prevailed with the tribunes of the people, who intended joining him in nomination with Pompey, to propose to the people a bill enabling him, though absent, to become a candidate for his second consulship, when the term of his command should be near expiring, that he might not be obliged on that account to quit his province too soon, and before the conclusion of the war. Having attained this object, carrying his views still higher, and animated with the hopes of success, he omitted no opportunity of gaining universal favour by acts of liberality and kindness to individuals, both in public and private. With money raised from the spoils of the war, he began to construct a new forum, the ground plot of which cost him above a hundred millions of sesterces. He promised the people a public entertainment of gladiators, and a feast in memory of his daughter, such as no one before him had ever given. The more to raise their expectations on this occasion, although he had agreed with victuallers of all denominations for his feast, he made yet farther preparations in private houses. He issued an order that the most celebrated gladiators, if at any time during the combat they incurred the displeasure of the public, should be immediately carried off by force and reserved for some future occasion. Young gladiators he trained up, not in the school and by the masters of defence, but in the houses of Roman knights and even senators skilled in the use of arms, earnestly requesting them, as appears from his letters, to undertake the discipline of those novitiates, and to give them the word during their exercises. He doubled the pay of the legions in perpetuity, allowing them likewise corn when it was in plenty, without any restriction, and sometimes distributing to every soldier in his army a slave and a portion of land. 
To maintain his alliance and good understanding with Pompey, he offered him in marriage his sister's granddaughter Octavia, who had been married to Gaius Marcellus, and requested for himself his daughter, lately contracted to Forster Scylla. Every person about him, and a great part likewise of the Senate, he secured by loans of money at low interest, or none at all, and to all others who came to wait upon him, either by invitation or of their own accord, he made liberal presents, not neglecting even the freedmen and slaves who were favourites with their masters and patrons. He offered also singular and ready aid to all who were under prosecution or in debt, and to prodigal youths, excluding from his bounty those only who were so deeply plunged in guilt, poverty, or luxury, that it was impossible effectually to relieve them. These, he openly declared, could derive no benefit from any other means than a civil war. He endeavoured with equal assiduity to engage in his interest princes and provinces in every part of the world, presenting some with thousands of captives, and sending to others the assistance of troops, at whatever time and place they desired, without any authority from either the Senate or people of Rome. He likewise embellished with magnificent public buildings the most powerful cities not only of Italy, Gaul, and Spain, but of Greece and Asia, until all people, being now astonished, and speculating on the obvious tendency of these proceedings, Claudius Marcellus the consul, declaring first by proclamation that he intended to propose a measure of the utmost importance to the state, made a motion in the senate that some person should be appointed to succeed Caesar in his province before the term of his command was expired, because the war was being brought to a conclusion, peace was restored, and the victorious army ought to be disbanded. He further moved that Caesar being absent, his claims to be a candidate at the next election of consuls should not be admitted, as Pompey himself had afterwards abrogated that privilege by a decree of the people. The fact was that Pompey, in his law relating to the choice of chief magistrates, had forgot to accept Caesar in the article in which he declared all such as were not present incapable of being candidates for any office. But soon afterwards, when the law was inscribed on brass and deposited in the treasury, he corrected his mistake. Marcellus, not content with depriving Caesar of his provinces and the privilege intended him by Pompey, likewise moved the Senate that the freedom of the city should be taken from those colonists whom, by the Vatinian law, he had settled at New Como, because it had been conferred upon them with ambitious views and by a stretch of the laws. Roused by these proceedings, and thinking, as he was often heard to say, that it would be a more difficult enterprise to reduce him, now that he was the chief man in the state, from the first rank of citizens to the second, than from the second to the lowest of all, Caesar made a vigorous opposition to the measure, partly by means of the tribunes who interposed in his behalf, and partly through Servius Sulpicius, the other consul. The following year, likewise, when Gaius Marcellus, who succeeded his cousin Marcus in the consulship, pursued the same course, Caesar, by means of an immense bribe, engaged in his defence Emilius Paulus, the other consul, and Gaius Curio, the most violent of the tribunes but finding the opposition obstinately bent against him, and that the consuls elect were also of that party, he wrote a letter to the senate, requesting that they would not deprive him of the privilege kindly granted him by the people, or else that the other generals should resign the command of their armies as well as himself. Fully persuaded, as it is thought, 
that he could more easily collect his veteran soldiers whenever he pleased than Pompey could his new raised troops. At the same time he made his adversaries an offer to disband eight of his legions and give up Transalpine Gaul, upon condition that he might retain two legions with the Cisalpine province, or but one legion with Illyricum, until he should be elected consul. But as the Senate declined to interpose in the business, and his enemies declared that they would enter into no compromise where the safety of the Republic was at stake, he advanced into hither Gaul, and, having gone the circuit for the administration of justice, made a halt at Ravenna, resolved to have recourse to arms if the Senate should proceed to extremity against the tribunes of the people who had espoused his cause. This was indeed his pretext for the civil war, but it is supposed that there were other motives for his conduct. Cnaeus Pompey used frequently to say, that he sought to throw everything into confusion, because he was unable, with all his private wealth, to complete the works he had begun, and answer at his return the vast expectations which he had excited in the people. Others pretend that he was apprehensive of being called to account for what he had done in his first consulship, contrary to the auspices, laws, and the protests of the tribunes. Marcus Cato having sometimes declared, and that too with an oath, that he would prefer an impeachment against him as soon as he disbanded his army. A report likewise prevailed that if he returned as a private person, he would, like Milo, have to plead his cause before the judges surrounded by armed men. This conjecture is rendered highly probable by Asinius Pollio, who informs us that Caesar, upon viewing the vanquished and slaughtered enemy in the field of Pharsalia, expressed himself in these very words. This was their intention. I, Gaius Caesar, after all the great achievements I had performed, must have been condemned had I not summoned the army to my aid. Some think that, having contracted from long habit an extraordinary love of power, and having weighed his own and his enemy's strength, he embraced that occasion of usurping the supreme power, which indeed he had coveted from the time of his youth. This seems to have been the opinion entertained by Cicero, who tells us in the third book of his offices that Caesar used to have frequently in his mouth two verses of Euripides, which he thus translates. Nam si violandum est ius, regnam di gratia violandum est, aliis rebus pietatem collas. Be just, unless a kingdom tempts to break the laws, for sovereign power alone can justify the cause. When intelligence, therefore, was received that the interposition of the tribunes in his favour had been utterly rejected, and that they themselves had fled from the city, he immediately sent forward some cohorts, but privately, to prevent any suspicion of his design, and, to keep up appearances, attended at a public spectacle, examined the model of a fencing school which he proposed to build, and, as usual, sat down to table with a numerous party of his friends. But after sunset, mules being put to his carriage from a neighbouring mill, he set forward on his journey with all possible privacy and a small retinue. The lights going out, he lost his way, and wandered about a long time, until at length, by the help of a guide, whom he found towards daybreak, he proceeded on foot through some narrow paths, and again reached the road. Coming up with his troops on the banks of the Rubicon, which was the boundary of his province, he halted for a while, and, revolving in his mind the importance of the step he was on the point of taking, he turned to those about him and said, 
we may still retreat, but if we pass this little bridge, nothing is left for us but to fight it out in arms. While he was thus hesitating, the following incident occurred. A person remarkable for his noble mien and graceful aspect appeared close at hand, sitting and playing upon a pipe. When not only the shepherds but a number of soldiers also flocked from their posts to listen to him, and some trumpeters among them, he snatched a trumpet from one of them, ran to the river with it, and sounding the advance with a piercing blast, crossed to the other side. Upon this Caesar exclaimed, Let us go whither the omens of the gods and the iniquity of our enemies call us. The die is now cast. Accordingly, having marched his army over the river, he showed them the tribunes of the people, who, upon their being driven from the city, had come to meet him, and in the presence of that assembly called upon the troops to pledge him their fidelity, with tears in his eyes, and his garment rent from his bosom. It has been supposed that upon this occasion he promised to every soldier a knight's estate, but that opinion is founded on a mistake. For when in his harangue to them he frequently held out a finger of his left hand, and declared that to recompense those who should support him in the defence of his honour, he would willingly part even with his ring, the soldiers at a distance, who could more easily see than hear him while he spoke, formed their conception of what he said by the eye, not by the ear, and accordingly gave out, that he had promised to each of them the privilege of wearing the gold ring and an estate of four hundred thousand sesterces. End of Julius Caesar, Part 2 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part Three of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 3, Paragraphs 34 to 55. Of his subsequent proceedings, I shall give a cursory detail in the order in which they occurred. He took possession of Picenum, Umbria, and Etruria and having obliged Lucius Domitius, who had been tumultuously nominated his successor, and held Corsinium with a garrison, to surrender, and dismissed him, he marched along the coast of the Upper Sea to Brundisium, to which place the consuls and Pompey were fled with the intention of crossing the sea as soon as possible. After vain attempts by all the obstacles he could oppose to prevent their leaving harbour, he turned his steps towards Rome, where he appealed to the Senate on the present state of public affairs, and then set out for Spain, in which province Pompey had a numerous army, under the command of three lieutenants, Marcus Petrius, Lucius Afranius, and Marcus Varro, declaring amongst his friends before he set forward, that he was going against an army without a general, and should return thence against a general without an army. Though his progress was retarded both by the siege of Marseilles, which shut her gates against him, and a very great scarcity of corn, yet in a short time he bore down all before him. Thence he returned to Rome, and crossing the sea to Macedonia, blocked up Pompey during almost four months, within a line of ramparts of prodigious extent, and at last defeated him in the battle of Pharsalia. 
pursuing him in his flight to Alexandria, where he was informed of his murder, he presently found himself also engaged, under all the disadvantages of time and place, in a very dangerous war with King Ptolemy, who, he saw, had treacherous designs upon his life. It was winter, and he, within the walls of a well-provided and subtle enemy, was destitute of everything and wholly unprepared for such a conflict. He succeeded, however, in his enterprise, and put the kingdom of Egypt into the hands of Cleopatra and her younger brother, being afraid to make it a province, lest under an aspiring prefect it might become the centre of revolt. From Alexandria he went into Syria, and thence to Pontus, induced by intelligence which he had received respecting Pharnaces. This prince, who was son of the great Mithridates, had seized the opportunity which the distraction at the times offered for making war upon his neighbours, and his insolence and fierceness had grown with his success. Caesar, however, within five days after entering his country, and four hours after coming in sight of him, overthrew him in one decisive battle upon which he frequently remarked to those about him the good fortune of Pompey, who had obtained his military reputation chiefly by victory over so feeble an enemy. He afterwards defeated Scipio and Juba, who were rallying the remains of the party in Africa, and Pompey's sons in Spain. During the whole course of the civil war, he never once suffered any defeat, except in the case of his lieutenants, of whom Gaius Curio fell in Africa, Gaius Antonius was made prisoner in Illyricum, Publius Dolabella lost a fleet in the same Illyricum, and Cnaeus Domitius Calvinus an army in Pontus. In every encounter with the enemy where he himself commanded, he came off with complete success nor was the issue ever doubtful except on two occasions, once at Dyrrachium, when, being obliged to give ground, and Pompey not pursuing his advantage, he said that Pompey knew not how to conquer. The other instance occurred in his last battle in Spain, when, despairing of the event, he even had thoughts of killing himself. For the victories obtained in the several wars, he triumphed five different times. After the defeat of Scipio, four times in one month, each triumph succeeding the former by an interval of a few days, and once again after the conquest of Pompey's sons. His first and most glorious triumph was for the victories he gained in Gaul, the next for that of Alexandria, the third for the reduction of Pontus, the fourth for his African victory, and the last for that in Spain. And they all differed from each other in their varied pomp and pageantry. On the day of the Gallic triumph, as he was proceeding along the street called Vilebrum, after narrowly escaping a fall from his chariot by the breaking of the axle-tree, he ascended the capital by torchlight, forty elephants carrying torches on his right and left. Amongst the pageantry of the Pontic Triumph, a tablet with this inscription was carried before him, I came, I saw, I conquered, not signifying as other mottoes on the like occasion what was done, so much as the dispatch with which it was done. To every foot soldier in his veteran legions, Besides the two thousand sesterces paid him in the beginning of the civil war, he gave twenty thousand more in the shape of prize money. He likewise allotted them lands, but not in contiguity, that the former owners might not be entirely dispossessed. To the people of Rome, besides ten modii of corn and as many pounds of oil, he gave three hundred sesterces a man, which he had formerly promised them, 
and a hundred more to each for the delay in fulfilling his engagement. He likewise remitted a year's rent due to the treasury for such houses in Rome as did not pay above two thousand sesterces a year, and through the rest of Italy for all such as did not exceed in yearly rent five hundred sesterces. To all this he added a public entertainment and a distribution of meat, and after his Spanish victory two public dinners. For, considering the first he had given as too sparing and unsuited to his profuse liberality, he five days afterwards added another which was most plentiful. The spectacles he exhibited to the people were of various kinds, namely a combat of gladiators and stage plays in the several wards of the city and in different languages. Likewise, Circensian games, wrestlers, and the representation of a sea fight. In the conflict of gladiators presented in the forum, Furius Leptinus, a man of Praetorian family, entered the lists as a combatant, as did also Quintus Calpinus, formerly a senator and a pleader of causes. The Pyrrhic dance was performed by some youths who were sons to persons of the first distinction in Asia and Bithynia. In the plays, Decimus Laberius, who had been a Roman knight, acted in his own piece, and being presented on the spot with five hundred thousand sesterces and a gold ring, he went from the stage through the orchestra and resumed his place in the seats allotted for the equestrian order. In the Circensian games, the circus being enlarged at each end and a canal sunk round it, several of the young nobility drove chariots, drawn some by four and others by two horses, and likewise rode races on single horses. The Trojan game was acted by two distinct companies of boys, one differing from the other in age and rank. The hunting of wild beasts was presented for five days successively, and on the last day a battle was fought by five hundred foot, twenty elephants, and thirty horse on each side. To afford room for this engagement the goals were removed, and in their space two camps were pitched, directly opposite to each other. Wrestlers likewise performed for three days successively in a stadium provided for the purpose in the Campus Martius. A lake having been dug in the little Codita, ships of the Tyrian and Egyptian fleets, containing two, three, and four banks of oars, with a number of men on board, afforded an animated representation of a sea fight. To these various diversions there flocked such crowds of spectators from all parts that most of the strangers were obliged to lodge in tents erected in the streets or along the roads near the city. Several in the throng were squeezed to death, amongst whom were two senators. Turning afterwards his attention to the regulation of the commonwealth, he corrected the calendar, which had for some time become extremely confused through the unwarrantable liberty which the pontiffs had taken in the article of intercalation. To such a height had this abuse proceeded, that neither the festivals designed for the harvest fell in summer, nor those for the vintage in autumn. He accommodated the year to the course of the sun, ordaining that in future it should consist of three hundred and sixty-five days without any intercalary month, and that every fourth year an intercalary day should be inserted. That the year might thenceforth commence regularly with the calends or first of January, he inserted two months between November and December, so that the year in which this regulation was made consisted of fifteen months, including the month of intercalation, which, according to the division of time then in use, happened that year. 
he filled up the vacancies in the Senate by advancing several plebeians to the rank of patricians, and also increased the numbers of praetors, aediles, quaestors, and inferior magistrates, restoring at the same time such as had been degraded by the censors or convicted of bribery at elections. The choice of magistrates he so divided with the people that, excepting only the candidates for the consulship, they nominated one half of them and he the other. The method which he practised in those cases was to recommend such persons as he had pitched upon by bills dispersed through the several tribes to this effect. Caesar the dictator to such a tribe, naming it. I recommend to you, naming likewise the persons, that by the favour of your votes they may attain to the honours for which they sue. He likewise admitted to offices the sons of those who had been proscribed. The trial of causes he restricted to two orders of judges, the equestrian and senatorial, excluding the tribunes of the treasury who had before made a third class. The revised census of the people he ordered to be taken neither in the usual manner or place, but street by street, by the principal inhabitants of the several quarters of the city, and he reduced the number of those who received corn at the public cost from three hundred and twenty to a hundred and fifty thousand. To prevent any tumults on account of the census, he ordered that the praetor should every year fill up by lot the vacancies occasioned by death from those who were not enrolled for the receipt of corn. Eighty thousand citizens having been distributed into foreign colonies, he enacted, in order to stop the drain on the population, that no free man of the city above twenty and under forty years of age, who was not in the military service, should absent himself from Italy for more than three years at a time, that no senator's son should go abroad unless in the retinue of some high officer, and as to those whose pursuit was tending flocks and herds, that no less than a third of the number of their shepherds freeborn should be youths. He likewise made all those who practised physic in Rome, and all teachers of the liberal arts, free of the city, in order to fix them in it, and induce others to settle there. With respect to debts, he disappointed the expectation which was generally entertained that they would be totally cancelled, and ordered that the debtors should satisfy their creditors according to the valuation of their estates at the rate at which they were purchased before the commencement of the civil war, deducting from the debt what had been paid for interest either in money or by bonds by virtue of which provision about a fourth part of the debt was lost. He dissolved all the guilds, except such as were of ancient foundation. Crimes were punished with greater severity, and the rich being more easily induced to commit them because they were only liable to banishment without the forfeiture of their property, he stripped murderers, as Cicero observes, of their whole estates, and other offenders of one half. He was extremely assiduous and strict in the administration of justice. He expelled from the Senate such members as were convicted of bribery, and he dissolved the marriage of a man of Praetorian rank, who had married a lady two days after her divorce from a former husband, although there was no suspicion that they had been guilty of any illicit connection. He imposed duties on the importation of foreign goods. The use of litters for travelling, purple robes, and jewels, he permitted only to persons of a certain age and station and on particular days. He enforced a rigid execution of the sumptuary laws, placing officers about the markets to seize upon all meats exposed to sale contrary to the rules and bring them to him. 
sometimes sending his lictors and soldiers to carry away such victuals as had escaped the notice of the officers, even when they were upon the table. His thoughts were now fully employed from day to day on a variety of great projects for the embellishment and improvement of the city, as well as for guarding and extending the bounds of the empire. In the first place, he meditated the construction of a temple to Mars, which should exceed in grandeur everything of that kind in the world. For this purpose, he intended to fill up the lake on which he had entertained the people with the spectacle of a sea fight. He also projected a most spacious theatre adjacent to the Tarpeian Mount, and also proposed to reduce the civil law to a reasonable compass, and out of that immense and undigested mass of statutes to extract the best and most necessary parts into a few books. To make as large a collection as possible of works in the Greek and Latin languages for the public use, the province of providing and putting them in proper order being assigned to Marcus Varro. He intended likewise to drain the Pomptine marshes, to cut a channel for the discharge of the waters of the Lake Fusinus, to form a road from the upper sea through the ridge of the Apennine to the Tiber, to make a cut through the Isthmus of Corinth, to reduce the Dacians who had overrun Pontus and Thrace within their proper limits, and then to make war upon the Parthians through the lesser Armenia, but not to risk a general engagement with them until he had made some trial of their prowess in war. But in the midst of all his undertakings and projects, he was carried off by death. Before I speak of which, it may not be improper to give an account of his person, dress, and manners, together with what relates to his pursuits, both civil and military. It is said that he was tall, of a fair complexion, round-limbed, rather full-faced, with eyes black and piercing, and that he enjoyed excellent health, except towards the close of his life, when he was subject to sudden fainting fits and disturbance in his sleep. He was likewise twice seized with the falling sickness while engaged in active service. He was so nice in the care of his person that he not only kept the hair of his head closely cut and had his face smoothly shaved, but even caused the hair on other parts of the body to be plucked out by the roots, a practice for which some persons rallied him. His baldness gave him much uneasiness, having often found himself upon that account exposed to the jibes of his enemies. He therefore used to bring forward the hair from the crown of his head, and of all the honours conferred upon him by the senate and people, there was none which he either accepted or used with greater pleasure than the right of wearing constantly a laurel crown. It is said that he was particular in his dress, for he used the latest clavus with fringes about the wrists, and always had it girded about him, but rather loosely. This circumstance gave origin to the expression of Scylla, who often advised the nobles to beware of the ill-girt boy. He first inhabited a small house in the Sabara, but after his advancement to the pontificate, he occupied a palace belonging to the state in the Via Sacra. Many writers say that he liked his residence to be elegant and his entertainments sumptuous, and that he entirely took down a villa near the grove of Aricia, which he had built from the foundation and finished at a vast expense, because it did not exactly suit his taste, although he had at that time but slender means and was in debt, and that he carried about in his expeditions tessellated and marble slabs for the floor of his tent. 
They likewise report that he invaded Britain in hopes of finding pearls, the size of which he would compare together and ascertain the weight by poising them in his hand, that he would purchase at any cost gems, carved works, statues and pictures executed by the eminent masters of antiquity, and that he would give for young and handy slaves a price so extravagant that he forbade its being entered in the diary of his expenses. We are also told that in the provinces he constantly maintained two tables, one for the officers of the army and the gentry of the country, and the other for Romans of the highest rank and provincials of the first distinction. He was so very exact in the management of his domestic affairs, both little and great, that he once threw a baker into prison for serving him with a finer sort of bread than his guests, and put to death a freedman who was a particular favourite for debauching the lady of a Roman knight, although no complaint had been made to him of the affair. The only stain upon his chastity was his having cohabited with Nicomedes, and that indeed stuck to him all the days of his life and exposed him to much bitter raillery. I will not dwell upon those well-known verses of Calvus Licinius, Whate'er Bithynia and her lord possessed, Her lord who Caesar in his lust caressed. I pass over the speeches of Dolabella and Curio the father, in which the former calls him the queen's rival and the inner side of the royal couch, and the latter, the brothel of Nicomedes and the Bithynian stew. I would likewise say nothing of the edicts of Bibulus, in which he proclaimed his colleague under the name of the Queen of Bithynia, adding that he had formerly been in love with a king, but now coveted a kingdom. At which time, as Marcus Brutus relates, one Octavius, a man of a crazy brain, and therefore the more free in his raillery, after he had in a crowded assembly saluted Pompey by the title of king, addressed Caesar by that of queen. Gaius Memmius likewise upbraided him with serving the king at table among the rest of his catamites, in the presence of a large company in which were some merchants from Rome, the names of whom he mentions. But Cicero was not content with writing in some of his letters that he was conducted by the royal attendants into the king's bedchamber, lay upon a bed of gold with a covering of purple, and that the youthful bloom of this scion of Venus had been tainted in Bithynia. But upon Caesar's pleading the cause of Nysa, the daughter of Nicomedes, before the senate, and recounting the king's kindnesses to him, replied, Pray tell us no more of that, for it is well known what he gave you, and you gave him. To conclude, his soldiers in the Gallic triumph, amongst other verses, such as they jocularly sung on those occasions following the general's chariot, recited these, which since that time have become extremely common. The Gauls to Caesar yield, Caesar to Nicomede. Lo, Caesar triumphs for his glorious deed, but Caesar's conqueror gains no victor's meed. It is admitted by all that he was much addicted to women, as well as very expensive in his intrigues with them, and that he debauched many ladies of the highest quality among whom were Posthumia, the wife of Servius Sulpicius, Lollia, the wife of Aulus Gabinius, Tertulla, the wife of Marcus Crassus, and Musia, the wife of Cnaeus Pompey. For it is certain that the Curios, both father and son, and many others made it a reproach to Pompey, that to gratify his ambition, he married the daughter of a man upon whose account he had divorced his wife after having had three children by her, 
and whom he used with a deep sigh to call Aegisthus. But the mistress he most loved was Sevilia, the mother of Marcus Brutus, for whom he purchased in his first consulship after the commencement of their intrigue a pearl which cost him six millions of sesterces, and in the civil war, besides other presents, assigned to her for a trifling consideration some valuable farms when they were exposed to public auction. Many persons expressing their surprise at the lowness of the price, Cicero wittily remarked, To let you know the real value of the purchase, between ourselves, Tertia was deducted. For Sevilia was supposed to have prostituted her daughter Tertia to Caesar. That he had intrigues likewise with married women in the provinces appears from this distich, which was as much repeated in the Gallic triumph as the former. Watch well your wives, ye sits. We bring a blade, a bald pate master of the wenching trade. Thy gold was spent on many a Gallic whore. Exhausted now thou comest to borrow more. In the number of his mistresses were also some queens, such as Eunoe, a Moor, the wife of Bogudes, to whom and her husband he made, as Naso reports, many large presents. But his greatest favourite was Cleopatra, with whom he often revelled all night until the dawn of day, and would have gone with her through Egypt in dalliance as far as Ethiopia in her luxurious yacht, had not the army refused to follow him. He afterwards invited her to Rome, whence he sent her back loaded with honours and presents, and gave her permission to call by his name a son, who, according to the testimony of some Greek historians, resembled Caesar both in person and gait. Mark Antony declared in the Senate that Caesar had acknowledged the child as his own, and that Gaius Matius, Gaius Oppius, and the rest of Caesar's friends knew it to be true. On which occasion Oppius, as if it had been an imputation which he was called upon to refute, published a book to show that the child which Cleopatra fathered upon Caesar was not his. Helvius Sinner, tribune of the people, admitted to several persons the fact that he had a bill ready drawn which Caesar had ordered him to get enacted in his absence, allowing him, with the hope of leaving issue, to take any wife he chose, and as many of them as he pleased and to leave no room for doubt of his infamous character for unnatural lewdness and adultery, Curio the father says in one of his speeches, He was every woman's man, and every man's woman. It is acknowledged even by his enemies, that in regard to wine he was abstemious. A remark is ascribed to Marcus Cato, that Caesar was the only sober man amongst all those who were engaged in the design to subvert the government. In the matter of diet, Caius Oppius informs us that he was so indifferent that when a person in whose house he was entertained had served him with stale instead of fresh oil, and the rest of the company would not touch it, he alone ate very heartily of it, that he might not seem to tax the master of the house with rusticity or want of attention. But his abstinence did not extend to pecuniary advantages, either in his military commands or civil offices, for we have the testimony of some writers that he took money from the proconsul who was his predecessor in Spain, and from the Roman allies in that quarter, for the discharge of his debts and plundered at the point of the sword some towns of the Lusitanians, notwithstanding they attempted no resistance, and opened their gates to him upon his arrival before them. In Gaul he rifled the chapels and temples of the gods, which were filled with rich offerings, 
and demolished cities oftener for the sake of their spoil than for any ill they had done. By this means gold became so plentiful with him that he exchanged it through Italy and the provinces of the empire for three thousand sesterces the pound. In his first consulship he purloined from the capital three thousand pounds weight of gold, and substituted for it the same quantity of gilt brass. He bartered likewise to foreign nations and princes for gold the titles of allies and kings, and squeezed out of Ptolemy alone near six thousand talents in the name of himself and Pompey. He afterwards supported the expense of the civil wars and of his triumphs and public spectacles by the most flagrant rapine and sacrilege. In eloquence and warlike achievements, he equalled at least, if he did not surpass, the greatest of men. After his prosecution of Dolabella, he was indisputably reckoned one of the most distinguished advocates. Cicero, in recounting to Brutus the famous orators, declares that he does not see that Caesar was inferior to any one of them, and says that he had an elegant, splendid, noble, and magnificent vein of eloquence, and in a letter to Cornelius Nepos, he writes of him in the following terms. What, of all the orators who, during the whole course of their lives, have done nothing else, which can you prefer to him? Which of them is more pointed or terse in his periods, or employs more polished and elegant language? In his youth he seems to have chosen Strabo Caesar for his model, from whose oration in behalf of the Sardinians he has transcribed some passages literally into his divination. In his delivery he is said to have had a shrill voice, and his action was animated, but not ungraceful. He has left behind him some speeches, among which are ranked a few that are not genuine, such as that on behalf of Quintus Metellus. These Augustus supposes, with reason, to be rather the production of blundering shorthand writers who were not able to keep pace with him in the delivery, than publications of his own. For I find in some copies that the title is not For Metellus, but What He Wrote to Metellus, whereas the speech is delivered in the name of Caesar, vindicating Metellus and himself from the aspersions cast upon them by their common defamers. The speech addressed to his soldiers in Spain Augustus considers likewise as spurious. We meet with two under this title, one made as is pretended in the first battle, and the other in the last, at which time Asinius Pollio says he had not leisure to address the soldiers on account of the suddenness of the enemy's attack. End of Julius Caesar, Part 3 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part 4 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 4 Paragraphs 56 to 79. He has likewise left commentaries of his own actions both in the war in Gaul and in the civil war with Pompey. For the author of the Alexandrian, African, and Spanish wars is not known with any certainty. Some think they are the production of Oppius, 
and some of Hirtius, the latter of whom composed the last book, which is imperfect, of the Gallic War. Of Caesar's commentaries, Cicero in his Brutus speaks thus. He wrote his commentaries in a manner deserving of great approbation. They are plain, precise, and elegant, without any affectation of rhetorical ornament. In having thus prepared materials for others who might be inclined to write his history, he may perhaps have encouraged some silly creatures to enter upon such a work, who will needs be dressing up his actions in all the extravagance of bombast. But he has discouraged wise men from ever attempting the subject. Hirtius delivers his opinion of these commentaries in the following terms. So great is the approbation with which they are universally perused, that, instead of rousing, he seems to have precluded the efforts of any future historian. Yet, with respect to this work, we have more reason to admire him than others, for they only know how well and correctly he has written, but we know likewise how easily and quickly he did it. Pollio Asinius thinks that they were not drawn up with much care, or with a due regard to truth, for he insinuates that Caesar was too hasty of belief in regard to what was performed by others under his orders, and that he has not given a very faithful account of his own acts, either by design or through defect of memory, expressing at the same time an opinion that Caesar intended a new and more correct edition. He has left behind him likewise two books on analogy, with the same number under the title of Anti Cato, and a poem entitled The Itinerary. Of these books he composed the first two in his passage over the Alps as he was returning to the army after making his circuit in hither Gaul, the second work about the time of the Battle of Munda, and the last during the four and twenty days he employed in his journey from Rome to farther Spain. There are extant some letters of his to the Senate, written in a manner never practised by any before him, for they are distinguished into pages in the form of a memorandum book, whereas the consuls and commanders till then used constantly in their letters to continue the line quite across the sheet, without any folding or distinction of pages. There are extant likewise some letters from him to Cicero, and others to his friends, concerning his domestic affairs, in which, if there was occasion for secrecy, he wrote in ciphers, that is, he used the alphabet in such a manner that not a single word could be made out. The way to decipher those epistles was to substitute the fourth for the first letter, as D for A, and so for the other letters, respectively. Some things likewise pass under his name, said to have been written by him when a boy or a very young man, as the encomium of Hercules, a tragedy entitled Oedipus, and a collection of apothems, all of which Augustus forbade to be published in a short and plain letter to Pompeius Mesa, who was employed by him in the arrangement of his libraries. He was perfect in the use of arms, an accomplished rider, and able to endure fatigue beyond all belief. On a march he used to go at the head of his troops, sometimes on horseback, but oftener on foot, with his head bare in all kinds of weather. He would travel post in a light carriage without baggage at the rate of a hundred miles a day and if he was stopped by floods in the rivers, he swam across, or floated on skins inflated with wind, so that he often anticipated intelligence of his movements. In his expeditions it is difficult to say whether his caution or his daring was most conspicuous. He never marched his army by roads which were exposed to ambuscades, without having previously examined the nature of the ground by his scouts, nor did he cross over to Britain before he had carefully examined in person the navigation, the harbours, 
and the most convenient point of landing in the island. When intelligence was brought to him of the siege of his camp in Germany, he made his way to his troops through the enemy's stations in a Gaulish dress. He crossed the sea from Brundisium and Dyrrachium in the winter through the midst of the enemy's fleets, and the troops, under orders to join him, being slow in their movements, notwithstanding repeated messages to hurry them, but to no purpose, he at last went privately and alone aboard a small vessel in the night-time, with his head muffled up nor did he make himself known, or suffer the master to put about, although the wind blew strong against them, until they were ready to sink. He was never deterred from any enterprise, nor retarded in the prosecution of it by superstition. When a victim which he was about to offer in sacrifice made its escape, he did not therefore defer his expedition against Scipio and Juba, and happening to fall upon stepping out of the ship, he gave a lucky turn to the omen by exclaiming, I hold thee fast, Africa. To chide the prophecies which were spread abroad that the name of the Scipios was by the decrees of fate fortunate and invincible in that province, he retained in the camp a profligate wretch of the family of the Cornelii, who, on account of his scandalous life, was surnamed Saluito. He not only fought pitched battles, but made sudden attacks when an opportunity offered, often at the end of a march, and sometimes during the most violent storms when nobody could imagine he would stir. Nor was he ever backward in fighting until towards the end of his life. He then was of opinion that the oftener he had been crowned with success, the less he ought to expose himself to new hazards, and that nothing he could gain by a victory would compensate for what he might lose by a miscarriage. He never defeated the enemy without driving them from their camp and giving them no time to rally their forces. When the issue of a battle was doubtful, he sent away all the horses, and his own first, that having no means of flight, they might be under the greater necessity of standing their ground. He rode a very remarkable horse, with feet almost like those of a man, the hoofs being divided in such a manner as to have some resemblance to toes. This horse he had bred himself, and the soothsayers having interpreted these circumstances into an omen that its owner would be master of the world, he brought him up with particular care, and broke him in himself, as the horse would suffer no one else to mount him. A statue of this horse was afterwards erected by Caesar's order before the temple of Venus Genitrix. He often rallied his troops, when they were giving way, by his personal efforts, stopping those who fled, keeping others in their ranks, and seizing them by their throat turned them towards the enemy. Although numbers were so terrified that an eagle-bearer thus stopped, made a thrust at him with the spearhead, and another, upon a similar occasion, left the standard in his hand. The following instances of his resolution are equally and even more remarkable. After the battle of Pharsalia, having sent his troops before him into Asia, as he was passing the straits of the Hellespont in a ferry-boat, he met with Lucius Cassius, one of the opposite party, with ten ships of war, and so far from endeavouring to escape, he went alongside his ship, and calling upon him to surrender, Cassius humbly gave him his submission. At Alexandria, in the attack of a bridge, being forced by a sudden sally of the enemy into a boat, and several others hurrying in with him, he leapt into the sea, and saved himself by swimming to the next ship, which lay at the distance of two hundred paces holding up his left hand out of the water for fear of wetting some papers which he held in it, 
and pulling his general's cloak after him with his teeth, lest it should fall into the hands of the enemy. He never valued a soldier for his moral conduct or his means, but for his courage only, and treated his troops with a mixture of severity and indulgence, for he did not always keep a strict hand over them, but only when the enemy was near. Then, indeed, he was so strict a disciplinarian that he would give no notice of a march or a battle until the moment of action, in order that the troops might hold themselves in readiness for any sudden movement, and he would frequently draw them out of the camp without any necessity for it, especially in rainy weather and upon holy days. Sometimes giving them orders not to lose sight of him, he would suddenly depart by day or by night, and lengthen the marches in order to tire them out, as they followed him at a distance. When at any time his troops were dispirited by reports of the great force of the enemy, he rallied their courage, not by denying the truth of what was said, or by diminishing the facts, but on the contrary, by exaggerating every particular. Accordingly, when his troops were in great alarm at the expected arrival of King Juba, he called them together and said, I have to inform you that in a very few days the king will be here, with ten legions, thirty thousand horse, a hundred thousand light-armed foot, and three hundred elephants. Let none of you therefore presume to make further inquiry or indulge in conjectures, but take my word for what I tell you, which I have from undoubted intelligence. Otherwise I shall put them aboard an old crazy vessel, and leave them exposed to the mercy of the winds, to be transported to some other country. He neither noticed all their transgressions, nor punished them according to strict rule. But for deserters and mutineers he made the most diligent inquiry, and their punishment was most severe. Other delinquencies he would connive at. Sometimes, after a great battle ending in victory, he would grant them a relaxation from all kinds of duty, and leave them to revel at pleasure, being used to boast that his soldiers fought nothing the worse for being well oiled. In his speeches he never addressed them by the title of soldiers, but by the kinder phrase of fellow-soldiers, and kept them in such splendid order that their arms were ornamented with silver and gold, not merely for parade, but to render the soldiers more resolute to save them in battle, and fearful of losing them. He loved his troops to such a degree that when he heard of the defeat of those under Titurius, he neither cut his hair nor shaved his beard until he had revenged it upon the enemy, by which means he engaged their devoted affection and raised their valour to the highest pitch. Upon his entering on the civil war, the centurions of every legion offered, each of them, to maintain a horseman at his own expense, and the whole army agreed to serve gratis without either corn or pay, those amongst them who were rich charging themselves with the maintenance of the poor. No one of them during the whole course of the war deserted to the enemy, and many of those who were made prisoners, though they were offered their lives upon condition of bearing arms against him, refused to accept the terms. They endured want and other hardships, not only when they were besieged themselves, but when they besieged others, to such a degree that Pompey, when blocked up in the neighbourhood of Dyrrhachium, upon seeing a sort of bread made of an herb which they lived upon, said, I have to do with wild beasts and ordered it immediately to be taken away, because if his troop should see it, their spirit might be broken by perceiving the endurance and determined resolution of the enemy. With what bravery they fought, one instance affords sufficient proof, 
which is that after an unsuccessful engagement at Dyrrachium, they called for punishment, insomuch that their general found it more necessary to comfort than to punish them. In other battles, in different quarters, they defeated with ease immense armies of the enemy, although they were much inferior to them in number. In short, one cohort of the Sixth Legion held out a fort against four legions belonging to Pompey during several hours, being almost every one of them wounded by the vast number of arrows discharged against them, and of which there were found within the ramparts a hundred and thirty thousand. This is no way surprising when we consider the conduct of some individuals amongst them, such as that of Cassius Siva, a centurion, or Gaius Acilius, a common soldier, not to speak of others. Siva, after having an eye struck out, being run through the thigh and the shoulder, and having his shield pierced in an hundred and twenty places, maintained obstinately the guard of the gate of a fort, with the command of which he was entrusted. Acilius, in the sea fight at Marseilles, having seized a ship of the enemies with his right hand, and that being cut off, in imitation of that memorable instance of resolution in Sinigyrus amongst the Greeks, boarded the enemy's ship, bearing down all before him with the boss of his shield. They never once mutinied during all the ten years of the Gallic War, but were sometimes refractory in the course of the Civil War. However, they always returned quickly to their duty, and that not through the indulgence, but in submission to the authority of their general. For he never yielded to them when they were insubordinate, but constantly resisted their demands. He disbanded the whole Ninth Legion with ignominy at Placentia, although Pompey was still in arms, and would not receive them again into his service until they had not only made repeated and humble entreaties, but until the ringleaders in the mutiny were punished. When the soldiers of the Tenth Legion at Rome demanded their discharge and rewards for their service, with violent threats and no small danger to the city, although the war was then raging in Africa, he did not hesitate, contrary to the advice of his friends, to meet the legion and disband it. But addressing them by the title of Quirites instead of soldiers, he by this single word so thoroughly brought them round and changed their determination that they immediately cried out they were his soldiers, and followed him to Africa, although he had refused their service. He nevertheless punished the most mutinous among them with the loss of a third of their share in the plunder and the land destined for them. In the service of his clients, while yet a young man, he evinced great zeal and fidelity. He defended the cause of a noble youth, Masintha, against King Hiemsal, so strenuously that in a scuffle which took place upon the occasion he seized by the beard the son of King Juba, and upon Masintha's being declared tributary to Hiemsal, while the friends of the adverse party were violently carrying him off, he immediately rescued him by force, kept him concealed in his house a long time, and when, at the expiration of his praetorship, he went to Spain, he took him away in his litter, in the midst of his lictors bearing the fasces, and others who had come to attend and take leave of him. He always treated his friends with such kindness and good nature, that when Gaius Oppius, in travelling with him through a forest, was suddenly taken ill, he resigned to him the only place there was to shelter them at night, and lay upon the ground in the open air. When he had placed himself at the head of affairs, he advanced some of his faithful adherents, though of mean extraction, to the highest offices. And when he was censured for this partiality, he openly said, 
had i been assisted by robbers and cutthroats in the defence of my honour i should have made them the same recompense the resentment he entertained against any one was never so implacable that he did not very willingly renounce it when opportunity offered although gaius memmius had published some extremely virulent speeches against him and he had answered him with equal acrimony yet he afterwards assisted him with his vote and interest when he stood candidate for the consulship when gaius calvus after publishing some scandalous epigrams upon him endeavoured to effect a reconciliation by the intercession of friends he wrote to him of his own accord the first letter. And when Valerius Catullus, who had, as he himself observed, fixed such a stain upon his character in his verses upon Mamurra as never could be obliterated, begged his pardon, he invited him to supper the same day, and continued to take up his lodging with his father occasionally, as he had been accustomed to do. His temper was also naturally averse to severity in retaliation. After he had captured the pirates by whom he had been taken, having sworn that he would crucify them, he did so, indeed, but he first ordered their throats to be cut. He could never bear the thought of doing any harm to Cornelius Fagitas, who had dogged him in the night when he was sick and a fugitive with the design of carrying him to Scylla, and from whose hands he had escaped with some difficulty by giving him a bribe. Philemon, his amanuensis, who had promised his enemies to poison him, he put to death without torture. When he was summoned as a witness against Publius Clodius, his wife Pompeia's gallant, who was prosecuted for the profanation of religious ceremonies, he declared he knew nothing of the affair, although his mother Aurelia and his sister Julia gave the court an exact and full account of the circumstances. And being asked why then he had divorced his wife, because, he said, my family should not only be free from guilt, but even from the suspicion of it. Both in his administration and his conduct towards the vanquished party in the civil war, he showed a wonderful moderation and clemency. For while Pompey declared that he would consider those as enemies who did not take arms in defence of the Republic, he desired it to be understood that he should regard those who remained neuter as his friends. With regard to all those to whom he had, on Pompey's recommendation, given any command in the army, he left them at perfect liberty to go over to him if they pleased. When some proposals were made at Illyria for a surrender, which gave rise to a free communication between the two camps, and Afranius and Petrius, upon a sudden change of resolution, had put to the sword all Caesar's men who were found in the camp, he scorned to imitate the base treachery which they had practised against himself. On the field of Pharsalia he called out to the soldiers to spare their fellow citizens, and afterwards gave permission to every man in his army to save an enemy. None of them, so far as appears, lost their lives but in battle, excepting only Afranius, Faustus, and young Lucius Caesar, and it is thought that even they were put to death without his consent. Afranius and Faustus had borne arms against him after obtaining their pardon, and Lucius Caesar had not only in the most cruel manner destroyed with fire and sword his freedmen and slaves, but cut to pieces the wild beasts which he had prepared for the entertainment of the people. And finally, a little before his death, he permitted all whom he had not before pardoned to return into Italy and to bear offices both civil and military. He even replaced the statues of Scylla and Pompey which had been thrown down by the populace. 
and after this whatever was devised or uttered he chose rather to check than to punish it accordingly having detected certain conspiracies and nocturnal assemblies he went no farther than to intimate by a proclamation that he knew of them and as to those who indulged themselves in the liberty of reflecting severely upon him he only warned them in a public speech not to persist in their offence. He bore with great moderation a virulent libel written against him by Aulus Cicinna, and the abusive lampoons of Pithalaeus most highly reflecting on his reputation. His other words and actions, however, so far outweigh all his good qualities, that it is thought he abused his power and was justly cut off. For he not only obtained excessive honours, such as the consulship every year, the dictatorship for life and the censorship, but also the title of emperor and the surname of father of his country, besides having his statue amongst the kings and a lofty couch in the theatre. He even suffered some honours to be decreed to him which were unbefitting the most exalted of mankind, such as a gilded chair of state in the senate house and on his tribunal, a consecrated chariot, and banners in the Circensian procession, temples, altars, statues among the gods, a bed of state in the temples, a priest, and a college of priests dedicated to himself like those of Pan, and that one of the months should be called by his name. There were indeed no honours which he did not either assume himself, or grant to others at his will and pleasure. In his third and fourth consulship he used only the title of the office, being content with the power of dictator which was conferred upon him with the consulship and in both years he substituted other consuls in his room during the three last months, so that in the intervals he held no assemblies of the people for the election of magistrates, excepting only tribunes and ediles of the people, and appointed officers under the name of prefects instead of the praetors to administer the affairs of the city during his absence. The office of consul having become vacant by the sudden death of one of the consuls the day before the calends of January, the 1st of January, he conferred it on a person who requested it of him for a few hours. Assuming the same license, and regardless of the customs of his country, he appointed magistrates to hold their offices for terms of years. He granted the insignia of the consular dignity to ten persons of praetorian rank. He admitted into the senate some men who had been made free of the city, and even natives of Gaul, who were semi-barbarians. He likewise appointed to the management of the mint and the public revenue of the state some servants of his own household, and entrusted the command of three legions, which he left at Alexandria, to an old catamite of his the son of his freedman Rufinus. He was guilty of the same extravagance in the language he publicly used, as Titus Ampius informs us, according to whom he said, The Republic is nothing but a name, without substance or reality. Scylla was an ignorant fellow to abdicate the dictatorship. Men ought to consider what is becoming when they talk with me, and look upon what I say as a law. To such a pitch of arrogance did he proceed, that when a soothsayer announced to him the unfavourable omen that the entrails of a victim offered for sacrifice were without a heart, he said, The entrails will be more favourable when I please, and it ought not to be regarded as a prodigy that a beast should be found wanting a heart. But what brought upon him the greatest odium, and was thought an unpardonable insult, was his receiving the whole body of the conscript fathers sitting before the temple of Venus Genetrix, 
when they waited upon him with a number of decrees conferring on him the highest dignities. Some say that on his attempting to rise he was held down by Cornelius Balbus, others that he did not attempt to rise at all, but frowned on Gaius Trebatius, who suggested to him that he should stand up to receive the Senate. This behaviour appeared the more intolerable in him, because when one of the tribunes of the people, Pontius Aquila, would not rise up to him as he passed by the tribune's seat during his triumph, he was so much offended that he cried out, Well then, you tribune, Aquila, oust me from the government. And for some days afterwards he never promised a favour to any person without this proviso, if Pontus Aquila will give me leave. To this extraordinary mark of contempt for the Senate, he added another affront still more outrageous. For when, after the sacred rites of the Latin festival, he was returning home amidst the immoderate and unusual acclamations of the people, a man in the crowd put a laurel crown encircled with a white fillet on one of his statues, upon which the tribunes of the people Epidius Morallus and Cisitius Flavus ordered the fillet to be removed from the crown and the man to be taken to prison. Caesar, being much concerned either that the idea of royalty had been suggested to so little purpose, or, as was said, that he was thus deprived of the merit of refusing it, reprimanded the tribunes very severely and dismissed them from their office. From that day forward he was never able to wipe off the scandal of affecting the name of king, although he replied to the populace when they saluted him by that title, I am Caesar and no king. And at the feast of the Lupercalia, when the consul Antony placed a crown upon his head in the rostra several times, he as often put it away, and sent it to the capital for Jupiter the best and the greatest. A report was very current that he had a design of withdrawing to Alexandria or Ilium, whither he proposed to transfer the imperial power, to drain Italy by new levies, and to leave the government of the city to be administered by his friends. To this report it was added that in the next meeting of the Senate, Lucius Cotta, one of the fifteen, would make a motion that as there was in the Sibylline books a prophecy that the Parthians would never be subdued but by a king, Caesar should have that title conferred upon him. End of Julius Caesar, Part 4 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part 5, of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 5, Paragraphs 80 to 89. For this reason, the conspirators precipitated the execution of their design that they might not be obliged to give their assent to the proposal. Instead, therefore, of caballing any longer separately in small parties, they now united their councils, the people themselves being dissatisfied with the present state of affairs, both privately and publicly condemning the tyranny under which they lived, and calling on patriots to assert their cause against the usurper. Upon the admission of foreigners into the Senate, a handbill was posted up in these words, A good deed! Let no one show a new senator the way to the house. 
These verses were likewise currently repeated. The Gauls he dragged in triumph through the town, Caesar has brought into the Senate House, and changed their plaids for the patrician gown. Gallos Caesar in triumphum ducit, e idem in curiam, Galli bracas deposuerunt, latum clavum sum serunt. When Quintus Maximus, who had been his deputy in the consulship for the last three months, entered the theatre, and the lictor, according to custom, bid the people take notice who was coming, they all cried out, He is no consul. After the removal of Cisicius and Morullus from their office, they were found to have a great many votes at the next election of consuls. Someone wrote under the statue of Lucius Brutus, Would you were now alive! And under the statue of Caesar himself, these lines. Because he drove from Rome the royal race, Brutus was first made consul in their place. This man, because he put the consuls down, has been rewarded with a royal crown. Brutus, quia reges eiecit, consul primus factus est. Hic, quia consules eiecit, rex postremo factus est. About sixty persons were engaged in the conspiracy against him, of whom Gaius Cassius and Marcus and Decimus Brutus were the chief. It was at first debated amongst them whether they should attack him in the Campus Martius when he was taking the votes of the tribes, and some of them should throw him off the bridge whilst others should be ready to stab him upon his fall, or else in the Via Sacra or at the entrance of the theatre. But after public notice had been given by proclamation for the Senate to assemble upon the Ides of March, the 15th of March, in the Senate house built by Pompey, they approved both of the time and place as most fitting for their purpose. Caesar had warning given him of his fate by indubitable omens. A few months before, when the colonists settled at Capua by virtue of the Julian law were demolishing some old sepulchres in building country houses, and were the more eager at the work because they discovered certain vessels of antique workmanship, a tablet of brass was found in a tomb in which Capis, the founder of Capua, was said to have been buried, with an inscription in the Greek language to this effect. Whenever the bones of Capis come to be discovered, a descendant of Iulus will be slain by the hands of his kinsmen, and his death revenged by fearful disasters throughout Italy. Lest any person should regard this anecdote as a fabulous or silly invention, it was circulated upon the authority of Gaius Balbus, an intimate friend of Caesar's. A few days likewise before his death, he was informed that the horses, which upon his crossing the Rubicon he had consecrated and turned loose to graze without a keeper, abstained entirely from eating and shed floods of tears. The soothsayer Spurina, observing certain ominous appearances in a sacrifice which he was offering, advised him to beware of some danger which threatened to befall him before the Ides of March were passed. The day before the Ides, birds of various kinds from a neighbouring grove, pursuing a wren which flew into Pompey's senate house with a sprig of laurel in its beak, tore it in pieces. Also, in the night on which the day of his murder dawned, he dreamt at one time that he was soaring above the clouds, and at another that he had joined hands with Jupiter. His wife Calpurnia fancied in her sleep that the pediment of the house was falling down, and her husband stabbed on her bosom, immediately upon which the chamber doors flew open. On account of these omens, as well as his infirm health, he was in some doubt whether he should not remain at home, 
and defer to some other opportunity the business which he intended to propose to the Senate. But Decimus Brutus, advising him not to disappoint the senators, who were numerously assembled and waited his coming, he was prevailed upon to go, and accordingly set forward about the fifth hour. In his way, some person having thrust into his hand a paper warning him against the plot, he mixed it with some other documents which he held in his left hand, intending to read it at leisure. Victim after victim was slain without any favourable appearances in the entrails. But still, disregarding all omens, he entered the Senate House, laughing at Spurinna as a false prophet, because the Ides of March were come without any mischief having befallen him to which the soothsayer replied, They are come indeed, but not past. When he had taken his seat, the conspirators stood round him under colour of paying their compliments, and immediately Tullius Simba, who had engaged to commence the assault, advancing nearer than the rest, as if he had some favour to request, Caesar made signs that he should defer his petition to some other time. Tullius immediately seized him by the toga on both shoulders, at which Caesar, crying out, Violence is meant, one of the Cassii wounded him a little below the throat. Caesar seized him by the arm and ran it through with his styli, and, endeavouring to rush forward, was stopped by another wound. Finding himself now attacked on all hands with naked poniards, he wrapped the toga about his head, and at the same moment drew the skirt round his legs with his left hand, that he might fall more decently with the lower part of his body covered. He was stabbed with three and twenty wounds, uttering a groan only, but no cry, at the first wound, although some authors relate that when Marcus Brutus fell upon him, he exclaimed, What? Art thou too one of them? Thou my son! The whole assembly instantly dispersing, he lay for some time after he expired, until three of his slaves laid the body on a litter and carried it home, with one arm hanging down over the side. Among so many wounds, there was none that was mortal, in the opinion of the surgeon Antistius, except the second, which he received in the breast. The conspirators meant to drag his body into the Tiber as soon as they had killed him, to confiscate his estate, and rescind all his enactments. But they were deterred by fear of Mark Antony and Lepidus, Caesar's master of the horse, and abandoned their intentions. At the instance of Lucius Piso, his father-in-law, his will was opened and read in Mark Antony's house. He had made it on the Ides, the 13th, of the preceding September, at his Lavican villa, and committed it to the custody of the chief of the Vestal Virgins. Quintus Tubero informs us that in all the wills he had signed from the time of his first consulship to the breaking out of the civil war, Cnaeus Pompey was appointed his heir, and that this had been publicly notified to the army. But in his last will he named three heirs, the grandsons of his sisters, namely Gaius Octavius for three-fourths of his estate, and Lucius Pinarius and Quintus Pedius for the remaining fourth. Other heirs in remainder were named at the close of the will, in which he also adopted Gaius Octavius, who was to assume his name, into his family, and nominated most of those who were concerned in his death among the guardians of his son if he should have any, as well as Decimus Brutus amongst his heirs of the second order. He bequeathed to the Roman people his gardens near the Tiber, and three hundred sesterces each man. Notice of his funeral having been solemnly proclaimed, a pile was erected in the Campus Martius, 
near the tomb of his daughter Julia, and before the rostra was placed a gilded tabernacle on the model of the temple of Venus Genitrix, within which was an ivory bed covered with purple and cloth of gold. At the head was a trophy with the blood-stained robe in which he was slain. It being considered that the whole day would not suffice for carrying the funeral oblations in solemn procession before the corpse, directions were given for every one, without regard to order, to carry them from the city into the campus marshes by what way they pleased. To raise pity and indignation for his murder, in the plays acted at the funeral, a passage was sung from Pacuvius's tragedy entitled The Trial for Arms, that ever I, unhappy man, should save wretches who thus have brought me to the grave, and some lines also from Attilius's tragedy of Electra to the same effect. Instead of a funeral panegyric, the consul Antony ordered a herald to proclaim to the people the decree of the Senate, in which they had bestowed upon him all honours, divine and human, with the oath by which they had engaged themselves for the defence of his person, and to these he added only a few words of his own. The magistrates, and others who had formerly filled the highest offices, carried the beer from the rostra into the forum. While some proposed that the body should be burnt in the sanctuary of the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, and others in Pompey's senate house, on a sudden two men, with swords by their sides and spears in their hands, set fire to the bier with lighted torches. The throng around immediately heaped upon it dry faggots, the tribunals and benches of the adjoining courts, and whatever else came to hand. Then the musicians and players stripped off the dresses they wore on the present occasion, taken from the wardrobe of his triumph at spectacles, rent them, and threw them into the flames. The legionaries also of his veteran bands cast in their armour which they had put on in honour of his funeral. Most of the ladies did the same by their ornaments, with the bully and mantles of their children. In this public mourning there joined a multitude of foreigners, expressing their sorrow according to the fashion of their respective countries, but especially the Jews, who for several nights together frequented the spot where the body was burnt. The populace ran from the funeral with torches in their hands to the houses of Brutus and Cassius, and were repelled with difficulty. Going in quest of Cornelius Cinna, who had in a speech the day before reflected severely upon Caesar, and mistaking for him Helvius Cinna, who happened to fall into their hands, they murdered the latter, and carried his head about the city on the point of a spear. They afterwards erected in the forum a column of Numidian marble, formed of one stone nearly twenty feet high, and inscribed upon it these words, To the father of his country. At this column they continued for a long time to offer sacrifices, make vows, and decide controversies in which they swore by Caesar. Some of Caesar's friends entertained a suspicion that he neither desired nor cared to live any longer on account of his declining health and for that reason slighted all the omens of religion and the warnings of his friends. Others are of opinion that thinking himself secure in the late decree of the Senate and their oaths, he dismissed his Spanish guards who attended him with drawn swords. Others again suppose that he chose rather to face at once the dangers which threatened him on all sides than to be for ever on the watch against them. Some tell us that he used to say the commonwealth was more interested in the safety of his person than himself, for that he had for some time been satiated with power and glory, but that the commonwealth, if anything should befall him, would have no rest, and, involved in another civil war, 
would be in a worse state than before. This, however, was generally admitted that his death was in many respects such as he would have chosen. For upon reading the account delivered by Xenophon, how Cyrus in his last illness gave instructions respecting his funeral, Caesar deprecated a lingering death, and wished that his own might be sudden and speedy. And the day before he died, the conversation at supper in the house of Marcus Lepidus, turning upon what was the most eligible way of dying, he gave his opinion in favour of a death that is sudden and unexpected. He died in the fifty-sixth year of his age, and was ranked amongst the gods, not only by a formal decree, but in the belief of the vulgar. For during the first games which Augustus his heir consecrated to his memory, a comet blazed for seven days together, rising always about eleven o'clock, and it was supposed to be the soul of Caesar now received into heaven, for which reason likewise he is represented on his statue with a star on his brow. The senate house in which he was slain was ordered to be shut up, and a decree made that the Ides of March should be called parricidal, and the Senate should never more assemble on that day. Scarcely any of those who were accessory to his murder survived him more than three years, or died a natural death. They were all condemned by the Senate. Some were taken off by one accident, some by another. Part of them perished at sea, others fell in battle, and some slew themselves with the same poniard with which they had stabbed Caesar. End of Julius Caesar Recording by Graham Redman Caesar Augustus, Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Caesar Augustus, Part 1, Paragraph 1 through 17. That the family of the Octavii was of the first distinction in Velitrae, is rendered evident by many circumstances. For in the most frequented part of the town, there was, not long since, a street named the Octavian, and an altar was to be seen consecrated to one Octavius, who, being appointed general in a war with some neighboring people, the enemy making a sudden attack, while he was sacrificing to Mars, he immediately snatched the entrails of the victim from off the fire, and offered them half raw upon the altar, after which, marching off to battle, he returned victorious. This incident gave rise to a law, by which it was enacted, that in all future times the entrails should be offered to Mars in the same manner, and the rest of the victims should be carried to the Octavii. This family, as well as several in Rome, was admitted to the Senate by Tarquinius Priscus, and afterwards placed by Servius Tullius among the patricians. But in process of time it transferred itself to the plebeian order, and, after the lapse of a long interval, was restored by Julius Caesar to the rank of patricians. The first person of the family raised by the suffrages of the people to the magistracy was Gaius Rufus. He obtained the quaestorship and had two sons, Nius and Gaius, from whom are descended the two branches of the Octavian family, which have had very different fortunes. For Nius and his descendants in uninterrupted succession held all the highest offices of the state whilst Gaius and his posterity, whether from their circumstances or their choice, remained in the equestrian order until the father of Augustus. The great-grandfather of Augustus served as a military tribune in the Second Punic War in Sicily, under the command of Aemilius Pappus. His grandfather contented himself with bearing the public offices of his own municipality, and grew old in the tranquil enjoyment of an ample patrimony, such as the account given by different authors. 
Augustus himself, however, tells us nothing more than he was descended of an equestrian family, both ancient and rich, of which his father was the first who obtained the rank of a senator. Mark Antony upbraidingly tells him that his great-grandfather was a freedman of the territory of Thermium, and a rope-maker, and his grandfather a usurer. This is all the information I have anywhere met with respecting the ancestors of Augustus by his father's side. His father, Gaius Octavius, was, from his earliest years, a person both of opulence and distinction, for which reason I am surprised at those who say he was a money-dealer, and was employed in scattering bribes and canvassing for the candidates at elections in the campus Martius. For being bred up in all the affluence of a great estate, he obtained with ease to honorable posts, and discharged the duties of them with much distinction. After his praetorship, he obtained by lot the province of Macedonia, in his way to which he cut off some of the banditti, the relics of the armies of Spartacus and Catiline, who had possessed themselves of the territory of Thurium, having received from the Senate an extraordinary commission for that purpose. In his government of the province he conducted himself with equal justice and resolution, for he defeated the Bessians and Thracians in a great battle, and treated the allies of the Republic in such a manner that there are extant letters from Marcus Tullius Cicero, in which he advises and exhorts his brother Quintus, who then held the proconsulship of Asia with no great reputation, to imitate the example of his neighbor Octavius in gaining the affections of the allies of Rome. After quitting Macedonia, before he could declare himself a candidate for the consulship, he died suddenly, leaving behind him a daughter, the elder Octavia, by Ancaria, and another daughter, Octavia the Younger, as well as Augustus by Atia, who was the daughter of Marcus Atius Balbus and Julia, sister to Gaius Julius Caesar. Balbus was, by the father's side, of a family who were natives of Aricia, and many of whom had been in the Senate. By the mother's side he was nearly related to Pompey the Great, and after he had borne the office of praetor, was one of the twenty commissioners appointed by the Julian law to divide the land in Campania among the people. But Mark Antony, treating with contempt Augustus's descent even by his mother's side, says that his great-grandfather was of African descent, and had one time kept a perfumer's shop, and at another a bakehouse in Aricia. And Cassius of Parma, in a letter, taxes Augustus with being the son not only of a baker, but a usurer. These are his words. Thou art a lump of thy mother's meal which a money-changer of Nerulum, taking from the newest bakehouse of Aricia, kneaded into some shape, with his hands all discolored by the fingering of money. Augustus was born in the consulship of Marcus Tullius Cicero and Gaius Antonius, upon the ninth of the Calends of October, 23rd September, a little before sunrise, in the quarter of the Palatine Hill, and the street called the Oxheads, where now stands a chapel dedicated to him, and built a little after his death. For, as it is recorded in the proceedings of the Senate, when Gaius Litorius, a young man of patrician family, in pleading before the senators for a lighter sentence, upon being convicted of adultery, alleged, besides his youth and quality, that he was the possessor, and as it were the guardian, of the ground which the divine Augustus first touched upon coming into the world and entreated that he might find favor for the sake of that deity, who was in a peculiar manner his, an act of the senate was passed for the consecration of that part of his house in which Augustus was born. His nursery is shown to this day, in a villa belonging to the family, in the suburbs of Velitri, being a very small place, and much like a pantry. An opinion prevails in the neighborhood that he was also born there. Into this place no person presumes to enter, unless upon necessity, and with great devotion, from a belief, for a long time prevalent, that such as rashly enter it are seized with great horror and consternation, which a short time since was confirmed by a remarkable incident. For when a new inhabitant of the house had, either by mere chance or to try the truth of the report, taken up his lodging in that apartment, in the course of the night, a few hours afterwards, he was thrown out by some sudden violence. He knew not how, and was found in a state of stupefaction, with a coverlid for his bed, before the door of the chamber. While he was yet an infant, the surname of Thurinus was given him, in memory of the birthplace of his family, or because, soon after he was born, his father Octavius had been successful against the fugitive slaves in the country near Thurium. 
That he was surnamed Thurinus I can affirm upon good foundation, for when a boy I had a small bronze statue of him, with that name upon it in iron letters, nearly effaced by age, which I presented to the emperor, by whom it is now revered amongst the other tutelar deities in his chamber. He is also often called Thurinus contemptuously by Mark Antony in his letters, to which he makes only this reply, I am surprised that my former name should be made a subject of reproach. He afterwards assumed the name of Gaius Caesar, and then of Augustus, the former in compliance with the will of his great uncle, and the latter upon the motion of Munatius Plancus in the Senate, for when some proposed to confer upon him the name of Romulus, as being, in a manner, a second founder of the city, it was resolved that he should rather be called Augustus, a surname not only new, but of more dignity, because places devoted to religion, and those in which anything is consecrated by augury, are denominated august, either from the word octus, signifying augmentation, or ab aviam gestu, gestuve, from the flight and feeding of birds, as appears from this verse of Aeneas, when glorious Rome by august augury was built. He lost his father when he was only four years of age, and, in his twelfth year, pronounced a funeral oration in praise of his grandmother, Julia. Four years afterwards, having assumed the robe of manhood, he was honored with several military rewards by Caesar in his African triumph, although he took no part in the war on account of his youth. Upon his uncle's expedition to Spain against the sons of Pompey, he was followed by his nephew, although he was scarcely recovered from a dangerous sickness, and after being shipwrecked at sea, and traveling with very few attendants through roads that were infested with the enemy, he at last came up with him. This activity gave great satisfaction to his uncle, who soon conceived an increasing affection for him, on account of such indications of character. After the subjugation of Spain, while Caesar was meditating an expedition against the Dacians and Parthians, he was sent before him to Apollonia, where he applied himself to his studies, until receiving intelligence that his uncle was murdered, and that he was appointed his heir. He hesitated from some time whether he should call to his aid the legions stationed in the neighborhood, but he abandoned the design as rash and premature. However, returning to Rome, he took possession of his inheritance, although his mother was apprehensive that such a measure might be attended with danger, and his stepfather, Marcius Philippus, a man of consular rank, very earnestly dissuaded him from it. From this time, collecting together a strong military force, he first held the government in conjunction with Mark Antony and Marcus Lepidus, then with Antony only, for nearly twelve years, and at last in his own hands during a period of four and forty. Having thus given a very short summary of his life, I shall prosecute the several parts of it, not in order of time, but arranging his acts into distinct classes for the sake of perspicuity. He was engaged in five civil wars, namely those of Modena, Philippi, Perugia, Sicily, and Actium, the first and last of which were against Antony, the second against Brutus and Cassius, the third against Lucius Antonius, the triumvir's brother, and the fourth against Sextus Pompeius, the son of Nius Pompeius. The motive which gave rise to all these wars was the opinion he entertained that both his honor and interest were concerned in revenging the murder of his uncle, and maintaining the state of affairs he had established. Immediately after his return from Apollonia, he formed the design of taking forcible and unexpected measures against Brutus and Cassius. But they, having foreseen the danger and made their escape, he resolved to proceed against them by an appeal to the laws in their absence, and impeach them for the murder. In the meantime, those whose province it was to prepare the sports, in honor of Caesar's last victory in the civil war, not daring to do it, he undertook it himself, and that he might carry into effect his other designs with greater authority, he declared himself a candidate in the room of a tribune of the people, who happened to die at that time, although he was of a patrician family, and had not yet been in the senate. But the consul, Mark Antony, from whom he had expected the greatest assistance, opposing him in his suit, and even refusing to do him so much as common justice, unless gratified with a large bribe, he went over to the party of the nobles, to whom he perceived Sulla to be odious, chiefly for endeavoring to drive Decius Brutus, whom he had besieged in the town of Modena, out of the province, 
which had been given him by Caesar, and confirmed to him by the Senate. At the instigation of persons about him, and he engaged some ruffians to murder his antagonist, but the plot being discovered, and dreading a similar attempt upon himself, he gained over Caesar's veteran soldiers, by distributing among them all the money he could collect. Being now commissioned by the Senate to command the troops he had gathered, with the rank of praetor, and in conjunction with Hortius and Pansa, who had accepted the consulship, to carry the assistance to Decius Brutus, he put an end to the war by two battles in three months. Antony writes that in the former of these he ran away, and two days afterwards made his appearance, without his general's cloak and his horse. In the last battle, however, it is certain that he performed the part not only of a general, but a soldier, for in the heat of battle, when the standard-bearer of his legion was severely wounded, he took the eagle upon his shoulders and carried it a long time. In this war, Hershius being slain in battle, and Panza dying a short time afterwards of a wound, a report was circulated that they both were killed through his means, in order that, when Antony fled, the Republic having lost its consuls, he might have the victorious armies entirely at his own command. The death of Panza was so fully believed to have been caused by undue means, that Glyco, his surgeon, was placed in custody, on a suspicion of having poisoned his wound, and to this Aquilius Niger adds, that he killed Hirtius, the other consul, in the confusion of the battle, with his own hands. But upon intelligence that Antony, after his defeat, had been received by Marcus Lepidus, and the rest of the generals and armies had all declared for the Senate, he, without any hesitation, deserted from the party of the nobles, alleging as an excuse for his conduct the actions and sayings of several amongst them, for some said he was a mere boy, others threw out that he ought to be promoted to honors and cut off, to avoid making any suitable acknowledgment either to him or to the veteran legions, and the more to testify his regret for having before attached himself to the other faction, he fined the Nursini in a large sum of money, which they were unable to pay, and then expelled them from the town, for having inscribed upon the monument erected at the public charge to their countrymen who were slain in the battle of Modena that they all fell in the cause of liberty. Having entered into a conference with Antony and Lepidus, he brought the war at Philippi to an end in two battles, although he was at that time weak and suffering from sickness. In the first battle he was driven from his camp, and with some difficulty made his escape to the wing of the army commanded by Antony. And now, intoxicated with success, he sent the head of Brutus to be cast at the floor of Caesar's statue and treated the most illustrious of the prisoners not only with cruelty, but with abusive language, insomuch as he is said to have answered one of them, who humbly entreated, that at least he might not remain unburied. That will be in the power of the birds. Two others, father and son, who begged for their lives, he ordered to cast lots, which of them should live, or to settle it between themselves by the sword, and was the spectator of both their deaths. For the father, offering his life to save his son, and being accordingly executed, the son likewise killed himself upon the spot. On this account, the rest of the prisoners, and among them Marcus Favonius, Cato's rival, being led up in fetters, after they had saluted Anthony, the general, with much respect, reviled Octavius in the foulest language. After this victory, dividing between them the offices of the state, Mark Antony undertook to restore the order in the east while Caesar conducted the veteran soldiers back to Italy, and settled them in colonies on the lands belonging to the municipalities. But he had the misfortune to please neither the soldiers nor the owners of the lands, one party complaining of the injustice done them, in being violently ejected from their possessions, and the other that they were not rewarded according to their merit. At this time he obliged Lucius Antony, who, presuming upon his own authority as consul, and his brother's power, was raising new commotions, to fly to Perugia, and forced him by famine to surrender at last, although not without having been exposed to great hazards, both before the war and during its continuance. For a common soldier, having got into the seats of the equestrian order and the theatre, at the public spectacles, Caesar ordered him to be removed by an officer, and a rumor being thus spread by his enemies, that he had put the man to death by torture. The soldiers flocked together, so much enraged that he narrowly escaped with his life. The only thing that saved him was the sudden appearance of the man, safe and sound, 
no violence having been offered him. And whilst he was sacrificing under the walls of Perugia, he nearly fell into the hands of a body of gladiators who sallied out of the town. After taking Perugia, he sentenced a great number of prisoners to death, making only one reply to all who implored pardon, or endeavored to excuse themselves. You must die. Some authors write that three hundred of the two orders, selected from the rest, were slaughtered like victims before an altar raised to Julius Caesar upon the Ides of March. Nay, there were some who relate that he entered upon the war with no other view than that his secret enemies, and those whom fear more than affection kept quiet, might be detected by declaring themselves, now that they had an opportunity, with Lucius Antony at their head, and that having defeated them and confiscated their estates, he might be enabled to fulfill his promises to the veteran soldiers. He soon commenced the Sicilian War, but it was protracted by various delays during a long period. At one time, for the purpose of repairing his fleets, which he twice lost by storm, even in the summer, at another, while patching up a peace, to which he was forced by the clamors of the people, in consequence of a famine occasioned by Pompey's cutting off the supply of corn by sea. But at last, having built a new fleet, and obtained twenty thousand manumitted slaves, who were given him for the oar, he formed the Julian harbor at Baiae, by letting the sea into the Lucrine and Avernian lakes, and having exercised his forces there during the whole winter, he defeated Pompey betwixt Mylae and Nauculus. Although, just as the engagement commenced, he suddenly fell into such a profound sleep that his friends were obliged to wake him to give the signal. This, I suppose, gave occasion for Antony's reproach. You were not better able to take a clear view of the fleet when drawn up in a line of battle, but lay stupidly upon your back, gazing up at the sky. Nor did you get up and let your men see you until Marcus Agrippa, had forced the enemy's ships to sheer off. Others imputed to him both a saying and an action, which were indefensible, for, upon the loss of his fleets by storm, he is reported to have said, I will conquer in spite of Neptune. And, at the next Circensian games, he would not suffer the statue of that god to be carried in procession as usual. Indeed, he scarcely ever ran more or greater risks in any of his wars than in this. Having transported part of his army to Sicily, in being on his return for the rest, he was unexpectedly attacked by Demarchus and Apollophanes, Pompey's admirals, from whom he escaped with great difficulty and with one ship only. Likewise, as he was traveling on foot through the Locrian territory to Regium, seeing two of Pompey's vessels passing by that coast and supposing them to be on his own, he went down to the shore and was very nearly taken prisoner. On this occasion, as he was making his escape, by some byways, a slave belonging to Aemilius Paulus, who, accompanying him, owing him a grudge for the prescription of Paulus, the father of Aemilius, and thinking he had now the opportunity of revenging it, attempted to assassinate him. After the defeat of Pompey, one of his colleagues, Marcus Lepidus, whom he had summoned to his aid from Africa, affecting great superiority because he was at the head of twenty legions, and claiming for himself the principal management of affairs in a threatening manner, he divested him of his command, but, upon his humble submission, granted him his life, but banished him for life to Circeii. The alliance between him and Antony, which had always been precarious, often interrupted, and ill-cemented by repeated reconciliations, he at last entirely dissolved, and to make it known to the world how far Antony had degenerated from patriotic feelings, he caused a will of his, which had been left at Rome, in which he had nominated Cleopatra's children, amongst others, as his heirs, to be opened and read in an assembly of the people. Yet, upon his being declared an enemy, he sent to him all his relations and friends, among whom were Gaius Sosius and Titus Domitius, at that time consuls. He likewise spoke favorably in public of the people of Bologna, for joining in the association with the rest of Italy to support his cause, because they had, in former times, been under the protection of the family of the Antonii. And not long afterwards he defeated him in a naval engagement near Actium, which was prolonged to so late an hour that, after the victory, he was obliged to sleep on board his ship. From Actium he went to the isle of Samoa to winter, 
but being alarmed with the accounts of a mutiny amongst the soldiers he had selected from the main body of his army sent to Brundisium after the victory, who insisted on their being rewarded for their service and discharged, he returned to Italy. In his passage thither, he encountered two violent storms, the first being between the promontories of Peloponnesus and Aetolia, and the other about the Curaunian mountains, in both of which a part of his Liburnian squadron was sunk, the spars and riggings of his own ships carried away, and the rudder broken in pieces. He remained only twenty-seven days at Brundisium, until the demands of the soldiers were settled, and then went, by way of Asia and Syria, to Egypt, where, laying siege to Alexandria, whither Antony had fled with Cleopatra, he made himself master of it in a short time. He drove Antony to kill himself, after he had used every effort to obtain conditions of peace, and he saw his corpse. Cleopatra he anxiously wished to save for his triumph, and when she was supposed to have been bit to death by an asp, he sent for the Sile to endeavor to suck out the poison. He allowed them to be buried together in the same grave, and ordered a mausoleum, begun by themselves, to be completed. The eldest of Antony's two sons by Fulvia he commanded to be taken from the statue of Julius Caesar, to which he had fled, after many fruitless supplications for his life, and put him to death. The same fate attended Caesario, Cleopatra's son by Caesar, as he pretended, who had fled for his life, but was retaken. The children which Antony had by Cleopatra he saved, and brought up and cherished in a manner suitable to their rank, just as if they had been his own relations. End of Caesar Augustus, Part 1《Caesar Augustus》Part Two of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. *Caesar Augustus* Part Two. Paragraphs 18-32 through 32. At this time he had a desire to see the sarcophagus and body of Alexander the Great, which, for that purpose, were taken out of the cell in which they rested, and after viewing them for some time he paid honors to the memory of that prince, by offering a golden crown, and scattering flowers upon the body. Being asked if he wished to see the tombs of the Ptolemies also, he replied, I wish to see a king, not dead men. He reduced Egypt into the form of a province, and to render it more fertile and more capable of supplying Rome with corn, he employed his army to scour the canals, into which the Nile, upon its rise, discharges itself, but which, during a long series of years, had become nearly choked up with mud. To perpetuate the glory of his victory at Actium, he built the city of Nicopolis on that part of the coast, and established games to be celebrated there every five years enlarging likewise an old temple of Apollo. He ornamented with naval trophies the spot on which he pitched his camp, and consecrated it to Neptune and Mars. He afterwards quashed several tumults and insurrections, as well as several conspiracies against his life, which were discovered by the confession of accomplices before they were ripe for execution, and others subsequently. Such were those of the younger Lepidus, of Varro Morina, and Phanius Capio, that of Marcus Ignatius, and afterwards of Plautius Rufus, and of Lucius Paulus, his granddaughter's husband, and besides these, another of Lucius Alsadius, an old feeble man who was under prosecution for forgery, and also of Asinius Epicatus, a Parthenian mongrel, and at last that of Telphus, a lady's prompter, for he was in danger of his life from the plots and conspiracies of some of the lowest of the people against him. Alsadius and Epicatus had formed the design of carrying off to the armies his daughter Julia and his grandson Agrippa from the islands in which they were confined. Telphus, wildly dreaming that the government was destined to him by the fates, proposed to fall both upon Octavius and the Senate. Nay, once a soldier's servant belonging to the army in Illyricum having passed the porters unobserved, was found in the night-time standing before his chamber door, 
armed with a hunting dagger. Whether the person was really disordered in the head, or only counterfeited madness, is uncertain, for no confession was obtained from him by torture. He conducted in person only two foreign wars, the Dalmatian, whilst he was but a youth, and, after Antony's final defeat, the Cantabrian. He was wounded in the former of these wars. In one battle he received a contusion in the right knee from a stone. In another he was much hurt, in one leg and both arms, by the fall of a fridge. His other wars he carried on by his lieutenants, but occasionally visited the army, in some of the wars of Pannonia in Germany, or remained at no great distance, proceeding from Rome as far as Ravenna, Milan, or Aquileia. He conquered, however, partly in person, and partly by his lieutenants, Cantabria, Aquitania, and Pannonia, Dalmatia with all Illyricum and Raetia, besides the two Alpine nations, the Vendaliki and the Salici. He also checked the incursions of the Dacians by cutting off three of their generals with vast armies, and drove the Germans beyond the river Elbe, removing two other tribes who submitted, the Ubii and Sicambri into Gaul, and settling them into the country bordering on the Rhine. Other nations also, which broke into revolt, he reduced to submission. But he never made war upon any nation without just and necessary cause. And so far from being ambitious either to extend the empire or advance his own military glory, that he obliged the chiefs of some barbarous tribes to swear in the temple of Mars the Avenger that they would faithfully observe their engagements and not violate the peace which they had implored. If some, he demanded a new description of hostages, their women, having found from experience that they cared little for their men when given as hostages, but he always afforded them the means of getting back their hostages whenever they wished it. Even those who engaged most frequently and with the greatest perfidy in their rebellion, he never punished more severely than by selling their captives, on the terms of their not serving in any neighboring country, nor being released from their slavery before the expiration of thirty years. By the character which he thus acquired for virtue and moderation, he induced even the Indians and Scythians, nations before known to the Romans by report only, to solicit his friendship and that of the Roman people by ambassadors. The Parthians readily allowed his claim to Armenia, restoring at his demand the standards which had been taken from Marcus Crassus and Mark Antony, and offering him hostages besides. Afterwards, when a contest arose between several pretenders to the crown of that kingdom, they refused to acknowledge any one who was not chosen by him. The temple of Janus Quirinus, which had been shut twice only, from the era of the building of the city to his own time, he closed thrice in a much shorter period, having established universal peace both by sea and land. He twice entered the city with the honors of an ovation, namely after the war of Philippi, and again after that of Sicily. He also had three curile triumphs, for his several victories in Dalmatia, and Actium, and Alexandria, each of which lasted three days. In all his wars, he never received any signal or ignominious defeat, except twice in Germany, under his lieutenants, under his lieutenants, Lolius and Varus. The former, indeed, had it more of dishonor than disaster, but that of Varus threatened the security of the empire itself. Three legions, with the commander, his lieutenants, and all the auxiliaries, being cut off. Upon receiving intelligence of this disaster, he gave orders for keeping a strict watch over the city, to prevent any public disturbance, and prolonged the appointments of the prefects in the provinces, that the allies might be kept in order by experience of persons to whom they were used. He made a vow to celebrate the great games in honor of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, if he would be pleased to restore the state to more prosperous circumstances. This had formerly been resorted to in the Cimbrian and Marcian wars. In short, we are informed that he was in such consternation at this event that he let the hair of his head and beard grow for several months, and sometimes knocked his head against the doorposts, crying out, O oh, Quintilius Varus! Give me back my legions. And, ever after, he observed the anniversary of this calamity as a day of sorrow and mourning. In military affairs he made many alterations, introducing some practices entirely new, and reviving others which had become obsolete. He maintained the strictest discipline among the troops, 
and would not allow even his lieutenants the liberty to visit their wives, except reluctantly, and in the winter season only. A Roman knight, having cut off the thumbs of his two young sons, to render them incapable of serving in the wars, he exposed both him and his estate to public sale. But upon observing the farmers of the revenue very greedy for the purchase, he assigned to him a freeman of his own, that he might send him into the country and suffer him to retain his freedom. The tenth legion becoming mutinous, he disbanded it with ignominy, and did the same by some others which petulantly demanded their discharge, withholding from them rewards usually bestowed on those who had served their stated time in the wars. The cohorts which yielded their ground in time of action, he decimated and fed with barley. Centurions, as well as common sentinels who deserted their posts when on guard, he punished with death. For other misdemeanors he inflicted upon them various kinds of disgrace, such as obliging them to stand all day before the praetorium, sometimes in their tunics only, and without their belts, and sometimes to carry poles ten feet long, or sods of turf. After the conclusion of the civil wars, he never, in any of his military harangues or proclamations, addressed him by the title of fellow soldiers, but as soldiers only nor would he suffer them to be otherwise called by his sons or stepsons, when they were in command, judging the former epithet to convey the idea of a degree of condescension inconsistent with military discipline, the maintenance of order and his own majesty and that of his house. Unless at Rome, in case of incendiary fires, or under the apprehension of public disturbances during a scarcity of provisions, he never employed in his army slaves who had been made freedmen, except on two occasions, on one for the security of the colonies bordering upon Illyricum, and on the other to guard the banks of the Rhine. Although he obliged persons of fortune, both male and female, to give up their slaves, and they received their manumission at once, yet he kept them together under their own standard, unmixed with soldiers who were better born, and armed likewise after different fashion. Military rewards, such as trappings, collars, and other decorations of gold and silver, he distributed more readily than camp or mural crowns, which were reckoned more honorable than the former. These he bestowed sparingly, without partiality, and frequently even on common soldiers. He presented Marcus Agrippa, after the naval engagement in the Sicilian War, with a sea-green banner. Those who shared in the honors of a triumph, although they had attended him in his expeditions and had taken part in his victories, he judged it improper to distinguish by the usual rewards for service because they had a right themselves to grant such rewards to whom they pleased. He thought nothing more derogatory to the character of an accomplished general than precipitancy and rashness, on which account he had frequently in his mouth these proverbs, Speude bladeos, hasten slowly, and Asphales gar est amenon, hierasis stratelitis, the cautious captains better than the bold, and that is done fast enough, which is done well enough. He was wont to say also that a battle or a war ought never to be undertaken unless the prospect of gain overbalance the fear of loss. For, said he, men who pursue small advantages with no small hazard resemble those who fish with a golden hook, the loss of which, if the line should happen to break, could never be compensated by all the fish they might take. He was advanced to public offices before the age at which he was legally qualified for them, and to some also of a new kind, and for life. He seized the consulship in the twentieth year of his age, quartering his legions in a threatening manner near the city, and sending deputies to demand it for him in the name of the army. When the Senate demurred, a centurion named Cornelius, who was at the head of the chief deputation, throwing back his cloak and showing the hilt of his sword, had the presumption to say in the Senate House, this will make him consul, if you will not. His second consulship he filled nine years afterwards, his third after the interval of only one year, and held the same office every year successively until the eleventh. From this period, although the consulship was frequently offered him, he always declined it, until, after a long interval, not less than seventeen years, he voluntarily stood for the twelfth, and two years after that for a thirteenth, that he might successively introduce into the forum, on their entering public life, his two sons, Gaius and Lucius, 
while he was invested with the highest office in the state. In his five consulships, from the sixth to the eleventh, he continued in office throughout the year, but in the rest, during only nine, six, four, or three months, and in his second no more than a few hours, for having sat for a short time in the morning upon the calends of January, in his curile chair, before the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, he abdicated his office, and substituted another in his room. Nor did he enter upon them all at Rome, but upon the fourth in Asia, the fifth in the Isle of Samos, and the eighth and ninth in Tarragona. During ten years he acted as one of the triumvirate for settling the commonwealth, in which office he for some time opposed his colleagues in their design of a prescription. But after it was begun, he prosecuted it with more determined rigor than either of them. For whilst they were often prevailed upon, by the interest and intercession of friends, to show mercy, he alone strongly insisted that no one should be spared, and even proscribed Gaius Tyrannius, his guardian, who had been formerly the colleague of his father Octavius, in the aedileship. Junius Saturninus adds this farther account of him, that when, after the prescription was over, Marcus Lepidus made an apology in the Senate for their past proceedings, and gave them hopes of a more mild administration, he, on the other hand, declared that the only limit he had fixed to the prescription was that he should be free to act as he pleased. Afterwards, however, repenting of his severity, he advanced Titus Vinius Philippoemen, to the equestrian rank, for having concealed his patron at the time when he was prescribed. In the same office he incurred great odium upon many accounts. For, as he was one day making an harangue, observing among the soldiers Penarius, a Roman knight, amid some private citizens, and engaged in taking notes, he ordered him to be stabbed before his eyes, as a busybody and a spy upon him. He was so terrified in his menaces, Tedius Afer, the consul-elect, for having reflected upon some actions of his, that he threw himself from a great height and died on the spot. And when Quintus Gallius, the praetor, came to compliment him, he concealed, and not yet venturing to make a search, came to compliment him with a double tablet under his cloak, suspecting that it was a sword he had concealed, and not yet venturing to make a search, lest it should be found to be something else, he caused him to be dragged from his tribunal by centurions and soldiers, and tortured like a slave and although he made no confession, ordered him to be put to death, after he had, with his own hands, plucked out his eyes. His own account of the matter, however, is that Quintus Gallius sought a private conference with him for the purpose of assassinating him, that he therefore put him in prison, but afterwards released him and banished him from the city. When he had perished, either in a storm at sea, or by falling into the hands of robbers. He twice entertained thoughts of restoring the Republic. First, immediately after he had crushed Antony, remembering that he had often charged him with being an obstacle to its restoration. The second time was in consequence of a long illness, when he sent for the magistrates and the Senate to his own house, and delivered them a particular account of the state of the empire. But reflecting at the same time that it would be both hazardous to himself to return to the condition of a private person, and might be dangerous to the public to have the government placed again under the control of the people, he resolved to keep it in his own hands. Whether with the better event or intention is hard to say. His good intentions he often affirmed in private discourse, and also published an edict, in which it was declared in the following terms, May it be permitted me to have the happiness of establishing the commonwealth on a safe and sound basis, and thus enjoy the reward of which I am ambitious, that of being celebrated for molding it into the form best adapted to present circumstances, so that, on my leaving the world, I may carry with me the hope that the foundations which I have laid for its future government will stand firm and stable. The city, which was not built in a manner suitable to the grandeur of the empire, and was liable to inundations of the Tiber, as well as to fires, was so much improved under his administration that he boasted, not without reason, that he found it of brick, but left it of marble. He also rendered it secure for the time to come against such disasters, as far as could be effected by human foresight. A great number of public buildings were erected by him, the most considerable of which were a forum, containing the temples of Mars, the Avenger, 
the temple of Apollo on the Palatine Hill, and the temple of Jupiter Tonans in the capital. The reason of his building a new forum was the vast increase in the population, and the number of causes to be tried in the courts, for which the two already existing, not affording sufficient space, it was thought necessary to have a third. It was, therefore, open for public use before the Temple of Mars was completely finished, and a law was passed that causes should be tried, the judges chosen by lot in that place. The Temple of Mars was built in fulfillment of a vow made during the War of Philippi, undertaken by him to avenge his father's murder. He ordained that the Senate should always assemble there when they meet to deliberate respecting wars and triumphs, that thence should be dispatched all those who were sent into the provinces in command of armies, and that in it those who returned victorious from the wars should lodge the trophies of their triumphs. He erected the Temple of Apollo in that part of his house on the Palatine Hill which had been struck with lightning, and which, on that account, the soothsayers declared the god to have chosen. He added porticos to it, with a library of Greek and Latin authors, and when advanced in years, used frequently there to hold the senate and examine the rolls of the judges. He dedicated the temple to Apollo Tonans in acknowledgment of his escape from a great danger in his Cantabrian expedition, when, as he was traveling in the night, his litter was struck by lightning, which killed the slave who carried a torch before him. He likewise constructed some public buildings in the name of others, for instance his grandsons, his wife and sister, Thus he built the portico and basilica of Lucius and Gaius, and the porticos of Livia and Octavia, and the theater of Marcellus. He also often exhorted other persons of rank to embellish the city by new buildings, or repairing and improving old according to their means. In consequence of this recommendation, many were raised, such as the temple of Hercules and the Muses by Marcius Philippus, a temple of Diana by Lucius Cornificius, the Temple of Freedom by Asinius Polio, a Temple of Saturn by Munatius Plancus, a theater and other noble edifices by Marcus Agrippa. He divided the city into regions and districts, ordaining that the annual magistrates should take by lot the charge of the former, and that the latter should be superintended by wardens chosen out of the people of each neighborhood. He appointed a nightly watch to be on their guard against accidents from fire, and to prevent their frequent inundations, he widened and cleansed the bed of the Tiber, which had in the course of years been almost dammed up with rubbish, and the channel narrowed by the ruins of houses. To render the approaches to the city more commodious, he took upon himself the charge of repairing the Flaminian Way as far as Ariminum, and distributed the repairs of the other roads amongst several persons who had obtained the honor of a triumph, to be defrayed out of the money arising from the spoils of war. Temples, decayed by time or destroyed by fire, he either repaired or rebuilt, and enriched them, as well as many others with splendid offerings. On a single occasion he deposited in the cell of the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus sixteen thousand pounds of gold, with jewels and pearls to the amount of fifty millions of sesterces. The office of Pontifex Maximus, of which he could not decently deprive Lepidus as long as he lived, he assumed as soon as he was dead. He then caused all prophetical books, both in Latin and Greek, the authors of which were either unknown or of no great authority, to be brought in, and the whole collection amounting to upwards of two thousand volumes he committed to the flames, preserving only the Sibylline oracles, and not even those without a strict examination, to a certain which were genuine. This being done, he deposited them in two gilt coffers under the pedestal of the statue of the Palatine Apollo. He restored the calendar which had been corrected by Julius Caesar, but through negligence was again fallen into confusion, to its former regularity, and upon that occasion called the month Sextilis by his own name, August, rather than September, in which he was born, because in it he had obtained his first consulship and all his most considerable victories. He increased the number, dignity, and revenues of the priests, and especially those of the Vestal Virgins and when, upon the death of one of them, a new one was to be taken, and many persons made interest that their daughter's names might be omitted in the list of elections, he replied with an oath, If either of my own granddaughters were old enough, I would have proposed her. He likewise revived some old religious customs which had become obsolete, 
as the augury of public health, the office of high priest of Jupiter, the religious solemnity of the Lupercalia with the secular and comipolitan games. He prohibited young boys from running in the Lupercalia, and in respect of the secular games, issued an order that no young persons of either sex should appear at any public diversions in the night time, unless in the company of some elderly relation. He ordered the household gods to be decked twice a year with spring and summer flowers in the Compatalian festival. Next to the immortal gods, he placed the highest honors to the memory of those generals who had raised the Roman state from its low origin to the highest pitch of grandeur. He accordingly repaired or rebuilt the public edifices erected by them, preserving the former inscriptions and placing statues of them all with triumphal emblems in both the porticos of his forum, issuing an edict on the occasion in which he made the following declaration. My design in doing so is that the Roman people may require from me and all succeeding princes a conformity to those illustrious examples. He likewise removed the statue of Pompey from the Senate house in which Gaius Caesar had been killed and placed it under a marble arch, fronting the palace attached to Pompey's theater. He corrected many ill practices which, to the detriment of the public, had either survived the licentious habits of the late civil wars, or else originated in the long peace. Bands of robbers showed themselves openly, completely armed, under the color of self-defense, and, in different parts of the country, travelers, freedmen, and slaves without distinction were forcibly carried off and kept to work in the houses of correction. Several associations were formed under the specious name of a new college, which banded together under the perpetration of all kinds of villainy. The banditti he quelled by establishing posts of soldiers in suitable stations for the purpose. The houses of correction were subjected to strict superintendence. All associations, those only excepted which were of ancient standing and recognized by the laws, were dissolved. He burnt all the notes of those who had been a long time in arrear with the treasury, as being the principal source of vexatious suits and prosecutions. Places in the city claimed by the public, where the right was doubtful, he adjudged to the actual possessors. He struck out the list of criminals, the names of those over whom prosecutions had been long impending, where nothing further was intended by the informers than to gratify their own malice by seeing their enemies humiliated laying it down as a rule that if any one chose to renew a prosecution, he would incur the risk of the punishment which he sought to inflict, and that crimes might not escape punishment, nor business be neglected by delay, he ordered the courts to sit during the thirty days which were spent in celebrating honorary games. To the three classes of judges then existing, he added a fourth, consisting of persons of inferior order, who were called ducanarii, and decided all litigations about trifling sums. He chose judges from the age of thirty years and upwards, that is five years younger than had been usual before, and a great many declining the office. He was with much difficulty prevailed upon to allow each class of judges a twelve-month vacation in turn, and the courts to be shut during the months of November and December. End of Caesar Augustus Part 2《Caesar Augustus》Part 3 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillius. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. — Caesar Augustus, Part Three, Paragraphs 33 through 50. He was himself assiduous in his functions as a judge, and would sometimes prolong his sittings even into the night. If he were indisposed, his litter was placed before the tribunal, or he administered justice reclining on his couch at home, displaying always not only the greatest attention, but extreme lenity. To save a culprit, who evidently appeared guilty of parricide, from the extreme penalty of being sewn up in a sack, because none were punished in that manner, but such as confessed the fact, he is said to have interrogated him thus. Surely you did not kill your father, did you? And when, in a trial of a case about a forged will, 
all those who had signed it were liable to the penalty of the Cornelian law, he ordered that his colleagues on the tribunal should not only be furnished with the two tablets by which they were decided, guilty or not guilty, but a third likewise, ignoring the offense, of those who should appear to have given their signatures through any deception or mistake. All appeals and causes between inhabitants of Rome he assigned every year to the praetor of the city, and where provincials were concerned, to men of consular rank, to one of whom the business of each province was referred. Some laws he abrogated, and he made some new ones, such as the sumptuary law, that, relating to adultery and violation of chastity, the law against bribery in elections, and likewise that for the encouragement of marriage. Having been more severe in his reform of this law than the rest, he found the people utterly adverse to submit to it, unless the penalties were abolished or mitigated, besides allowing an interval of three years after a wife's death, and increasing the premiums on marriage. The equestrian order clamored loudly at a spectacle in the theater for its total repeal, whereupon he sent for the children of Germanicus, and showed them, partly sitting upon his own lap, and partly on their father's, imitating by his looks and gestures that they ought not to think it a grievance to follow the example of that young man. But finding that the force of law was eluded by marrying girls under the age of puberty, and by frequent changes of wives, he limited the time for consummation after espousals, and imposed restrictions on divorce. By two separate scrutinies, he reduced to their former number and splendor the Senate, which had been swamped by a disorderly crowd, for they were now more than a thousand, and some of them very mean persons, who, after Caesar's death, had been chosen by dint of interest and bribery, and so they had the nickname of Orcini among the people. The first of these scrutinies was left to themselves, each senator naming another, but the last was conducted by himself and Agrippa. On this occasion he is believed to have taken his seat, as he presided, with a coat of mail under his tunic and a sword by his side, and with ten of the stoutest men of senatorial rank who were his friends standing round his chair. Cordus Cremutius relates that no senator was suffered to approach him, except singly, and after having his bosom searched for secreted daggers. Some he obliged to have the grace of declining the office. These he allowed to retain the privileges of wearing the distinguishing dress, occupying the seats at the solemn spectacles, and of feasting publicly, reserved to the senatorial order. Yet those who were chosen and approved of might perform their functions under more solemn obligations, and with less inconvenience, he ordered that every senator, before he took his seat in the house, should pay his devotions with an offering of frankincense and wine at the altar of that god in whose temple the senate then assembled, and that their stated meetings should only be twice in the month, namely on the calends and ides, and that in the months of September and October, a certain number only, chosen by lot, such as the law required to give validity to a decree, should be required to attend. For himself he resolved to choose every six months a new council, by whom he might consult previously upon such affairs as he judged proper, and any time to lay before the full senate. He also took the votes of the senators upon any subject of importance, not according to custom, nor in regular order, but as he pleased, that every one might hold himself ready to give his opinion, rather than a mere vote of assent. He also made several other alterations in the management of public affairs, among which were these following, that the acts of the Senate should not be punished, that the magistrates should not be sent into provinces immediately after the expiration of their office, that the proconsuls should have a certain sum assigned them out of the treasury for mules and tents, which used before to be contracted for by the government with private persons, that the management of the treasury should be transferred from the city quaestors to the praetors, or those who had already served in the latter office, and that the decemviri, who called together the court of the one hundred, which had been formally summoned by those who had filled the office of quaestor. To augment the number of persons employed in the administration of the state, he devised several new offices, such as surveyors of public buildings, of the roads, the aqueducts, and the bed of the Tiber, for the distribution of corn to the people, the prefecture of the city, a triumvirate for the election of the senators, 
and another for inspecting the several troops of the equestrian order, as often as it was necessary. He revived the office of censor, which had been long disused, and increased the number of praetors. He likewise required that whenever the consulship was conferred upon him, he should have two colleagues instead of one, but his proposal was rejected, all the senators declaring by acclamation that he abated his high majesty quite enough in not filling the office alone, and consenting to share it with another. He was unsparing in the reward of military merit, having granted to above thirty generals the honor of the greater triumph, besides which he took care to have triumphal decorations voted by the Senate for more than that number, that the sons of senators might become early acquainted with the administration of affairs, he permitted them, at the age when they took the garb of manhood, to assume also the distinction of the senatorian robe, with its broad border, and to be present at the debates in the Senate House. When they entered the military service, he not only gave them the rank of military tribunes in the legions, but likewise the command of the auxiliary horse, and that all might have the opportunity of acquiring military experience, he commonly joined two sons of senators in command of each troop of horse. He frequently reviewed the troops of the equestrian order, reviving the ancient custom of a cavalcade, which had been long laid aside. But he did not suffer any one to be obliged by an accuser to dismount while he passed in review, as had formerly been the practice. For such as were infirm with age, or any way deformed, he allowed them to send their horses before them, coming on foot to answer to their names, when the muster roll was called over soon afterwards. He permitted those who had attained the age of thirty-five years, and desired not to keep their horse any longer, to have the privilege of giving it up. With the assistance of ten senators, he obliged each of the Roman knights to give an account of his life. In regard to those who fell under his displeasure, some were punished, others had a mark of infamy set against their names. The most part he only reprimanded, but not in the same terms. The mildest mode of reproof was by delivering them tablets, the contents of which, confined to themselves, they were to read on the spot. Some he disgraced for borrowing money at low interest, and letting it out again upon usurious profit. In the election of tribunes of the people, if there were not a sufficient number of senatorian candidates, he nominated others from the equestrian order, granting them the liberty, after the expiration of their office, to continue in whichsoever of the two orders they pleased. As most of the knights had been much reduced in their estates by the civil wars, and therefore durst not sit to see the public games in the theater, in the seats allotted to their order, for fear of the penalty provided by the law in that case, he enacted that none were liable to it, who had themselves or their parents had ever possessed a knight's estate. He took the census of the Roman people, street by street, and that the people might not be too taken from their business to receive the distribution of corn, it was his intention to deliver tickets three times a year for four months respectively, but at their request he continued the former regulation that they should receive their share monthly. He revived the former law of elections, endeavoring by various penalties to suppress the practice of bribery. Upon the day of election he distributed to the freedmen of the Fabian and Scaptian tribes, in which he was himself enrolled, a thousand sesterces each, that they might look for nothing from any of the candidates. Considering it of extreme importance to preserve the Roman people pure and untainted with a mixture of foreign or servile blood, he not only bestowed the freedom of the city with a sparing hand, but laid some restriction upon the practice of manumitting slaves. When Tiberius interceded with him for the freedom of Rome, in behalf of a Greek client of his, he wrote to him for answer, I shall not grant it, unless he comes himself, and satisfies me that he has just grounds for the application. And when Livia begged the freedom of the city for a tributary Gaul, he refused it, but offered to release him from payment of taxes, saying, I shall sooner suffer some loss in my exchequer than that the citizenship of Rome be rendered too common. Not content with interposing many obstacles to either the partial or complete emancipation of slaves, by quibbles respecting the number, condition, and difference of those who were to be manumitted, he likewise enacted that none who had been put in chains or tortured should ever obtain the freedom of the city in any degree. He endeavored also to restore the old habit and dress of the Romans, and seeing once, in an assembly of the people, a crowd of gray cloaks, 
he exclaimed with indignation, See there, Romanos rerum dominos, egentumque togatum. Rome's conquered sons, lords of the widespread globe, stalk proudly in the toga's graceful robe. And he gave orders to the ediles not to permit, in future, any Roman to be present in the forum or circus unless they took off their short coats and wore the toga. He displayed his munificence to all the ranks of the people on various occasions. However, upon bringing the treasure belonging to the kings of Egypt into the city, in his Alexandrian triumph, he made money so plentiful that interest fell, and the price of land rose considerably. And afterwards, as often as large sums of money came into his possession, by means of confiscations, he would lend it free of interest, for a fixed term, to such as could give security for the double of what was borrowed. The estate necessary to qualify a senator, instead of 800,000 sesterces, the former standard, he ordered, for the future, to be 1,200,000, and those who had not so much, he made good the deficiency. He often made donations to the people, but generally of different sums, sometimes 400, sometimes 300, or 250 sesterces, upon which occasions he extended his bounty even to young boys, who before were not used to receive anything, until they arrived at eleven years of age. In a scarcity of corn, he would frequently let them have it at a very low price, or none at all, and doubled the number of the money tickets. But to show that he was a prince who regarded more the good of his people than their applause, he reprimanded them very severely upon their complaining of the scarcity and dearness of wine. My son-in-law, Agrippa, he said, has sufficiently provided for quenching your thirst by the great plenty of water with which he has supplied the town. Upon their demanding a gift which he had promised them, he said, I am a man of my word. But upon their importuning him for one which he had not promised, he issued a proclamation upbraiding them for their scandalous impudence, at the same time telling them, I shall now give you nothing, whatever I may have intended to do. With the same strict firmness, when, upon a promise he had made of a donative, he found many slaves had been emancipated and enrolled among the citizens, he declared that no one should receive anything who was not included in the promise, and he gave the rest less than he had promised them, in order that the amount he had set apart might hold out. On one occasion, in a season of great scarcity, which it was difficult to remedy, he ordered out of the city the troops of slaves brought for sale, the gladiators belonging to the masters of defense, and all foreigners excepting physicians and the teachers of the liberal sciences. Part of the domestic slaves were likewise ordered to be dismissed. When, at last, plenty was restored, he writes thus, I was much inclined to abolish forever the practice of allowing the people corn at the public expense, because they trust so much to it, that they are too lazy to till their lands. But I did not persevere in my design, as I felt that the practice would some time or other be revived by one ambitious of popular favor. However, he so managed the affair ever afterwards that so much account was taken of husbandmen and traders as of the idle populace. In the number, variety, and magnificence of his public spectacles, he surpassed all former examples. Four and twenty times, he says, he treated the people with games upon his own account and three and twenty times for such magistrates who were either absent or not able to afford the expense. The performances took place sometimes in the different streets of the city, and upon several stages, by players in all languages. The same he did not only in the forum and amphitheater, but in the circus likewise, and in the septa, and sometimes he exhibited only the hunting of wild beasts. He entertained the people with wrestlers in the campus martius, where wooden seats were erected for the purpose, and also with a naval fight, for which he excavated the ground near the Tiber, where there is now a grove of the Caesars. During these two entertainments he stationed guards in the city, lest, by robbers taking advantage of the small number of people left at home, it might be exposed to depredations. In the circus he exhibited chariot and foot races, and combats with wild beasts, in which the performers were often youths of the highest ranks. His favorite spectacle was the Trojan game, 
acted by a select number of boys, in parties differing in age and station, thinking that it was a practice both excellent in itself and sanctioned by ancient usage, that the spirit of the young nobles should be displayed in such exercises. Gaius Nonius Asparanus, who was lamed by a fall in this diversion, he presented with a golden collar, and allowed him and his posterity to bear the name of Torquati. But soon afterwards he gave up the exposition of this game, in consequence of a severe and bitter speech made in the Senate by Osinius Polio, the orator, in which he complained bitterly of the misfortune of Isorinius, his grandson, who likewise broke his leg in the same diversion. Sometimes he engaged Roman knights to act upon the stage, or to fight as gladiators, but only before the practice was prohibited by a decree of the Senate. Thenceforth, the only exhibition he made of that kind was that of a young man named Lucius, of a good family, who was not quite two feet in height, and weighed only seventeen pounds, but had a stentorian voice. In one of his public spectacles, he brought the hostages of the Parthians, the first ever sent to Rome from that nation, through the middle of the amphitheater, and placed them in the second tier of seats above him. He used likewise, at times, when there were no public entertainments, if anything was brought to Rome which was uncommon and might gratify curiosity, to expose it to public view in any place whatever, as he did a rhinoceros in the septa, a tiger upon a stage, and a snake fifty cubits long in the comitium. It happened that in the Circensian games, which he performed in consequence of a vow that he had taken ill and obliged to attend the thensai reclining in a litter. Another time, in the game celebrated for the opening of the theatre of Marcellus, the joints of his curile chair happened to give way. He fell on his back. And in the games exhibited by his grandsons, when the people were in such consternation, by an alarm raised that the theatre was falling, that all his efforts to reassure them and keep them quiet failed, he moved from his place and seated himself in that part of the theatre which was thought to be exposed to the most danger. He corrected the confusion and disorder with which the spectators took their seats at the public games, after an affront which was offered to an ascendator at Puteoli, for whom, in a crowded theatre, no one would make room. He therefore procured a decree of the Senate that, in all public spectacles of any sort and in any place whatever, the first tier of benches should be left empty for the accommodation of senators. He would not even permit the ambassadors of free nations, nor those which were allies of Rome to sit in the orchestra, having found that some manumitted slaves had been sent under that character. He separated the soldiery from the rest of the people, and assigned to married plebeians their particular rows of seats. To the boys he assigned their own benches, and to their tutors the seats which were nearest it, ordering that none clothed in black should sit in the center of the circle. Nor would he allow any women to witness the combats of gladiators, except from the upper part of the theater, although they formerly used to take their places promiscuously with the rest of the spectators. To the Vestal Virgins he granted seats in the theater, reserved for them only, opposite the Praetor's bench. He excluded, however, the whole female sex from seeing the wrestlers, so that in the games which he exhibited upon his accession to the office of high priest, he deferred producing a pair of combatants which the people called for, until the next morning, and intimated by proclamation his pleasure that no woman should appear in the theater before five o'clock. He generally viewed the Circensian games himself from the upper rooms of the houses of his friends or freedmen, sometimes from the place appointed for the statues of the gods, sitting in the company with his wife and children. He occasionally absented himself from the spectacles for several hours, and occasionally for whole days, but not without first making an apology, and appointing substitutes to preside in his stead. When present, he never attended to anything else, either to avoid the reflections which he used to say were commonly made upon his father Caesar, for perusing letters and memorials, and making rescripts during the spectacles, or from the real pleasure he took in attending those exhibitions, of which he made no secret, he often candidly owning it. This he manifested frequently by presenting honorary crowns and handsome rewards to the best performers. In the games exhibited by others, and he was never present in any performances of the Greeks without rewarding the most deserving according to their merit. 
he took particular pleasure in witnessing pugilistic contests, especially those of the Latins, not only between combatants who had been trained scientifically, whom he often used to match with the Greek champions, but even between mobs of the lower classes fighting in streets and tilting at random, without any knowledge of the art. In short, he honored with his patronage all sorts of persons who contributed in any way to the success of the public entertainments. He not only maintained but enlarged the privileges of the wrestlers. He prohibited combats of the gladiators where no quarter was given. He deprived the magistrates of the power of correcting the stage players, which by an ancient law was allowed them at, at all times and in all places, restricting their jurisdiction entirely to the time of performance and misdemeanors in the theaters. He would, however, admit of no abatement, and exacted with the utmost rigor the greatest exertions of the wrestlers and gladiators in their several encounters. He went so far in restraining the licentiousness of stage players, that upon discovering that Stefanio, a performer of the highest class, had married a woman with her hair cropped and dressed in boys' clothes to await upon him at table, he ordered him to be whipped through all three theaters, and then banished him. Hylas, an actor of pantomimes, upon a complaint against him by the praetor, he commanded to be scourged in the court of his own house, which, however, was open to the public. And Pylades he not only banished from the city, but from Italy also, for pointing with his finger at a spectator, by whom he was hissed, and turning the eyes of the audience upon him. Having thus regulated the city and its concerns, he augmented the population of Italy by planting in it no less than 28 colonies, and greatly improving it by public works and a beneficial application of the revenues. In rights and privileges, he rendered it in a measure equal to the city itself, by inventing a new kind of suffrage, which the principal officers and magistrates of the colonies might take at home and forward under seal to the city against the time of the elections. To increase the number of persons of condition, and of children among the lower ranks, he granted the petitions of all those who requested the honor of doing military service on horseback as knights, provided their demands were seconded by the recommendation of the town in which they lived. And when he visited the several districts of Italy, he distributed a thousand sesterces a head to such of the lower class as presented him with sons or daughters. The most important provinces, which could not with ease or safety be entrusted to the government of annual magistrates, he reserved for his own administration. The rest he distributed by lot amongst the proconsuls, but sometimes he made exchanges, and frequently visited most of both kinds in person. Some cities in alliance with Rome, but which their great licentiousness were hastening to ruin, he deprived of their independence. Others which were much in debt he relieved and rebuilt such as had been destroyed by earthquakes. To those who could produce any instance of their having deserved well of the Roman people, he presented the freedom of Latium, or even that of the city. There is not, I believe, a province, except Africa and Sardinia, which he did not visit. After forcing Sextus Pompeius to take refuge in those provinces, he was indeed preparing to cross over from Sicily to them, but was prevented by continual and violent storms, and afterwards there was no occasion or call for such a voyage. Kingdoms, of which he had made himself master by the right of conquest, a few only excepted, he either restored to their former possessors, or conferred upon aliens. Between kings of alliance with Rome, he encouraged most intimate union, being always ready to promote or favor any proposal of marriage or friendship amongst them, and indeed treated them all with the same consideration, as if they were members and parts of the empire. To such as them as were minors or lunatics, he presented guardians, until they arrived at age, or recovered their senses, and the sons of many of them he brought up and educated with his own. With respect to the army, he distributed the legions and auxiliary troops throughout the several provinces. He stationed a fleet at Mycenae and another at Ravenna, for the protection of the upper and lower seas. A certain number of the forces were selected to occupy the posts in the city, and partly for his own bodyguard, but he dismissed the Spanish guard, which he retained about him until the fall of Antony, and also the Germans, whom he had amongst his guards until the defeat of Varus. Yet he never permitted a greater force than three cohorts in the city, and had no praetorian camps. The rest he quartered 
in the neighborhood of the nearest towns, in winter and summer camps. All the troops throughout the empire he reduced to one fixed model with regard to their pay and their pensions, determining these according to their rank in the army, the time they had served, and their private means, so that after their discharge they might not be tempted by age or necessities to join the agitators for a revolution. For the purpose of providing a fund, always ready to meet their pay and pensions, he instituted a military exchequer, and appropriated two taxes to that object. In order to obtain the earliest intelligence of what was passing in the provinces, he established posts, consisting at first of young men stationed at moderate distances along the military roads, and afterwards of regular couriers with fast vehicles, which appeared to him the most commodious, because the persons who were the bearers of dispatches written on the spot might then be questioned about the business as occasion occurred. In sealing letters patent, rescripts, or epistles, he had first used the figure of a sphinx, afterwards the head of Alexander the Great, and at last his own, engraved by the hand of Discorides, which practice was retained by the succeeding emperors. He was extremely precise in dating his letters, putting down exactly the time of day or night at which they were dispatched. End of Caesar Augustus, Part 3《Augustus》Part 4 of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Caesar Augustus, Part Four. Of his clemency and moderation, there are abundant and signal instances. For, not to enumerate how many and what persons of the adverse party he pardoned, received into favor, and suffered to rise to the highest eminence in the state, he thought it sufficient to punish Junius Novatus and Cassius Patavinus, who were both plebeians, one of them with a fine, and the other with an easy banishment. Although the former had published, in the name of young Agrippa, a very scurrilous letter against him, and the other declared openly, at an entertainment where there was a great deal of company, that he neither wanted inclination nor courage to stab him. In the trial of Emilius Ilianus of Cordova, when, among other charges exhibited against him, it was particularly insisted upon that he used to calumniate Caesar, he turned round to the accuser and said, with an air and tone of passion, I wish you could make that appear. I shall let Ilianus know that I have a tongue too, and shall speak sharper of him than he ever did of me. Nor did he, either then or afterwards, make any farther inquiry into the affair. And when Tiberius, in a letter, complained of the affront with great earnestness, he returned him an answer in the following terms. Do not, my dear Tiberius, give way to the ardor of youth in this affair, nor be so indignant that any person should speak ill of me. It is enough for us if we can prevent any one from really doing us mischief. Although he knew that it had been customary to decree temples in honor of the proconsuls, yet he would not permit them to be erected in any of the provinces, unless in the joint names of himself and Rome. Within the limits of the city, he positively refused any honor of that kind. He melted down all the silver statues which had been erected to him, and converted the whole into tripods, which he consecrated to the Palatine Apollo. And when the people importuned him to accept the dictatorship, he bent down on one knee, with his toga thrown over his shoulders, and his breast exposed to view, begging to be excused. He always abhorred the title of lord, as ill-omened and offensive. And when, in a play, performed at the theatre, at which he was present, these words were introduced, O just and gracious lord, and the whole company, 
with joyful acclamations, testified their approbation of them as applied to him. He instantly put a stop to their indecent flattery by waving his hand and frowning sternly, and next day publicly declared his displeasure in a proclamation. He never afterwards would suffer himself to be addressed in that manner, even by his own children or grandchildren, either in jest or earnest, and forbade them the use of all such complimentary expressions to one another. He rarely entered any city or town, or departed from it, except in the evening or the night, to avoid giving any person the trouble of complimenting him. During his consulships he commonly walked the streets on foot, but at other times rode in a close carriage. He admitted to court even plebeians, in common with people of the higher ranks. Receiving the petitions of those who approached him, with so much affability, that he once jocosely rebuked a man by telling him, You present your memorial with as much hesitation as if you were offering money to an elephant. On Senate days he used to pay his respects to the conscript fathers only in the house, addressing them each by name as they sat, without any prompter. And, on his departure, he bade each of them farewell while they retained their seats. In the same manner, he maintained with many of them a constant intercourse of mutual civilities, giving them his company upon occasions of any particular festivity in their families. Until he became advanced in years and was incommoded by the crowd at a wedding. Being informed that Gallus Tyrrhenius, a senator, with whom he had only a slight acquaintance, had suddenly lost his sight, and under that privation had resolved to starve himself to death, he paid him a visit, and by his consolatory admonitions diverted him from his purpose. On his speaking in the Senate, he has been told by one of the members, I did not understand you, and by another, I would contradict you could I do it with safety. And sometimes, upon his being so much offended at the heat with which the debates were conducted in the Senate, as to quit the House in anger, some of the members have repeatedly exclaimed, Surely the senators ought to have liberty of speech on matters of government. And Tistius Labio, in the election of a new Senate, when each, as he was named, chose another, nominated Marcus Lepidus, who had formerly been Augustus' enemy, and was then in banishment, and being asked by the latter, Is there no other person more deserving? He replied, Every man has his own opinion. Nor was any one ever molested for his freedom of speech, although it was carried to the extent of insolence. Even when some infamous libels against him were dispersed in the Senate House, he was neither disturbed, nor did he give himself much trouble to refute them. He would not so much as order an inquiry to be made after the authors, but only proposed that, for the future, those who published libels or lampoons in a borrowed name against any person should be called to account. Being provoked by some petulant jests which were designed to render him odious, he answered them by a proclamation, and yet he prevented the Senate from passing an act to restrain the liberties which were taken with others in people's wills. Whenever he attended at the election of magistrates, he went round the tribes with the candidates of his nomination, and begged the votes of the people in the usual manner. He likewise gave his own vote in his tribe as one of the people. He suffered himself to be summoned as a witness upon trials, and not only to be questioned, but to be cross-examined with the utmost patience. In building his forum, he restricted himself in the side, not presuming to compel the owners of the neighboring houses to give up their property. He never recommended his sons to the people without adding these words, if they deserve it. And upon the audience rising on their entering the theater while they were yet minors, and giving them applause in a standing position, he made it a matter of serious complaint. He was desirous that his friends should be great and powerful in the state, but have no exclusive privileges, or be exempt from the laws which governed others. When Asprenus Nonius, an intimate friend of his, was tried upon a charge of administering poison at the instance of Cassius Severus, he consulted the Senate for their opinion, 
what was his duty under the circumstances. For, said he, I am afraid, lest, if I should stand by him in the cause, I may be supposed to screen a guilty man, and if I do not, to desert and prejudge a friend. With the unanimous concurrence, therefore, of the Senate, he took his seat amongst his advocates for several hours, but without giving him the benefit of speaking to character as was usual. He likewise appeared for his clients, as on behalf of Scutarius, an old soldier of his, who brought an action for slander. He never relieved any one from prosecution but in a single instance, in the case of a man who had given information of the conspiracy of Murena, and that he did only by prevailing upon the accuser in open court to drop his prosecution. How much he was beloved for his worthy conduct in all these respects, it is easy to imagine. I say nothing of the decrees of the Senate in his honor, which may seem to have resulted from compulsion or deference. The Roman knights voluntarily and with one accord always celebrated his birth for two days together, and all ranks of the people, yearly, in performance of a vow they had made, threw a piece of money into the Kirshen Lake as an offering for his welfare. They, likewise, on the calends of January, presented for his acceptance New Year's gifts in the capital, though he was not present, with which the nations he purchased some costly images of the gods, which he erected in several streets of the city, as that of Apollo Sandalierius, Jupiter Targoidus, and others. When his house on the Palatine Hill was accidentally destroyed by fire, the veteran soldiers, the judges, the tribes, and even the people individually contributed, according to the ability of each, for rebuilding it. But he would accept only of some small portion out of the several sums collected, and refused to take from any one person more than a single denarius. Upon his return home from any of the provinces, they attended him not only with joyful acclamations, but with songs. It is also remarked that as often as he entered the city, the infliction of punishment was suspended for the time. The whole body of the people, upon a sudden impulse, and with unanimous consent, offered him the title of Father of his Country. It was announced to him first at Antium, by a deputation from the people, and, upon his declining the honor, they repeated their offer on his return to Rome, in a full theater, when they were crowned with laurel. The Senate soon afterwards adopted the proposal, not in the way of acclamation or decree, but by commissioning Messala, in an unanimous vote, to compliment him with it in the following terms. With hearty wishes for the happiness and prosperity of yourself and your family, Caesar Augustus, for we think we thus most effectually pray for the lasting welfare of the state. The Senate, in agreement with the Roman people, salute you by the title of Father of your country. To this compliment, Augustus replied, with tears in his eyes, in these words, for I give them exactly as I have done those of Messala. Having now arrived at the summit of my wishes, O conscript fathers, what else have I to beg of the immortal gods but the continuance of this, your affection for me, to the last moments of my life? To the physician Antonius Musa, who had cured him of a dangerous illness, they erected a statue near that of Esculapius, by a general subscription. Some heads of families order in their wills that their heirs should leave victims to the capital, with a tablet carried before them, and pay their vows, because Augustus still survived. Some Italian cities appointed the day upon which he first visited them to be thenceforth the beginning of their year. And most of the provinces, besides erecting temples and altars, instituted games to be celebrated to his honor, in most towns, every five years. The kings, his friends and allies, built cities in their respective kingdoms, to which they gave the name of Caesarea, and all, with one consent, resolved to finish, at their common expense, the temple of Jupiter Olympius at Athens, which had been begun long before, and consecrated to his genius. They frequently also left their kingdoms, led aside the badges of royalty, and, assuming the toga, attended and paid their respects to him daily, in the manner of clients to their patrons, not only at Rome, but when he was traveling through the provinces. 
having thus given an account of the manner in which he filled his public offices both civil and military and his conduct in the government of the empire both in peace and war i shall now describe his private and domestic life his habits at home and among his friends and dependents and the fortune attending him in those scenes of retirement from his youth to the day of his death he lost his mother in his first consulship and his sister octavia when he was in the fifty-fourth year of his age he behaved towards them both with the utmost kindness whilst living and after they deceased paid the highest honors to their memory he was contracted when very young to the daughter of publius servilius isauricus but upon his reconciliation with antony after their first rupture the armies on both sides insisting on a family alliance between them he married antony's stepdaughter claudia the daughter of fulvia by publius claudius although at that time she was scarcely marriageable and upon a difference arising with his mother-in-law fulvia he divorced her untouched and a pure virgin soon afterwards he took to wife scribonia who had before been twice married to men of consular rank and was a mother by one of them with her likewise he parted being quite tied out as he himself writes with the perverseness of her temper and immediately took livia drusilla though then pregnant from her husband tiberius nero and she had never any rival in his love and esteem by scribonia he had a daughter named julia but no children by livia although extremely desirous of issue she indeed conceived once but miscarried he gave his daughter julia in the first instance to marcellus his sister's son who had just completed his minority and after his death to marcus agrippa having prevailed with his sister to yield her son-in-law to his wishes for at that time agrippa was married to one of the marcellus and had children by her agrippa dying also he for a long time thought of several matches for julia and even the equestrian order and at last resolved upon selecting tiberius for his stepson and he obliged him to part with his wife at that time pregnant and who had already brought him a child mark antony writes that he first contracted julia to his son and afterwards to cotiso king of the gete demanding at the same time the king's daughter in marriage for himself he had three grandsons by agrippa and julia namely caius lucius and agrippa and two granddaughters julia and agrippina julia he married to lucius paulus the censor's son and agrippina to germanicus his sister's grandson caius and lucius he adopted at home by the ceremony of purchase from their father advanced them while yet very young to offices in the state and when they were consuls elect sent them to visit the provinces and armies in bringing up his daughter and granddaughters he accustomed them to domestic employments and even spinning and obliged them to speak and act everything openly before the family that it might be put down in the diary he so strictly prohibited them from all converse with strangers that he once wrote a letter to lucius vinicius a handsome young man of a good family in which he told him you have not behaved very modestly in making a visit to my daughter at baie he usually instructed his grandsons himself in reading swimming and other rudiments of knowledge and he labored nothing more than to perfect them in the imitation of his handwriting he never supped but he had them sitting at the foot of his couch nor even traveled but with them in a chariot before him or riding beside him but in the midst of all his joy and hopes in his numerous and well-regulated family his fortune failed him the two julius his daughter and granddaughter abandoned themselves to such courses of lewdness and debauchery that he banished them both caius and lucius he lost within the space of eighteen months the former dying in lycia and the latter at marseille his third grandson agrippa with his stepson tiberius he adopted in the forum by a law passed for the purpose by the sections but he soon afterwards discarded agrippa for his coarse and unruly temper and confined him at sorrentum he bore the death of his relations with more patience than he did their disgrace for he was not overwhelmed by the loss of caius and lucius but in the case of his daughter he stated the facts to the senate in a message read to them by the quaestor 
not having the heart to be present himself. Indeed, he was so much ashamed of her infamous conduct, that for some time he avoided all company, and had thoughts of putting her to death. It is certain that when one Phoebe, a freedwoman and confident of hers, hanged herself about the same time, he said, I had rather be the father of Phoebe than of Julia. In her banishment, he would not allow her the use of wine, nor any luxury in dress, nor would he suffer her to be waited upon by any male servant, either freeman or slave, without his permission, and having received an exact account of his age, stature, complexion, and what marks or scars he had about him. At the end of five years, he removed her from the island where she was confined, to the continent, and treated her with less severity, but could never be prevailed upon to recall her. When the Roman people interposed on her behalf several times, with much importunity, all the reply he gave was, I wish you had all such daughters and wives as she is. He likewise forbade a child, of which his granddaughter Julia was delivered, after sentence had passed against her, to be either owned as a relation or brought up. Agrippa, who was equally intractable, and whose folly increased every day, he transported to an island, and placed a guard of soldiers about him, procuring, at the same time, an act of the Senate for his confinement there during life. Upon any mention of him and the two Julius, he would say, with a heavy sigh, I thophilon agamos temenai agonos tapoletai. Would I were wifeless or had childless died. Nor did he usually call them by any other name than that of his three impostums or cancers. He was cautious in forming friendships, but clung to them with great constancy, not only rewarding the virtues and merits of his friends according to their deserts, but bearing likewise with their faults and vices, provided that they were of a venial kind. For amongst all his friends, we scarcely find any who fell into disgrace with him, except Salvidianus Rufus, whom he raised to the consulship, and Cornelius Gallus, whom he made prefect of Egypt, both of them men of the lowest extraction. One of these, being engaged in plotting a rebellion, he delivered over to the Senate for condemnation, and the other, on account of his ungrateful and malicious temper, he forbade his house and his living in any of the provinces. When, however, Gallus, being denounced by his accusers and sentenced by the Senate, was driven to the desperate extremity of laying violent hands upon himself, he commanded, indeed, the attachment to his person of those who manifested so much indignation, but he shed tears and lamented his unhappy condition. That I alone, said he, cannot be allowed to resent the misconduct of my friends in such a way only as I would wish. The rest of his friends of all orders flourished during their whole lives, both in power and wealth, in the highest ranks of their several orders, notwithstanding some occasional lapses. For, to say nothing of others, he sometimes complained that Agrippa was hasty, and was sent as a tattler, the forming having thrown up all his employments and retired to Mytilene, on suspicion of some slight coolness, and from jealousy that Marcellus received greater marks of favor, and the latter, having confidentially imparted to his wife Terentia the discovery of Morena's conspiracy. He likewise expected from his friends, at their deaths as well as during their lives, some proofs of their reciprocal attachment. For, though he was far from coveting their property, and indeed would never accept of any legacy left him by a stranger, yet he pondered in a melancholy mood over their last words, not being able to conceal his chagrin, if in their wills they made but a slight or no very honorable mention of him, nor his joy, on the other hand, if they expressed a grateful sense of his favors and a hearty affection for him. And whatever legacies or shares of their property were left him by such as were parents, he used to restore to their children, either immediately, or, if they were under age, upon the day of their assuming the manly dress, or of their marriage, with interest. As a patron and master, his behavior in general was mild and conciliating, but, when occasion required it, he could be severe. He advanced many of his freedmen to posts of honor and great importance, as Licinus and Saladus and others, and when his slave, Cosmus, had reflected bitterly upon him, he resented the injury no further than by putting him in fetters. 
when his steward, Diomedes, left him to the mercy of a wild boar, which suddenly attacked him while they were walking together, he considered it rather a cowardice than a breach of duty, and turned an occurrence of no small hazard into a jest, because there was no navery in his steward's conduct. He put to death Proculus, one of his most favorite freedmen, for maintaining a criminal commerce with other men's wives. He broke the legs of his secretary, Thallus, for taking a bribe of five hundred denarii to discover the contents of one of his letters. And the tutor and other attendants of his son, Caius, having taken advantage of his sickness and death to give loose to their insolence and rapacity in the province he governed, he caused heavy weights to be tied about their necks and had them thrown into a river. In his early youth, various aspersions of an infamous character were heaped upon him. Sextus Pompey reproached him with being an effeminate fellow, and Marcus Antony with earning his adoption from his uncle by prostitution. Lucius Antony, likewise Mark's brother, charges him with pollution by Caesar, and that, for a gratification of three hundred thousand sesterces, he had submitted to Aulus Hirtius in the same way in Spain adding that he used to singe his legs with burnt nutshells to make the hair become softer. Nay, the whole concourse of the people, at some public diversions in the theatre, when the following sentence was recited, alluding to the Gallic priest of the Mother of the Gods, beating a drum, With desne ut quinaidus orben digito temperet, see with his orb the wanton's finger play, applied the passage to him with great applause. That he was guilty of various acts of adultery is not denied even by his friends, but they allege, in excuse for it, that he engaged in those intrigues not from lewdness, but from policy, in order to discover more easily the designs of his enemies, through their wives. Mark Antony, besides the precipitate marriage of Livia, charges him with taking the wife of a man of consular rank from table, in the presence of her husband, into a bedchamber, and bringing her again to the entertainment with her ears very red, and her hair in great disorder. That he had divorced Scribonia for resenting too freely the excessive influence which one of his mistresses had gained over him. That his friends were employed to pimp for him, and accordingly obliged both matrons and ripe virgins to strip for a complete examination of their persons, in the same manner as if Theranius, the dealer in slaves, had them under sale. And before they came to an open rupture, he writes to him in a familiar manner thus. Why are you changed towards me? Because I lie with a queen? She is my wife. Is this a new thing with me, or have I not done so for these nine years? And do you take freedoms with Drusilla only? May health and happiness so attend you, as when you read this letter you are not in dalliance with Tertulla, Tarantilla, Rufilla, or Salvia Titichenia, or all of them. What matters it to you, where or upon whom, you spend your manly vigor? End of Caesar Augustus, Part 4《Part 5 of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forster. Augustus Caesar, Part 5, Paragraph 70 to 89. A private entertainment which he gave, commonly called the Supper of the Twelve Gods, and at which the guests were dressed in the habit of gods and goddesses while he personated Apollo himself, afforded subject of much conversation, and was imputed to him not only by Antony in his letters, who likewise names all the parties concerned, but in the following well-known anonymous verses. Cum primum istorum conduxit mensa coragum, sexque deos vidit malia, sexque deas, impia dum foibi caesar mendacia ludit, dum nova divorum coinat adulteria, Omnia se a terris tunc numina declinarunt, fugit et auratus Jupiter ipse tronos. When Malia late beheld in mingled train twelve mortals, eight, twelve deities, in vain, 
Caesar assumed what was Apollo's due, and wine and lust inflamed the motley crew. At the foul sight the gods avert their eyes, and from his throne great Jove indignant flies. What rendered this supper more obnoxious to public censure was that it happened at a time when there was a great scarcity, and almost a famine, in the city. The day after there was a cry current among the people, that the gods had eaten up all the corn, and that Caesar was indeed Apollo, but Apollo the Tormentor, under which title that god was worshipped in some quarter of the city. He was likewise charged with being excessively fond of fine furniture and Corinthian vessels, as well as with being addicted to gaming. For, during the time of the proscription, the following line was written upon his statue. Pater Argentarius ego Corinthiarius. My father was a silversmith, my dealings are in brass. Because it was believed that he had put some persons upon the list of the proscribed, only to obtain the Corinthian vessels in their possession. And afterwards, in the Sicilian War, the following epigram was published. Postquam bis classe victus now is perdidit, aliquando ut vincat, ludit assidue aliam. Twice having lost a fleet in luckless fight, to win at last he gains both day and night. With respect to the charge or imputation of loathsome impurity before mentioned, he very easily refuted it by the chastity of his life, at the very time when it was made, as well as ever afterwards. His conduct, likewise, gave the lie to that of luxurious extravagance in his furniture, when, upon the taking of Alexandria, he reserved for himself nothing of the royal treasures but a porcelain cup, and soon afterwards melted down all the vessels of gold, even such as were intended for common use. But his amorous propensities never left him, and, as he grew older, as is reported, he was in the habit of debauching young girls, who were procured for him from all quarters, even by his own wife. To the observations on his gaming, he paid not the smallest regard, but played in public, but purely for his diversion, even when he was advanced in years, and not only in the month of December, but at other times, and upon all days, whether festivals or not. This evidently appears from a letter under his own hand, in which he says, I supped, my dear Tiberius, with the same company, we had, besides, Venetius and Silvius, the father. We gained at supper like old fellows, both yesterday and today. And, as any one threw upon the tally aces or sixes, he put down for every talus a denarius, all which was gained by him who threw a Venus. In another letter he says, We had, my dear Tiberius, a pleasant time of it during the festival of Minerva, for we played every day, and kept the gaming board warm. Your brother uttered many exclamations at a desperate run of ill fortune, but recovering by degrees and unexpectedly, he in the end lost not much. I lost twenty thousand sesterces for my part, but then I was profusely generous in my play, as I commonly am, for had I insisted upon the stakes which I declined, or kept what I gave away, I should have won about fifty thousand. But this I like better, for it will raise my character for generosity to the skies. In a letter to his daughter, he writes thus, I have sent you two hundred and fifty denarii, which I gave to every one of my guests, in case they were inclined at supper to divert themselves with the tally, or at the game of even or odd. In other matters, it appears that he was moderate in his habits, and free from suspicion of any kind of vice. He lived at first near the Roman Forum, above the ringmaker's stairs, in a house which had once been occupied by Calvus, the orator. He afterwards moved to the Palatine Hill, where he resided in a small house belonging to Hortensius, no way remarkable, either for size or ornament. The piazzas being but small, the pillars of Alban stone, and the rooms without anything of marble or fine paving. He continued to use the same bedchamber, both winter and summer, during forty years. For, though he was sensible that the city did not agree with his health in the winter, he nevertheless resided constantly in it during that season. If at any time he wished to be perfectly retired and secure from interruption, 
he shut himself up in an apartment at the top of his house, which he called his Syracuse or Technophuon. Or he went to some villa belonging to his freedmen near the city. But when he was indisposed, he commonly took up his residence in the house of Messinus. Of all the places of retirement from the city, he chiefly frequented those upon the sea coast and the islands of Campania, or the towns nearest the city, such as Lanuvium, Prenesti, and Tibur, where he often used to sit for the administration of justice in the porticos of the Temple of Hercules. He had a particular aversion to large and sumptuous palaces and some which had been raised at a vast expense by his granddaughter, Julia, he leveled to the ground. Those of his own, which were far from being spacious, he adorned, not so much with statues and pictures, as with walks and groves, and things which were curious either for their antiquity or rarity, such as, at Capri, the huge limbs of sea monsters and wild beasts, which some affect to call the bones of giants, and also the arms of ancient heroes. His frugality in the furniture of his house appears even at this day from some beds and tables still remaining, most of which are scarcely elegant enough for a private family. It is reported that he never lay upon a bed, but such as was low and meanly furnished. He seldom wore any garment, but what was made by the hands of his wife, sister, daughter, and granddaughters. His togas were neither scanty nor full and the clavis was neither remarkably broad or narrow. His shoes were a little higher than common, to make him appear taller than he was. He had always clothes and shoes, fit to appear in public, ready in his bedchamber for any sudden occasion. At his table, which was always plentiful and elegant, he constantly entertained company, but was very scrupulous in the choice of them, both as to rank and character. Valerius Messala informs us, that he never admitted any freedman to his table, except Minas, when rewarded with the privilege of citizenship, for betraying Pompey's fleet. He writes himself that he invited to his table a person in whose villa he lodged, and who had formerly been employed by him as a spy. He often came late to table, and withdrew early, so that the company began supper before his arrival, and continued at table after his departure. His entertainments consisted of three entries, or at most of only six. But if his fare was moderate, his courtesy was extreme. For those who were silent or talked in whispers, he encouraged to join in the general conversation, and introduced buffoons and stage players, or even low performers from the circus, and very often itinerant humorists, to enliven the company. Festivals and holidays he usually celebrated very expensively, but sometimes only with merriment. In the Saturnalia, or at any other time when the fancy took him, he distributed to his company clothes, gold, and silver, sometimes coins of all sorts, even of the ancient kings of Rome and of foreign nations. Sometimes nothing but towels, sponges, rakes, and tweezers, and other things of that kind, with thickets on them, which were enigmatical and had a double meaning. He used likewise to sell by lot among his guests articles of very unequal value, and pictures with their fronts reversed. And so, by the unknown quality of the lot, disappoint or gratify the expectation of the purchasers. The sort of traffic went round the whole company, every one being obliged to buy something, and to run the chance of loss or gain with the rest. He ate sparingly, for I must not omit even this, and commonly used a plain diet, he was particularly fond of coarse bread, small fishes, new cheese made of cow's milk, and green figs of the sort which bear fruit twice a year. He did not wait for supper, but took food at any time and in any place when he had an appetite. The following passages relative to this subject I have transcribed from his letters. I ate a little bread and some small dates in my carriage. Again. In returning home from the palace in my litter, I ate an ounce of bread and a few raisins. Again, no Jew, my dear Tiberius, ever keeps such strict fast upon the Sabbath as I have today, for while in the bath and after the first hour of the night, I only ate two biscuits before I began to be rubbed with oil. From this great indifference about his diet, he sometimes supped by himself, before his company began, or after they had finished, 
and would not touch a morsel at table with his guests. He was by nature extremely sparing in the use of wine. Cornelius Nepos says that he used to drink only three times at supper in the camp at Modena, and when he indulged himself the most, he never exceeded a pint, or if he did, his stomach rejected it. Of all wines he gave the preference to the Retian, but scarcely ever drank any in the daytime. Instead of drinking, he used to take a piece of bread dipped in cold water, or a slice of cucumber, or some leaves of lettuce, or a green, sharp, juicy apple. After a slight repast at noon, he used to seek repose, dressed as he was, and with his shoes on, his feet covered, and his hand held before his eyes. After supper, he commonly withdrew to his study, a small closet, where he sat late, until he had put down in his diary all or most of the remaining transactions of the day, which he had not before registered. He would then go to bed, but never slept above seven hours at most, and that not without interruption, for he would wake three or four times during that time. If he could not again fall asleep, as sometimes happened, he called for someone to read or tell stories to him, until he became drowsy, and then his sleep was usually protracted till after daybreak. He never liked to lie awake in the dark, without somebody to sit by him. Very early rising was apt to disagree with him. On which account, if he was obliged to rise, betimes, for any civil or religious functions, in order to guard as much as possible against the inconvenience resulting from it, he used to lodge in some apartment near the spot, belonging to any of his attendants. If at any time a fit of drowsiness seized him in passing along the streets, his litter was set down while he snatched a few moments' sleep. In person he was handsome and graceful, through every period of his life. But he was negligent in his dress, and so careless about dressing his hair, that he usually had it done in great haste by several barbers at a time. His beard he sometimes clipped, and sometimes shaved, and either read or rose during the operation. His countenance, either when discoursing or silent, was so calm and serene that a goal of the first rank declared amongst his friends that he was so softened by it as to be restrained from throwing him down a precipice in his passage over the Alps, when he had been admitted to approach him under pretense of conferring with him. His eyes were bright and piercing, and he was willing it should be thought that there was something of a divine vigor in them. He was likewise not a little pleased to see people, upon his looking steadfastly at them, lower their countenances, as if the sun shone in their eyes. But in his old age he saw very imperfectly with his left eye. His teeth were thin-set, small and scaly, his hair a little curled, and inclining to a yellow collar. His eyebrows met, his ears were small, and he had an aquiline nose. His complexion was betwixt brown and fair. His stature was low, though Julius Morethus, his freedman, says he was five feet and nine inches in height. This, however, was so much concealed by the just proportion of his limbs, that it was only perceivable upon comparison with some taller person standing by him. He is said to have been born with many spots upon his breast and belly, answering to the figure, order, and number of the stars in the constellation of the bear. He had besides several callosities resembling scars, occasioned by an itching in his body, and the constant and violent use of the strigil in being rubbed. He had a weakness in his left hip, thigh, and leg, insomuch that he often halted on that side, but he received much benefit from the use of sand and reeds. He likewise sometimes found the forefinger of his right hand so weak, that when it was benumbed and contracted with cold, to use it in writing, he was obliged to have recourse to a circular piece of horn. He had occasionally a complaint in the bladder, but upon voiding some stones into his urine, he was relieved from that pain. During the whole course of his life, he suffered, at times, dangerous fits of sickness, especially after the conquest of Cantabria, when his liver being injured by a defluxion upon it, he was reduced to such a condition that he was obliged to undergo a desperate and doubtful method of cure. For warm applications having no effect, Antonius Musa directed the use of those which were cold. He was likewise subject to fits of sickness at stated times every year, for about his birthday he was commonly a little indisposed, 
in the beginning of the spring he was attacked with an inflammation on the midriff and when the wind was southerly with a cold in his head by all these complaints his constitution was so shattered that he could not easily bear either heat or cold in winter he was protected against the inclemency of the weather by a thick toga four tunics a shirt a flannel stomacher and swathings upon his legs and tides in summer he lay with the doors of his bedchamber open and frequently in a piazza refreshed by a bubbling fountain and a person standing by to fan him he could not bear even the winter sun and at home never walked in the open air without a broad-brimmed hat on his head he usually travelled in a litter and by night and so slow that he was two days in going to Pernassi or Tibur. And if he could go to any place by sea, he preferred that mode of travelling. He carefully nourished his health against his many infirmities, avoiding chiefly the free use of the bath. But he was often rubbed with oil and sweated in a stove, after which he was washed with tepid water, warmed either by a fire or by being exposed to the heat of the sun. When, upon account of his nerves, he was obliged to have recourse to sea-water, or the waters of Albula, he was contented with sitting over a wooden tub, which he called by a Spanish name, Dureta, and plunging his hands and feet in the water by turns. As soon as the civil wars were ended, he gave up riding and other military exercises in the campus marshes, and took to playing at ball or football, but soon afterwards used no other exercise than that of going abroad in his litter, or walking. Towards the end of his walk, he would run leaping, wrapped up in a short cloak or cape. For amusement, he would sometimes angle or play with dice, pebbles, or nuts, with little boys, collected from various countries, and particularly Moors and Syrians, for their beauty or amusing talk. But dwarfs, and such as were in any way deformed, he held in abhorrence, as lusus naturae, nature's abortions, and of evil omen. From early youth, he devoted himself with great diligence and application to the study of eloquence and the other liberal arts. In the war of Modena, notwithstanding the weighty affairs in which he was engaged, he is said to have read, written, and declaimed every day. He never addressed the senate, the people, or the army, but in a premeditated speech, though he did not want the talent of speaking extemper on the spur of the occasion. And lest his memory should fail him, as well as to prevent the loss of time in getting up his speeches, it was his general practice to recite them. In his intercourse with individuals, and even with his wife, Livia, upon subjects of importance, he wrote on his tablets all he wished to express, lest, if he spoke extempore, he should say more or less than was proper. He delivered himself in a sweet and peculiar tone, in which he was diligently instructed by a master of elocution but when he had a code, he sometimes employed a herald to deliver his speeches to the people. He composed many tracts in prose on various subjects, some of which he read occasionally in the circle of his friends, as to an auditory. Among these was his Rescript to Britus Respecting Cato. Most of the pages he read himself, although he was advanced in years, but, becoming fatigued, he gave the rest to Tiberius to finish. He likewise read over to his friends his exhortations to philosophy and the history of his own life, which he continued in thirteen books, as far as the Cantabrian War, but no farther. He likewise made some attempts at poetry. There is extant one book, written by him in examiner verse, of which both the subject and title is Sicily. There is also a book of epigrams, no larger than the last, which he composed almost entirely while he was in the bath. These are all his poetical compositions, for, though he begun a tragedy with great zest, becoming dissatisfied with the style, he obliterated the whole. And his friend saying to him, What is your Ajax doing? he answered, My Ajax has met with a sponge. He cultivated a style which was neat and chaste, avoiding frivolous or harsh language, as well as obsolete words, which he calls disgusting. His chief object was to deliver his thoughts with all possible perspicuity. To attain this end, and that he might nowhere perplex or retard the reader or hearer, he made no scruple to add prepositions to his verbs, 
or to repeat the same conjunction several times, which, when omitted, occasion some little obscurity, but give a grace to the style. Those who used affected language or adopted obsolete words he despised, as equally faulty, though in different ways. He sometimes indulged himself in jesting, particularly with his friend Messinus, whom he rallied upon all occasions for his fine phrases, and ventured by imitating his way of talking. Nor did his spare Tiberius, who was fond of obsolete and far-fetched expressions. He charges Mark Antony with insanity, writing rather to make men stare than to be understood, and by way of sarcasm, upon his depraved and fickle taste in the choice of words, he writes to him thus, And are you yet in doubt whether Cimber Aeneas or Verenius Flaccus be more proper for your imitation? Whether you will adopt words which Celestius Crispus has borrowed from the Origenes of Cato? Or do you think that the verbose empty bombast of Asiatic orators is fit to be transfused into our language? And, in a letter where he commends the talent of his granddaughter Agrippina, he says, But you must be particularly careful, both in writing and speaking, to avoid affectation. In ordinary conversation, he made use of several peculiar expressions, as appears from his letters in his own handwriting, in which, now and then, when he means to intimate that some persons would never pay their debts, he says, they will pay at the Greek calends. And when he advised patience in the present posture of affairs, he would say, let us be content with our cato. To describe anything in haste, he said, it was sooner done than asparagus cooked. He constantly puts bacellus for stultus, puleiacius for pulus, vaquerosus for queritus, wapide se habere for male, and betizare for languere, which is commonly called lacanitare. Likewise, simus for sumus, domos for domus in the genitive singular. With respect to the last two peculiarities, lest any person should imagine that they were only slips of his pen, and not customary with him, he never varies. I have likewise remarked this singularity in his handwriting. He never divides his words, so as to carry the letters which cannot be inserted at the end of a line to the next, but puts them below the other, enclosed by a bracket. He did not adhere strictly to orthography as laid down by the grammarians but seems to have been of the opinion of those who think that we ought to write as we speak. For, as to his changing and omitting not only letters but whole syllables, it is a vulgar mistake. Nor should I have taken notice of it, but that it appears strange to me that any person should have told us that he sent a successor to a consular lieutenant of a province as an ignorant, illiterate fellow, upon his observing that he had written Ixi for Ipsi, when he had occasion to write in cipher, he put B for A, C for B, and so forth, and instead of Z, A, A. He was no less fond of the Greek literature in which he made considerable proficiency. Having had Apollodorus of Pergamus for his master in rhetoric, whom, though much advanced in years, he took with him from the city, when he was himself very young, to Apollonia. Afterwards, being instructed in philology by Seferis, he received into his family Arius, the philosopher, and his sons Dionysius and Nicanor, but he never could speak the Greek tongue readily, nor even ventured to compose in it. For if there was occasion for him to deliver his sentiments in that language, he always expressed what he had to say in Latin, and gave it an order to translate. He was evidently not unacquainted with the poetry of the Greeks, and had a great taste for the ancient comedy, which he often brought upon the stage in his public spectacles. In reading the Greek and Latin authors, he paid particular attention to precepts and examples which might be useful in public or private life. Those he used to extract verbatim, and gave to his domestics, or sent to the commanders of the armies, the governors of the provinces, or the magistrates of the city, when any of them seemed to stand in need of admonition. He likewise read whole books to the senate, and frequently made them known to the people by his edicts such as the orations of Quintus Metellus, for the encouragement of marriage, and those of Rutilius, on the style of building, to show the people that he was not the first who had promoted those objects, but that the ancients likewise had thought them worthy their attention. 
he patronized the men of genius of that age in every possible way. He would hear them read their works with a great deal of patience and good nature, and not only poetry and history, but orations and dialogues. He was displeased, however, that anything should be written upon himself, except in a grave manner, and by men of the most eminent abilities. And he enjoined the praetors not to suffer his name to be made too common in the contests among orators and poets in the theatres. End of Caesar Augustus, Part 5《奥斯特》Part VI of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forster. Augustus Caesar, Part VI, Paragraphs 90 to 101. We have the following account of him respecting his belief in omens and such like. He had so great a dread of thunder and lightning that he always carried about him a seal skin by way of preservation. And upon any apprehension of a violent storm, he would retire to some place of concealment in a vault underground, having formerly been terrified by a flash of lightning while traveling in the night, as we have already mentioned. He neither slighted his own dreams nor those of other people relating to himself. At the Battle of Philippi, although he had resolved not to stir out of his tent on account of his being indisposed, yet, being warned by a dream of one of his friends, he changed his mind. And well it was that he did so, for, in the enemy's attack, his couch was pierced and cut to pieces on the supposition of his being in it. He had many frivolous and frightful dreams during the spring, but in the other parts of the year they were less frequent and more significative. Upon his frequently visiting a temple near the capital, which he had dedicated to Jupiter Tonans, he dreamt that Jupiter Capitolinus complained that his worshippers were taken from him, and that upon this he replied, he had only given him the thunderer for his porter. He therefore immediately suspended little bells round the summit of the temple, because such commonly hung at the gates of great houses. In consequence of a dream, too, he always, on a certain day of the year, begged alms of the people, reaching out his hand to receive the dole which they offered him. Some signs and omens he regarded as infallible. If in the morning his shoe was put on wrong, the left instead of the right, that boded some disaster. If, when he commenced a long journey, by sea or land, there happened to fall a mizzling rain, he held it to be a good sign of a speedy and happy return. He was much affected likewise with anything out of the common course of nature. A palm tree, which chanced to grow up between some stones in the court of his house, he transplanted into a court where the images of the household gods were placed, and took all possible care to make it thrive in the island of Capri. Some decayed branches of an old ilex, which hung drooping to the ground, recovered themselves upon his arrival, at which he was so delighted that he made an exchange with the Republic of Naples of the island of Enaria, Ischia, for that of Capri. He likewise observed certain days, as never to go from home the day after the Nundie, nor to begin any serious business upon the nones, avoiding nothing else in it, as he writes to Tiberius, than its unlucky name. With regard to the religious ceremonies of foreign nations, he was a strict observer of those which had been established by ancient custom, but others he held in no esteem. For, having been initiated at Athens, and coming afterwards to hear a cause at Rome, relative to the privileges of the priests of the Attic Ceres, when some of the mysteries of their sacred rites were to be introduced in the pleadings, he dismissed those who sat upon the bench as judges with him, as well as the bystanders, and bared the argument upon those points himself. But on the other hand, he not only declined in his progress through Egypt to go out of his way to pay a visit to Epis, but he likewise commended his grandson Caius for not paying his devotions at Jerusalem 
in his passage through Judea. Since we are upon this subject, it may not be improper to give an account of the omens before and at his birth, as well as afterwards, which gave hopes of his future greatness, and the good fortune that constantly attended him. A part of the wall of Velatri having in former times been struck with thunder, the response of the soothsayers was that a native of that town would some time or other arrive at supreme power. Relying on which prediction, the Velatrians both then and several times afterwards made war upon the Roman people to their own ruin. At last, it appeared by the event that the omen had portended the elevation of Augustus. Julius Marathus informs us that a few months before his birth, there happened at Rome a prodigy, by which was signified that nature was in travail with a king for the Roman people, and that the Senate, in alarm, came to the resolution that no child born that year should be brought up, but that those amongst them whose wives were pregnant, to secure to themselves a chance of that dignity, took care that the decree of the Senate should not be registered in the treasury. I find in the theological books of Asclepiades the Mendesian, that Atia, upon attending at midnight a religious solemnity in honor of Apollo, when the rest of the matrons retired home, fell asleep on her couch in the temple, and that a serpent immediately crept to her, and soon after withdrew. She, awaking upon it, purified herself, as usual, after the embraces of her husband, and instantly there appeared upon her body a mark in the form of a serpent, which she never after could efface, and which obliged her, during the subsequent part of her life, to decline the use of the public baths. Augustus, it was added, was born in the tenth month after, and for that reason was thought to be the son of Apollo. The same Atia, before her delivery, dreamed that her bowels stretched to the stars, and expanded through the whole circuit of heaven and earth. His father, Octavius, likewise, dreamt that a sunbeam issued from his wife's womb. Upon the day he was born, the Senate being engaged in a debate on Catiline's conspiracy, and Octavius, in consequence of his wife's being in childbirth, coming late into the house, it is a well-known fact that Publius Nigidius, upon hearing the occasion of his coming so late, and the hour of his wife's delivery, declared that the world had got a master. Afterwards, when Octavius, upon marching with his army through the deserts of Thrace, consulted the oracle in the grove of Father Bacchus, with barbarous rites, concerning his son, he received from the priests an answer to the same purpose, because, when they poured wine upon the altar, there burst out so prodigious a flame that it ascended above the roof of the temple and reached up to the heavens. A circumstance which had never happened to any one but Alexander the Great upon his sacrificing at the same altars. The next night he dreamt that he saw his son under a more than human appearance, with thunder and a scepter, and the other insignia of Jupiter, Optimus, Maximus, having on his head a radiant crown, mounted upon a chariot decked with laurel, and drawn by six pair of milk-white horses. Whilst he was yet an infant, as Caius Drissus relates, being laid in his cradle by his nurse and in a low place, the next day he was not to be found, and after he had been sought for a long time, he was at last discovered upon a lofty tower, lying with his face towards the rising sun. When he first began to speak, he ordered the frogs that happened to make a troublesome noise upon an estate belonging to the family near the town to be silent. And there goes a report that frogs never croaked there since that time. As he was dining in a grove at the fourth milestone on the companion road, an eagle suddenly snatched a piece of bread out of his hand, and, soaring to a prodigious height after hovering, came down most unexpectedly and returned it to him. Quintus Catullus had a dream for two nights successively after his dedication of the capital. The first night he dreamt that Jupiter, out of several boys of the order of the nobility who were playing about his altar, selected one, into whose bosom he put the public seal of the commonwealth, which he held in his hand. But in his vision, the next night, he saw in the bosom of Jupiter Capitolinus the same boy, whom he ordered to be removed, but it was forbidden by the god, who declared that it must be brought up to become the guardian of the state. The next day, meeting Augustus, with whom till that hour he had not the least acquaintance, and looking at him with admiration, 
he said he was extremely like the boy he had seen in his dream. Some give a different account of Catullus's first dream, namely, that Jupiter, upon several noble lads requesting of him that they might have a guardian, had pointed to one amongst them, to whom they were to prefer their requests, and putting his fingers to the boy's mouth to kiss, he afterwards applied them to his own. Marcus Cicero, as he was attending Caius Caesar to the capital, happened to be telling some of his friends a dream which he had the preceding night, in which he saw a comely youth, let down from heaven by a golden chain, who stood at the door of the capital, and had a whip put into his hands by Jupiter. And immediately upon sight of Augustus, who had been sent for by his uncle Caesar to the sacrifice, and was as yet perfectly unknown to most of the company, he affirmed that it was the very boy he had seen in his dream. When he assumed the manly toga, his senatorian tunic becoming loose in the seam on each side fell at his feet. Some would have this to forebode, that the order of which that was the badge of distinction would some time or other be subject to him. Julius Caesar, in cutting down a wood to make room for his camp near Munda, happened to light upon a palm tree, and ordered it to be preserved as an omen of victory. From the root of this tree there put out immediately a sucker, which, in a few days, grew to such a height as not only to equal, but to overshadow it, and afford room for many nests of wild pigeons which built in it, though that species of bird particularly avoids a hard and rough leaf. It is likewise reported that Caesar was chiefly influenced by this prodigy, to prefer his sister's grandson before all others for his successor. In his retirement at Apollonia, he went with his friend Agrippa to visit Theogenes, the astrologer, in his gallery on the roof. Agrippa, who first consulted the fates, having great and almost incredible fortunes predicted of him, Augustus did not choose to make known his nativity, and persisted for some time in the refusal, from a mixture of shame and fear, lest his fortunes should be predicted as inferior to those of Agrippa. Being persuaded, however, after much importunity to declare it, Theogenes started up from his seat, and paid him adoration. Not long afterwards, Augustus was so confident on the greatness of his destiny, that he published his horoscope, and struck a silver coin, bearing upon it the sign of Capricorn, under the influence of which he was born. After the death of Caesar, upon his return from Apollonia, as he was entering the city, on a sudden, in a clear and bright sky, a circle, resembling the rainbow, surrounded the body of the sun, and immediately afterwards the tomb of Julia, Caesar's daughter, was struck by lightning. In his first consulship, whilst he was observing the auguries, twelve vultures presented themselves, as they had done to Romulus. And when he offered sacrifice, the livers of all the victims were folded inward in the lower part, a circumstance which was regarded by those present, who had skill in things of that nature, as an indubitable prognostic of great and wonderful fortune. He certainly had a presentiment of the issue of all his wars. When the troops of the Triumviri were collected about Bologna, an eagle, which sat upon his tent, and was attacked by two crows, beat them both, and struck them to the ground in the view of the whole army, who thence inferred that discord would arise between the three colleagues, which would be attended with the like event, and it accordingly happened. At Philippi he was assured of success by a Thessalian, upon the authority, as he pretended, of the divine Caesar himself, who had appeared to him while he was travelling in a by-road. At Perugia, the sacrifice not presenting any favourable intimations, but the contrary, he ordered fresh victims. The enemy, however, carrying off the sacred things in a sudden sally, it was agreed amongst the augurs that all the dangers and misfortunes which had threatened the sacrificer would fall upon the heads of those who had got possession of the entrails. And accordingly, so it happened. The day before the sea fight near Sicily, as he was walking upon the shore, a fish leaped out of the sea and laid itself at his feet. At Axiom, while he was going down to his fleet to engage the enemy, he was met by an ass with a fellow driving in it. The name of the man was Eutychus, and that of the animal, Nikon. After the victory, he erected a brazen statue to each, in a temple built upon the spot where he had encamped. His death, of which I shall now speak, and his subsequent deification, 
were intimated by divers manifest prodigies. As he was finishing the census amidst a great crowd of people in the campus marshes, an eagle hovered round him several times, and then directed its course to a neighboring temple, where it settled upon the name of Agrippa, and at the first letter. Upon observing this, he ordered his colleague Tiberius to put up the vows, which it is usual to make on such occasions, for the succeeding lustrum. For he declared he would not meddle with what it was probable he should never accomplish, though the tables were ready drawn for it. About the same time, the first letter of his name, in an inscription upon one of his statues, was struck out by lightning, which was interpreted as a presage that he would live only a hundred days longer, the letter C denoting that number, and that he would be placed amongst the gods, as Caesar, which is the remaining part of the word Caesar, signifies, in the Tuscan language, a god. Being, therefore, about dispatching Tiberius to Illyricum, and designing to go with him as far as Beneventum, but being detained by several persons who applied to him respecting causes they had depending, he cried out, and it was afterwards regarded as an omen of his death, Not all the business in the world shall detain me at home one moment longer. And setting out upon his journey, he went as far as Astura, whence, contrary to his custom, he put to sea in the night-time, as there was a favorable wind. His malady proceeded from diarrhea, notwithstanding which he went round the coast of Campania, in the adjacent islands, and spent four days in that of Caprae, where he gave himself up entirely to repose and relaxation. Happening to sail by the bay of Puteoli, the passengers and mariners aboard a ship of Alexandria, just then arrived, clad all in white, with chaplets upon their heads and offering incense, loaded him with praises and joyful acclamations, crying out, by you we live, by you we sail securely, by you enjoy our liberty and our fortunes. At which, being greatly pleased, he distributed to each of those who attended him forty gold pieces, requiring from them an assurance on oath, not to employ the sum given them in any other way than the purchase of Alexandrian merchandise. And, during several days afterwards, he distributed toge and pelia, among other gifts, on condition that the Romans should use the Greek, and the Greeks the Roman dress and language. He likewise constantly attended to see the boys perform their exercises, according to an ancient custom still continued at Caprae. He gave them likewise an entertainment in his presence, and not only permitted, but required from them the utmost freedom in jesting, and scrambling for fruit, victuals, and other things which he threw amongst them. In a word, he indulged himself in all the ways of amusement he could contrive. He called an island near Caprae, Epigopolis, the city of the Doolittles, from the indolent life which several of his party led there. A favorite of his, one Masgabas, he used to call Tistes, as if he had been the planter of the island. And observing from his room a great company of people with torches, assembled at the tomb of this Masgabas, who died the year before, he uttered very distinctly this verse, which he made extempore. Ctistu de tumbo, eisoro pirumenon. Blazing with lights, I see the founder's tomb. Then, turning to Thrasyllus, a companion of Tiberius, who reclined on the other side of the table, he asked him, who knew nothing about the matter, what poet he thought was the author of that verse, and on his hesitating to reply, he added another. Oras fessi mas gaban timomenon. Honored with torches, Masgabas, you see. And put the same question to him concerning that likewise. The latter replying that, whoever might be the author, they were excellent verses, he set up a great laugh, and fell into an extraordinary vein of jesting upon it. Soon afterwards, passing over the Naples, although at that time greatly disordered in his bowels by the frequent returns of his disease, he set out the exhibition of the gymnastic games, which were performed in his honor every five years, and proceeded with Tiberius to the place intended. But on his return, his disorder increasing, he stopped at Nola, sent for Tiberius back again, and had a long discourse with him in private, after which he gave no further attention to business of any importance. Upon the day of his death, he now and then inquired if there was any disturbance in the town on his account, and calling for a mirror, he ordered his hair to be combed and his shrunk cheeks to be adjusted. Then, asking his friends who were admitted into the room, 
Do you think that I have acted my part on the stage of life well? He immediately subjoined. Ei de pane heikalos, to paignio, dote croton, kai pante sumis metachiaras to paisati. If all be right, with joy your voices raise, in loud applauses to the actor's praise. After which, having dismissed them all, whilst he was inquiring of some persons who were just arrived from Rome concerning Drusus's daughter, who was in a bad state of health, he expired suddenly amidst the kisses of Livia, and with these words, Livia, live mindful of our union, and now farewell, dying a very easy death, and such as he himself had always wished for. For as often as he heard that any person had died quickly and without pain, he wished for himself and his friends the like euthanasian and easy death, for that was the word he made use of. He betrayed but one symptom, before he breathed his last, of being delirious, which was this. He was all on a sudden much frightened, and complained that he was carried away by forty men. But this was rather a presage than any delirium, for precisely that number of soldiers belonging to the Praetorian cohort carried out his corpse. He expired in the same room in which his father Octavius had died, when the two Sextus, Pompey and Apuleius, were consuls, upon the fourteenth of the calends of September, the nineteenth of August, at the ninth hour of the day, being seventy-six years of age, wanting only thirty-five days. His remains were carried by the magistrates of the municipal towns and colonies, from Nola to Bovile, and in the night-time, because of the season of the year. During the intervals the body lay in some basilica, or great temple, of each town. At Bovile it was met by the equestrian order, who carried it to the city, and deposited it in the vestibule of his own house. The senate proceeded with so much zeal in the arrangement of his funeral, and paying honor to his memory, that, among several other proposals, some were for having the funeral procession made through the triumphal gate, preceded by the image of victory, which is in the senate house, and the children of highest rank and of both sexes singing the funeral dirge. Others proposed that on the day of the funeral they should lay aside their gold rings and wear rings of iron, and others that his bones should be collected by the priests of the principal colleges. One likewise proposed to transfer the name of August to September, because he was born in the latter, but died in the former. Another moved that the whole period of time from his birth to his death should be called the Augustan Age, and be inserted in the calendar under that title. But at last it was judged proper to be moderate in the honors paid to his memory. Two funeral orations were pronounced in his praise, one before the temple of Julius by Tiberius, and the other before the rostra under the old ships by Drusus, Tiberius' son. The body was then carried upon the shoulders of senators into the campus martius, and there burnt. A man of Praetorian rank affirmed upon oath that he saw his spirit ascend from the funeral pile to heaven. The most distinguished persons of the equestrian order, barefooted and with their tunics loose, gathered up his relics and deposited them in the mausoleum which had been built in his sixth consulship between the Flaminian Way and the bank of the Tiber, at which time likewise he gave the groves and walks about it for the use of the people. He had made a will, a year and four months before his death, upon the third of the nones of April, the eleventh of April, in the consulship of Lucius Plancus and Caius Silius. It consisted of two skins of parchment, written partly in his own hand and partly by his freedmen, Polybius and Hilarion, and had been committed to the custody of the Vestal Virgins, by whom it was now produced, with three codicils under seal, as well as the will. All these were opened and read in the Senate. He appointed as his direct heirs Tiberius for two-thirds of his estate, and Livia for the other third, both of whom he desired to assume his name. The heirs in remainder were Drusus, Tiberius' son, for one-third, and Germanicus, with his three sons, for the residue. In the third place, failing them, were his relations and several of his friends. He left in legacies to the Roman people, forty millions of sesterces, to the tribes three millions five hundred thousand, to the praetorian troops a thousand each man, to the city cohorts five hundred, and to the legions and soldiers three hundred each, 
which several sums he ordered to be paid immediately after his death, having taken due care that the money should be ready in his exchequer. For the rest he ordered different times of payment. In some of his bequests he went as far as twenty thousand sesterces, for the payment of which he allowed a twelve-month, alleging for this procrastination the scantiness of his estate, and declaring that not more than a hundred and fifty millions of sesterces would come to his heirs, notwithstanding that during the twenty preceding years he had received, in legacies from his friends, the sum of fourteen hundred millions, almost the whole of which, with his two paternal estates, and others which had been left him, he had spent in the service of the state. He left orders that the two Julius, his daughter and granddaughter, if anything happened to them, should not be buried in his tomb. With regard to the three codicils before mentioned, in one of them he gave orders about his funeral. Another contained a summary of his acts, which he intended should be inscribed on brazen plates, and placed in front of his mausoleum. In the third, he had drawn up a concise account of the state of the empire, the number of troops enrolled, what money there was in the treasury, the revenue and arrears of taxes, to which were added the names of the freedmen and slaves from whom the several accounts might be taken. End of Caesar Augustus Tiberius, Part 1 of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Tiberius, Part 1. The patrician family of the Claudii, for there was a plebeian family of the same name, no way inferior to the other either in power or dignity, came originally from Regili, a town of the Sabines. They removed thence to Rome soon after the building of the city with a great body of their dependents under Titus Tatitus, who reigned jointly with Romulus in the kingdom, or perhaps what is related upon better authority under Atta Claudius, the head of the family, who was admitted by the Senate into the patrician order six years after the expulsion of the Tarquins. They likewise received from the state lands beyond the Anio for their followers, and a burying place for themselves near the capital. After this period, in process of time, the family had the honor of twenty-eight consulships, five dictatorships, seven censorships, seven triumphs and two ovations. Their descendants were distinguished by various praenomina and cognomina, but rejected by common consent the praenomen of Lucius, when, of the two races who bore it, one individual had been convicted of robbery and another of murder. Amongst other cognomina, they assumed that of Nero, which, in the Sabine language, signifies strong and valiant. It appears from record that many of the Claudi have performed signal services to the state, as well as committed acts of delinquency. To mention the most remarkable only, Appius Caecus dissuaded the Senate from agreeing to an alliance with Pyrrhus, as prejudicial to the Republic. Claudius Candex first passed the Straits of Sicily with the fleet, and drove the Carthaginians out of the island. Claudius Nero cut off Hasdrubal with a vast army upon his arrival in Italy from Spain, before he could form a junction with his brother Hannibal. On the other hand, Claudius Appius Regulanus, one of the Decemvirs, made a violent attempt to have a free virgin, of whom he was enamoured, adjudged a slave, which caused the people to secede a second time from the Senate. Claudius Drusus erected a statue of himself, wearing a crown at Appii Forum, and endeavoured, by means of his dependents, to make himself master of Italy. Claudius Pulcher, when, of the coast of Sicily, the pullets used for taking augury would not eat, in contempt of the omen threw them overboard, as if they should drink at least, if they would not eat, and then engaging the enemy, was rooted. 
After his defeat, when he was ordered by the Senate to name a dictator, making a sort of jest of the public disaster, he named Glycius his apparitor. The women of this family, likewise, exhibited characters equally opposed to each other. For both the Claudias belonged to it. She, who, when the ship freighted with things sacred to the Idaean mother of the gods, stuck fast in the shallows of the Tiber, got it off by praying to the goddess with a loud voice, Follow me if I am chased. And she also, who, contrary to the usual practice in the case of women, was brought to trial by the people for treason. Because, when her litter was stopped by a great crowd in the streets, she openly exclaimed, I wish my brother, Pulcher, was alive now, to lose another fleet that Rome might be less thronged. Besides, it was well known that all the Claudii, except Publius Claudius, who, to effect the banishment of Cicero, procured himself to be adopted by a plebeian, and one younger than himself, were always of the patrician party, as well as great sticklers for the honor and power of that order, and so violent and obstinate in their opposition to the plebeians, that not one of them, even in the case of a trial for life by the people, would ever condescend to put on mourning, according to custom, or make any supplication to them for favor. And some of them in their contests have even proceeded to lay hands on the tribunes of the people. A vestal virgin likewise of the family, when her brother was resolved to have the honor of a triumph contrary to the will of the people, mounted the chariot with him, and attended him into the capital, that it might not be lawful for any of the tribunes to interfere and forbid it. From this family Tiberius Caesar is descended, indeed both by the father and mother's side, by the former from Tiberius Nero, and by the latter from Appius Pulcher, who were both sons of Appius Caecus. He likewise belonged to the family of the Levi, by the adoption of his mother's grandfather into it, which family, although plebeian, made a distinguished figure, having had the honor of eight consulships, two censorships, three triumphs, one dictatorship, and the office of master of the horse, and was famous for eminent men, particularly Salinator and the Drusi. Salinator, in his censorship, branded all the tribes for their inconstancy, in having made him consul a second time, as well as censor, although they had condemned him to a heavy fine after his first consulship. Drusus procured for himself and his posterity a new surname, by killing in single combat Drausus, the enemy's chief. He is likewise said to have recovered, when proprietor in the province of Gaul, the gold which was formerly given to the Senones, at the siege of the capital, and had not, as is reported, been forced from them by Camillus. His great-great-grandson, who, for his extraordinary services against the Gracchi, was styled the patron of the Senate, left a son, who, while plotting in a sedition of the same description, was treacherously murdered by the opposite party. But the father of Tiberius Caesar, being quester to Caius Caesar, and commander of his fleet in the war of Alexandria, contributed greatly to its success. He was therefore made one of the high priests in the room of Publius Scipio, and was sent to settle some colonies in Gaul, and amongst the rest, those of Narbonne and Arles. After the assassination of Caesar, however, when the rest of the senators, for fear of public disturbances, were for having the affair buried in oblivion, he proposed a resolution for rewarding those who had killed the tyrant. Having filled the office of praetor, and at the end of the year a disturbance breaking out amongst the triumviri, he kept the badges of his office beyond the legal time, and following Lucius Antonius the consul, brother of the triumvir, to Perusia, Though the rest submitted, yet he himself continued firm to the party, and escaped first to Praeneste and then to Naples, whence, having in vain invited the slaves to liberty, he fled over to Sicily. But resenting his not being immediately admitted into the presence of Sextus Pompey, and being also prohibited the use of the Fasces, he went over into Achaia to Mark Antony, with whom, upon a reconciliation soon after brought about, amongst the several contending parties, he returned to Rome, and, at the request of Augustus, 
gave up to him his wife, Livia Drusilla, although she was then big with child, and had before borne him a son. He died not long after, leaving behind him two sons, Tiberius and Drusus Nero. Some have imagined that Tiberius was born at Fundi, but there is only this trifling foundation for the conjecture, that his mother's grandmother was of Fundi, and that the image of good fortune was, by a decree of the Senate, erected in a public place in that town. But according to the greatest number of writers, and those two of the best authority, he was born at Rome, in the Palatine Quarter, upon the 16th of the calends of December, 16th November, when Marcus Aemilius Lepidus was second time consul, with Lucius Monatius Plancus, after the Battle of Philippi, for so it is registered in the calendar, and the public acts. According to some, however, he was born the preceding year, in the consulship of Hirtius and Pansa, and others say in the year following, during the consulship of Servilius, Isauricus, and Antony. His infancy and childhood were spent in the midst of danger and trouble, for he accompanied his parents everywhere in their flight, and twice at Naples nearly betrayed them by his crying, when they were privately hastening to a ship, as the enemy rushed into the town. Once, when he was snatched from his nurse's breast, and again from his mother's bosom, by some of the company who on the sudden emergency wished to relieve the woman of their burden, being carried through Sicily and Ahia, and entrusted for some time to the care of Lacedaemonians, who were under the protection of the Claudian family, upon his departure thence, when travelling by night, he ran the hazard of his life, by a fire which, suddenly bursting out of a wood on all sides, surrounded the whole party so closely, that part of Livia's dress and hair was burnt. The presents which were made him by Pompeia, sister to Sextus Pompey, in Sicily, namely, a cloak with a clasp, and bola of gold, are still in existence, and shown at Baiae, to this day. After his return to the city, being adopted by Marcus Gallius, a senator, in his will, he took possession of the estate, but soon afterwards declined the use of his name, because Gallius had been of the party opposed to Augustus. When only nine years of age, he pronounced a funeral oration in praise of his father upon the rostra, and afterwards, when he had nearly attained the age of manhood, he attended the chariot of Augustus, in his triumph for the victory at Actium, riding on the left-hand horse, whilst Marcellus, Octavius' son, rode that on the right. He likewise presided at the games celebrated on account of that victory, and in the Trojan games, intermixed with the Circensian, he commanded a troop of the biggest boys. After assuming the manly habit, he spent his youth and the rest of his life until he succeeded to the government in the following manner. He gave the people an entertainment of gladiators, in memory of his father, and another for his grandfather Drusus, at different times and in different places. The first in the forum, the second in the amphitheatre. Some gladiators who had been honorably discharged, being induced to engage again, by a reward of a hundred thousand sesterces. He likewise exhibited public sports, at which he was not present himself. All these he performed with great magnificence, at the expense of his mother and father-in-law. He married Agrippina, the daughter of Marcus Agrippa, and granddaughter of Caecilius Atticus, a Roman knight, the same person to whom Cicero has addressed so many epistles. After having by her his son Drusus, he was obliged to part with her, though she retained his affection and was again pregnant, to make way for marrying Augustus' daughter Julia. But this he did with extreme reluctance, for besides having the warmest attachment to Agrippina, he was disgusted with the conduct of Julia, who had made indecent advances to him during the lifetime of her former husband, and that she was a woman of loose character was the general opinion. At divorcing Agrippina, he felt the deepest regret, and upon meeting her afterwards, he looked after her, with eyes so passionately expressive of affection, that care was taken, she should never again come in his sight. At first, however, he lived quietly and happily with Julia, but a rupture soon ensued, 
which became so violent that after the loss of their son, the pledge of their union, who was born at Aquileia and died in infancy, he never would sleep with her more. He lost his brother Drusus in Germany, and brought his body to Rome, travelling all the way on foot before it. When he first applied himself to civil affairs, he defended the several causes of King Archelaus, the Trallians, and the Thessalians before Augustus, who sat as judge at the trials. He addressed the Senate on behalf of the Laodiceans, the Thyatireans, and Chians, who had suffered greatly by an earthquake, and implored relief from Rome. He prosecuted Fannius Caepio, who had been engaged in a conspiracy with Varro Muraena against Augustus, and procured sentence of condemnation against him. Amidst all this he had besides to superintend two departments of the administration, that of supplying the city with corn, which was then very scarce, and that of clearing the houses of correction throughout Italy, the masters of which had fallen under the odious suspicion of seizing and keeping confined, not only travellers, but those whom the fear of being obliged to serve in the army had driven to seek refuge in such places. He made his first campaign as a military tribune in the Cantabrian War. Afterwards he led an army into the east, where he restored the kingdom of Armenia to Tigranes, and seated on a tribunal, put a crown upon his head. He likewise recovered from the Parthians the standards which they had taken from Crassus. He next governed, for nearly a year, the province of Gallia Comata, which was then in great disorder, on account of the incursions of the barbarians and the foils of the chiefs. He afterwards commanded in the several wars against the Raetians, Vindelicians, Pannonians, and Germans. In the Raetian and Vindelician wars, he subdued the nations in the Alps, and in the Pannonian wars, the Bruci and the Dalmatians. In the German war, he transplanted into Gaul 40,000 of the enemy, who had submitted and assigned them lands near the banks of the Rhine. For these actions he entered the city with an ovation, but riding in a chariot, and is said, by some, to have been the first that ever was honored with this distinction. He filled early the principal offices of state, and passed through the quaestorship, praetorship, and consulate, almost successively. After some interval he was chosen consul a second time, and held the tribunician authority during five years. Surrounded by all this prosperity, in the prime of life and in excellent health, he suddenly formed the resolution of withdrawing to a greater distance from Rome. It is uncertain whether this was the result of disgust for his wife, whom he neither durst accuse nor divorce, and the connection with whom became every day more intolerable, or to prevent that indifference towards him which his constant residence in the city might produce, or in the hope of supporting and improving by absence his authority in the state, if the public should have occasion for his service. Some are of opinion that as Augustus' sons were now grown up to years of maturity, he voluntarily relinquished the possession of he had long enjoyed of the second place in the government, as Agrippa had done before him, who, when M. Marcellus was advanced to public offices, retired to Mytilene, that he might not seem to stand in the way of his promotion, or in any respect lessen him by his presence. The same reason likewise Tiberius gave afterwards for his retirement, but this pretext at this time was, that he was satiated with honours and desirous of being relieved from the fatigue of business, requesting therefore that he might have leave to withdraw. And neither the earnest entreaties of his mother, nor the complaint of his father-in-law, made even in the Senate, that he was deserted by him, could prevail upon him to alter his resolution. Upon their persisting in the design of detaining him, he refused to take any sustenance for four days together. At last, having obtained permission, leaving his wife and son at Rome, he proceeded to Ostia, without exchanging a word with those who attended him, and having embraced but very few persons at parting. From Ostia, journeying along the coast of Campania, he halted a while on receiving intelligence of Augustus being taken ill, 
but this giving rise to a rumor that he stayed with a view to something extraordinary, he sailed with the wind almost full against him, and arrived at Rhodes, having been struck with the pleasantness and healthiness of the island, at the time of his landing therein, his return from Armenia. Here contenting himself with a small house, and a villa not much larger, near the town, he led entirely a private life, taking his walks sometimes about the gymnasia, without any lictor or other attendant, and returning the civilities of the Greeks, was almost as much complacence as if he had been upon a level with them. One morning, in settling the course of his daily excursion, he happened to say that he should visit all the sick people in the town. This being not rightly understood by those about him, the sick were brought into a public portico, and ranged in order, according to their several distempers. Being extremely embarrassed by this unexpected occurrence, he was for some time irresolute how he should act, but at last he determined to go round them all, and make an apology for the mistake, even to the meanest amongst them, and such as were entirely unknown to him. One instance only is mentioned in which he appeared to exercise his tribunician authority. Being a constant attendant upon the schools and lecture rooms of the professors of the liberal arts, an occasion of the quarrel amongst the wrangling sophists, in which he interposed to reconcile them, some person took the liberty to abuse him as an intruder, and partial in the affair. Upon this, withdrawing privately home, he suddenly returned attended by his officers, and summoning his accuser before his tribunal, by a public crier, ordered him to be taken to prison. Afterwards he received tidings that his wife Julia had been condemned for her lewdness and adultery, and that a bill of divorce had been sent to her in his name, by the authority of Augustus. Though he secretly rejoiced at this intelligence, he thought it incumbent upon him, in point of decency, to interpose in her behalf by frequent letters to Augustus, and to allow her to retain the presence which he had made her, notwithstanding the little regard she merited from him. When the period of his tribunician authority expired, declaring at last that he had no other object in his retirement than to avoid all suspicion of rivalship with Caius and Lucius, he petitioned that, since he was now secure in that respect, as they were come to the age of manhood, and would easily maintain themselves in possession of the second place in the state, he might be permitted to visit his friends, whom he was very desirous of seeing. But his request was denied, and he was advised to lay aside all concern for his friends, whom he had been so eager to greet. He therefore continued at Rhodes, much against his will, obtaining with difficulty through his mother the title of Augustus Lieutenant, to cover his disgrace. He thenceforth lived, however, not only as a private person, but as one suspected and under apprehension, retiring into the interior of the country, and avoiding the visits of those who sailed that way, which were very frequent, for no one passed to take command of an army, or the government of a province, without touching at Rhodes. But there are fresh reasons for increased anxiety. For crossing over to Samos, on a visit to his stepson Caius, who had been appointed governor of the east, he found him prepossessed against him by the insinuations of Marcus Lollius, his companion and director. He likewise fell under suspicion of sending by some centurions, who had been promoted by himself, upon their return to the camp after a furlough, mysterious messages to several persons there, intended, apparently, to tamper with them for a revolt. The jealousy respecting his designs, being intimated to him by Augustus, he begged repeatedly that some person of any of the three orders might be placed as a spy upon him in everything he either said or did. He laid aside likewise his usual exercises of riding and arms, and quitting the Roman habit, made use of the pallium and crepida. In this condition he continued almost two years, becoming daily an object of increasing contempt and odium, insomuch that the people of Nismes pulled down all the images and statues of him in their town, and upon mention being made of him at table, 
one of the company said to Caius, I will sail over to Rhodes immediately, if you desire me, and bring you the head of the exile. For that was the appellation now given him. Thus alarmed, not only by apprehensions, but real danger, he renewed his solicitations for leave to return, and seconded by the most urgent supplications of his mother, he at last obtained his request, to which an accident somewhat contributed. Augustus had resolved to determine nothing in the affair, but with the consent of his eldest son. The latter was at the time out of humor with Marcius Lollius, and therefore easily disposed to be favorable to his father-in-law. Caius thus acquiescing, he was recalled, but upon condition that he should take no concern whatever in the administration of affairs. He returned to Rome after an absence of nearly eight years, with great and confident hopes of his future elevation, which he had entertained from his youth, in consequence of various prodigies and predictions. For Livia, when pregnant with him, being anxious to discover, by different modes of divination, whether her offspring would be a son, amongst others, took an egg from a hen that was sitting, and kept it warm with her own hands, and those of her maids, by turns, until a fine cock chicken with a large comb was hatched. Scribonius, the astrologer, predicted great things of him when he was a mere child. He will come in time, said the prophet, to be even a king, but without the usual badge of royal dignity. The rule of the Caesars being as yet unknown, when he was making his first expedition and leading his army through Macedonia into Syria, the altars which had been formerly consecrated by Philippi, by the victorious legions, blazed suddenly with spontaneous fires. Soon after, as he was marching to Illyricum, he stopped to consult the oracle of Gerion, near Padua, and having drawn a lot by which he was desired to throw golden tally into the fountain of Oponus, for an answer to his inquiries, he did so, and the highest numbers came up. And those very tally are still to be seen at the bottom of the fountain. A few days before his leaving Rhodes, an eagle, a bird never before seen in that island, perched on the top of his house. And the day before he received intelligence of the permission granted him to return, as he was changing his dress, his tunic appeared to be all on fire. He then likewise had a remarkable proof of the skill of Thrasyllus, the astrologer, whom, for his proficiency in philosophical researches, he had taken into his family. For upon sight of the ship which brought the intelligence, he said, good news was coming whereas everything going wrong before, and quite contrary to his predictions, Tiberius had intended that very moment, when they were walking together, to throw him into the sea as an impostor, and one to whom he had too hastily entrusted his secrets. End of Tiberius, Part 1「Tiberius, Part 2 of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Tiberius, Part Two. Upon his return to Rome, having introduced his son Drusus into the forum, he immediately removed from Pompey's house in the Carinae to the gardens of Messianus on the Esquiline, and resigned himself entirely to his ease, performing only the common offices of civility in private life, without any preferment in the government. But Caius and Lucius, being both carried off in the space of three years, he was adopted by Augustus, along with their brother Agrippa, being obliged in the first place to adopt Germanicus, his brother's son. After his adoption he never more acted as master of a family, nor exercised in the smallest degree the rights which he had lost by it. For he neither disposed of anything in the way of gift, nor manumitted a slave, nor so much as received any estate left him by will, nor any legacy, 
without reckoning it as a part of his peculium or property held under his father. From that day forward, nothing was omitted that might contribute to the advancement of his grandeur, and much more, when upon Agrippa being discarded and banished, it was evident that the hope of succession rested upon him alone. The tribunitian authority was again conferred upon him for five years, and a commission given him to settle the affairs of Germany. The ambassadors of the Parthians, after having had an audience of Augustus, were ordered to apply to him likewise in his province. But on receiving intelligence of an insurrection in Illyricum, he went over to superintend the management of that new war, which proved the most serious of all the foreign wars since the Carthaginian. This he conducted during three years, with fifteen legions and an equal number of auxiliary forces, under great difficulties, and an extreme scarcity of corn. And though he was several times recalled, he nevertheless persisted, fearing lest an enemy so powerful and so near should fall upon the army in their retreat. This resolution was attended with good success, for he at last reduced to complete subjection all Illyricum, lying between Italy and the kingdom of Noricum, Thrace, Macedonia, the river Danube, and the Adriatic Gulf. The glory he acquired by these successes received an increase from the conjuncture in which they happened. For almost about that very time Quintilius Varus was cut off with three legions in Germany, and it was generally believed that the victorious Germans would have joined the Pannonians had not the war in Illyricum been previously concluded. A triumph, therefore, besides many other great honors, was decreed him. Some proposed that the surname of Pannonicus, others that of Invincible, and others of Opius should be conferred on him. But Augustus interposed, engaging for him that he would be satisfied with that to which he would succeed at his death. He postponed his triumph because the state was at that time under great affliction for the disaster of Varus and his army. Nevertheless, he entered the city in a triumphal robe, crowned with laurel, and mounting a tribunal in the scepter, sat with Augustus between the two consuls, whilst the senate gave their attendance standing, whence, after he had saluted the people, he was attended by them in procession to the several temples. Next year he went again to Germany, where, finding that the defeat of Varus was occasioned by the rashness and negligence of the commander, he thought proper to be guided in everything by the advice of a council of war, whereas, at other times, he used to follow the dictates of his own judgment, and considered himself alone as sufficiently qualified for the direction of affairs. He likewise used more cautions than usual. Having to pass the Rhine, he restricted the whole convoy with certain limits, and stationing himself on the bank of the river, would not suffer the wagons to cross the river, until he had searched them at the water-side, to see that they carried nothing but what was allowed or necessary. Beyond the Rhine, such was his way of living, that he took his males sitting on the bare ground, and often passed the night without a tent. And his regular orders for the day, as well as those upon sudden emergencies, he gave in writing, with this injunction that in case of any doubt as to the meaning of them, they should apply to him for satisfaction, even at any hour of the night. He maintained the strictest discipline amongst the troops, reviving many old customs relative to punishing and degrading offenders, setting a mark of disgrace even upon the commander of a legion, for sending a few soldiers with one of his freedmen across the river for the purpose of hunting. Though it was his desire to leave as little as possible in the power of fortune or accident, yet he always engaged the enemy with more confidence when, in his night watches, the lamp failed and went out of itself, trusting, as he said, in an omen which had never failed him, and his ancestors in all their commands. But in the midst of victory he was very near being assassinated by some Brukterian, who, mixing with those about him, and being discovered by his trepidation, was put to the torture, and confessed the intended crime. After two years he returned from Germany to the city, and celebrated the triumph which he had deferred, attended by his lieutenants, 
for whom he had procured the honor of triumphal ornaments. Before he turned to ascend the capital, he alighted from his chariot, and kneeled before his father, who sat by, to superintend the solemnity. Bato, the Pannonian chief, he sent to Ravenna, loaded with rich presents, in gratitude for his having suffered him and his army to retire from a position in which he had so enclosed them that they were entirely at his mercy. He afterwards gave the people a dinner at a thousand tables, besides thirty sisters to each man. He likewise dedicated the Temple of Concord and that of Castor and Pollux, which had been erected out of the spoils of the war, in his own and his brother's name. A law having been not long after carried by the consuls for his being appointed a colleague with Augustus in the administration of the provinces, and in taking the census, when that was finished he went into Illyricum. But being hastily recalled during his journey, he found Augustus alive indeed, but past all hopes of recovery, and was with him in private a whole day. I know it is generally believed that upon Tiberius quitting the room, after their private conference, those who were in waiting overheard Augustus say, Ah, unhappy Roman people, to be ground by the jaws of such a slow devourer. Nor am I ignorant of its being reported by some that Augustus so openly and undisguisedly condemned the sourness of his temper, that sometimes, upon his coming in, he would break off any jocular conversation in which he was engaged, and that he was only prevailed upon by the importunity of his wife to adopt him, or actuated by the ambitious view of recommending his own memory from a comparison with such a successor. Yet I must thought to this opinion that a prince, so extremely circumspect and prudent as he was, did nothing rashly, especially in an affair of so great importance, but that, upon weighing the vices and virtues of Tiberius with each other, he judged the latter to preponderate, and this the rather since he swore publicly, in an assembly of the people, that he adopted him for the public good. Besides, in several of his letters, he extols him as a consummate general, and the only security of the Roman people. Of such declarations I subjoin the following instances. Farewell, my dear Tiberius, and may success attend you, whilst you are warring for me and the muses. Farewell, my most dear, and as I hope to prosper, most gallant man, and accomplished general. Again, the disposition of your summer quarters, in truth, my dear Tiberius, I do not think that amidst so many difficulties, and with an army so little disposed for action, any one could have behaved more prudently than you have done. All those likewise who were with you acknowledge that this verse is applicable to you. Unus homo nobis vigilando restituit rem. One man by vigilance restored the state. Whenever, he says, anything happens that requires more than ordinary consideration, or I am out of humor upon any occasion, I still, by Hercules, long for my dear Tiberius, and those lines of Homer frequently occur to my thoughts. Tutuk hes pomenoio, caec puros ait homenoio, ampo nos desaimen, epe perioide no esai. Bought from his prudence, I could even aspire, to dare with him the burning rage of fire. When I hear and read that you are much impaired by the continued fatigues you undergo, may the gods confound me if my whole frame does not tremble. So I beg you to spare yourself, lest, if we should hear of your being ill, the news prove fatal both to me and your mother, and the Roman people should be in peril for the safety of the empire. It matters nothing whether I be well or no, if you be not well. I pray heaven preserve you for us, and bless you with health both now and ever, if the gods have any regard for the Roman people. He did not make the death of Augustus public, until he had taken off young Agrippa. He was slain by a tribune who commanded his guard, upon reading a written order for that purpose, respecting which order it was then a doubt, whether Augustus left it in his last moments, to prevent any occasion of public disturbance after his decease, 
or Livia issued it in the name of Augustus, and whether with the knowledge of Tiberius or not. When the tribune came to inform him that he had executed his command, he replied, I commanded you no such thing, and you must answer for it to the senate, avoiding, as it seems, the odium of the act for that time, and the affair was soon buried in silence. Having summoned the senate to meet by virtue of his tribunitian authority, and begun a mournful speech, he drew a deep sigh, as if unable to support himself under his affliction, and wishing that not his voice only, but his very breath of life, might fail him, gave his speech to his son Drusus to read. Augustus' will was then brought in, and read by a freedman, none of the witnesses to it being admitted, but such as were of the senatorian order, the rest owning their handwriting without doors. The will began thus, Since my ill fortune has deprived me of two my two sons, Caius and Lucius, let Tiberius Caesar be heir to two-thirds of my estate. These words countenanced the suspicion of those who were of opinion that Tiberius was appointed successor more out of necessity than choice, since Augustus could not refrain from prefacing his will in that manner. Though he made no scruple to assume and exercise immediately the imperial authority by giving orders that he should be attended by the guards, who were the security and badge of the supreme power, yet he affected by a most impudent piece of acting to refuse it for a long time, one while sharply reprehending his friends who entreated him to accept it, as little knowing what a monster the government was, another while keeping in suspense the senate when they implored him and threw themselves at his feet by ambiguous answers and a crafty kind of dissimulation, insomuch that some were out of patience, and one cried out during the confusion, either let him accept it or decline it at once, and the second told him to his face, others are slow to perform what they promise, but you are slow to promise what you actually perform. At last, as if forced to it, and complaining of the miserable and burdensome service imposed upon him, he accepted the government, not, however, without giving hopes of his resigning it some time or other. The exact words he used were these, and till the time shall come when you may think it reasonable to give some rest to my old age. The cause of his long demur was fear of the dangers which threatened him on all hands, insomuch that he said, I have got a wolf by the ears. For a slave of Agrippa's, Clemens by name, had drawn together a considerable force to revenge his master's death. Lucius Scribonius Libo, a senator of the first distinction, was secretly fomenting a rebellion, and the troops both in Illyricum and Germany were mutinous. Both armies insisted upon high demands, particularly that their pay should be made equal to that of the Praetorian guards. The army in Germany absolutely refused to acknowledge a prince who was not their own choice, and urged, with all possible importunity, Germanicus, who commanded them, to take the government on himself, though he obstinately refused it. It was Tiberius' apprehension from this quarter which made him request the Senate to assign him some part only in the administration, such as they should judge proper, since no man could be sufficient for the whole, without one or more to assist him. He pretended likewise to be in a bad state of health, that Germanicus might the more patiently wait, in hopes of speedily succeeding him, or at least of being admitted to be a colleague in the government. When the mutinies in the armies were suppressed, he got Clemens into his hands by stratagem. That he might not begin his reign by an act of severity, he did not call Lipo to an account before the Senate until his second year, being content in the meantime with taking proper precautions for his own security. For upon Libos attending a sacrifice amongst the high priests, instead of the usual knife, he ordered one of lead to be given him, and when he desired a private conference with him, he would not grant his request, but on condition that his son Drusus should be present, and as they walked together, he held him fast by the right hand, under the pretense of leaning upon him, until the conversation was over. When he was delivered from his apprehensions, 
his behavior at first was unassuming, and he did not carry himself much above the level of a private person, and of the many and great honors offered him, he accepted but few, and such as were very moderate. His birthday, which happened to fall at the time of the plebeian Circensian games, he was difficulty suffered to be honored, with the addition of only a single chariot, drawn by two horses. He forbade temples, flamens, or priests to be appointed for him, as likewise the erection of any statues or effigies for him, without his permission, and this he granted only on condition, that they should not be placed among the images of the gods, but only amongst the ornaments of houses. He also interposed to prevent the senate from swearing to maintain his acts, and the month September from being called Tiberius, and October being named after Livia. The praenomen likewise of emperor, with the cognomen of father of his country, and a civic crown in the vestibule of his house, he would not accept. He never used the name of Augustus, although he inherited it, in any of his letters, excepting those addressed to kings and princes. Nor had he more than three consulships, one for a few days, another for three months, and a third, during his absence from the city, until the Eads, 15th of May. He had such an aversion to flattery, that he would never suffer any senator to approach his litter, as he passed the streets in it, either to pay him a civility or upon business. And when a man of consular rank, in begging his pardon for some offence he had given him, attempted to fall at his feet, he started from him in such haste, that he stumbled and fell. If any compliment was paid him, either in conversation or a set speech, he would not scruple to interrupt and reprimand the party, and alter what he had said. Being once called Lord by some person, he desired that he might no more be affronted in that manner. When another, to excite veneration, called his occupation sacred, and the third had expressed himself thus, by your authority I have waited upon the senate, he obliged them to change their phrases, in one of them adopting persuasion instead of authority, and in the other laborious instead of sacred. He remained unmoved at all the aspersions, scandals, reports, and lampoons which were spread against him or his relations, declaring, in a free state, both the tongue and the mind ought to be free. Upon the senate desiring that some notice might be taken of those offences, and the persons charged with them, he replied, We have not so much time upon our hands that we ought to involve ourselves in more business. If you once make an opening for such proceedings, you will soon have nothing else to do. All private quarrels will be brought before you under that pretense. There is also on record another sentence used by him in the Senate, which is far from assuming if he speaks otherwise of me, I shall take care to behave in such a manner as to be able to give a good account both of my words and actions, and if he persists, I shall hate him in my turn. These things were so much the more remarkable in him, because, in the respect he paid to individuals, or the whole body of the Senate, he went beyond all bounds. Upon his differing with Quintus Haterius in the Senate House, Pardon me, sir, he said, I beseech you, if I shall, as a senator, speak my mind very freely in opposition to you. Afterwards, addressing the senate in general, he said, Conscript fathers, I have often said it both now and at other times, that a good and useful prince, whom you have invested with so great an absolute power, ought to be a slave to the senate, to the whole body of the people, and often to individuals likewise. Nor am I sorry that I have said it. I have always found you good, kind, and indulgent masters, and still find you so. He likewise introduced a certain show of liberty, by preserving to the senate and magistrates their former majesty and power. All affairs, whether of great or small importance, public or private, were laid before the senate. Taxes and monopolies, the erecting or repairing edifices, levying and disbanding soldiers, the disposal of the legions and auxiliary forces in the provinces, the appointment of generals for the management of extraordinary wars, and the answers to letters from foreign princes were all submitted to the senate. 
he compelled the commander of a troop of horse, who was accused of robbery attended with violence, to plead his cause before the senate. He never entered the senate house but unattended, and being once brought thither in a litter, because he was indisposed, he dismissed his attendants at the door. When some decrees were made contrary to his opinion, he did not even make any complaint, and though he saw that no magistrates after their nomination should be allowed to absent themselves for the city, but reside in it constantly, to receive their honors in person, a praetor elect obtained liberty to depart under the honorary title of a legate at large. Again, when he proposed to the senate that the Trebians might have leave, granted them to divert some money which had been left them by will for the purpose of building a new theatre to that of making a road, he could not prevail to have the will of the testator set aside. And when, upon a division of the house, he went over to the minority, nobody followed him. All other things of a public nature were likewise transacted by the magistrates, and in the usual forms. The authority of the consuls remaining so great, that some ambassadors from Africa applied to them, and complained that they could not have their business dispatched by Caesar, to whom they had been sent. And no wonder, since it was observed that he used to rise up as the consuls approached, and give them the way. He reprimanded some persons of consular rank in command of armies, for not writing to the senate on account of their proceedings, and for consulting him about the distribution of military rewards, as if they themselves had not a right to bestow them as they judged proper. He commanded a praetor, who, on entering office, revived an old custom of celebrating the memory of his ancestors, in a speech to the people. He attended the corpses of some persons of distinction to the funeral pile. He displayed the same moderation with regard to persons and things of inferior consideration. The magistrates of Rhodes, having dispatched to him a letter on public business, which was not subscribed, he sent for them, and without giving them so much as one harsh word, desired them to subscribe it, and so dismissed them. Diogenes, the grammarian, who used to hold public disquisitions at Rhodes every Sabbath day, once refused him admittance upon his coming to hear him out of course, and sent him a message by a servant postponing his admission until the next seventh day. Diogenes afterwards coming to Rome, and waiting at his door to be allowed to pay his respects to him, he sent him word to come again at the end of seven years. To some governors who advised him to load the provinces with taxes, he answered, It is the part of a good shepherd to shear, not flay his sheep. He assumed the sovereignty by slow degrees, and exercised it for a long time, with great variety of conduct, so generally with a due regard to the public good. At first he only interposed to prevent ill management. Accordingly, he rescinded some decrees of the Senate, and when the magistrates sat for the administration of justice, he frequently offered his service as assessor, either taking his place promiscuously among them, or seating himself in a corner of the tribunal. If a rumor prevailed that any person under prosecution was likely to be acquitted by his interest, he would suddenly make his appearance, and from the floor of the court, or the praetor's bench, remind the judges of the laws, and of their oaths, and the nature of the charge brought before them. He likewise took upon himself the correction of public morals, where they tended to decay, either through neglect or evil custom. He reduced the expense of the plays and public spectacles by diminishing the allowances to actors and curtailing the number of gladiators. He made grievous complaints to the Senate that the price of Corinthian vessels was become enormous, and that three mullets had been sold for thirty thousand sesterces, upon which he proposed that a new sumptuary law should be enacted, that the butchers and other dealers in viands should be subject to an assize fixed by the Senate yearly, and the ideals commissioned to restrain eating-houses and taverns, so far as not even to permit the sale of any kind of pastry. And to encourage frugality in the public by his own example, he would often, at his solemn feasts, have at his tables victuals which had been served up the day before, 
and were partly eaten, and half a boar, affirming, it has all the same good bits that the whole had. He published an edict against the practice of people's kissing each other when they met, and would not allow New Year's gifts to be presented after the calends, the first of January was passed. He had been in the habit of returning these offerings fourfold, and making them with his own hand, but being annoyed by the continual interruption to which he was exposed during the whole month by those who had not the opportunity of attending him on the festival, he returned none after that day. Married woman, guilty of adultery, though not prosecuted publicly, he authorized the nearest relations to punish by agreement among themselves, according to ancient custom. He discharged a Roman knight from the obligation of an oath he had taken, never to turn away his wife, and allowed him to divorce her, upon her being caught in criminal intercourse with her son-in-law. Women of ill fame, divesting themselves of the rights and dignity of matrons, had now begun a practice of professing themselves prostitutes, to avoid the punishment of the laws, and the most profligate young men of the senatorian and equestrian orders, to secure themselves against the decree of the Senate, which prohibited their performing on the stage, or in the amphitheater, voluntarily subjected themselves to an infamous sentence, by which they were degraded. All those he banished, that none for the future might evade by such artifices the intention and efficacy of the law. He stripped the senator of the broad stripes on his robe, upon information of his having removed to his gardens before the calends, the first of July, in order that he might afterwards hire a house cheaper in the city. He likewise dismissed another from the office of Questor, for repudiating, the day after he had been lucky in drawing his lot, a wife whom he had married only the day before. He suppressed all foreign religions, and the Egyptian and Jewish rites, obliging those who practiced that kind of superstition to burn their vestments, and all their sacred utensils. He distributed the Jewish youth, under the pretense of military service, among the provinces, noted for an unhealthy climate, and dismissed from the city all the rest of that nation, as well as those who were proselytes to that religion, under pain of slavery for life, unless they complied. He also expelled the astrologers, but upon their suing for pardon, and promising to renounce their profession, he revoked his decree. End of Tiberius, Part 2「Tiberius, Part 3, of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Vetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Vetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson, and edited by T. Forrester. Tiberius, Part 3. But above all things he was careful to keep the public peace against robbers, burglars, and those who were disaffected to the government. He therefore increased the number of military stations throughout Italy, and formed a camp at Rome for the Praetorian cohorts, which till then had been quartered in the city. He suppressed with great severity all tumults of the people on their first breaking out, and took every precaution to prevent them. Some persons having been killed in a quarrel which happened in the theater, he banished the leaders of the parties and the players about whom the disturbance had arisen, nor could all the entreaties of the people afterwards prevail upon him to recall them. The people of Palentia having refused to permit the removal of the corpse of a centurion of the first rank from the forum until they had extorted from his heirs a sum of money for a public exhibition of gladiators, he detached a cohort from the city, and another from the kingdom of Cotius, who, concealing the cause of their march, entered the town by different gates, with their arms suddenly displayed and trumpets sounding, and having seized the greatest part of the people and the magistrates, they were imprisoned for life. He abolished everywhere the privileges of all places of refuge, 
Cisicentians, having committed an outrage upon some Romans, he deprived them of the liberty they had obtained for their good services in the Mithridatic War. Disturbances from foreign enemies he quelled by his lieutenants, without ever going against them in person, nor would he even employ his lieutenants, but with much reluctance, and when it was absolutely necessary. Princes who were ill-affected towards him he kept in subjection, more by menaces and remonstrances than by force of arms. Some whom he induced to come to him by fair words and promises, he never would permit to return home, as Marabodus, the German, Traskipolis, the Thracian, and Archelaus, the Cappadocian, whose kingdom he even reduced into the form of a province. He never set foot outside the gates of Rome for two years together, from the time he assumed the supreme power, and after that period, went no farther from the city than to some of the neighboring towns, his farthest excursion being to Antium, and that but very seldom, and for a few days, though he often gave out that he would visit the provinces and armies, and made preparations for it almost every year, but taking up carriages and ordering provisions for his retinue in the municipia and colonies. At last he suffered woes to be put up for his good journey and safe return, insomuch that he was called joshously by the name of Callipides, who is famous in a Greek proverb for being in a great hurry to go forward, but without ever advancing a cubit. But after the loss of his two sons, of whom Germanicus died in Syria and Drusus at Rome, he withdrew into Campania, at which time opinion and conversation were almost general that he never would return and would die soon. And both nearly turned out to be true, for indeed he never more came back to Rome, and a few days after leaving it, when he was at a villa of his called the Cave, near Terracina, during supper a great many huge stones fell from above, which killed several of the guests and attendants, but he almost hopelessly escaped. After he had gone round Campania, and dedicated the capital of Capua, and the temple to Augustus at Nola, which he made the pretext of his journey, he retired to Capri, being greatly delighted with the island, because it was accessible only by a narrow beach, being on all sides surrounded with rugged cliffs, of a stupendous height, and by a deep sea. But immediately the people of Rome, being extremely clamorous for his return, on account of a disaster at Fidenae, where upwards of twenty thousand persons had been killed by the fall of the amphitheater, during a public spectacle of gladiators, he crossed over again to the continent, and gave all people free access to him, so much the more because, at his departure from the city, he had caused it to be proclaimed, that no one should address him, and had declined admitting any persons to his presence on the journey. Returning to the island, he so far abandoned all care of the government, that he never filled up the decuriae of the knights, never changed any military tribunes or prefects, or governors of provinces, and kept Spain and Syria for several years without any consular lieutenants. He likewise suffered Armenia to be seized by the Parthians, Moesia by the Dacians and Sarmatians, and Gaul to be ravaged by the Germans, to the great disgrace, and no less danger of the empire. But having now the advantage of privacy, and being remote from the observation of the people of Rome, he abandoned himself to all the vicious propensities which he had long but imperfectly concealed, and of which I shall here give a particular account from the beginning. While a young soldier in the camp, he was so remarkable for his excessive inclination to wine, that, for Tiberius, they called him Biberius, for Claudius, Caldius, and for Nero, Mero. And after he succeeded to the empire, and was invested with the office of reforming the morality of the people, he spent a whole night and two days together, in feasting and drinking, with Pomponius Flaccus and Lucius Piso, to one of whom he immediately gave the province of Syria, and to the other the prefecture of the city, declaring them, in his letters patent, to be very pleasant companions and friends, fit for all occasions. He made an appointment to sup with Cestius Gallus, a lewd and prodigal old fellow, who had been disgraced by Augustus, and reprimanded by himself but a few days before in the senate-house, upon condition that he should not recede in the least 
from his usual method of entertainment, and that they should be attended at table by naked girls. He preferred a very obscure candidate for the questorship before the most noble competitors, only for taking off, in pledging him at table, an amphora of wine at a draught. He presented Asellius Sabinus with two hundred thousand sesterces for writing a dialogue in the way of dispute betwixt the truffle and the fig pecker, the oyster and the thrush. He likewise instituted a new office to administer to his voluptuousness, to which he appointed Titus Caesonius Priscus, a Roman knight. In his retreat at Capri he also contrived an apartment containing couches, and adapted to the secret practice of abominable lewdness, where he entertained companies of girls and catamids, and assembled from all quarters inventors of unnatural copulations, whom he called spintriae, who defiled one another in his presence, to inflame by the exhibition the languid appetite. He had several chambers set round with pictures and statues, in the most lascivious attitudes, and furnished with the books of elephantes, that none might want a pattern for the execution of any lewd project that was prescribed him. He likewise contrived recesses in woods and groves for the gratification of lust, where young persons of both sexes prostituted themselves in caves and hollow rocks, in the disguise of little pans and nymphs, so that he was publicly and commonly called, by an abuse of the name of the island, Caprineus. But he was still more infamous, if possible, for an abomination not fit to be mentioned or heard, much less credited. When a picture, painted by Parhasius, in which the artist had represented Atalanta in the act of submitting to Meleager's lust in a most unnatural way, was bequeathed to him, with this proviso, that if the subject was offensive to him, he might receive in lieu of it a million of sesterces. He not only chose the picture, but hung it up in his bedchamber. It's also reported that, during a sacrifice, he was so captivated with the form of a youth who held a censor, that, before the religious rites were well over, he took him aside and abused him, as also a brother of his, who had been playing the flute, and soon afterwards broke the legs of both of them, for upbraiding one another with their shame. How much he was guilty of a most foul intercourse with women even of the first quality, appeared very plainly by the death of one Malonia, who, being brought to his bed, but resolutely refusing to comply with his lust, he gave her up to the common informers. Even when she was upon her trial, he frequently called out to her, and asked her, Do you repent? Until she, quitting the court, went home, and stabbed herself, openly upbraiding the vile old leecher for his gross obscenity. Hence there was an allusion to him in a farce, which was acted at the next public sports, and was received with great applause, and became a common topic of ridicule, the dulled goat. He was so niggardly and covetous, that he never allowed to his attendants, in his travels and expeditions, any salary, but their diet only. Once indeed he treated them liberally, at the instigation of his stepfather, when, dividing them into three classes according to their rank, he gave the first six, the second four, and the third two hundred thousand sesterces, which last class he called not friends, but Greeks. During the whole time of his government, he never erected any noble edifice, for the only things he did undertake, namely, building the temple of Augustus and restoring Pompey's theater, he left at last, after many years, and finished. Nor did he ever entertain the people with public spectacles, and he was seldom present at those which were given by others, lest anything of that kind should be requested of him, especially after he was obliged to give freedom to the comedian Actus. Having relieved the poverty of a few senators, to avoid further demands, he declared that he should for the future assist none, but those who gave the Senate false satisfaction as to the cause of their necessity. Upon this, most of the needy senators, from modesty and shame, declined troubling him. Amongst these was Hortalus, grandson to the celebrated orator Quintus Hortensius, who, 
marrying by the persuasion of Augustus, had brought up four children upon a very small estate. He displayed only two instances of public munificence. One was an offer to lend gratis, for three years, a hundred millions of sesterces to those who wanted to borrow, and the other, when, some large houses being burned down upon Mount Caelius, he indemnified the owners. To the former of these he was compelled by the clamors of the people, in a great scarcity of money, when he had ratified a decree of the Senate, obliging all money lenders, to advance two-thirds of their capital on land, and the debtors to pay off at once the same proportion of their debts, and it was found insufficient to remedy the grievance. The other he did to alleviate in some degree the pressure of the times. But his benefaction to the sufferers by fire he estimated at so high a rate that he ordered the Caelian hill to be called in future the Augustan. To the soldiery, after doubling the legacy left them by Augustus, he never gave anything except a thousand denarii a man to the Praetorian guards for not joining the party of Sianus, and some presents to the legions in Syria, because they alone had not paid reverence to the effigies of Sejanus among their standards. He seldom gave discharges to the veteran soldiers, calculating on their deaths from advanced age, and on what would be said by thus getting rid of them, in the way of rewards or pensions. Nor did he ever relieve the provinces by any act of generosity, excepting Asia, where some cities had been destroyed by an earthquake. In the course of a very short time he turned his mind to sheer robbery. It's certain that Cnaeus Lentulus, the augur, a man of vast estate, was so terrified and worried by his threats and importunities that he was obliged to make him his heir, and that Lepida, a lady of a very noble family, was condemned by him in order to gratify Quirinus, a man of consular rank, extremely rich and childless, who had divorced her twenty years before, and now charged her with an old design to poison him. Several persons likewise, of the first distinction in Gaul, Spain, Syria, and Greece, had their estates confiscated upon such despicably trifling and shameless pretenses, that against some of them no other charge was preferred, than that they held large sums of ready money as part of their property. All the immunities, the rights of mining and of levying tolls, were taken from several cities and private persons, and Vonones, king of the Parthians, who had been driven out of his dominions by his own subjects, and fled to Antioch with a vast treasure, claiming the protection of the Roman people, his allies, was treacherously robbed of all his money, and afterwards murdered. He first manifested hatred towards his own relations in the case of his brother Drusus, betraying him by the production of a letter to himself, in which Drusus proposed, that Augustus should be forced to restore the public liberty. In course of time, he showed the same disposition with regard to the rest of his family. So far was he from performing any office of kindness or humanity to his wife, when she was banished, and by her father's order confined to one town, that he forbade her to stir out of the house, or converse with any man. He even wronged her of the dowry given her by her father, and of her yearly allowance, by a quibble of law, because Augustus had made no provision for them on her behalf in his will. Being harassed by his mother, Livia, who claimed an equal share in the government with him, he frequently avoided seeing her, and all long and private conferences with her, lest it should be thought that he was governed by her counsels, which, notwithstanding, he sometimes sought, and was in the habit of adopting. He was much offended at the Senate, when they proposed to add to his other titles that of the son of Livia, as well as Augustus. He therefore would not suffer her to be called the mother of her country, nor to receive any extraordinary public distinction. Nay, he frequently admonished her not to meddle with weighty affairs, and such as did not suit her sex. Especially when he found her present at a fire which broke out near the temple of Vesta, and encouraging the people and soldiers to use their utmost exertions, as she had been used to do in the time of her husband. He afterwards proceeded to an open rupture with her, and, as is said upon this occasion, she having frequently urged him to place among the judges a person who had been made free of the city, he refused her request, 
unless she would allow it to be inscribed on the roll that the appointment had been extorted from him by his mother. Enraged at this, Livia brought forth from her chapel some letters from Augustus to her, complaining of the soreness and insolence of Tiberius' temper, and these she read. So much was he offended at these letters having been kept so long, and now produced with so much bitterness against him, that some considered this incident as one of the causes of his going into seclusion, if not the principal reason for his so doing. In the whole year she lived during his retirement, he saw her but once, and that for a few hours only. When she fell sick shortly afterwards, he was quite unconcerned about visiting her in her illness, and when she died, after promising to attend her funeral, he deferred his coming for several days, so that the corpse was in a state of decay and putrefaction before the interment, and he then forbade divine honors being paid to her, pretending that he acted according to her own directions. He likewise annulled her will, and in a short time ruined all her friends and acquaintance, not even sparing those to whom, on her deathbed, she had recommended the care of her funeral, but condemning one of them, a man of equestrian rank, to the treadmill. He entertained no paternal affection either for his own son Drusus or his adopted son Germanicus. Offended at the vices of the former, who was of a loose disposition and led a dissolute life, he was not much affected at his death, but almost immediately after the funeral resumed his attention to business and prevented the courts from being longer closed. The ambassadors from the people of Ilium, coming rather late to offer their condolence, he said to them by way of banter, as if the affair had already faded from his memory, and I heartily condole with you on the loss of your renowned countryman, Hector. He so much affected to depreciate Germanicus, that he spoke of his achievements as utterly insignificant, and railed at his most glorious victories as ruinous to the state, complaining of him also to the senate for going to Alexandria, without his knowledge, upon occasion of a great and sudden famine at Rome. It was believed that he took care to have him dispatched by Cneius Piso, his lieutenant in Syria. This person was afterwards tried for the murder, and would, as was supposed, have produced his orders, had they not been contained in a private and confidential dispatch. The following words, therefore, were posted up in many places, and frequently shouted in the night, Give us back our Germanicus. This suspicion was afterwards confirmed by the barbarous treatment of his wife and children. His daughter-in-law, Agrippina, after the death of her husband, complaining upon some occasion with more than ordinary freedom, he took her by the hand and addressed her in a Greek verse to this effect. My dear child, do you think yourself injured because you are not empress? Nor did he ever wish safe to speak to her again. Upon her refusing once at supper to taste some fruit which he presented to her, he declined inviting her to his table, pretending that she in effect charged him with a design to poison her, whereas the whole was a contrivance of his own. He was to offer the fruit, and she to be privately cautioned against eating what would infallibly cause her death. At last, having her accused of intending to flee for refuge to the statue of Augustus, or to the army, he banished her to the island of Pandataria. Upon her reviling him for it, he caused a centurion to beat out one of her eyes, and when she resolved to starve herself to death, he ordered her mouth to be forced open, and meat to be crammed down her throat. But she persisting in her resolution, and dying soon afterwards, he persecuted her memory, with the basest aspersions, and persuaded the senate to put her birthday among the number of unlucky days in the calendar. He likewise took credit for not having caused her to be strangled, and her body cast upon the Gemonian steps, and suffered a decree of the senate to pass, thanking him for his clemency, and an offering of gold to be made to Jupiter Capitolinus on the occasion. He had by Germanicus three grandsons, Nero, Drusus, and Caius, and by his son Drusus I, named Tiberius. Of these, after the loss of his sons, he commended Nero and Drusus, the two eldest sons of Germanicus, to the senate, and at their being solemnly introduced into the forum, distributed money among the people. 
but when he found that on entering upon the new year they were included in the public vows for his own welfare, he told the Senate that such honors ought not to be conferred but upon those who had been proved and were of more advanced years. By thus betraying his private feelings towards them, he exposed them to all sorts of accusations, and after practicing many artifices to provoke them, to rail at and abuse him, that he might be furnished with a pretense to destroy them, he charged them with it in a letter to the Senate, at the same time accusing them in the bitterest terms of the most scandalous vices. Upon their being declared enemies by the Senate, he starved them to death, Nero in the island of Ponza, and Drusus in the vaults of the Palatium. It is thought by some that Nero was driven to a voluntary death by the executioner showing him some halters and hooks, as if he had been sent to him by order of the Senate. Drusus, it is said, was so rapid with hunger that he attempted to eat the chaff with which his mattress was stuffed. The relics of both were so scattered that it was with difficulty they were collected. Besides his old friends and intimate acquaintance, he required the assistance of twenty of the most eminent persons in the city, as consulars in the administration of public affairs. Out of all this number, scarcely two or three escaped the fury of his savage disposition. All the rest he destroyed upon one pretense or another, and among them Aelius Sejanus, whose fall was attended with the ruin of many others. He had advanced this minister to the highest pitch of grandeur, not so much for any real regard for him, as that by his base and sinister contrivances he might ruin the children of Germanicus, and thereby secure the succession to his own grandson by Drusus. He treated with no greater leniency the Greeks in his family, even those with whom he was most pleased. Having asked one Zeno, upon his using some far-fetched phrases, what uncouth dialect is that? He replied, the Doric. For this answer he banished him to Sinara, suspecting that he taunted him with his former residence at Rhodes, where the Doric dialect is spoken. It being his custom to start questions at supper, arising out of what he had been reading in the day, and finding that Seleucus, the grammarian, used to inquire of his attendants what authors he was then studying, and so came prepared for his inquiries. He first turned him out of his family, and then drove him to the extremity of laying violent hands upon himself. His cruel and sullen temper appeared when he was still a boy, which Theodorus of Gadara, his master in rhetoric, first discovered, and expressed by a very opposite smile, calling him sometimes, when he chid him, mud mixed with blood. But his disposition showed itself still more clearly on his attaining the imperial power, and even in the beginning of his administration, when he was endeavoring to gain the popular favor by affecting moderation. Upon a funeral passing by, a wag called out to the dead man, Tell Augustus that the legacies he bequeathed to the people are not yet paid. The man being brought before him, he ordered that he should receive what was due to him, and then be led to execution, that he might deliver the message to his father himself. Not long afterwards, when one Pompey, a Roman knight, persisted in his opposition to something he proposed in the Senate, he threatened to put him in prison, and told him, Of a Pompey I shall make a Pompeian of you. By a bitter kind of pun playing upon the man's name, and the ill fortune of his party. End of Tiberius, Part 3《The Barriers》Part 4 of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Tiberius, Part 4 About the same time, when the praetor consulted him whether it was his pleasure that the tribunal should take cognizance of accusations of treason, 
he replied, the laws ought to be put in execution, and he did put them in execution most severely. Some person had taken off the head of Augustus from one of his statues and replaced it by another. The matter was brought before the Senate, and because the case was not clear, the witnesses were put to the torture. The party accused being found guilty and condemned, this kind of proceeding was carried so far that it became capital for a man to beat his slave or change his clothes near the statue of Augustus, to carry his head stamped upon the coin or cut in the stone of a ring into a necessary house, or the stews, or to reflect upon anything that had been either said or done by him. In fine, a person was condemned to death for suffering some honors to be decreed to him in the colony where he lived, upon the same day on which they had formerly been decreed to Augustus. He was besides guilty of many barbarous actions, under the pretense of strictness and reformation of manners, but more to gratify his own savage disposition. Some verses were published, which displayed the present calamities of his reign, and anticipated the future. Asper et imitis, breviter vis omnia dicam, despeream, si temater amare potest, non es equus quare, non sunt tibi milia centum, omnia sequaeras et rodus exilium est, Aurea mutaste Saturni saecula Caesar, in columni namte ferrea semper erunt. Fastidit vinum, quia jam, sedit iste cruorem, tam bibit hunc avida, quam bibit antemerum. At spica felicem sibi, non tibi Romule solam, et marium civis at spica sed reducum, nec non Antoni civilia bella momentis. Nec semel infectas ad spice caea de manus, et dic roma perit, regnabit sanquine multo, ad regnum quisquis venib ad exilio. Obdurate wretch, too fierce to fail to move, to least kind yearnings of a mother's love. No knight so art, a having no estate, long suffered so in Rhodes and exile fate. No more the happy golden age we see, the irons come, and short last with thee. Instead of wine he thirst for before, he wallows now in floods of human gore. Reflect ye Romans on the dreadful times, made such by Marius and by Sulla's crimes. Reflect how Antony's ambitious rage, twice scared with horror a distracted age, and say, alas, Rome's blood in streams will flow, when banished miscreants rule this world below. At first he would have it understood, that these satirical verses were drawn forth by the resentment of those who were impatient under the discipline of reformation, rather than that they spoke their real sentiments, and he would frequently say, Let them hate me, so long as they do but approve my conduct. At length, however, his behavior showed that he was sensible they were too well founded. A few days after his arrival at Capri, a fisherman coming up to him unexpectedly when he was desirous of privacy, and presenting him with a large mullet, he ordered the man's face to be scrubbed with the fish, being terrified at the thought of his having been able to creep upon him from the back of the island, over such rugged and steep rocks. The man, while undergoing the punishment, expressing his joy that he had not likewise offered him a large crab, which he had also taken, he ordered his face to be farther lacerated with its claws. He put to death one of the Praetorian guards, for having stolen a peacock out of his orchard. In one of his journeys, his litter being obstructed by some bushes, he ordered the officer, whose duty it was to ride on and examine the road, a centurion of the first cohorts, to be laid on his face upon the ground, and scourged almost to death. Soon afterwards he abandoned himself to every species of cruelty, never wanting occasions of one kind or another to serve as a pretext. He first fell upon the friends and acquaintances of his mother, then those of his grandsons and his daughter-in-law, and lastly those of Sejanus, after whose death he became cruel in an extreme. From this it appeared that he had not been so much instigated by Sejanus, as supplied with occasions of gratifying his savage temper when he wanted them. Though in a short memoir, which he composed of his own life, he had the effrontery to write, 
I have punished Sejanus, because I found him bent upon the destruction of the children of my son Germanicus. One of these he put to death, when he began to suspect Sejanus, and another after he was taken off. It would be tedious to relate all the numerous instances of his cruelty. Suffice it to give a few examples in their different kinds. Not a day passed without the punishment of some person or other, not excepting holidays, or those appropriated to the worship of the gods. Some were tried even on New Year's Day. Of many who were condemned, their wives and children shared the same fate, and for those who were sentenced to death, the relations were forbid to put on mourning. Considerable rewards were voted for the prosecutors, and sometimes for the witnesses also. The information of any person, without exception, was taken, and all offences were capital, even speaking a few words, though without any ill intention. A poet was charged with abusing Agamemnon, and a historian for calling Brutus and Cassius the last of the Romans. The two authors were immediately called to account, and their writings suppressed, though they had been well received some years before, and read in the hearing of Augustus. Some who were thrown into prison were not only denied the solace of study, but debarred from all company and conversation. Many persons, when summoned to trial, stabbed themselves at home, to avoid the distress and ignominy of a public condemnation, which they were certain would ensue. Others took poison in the Senate House. The wounds were bound up, and all who had not expired were carried, half dead, and panting for life to prison. Those who were put to death were thrown down the Gemonian stairs, and then dragged into the Tiber. In one day twenty were treated in this manner, and amongst them women and boys. Because, according to an ancient custom, it was not lawful to strangle virgins, the young girls were first deflowered by the executioner, and afterwards strangled. Those who were desirous to die were forced to live, for he saw death so slight a punishment, that upon hearing that Carnulius, one of the accused, who was under persecution, had killed himself, he exclaimed, Carnulius has escaped me. In calling over his prisoners, when one of them requested the favor of a speedy death, he replied, You are not yet restored to favor. A man of consular rank writes in his annals that at table, where he himself was present with a large company, he was suddenly asked aloud by a dwarf, who stood by amongst the buffins, why Paconius, who was under prosecution for treason, lived so long. Tiberius immediately reprimanded him for his pertinence, but wrote to the Senate a few days after, to proceed without delay to the punishment of Paconius. Exasperated by information he received respecting the death of his son Drusus, he carried his cruelty still farther. He imagined that he had died of a disease occasioned by his intemperance, but finding that he had been poisoned by the contrivance of his wife Livilla and Sejanus, he spared no one from torture and death. He was so entirely occupied with the examination of this affair for whole days together, that upon being informed that the person in whose house he had lodged at Rhodes, and whom he had by a friendly letter invited to Rome, was arrived, he ordered him immediately to be put to the torture, as a party concerned in the inquiry. Upon finding his mistake, he commanded him to be put to death, that he might not publish the injury done him. The place of execution is still shown at Capri, where he ordered those who were condemned to die, after long and exquisite tortures, to be thrown before his eyes from a precipice into the sea. There a party of soldiers belonging to the fleet waited for them, and broke their bones with poles and oars, lest they should have any life left in them. Among various kinds of torture invented by him, one was to induce people to drink a large quantity of wine, and then to tie up their members with harp strings, thus tormenting them at once by the tightness of the ligature and the stoppage of their urine. Had not death prevented him, and Thrasyllus, designedly, as some say, prevailed with him to defer some of his cruelties, in hopes of longer life. It's believed that he would have destroyed many more, and not have spared even the rest of his grandchildren. For he was jealous of Caius, and hated Tiberius, as having been conceived in adultery. 
This conjecture is indeed highly probable, for he used often to say, Happy Priam, who survived all his children. Amidst these enormities, in how much fear and apprehension, as well as odium and detestation he lived, is evident from many indications. He forbade the soothsayers to be consulted in private, and without some witnesses being present. He attempted to suppress the oracles in the neighborhood of the city, but being terrified by the divine authority of the Prionistine lots, he abandoned the design. For though they were sealed up in a box and carried to home, yet they were not to be found in it until it was returned to the temple. More than one person of consular rank appointed governors of provinces, he never ventured to dismiss to their respective destinations, but kept them until several years after, when he nominated their successors, while they still remained present with him. In the meantime they bore the title of their office, and he frequently gave them orders, which they took care to have executed by their deputies and assistants. He never removed his daughter-in-law or grandsons after their condemnation to any place, but in fetters and in a covered litter, with a guard to hinder all who met them on the road and travelers from stopping to gaze at them. After Sejanus had plotted against him, though he saw that this birthday was solemnly kept by the public, and divine honors paid to golden images of him in every quarter, yet it was this difficulty at last, and more by artifice than his imperial power, that he accomplished his death. In the first place to remove him from about his person, under the pretext of doing him honor, he made him his colleague in his fifth consulship, which, although then absent from the city, he took upon him for that purpose, long after his preceding consulship. Then, having flattered him with the hope of an alliance by marriage with one of his own kindred, and the prospect of the tribunitian authority, he suddenly, while Sejanus little expected it, charged him with treason, in an abject and pitiful address to the senate, in which, among other things, he begged them, to send one of the consuls to conduct himself a poor solitary old man with a guard of soldiers into their presence. Still distrustful, however, and apprehensive of an insurrection, he ordered his grandson Drusus, whom he still kept in confinement at Rome, to be set at liberty, and if occasion required, to head the troops. He had likewise ships in readiness to transport him to any of the legions to which he might consider it expedient to make his escape. Meanwhile he was upon the watch, from the summit of the lofty cliff, for the signals which he had ordered to be made, if anything occurred, lest the messenger should be tardy. Even when he had quite foiled the conspiracy of Sejanus, he was still haunted as much as ever with fears and apprehensions, insomuch that he never once steered out of the Villa Jovis for nine months after. To the extreme anxiety of mind, which he now experienced, he had the mortification to find, superadded, the most poignant reproaches from all quarters. Those who were condemned to die heaped upon him the most opprobrious language in his presence, or by handbills scattered in the senator seats in the theatre. These produced different effects. Sometimes he wished, out of shame, to have all smothered and concealed, at other times he would disregard what was said, and publish it himself. To this accumulation of scandal and open sarcasm, there is to be subjoined a letter from Artabanus, king of the Parthians, in which he abrades him with his parasites, murders, cowardice, and lewdness, and advises him to satisfy the furious rage of his own people, which he had so justly excited, by putting an end to his life without delay. At last, being quite weary of himself, he acknowledged his extreme misery in a letter to the Senate, which began thus. What to write to you, conscript fathers, or how to write, or what not to write at this time? May all the gods and goddesses pour upon my head a more terrible vengeance than that under which I feel myself daily thinking, if I can tell. Some are of opinion that he had a foreign knowledge of those things, from his skill in the science of divination, and perceived long before what misery and infamy would at last come upon him, and that for this reason, at the beginning of his reign, he had absolutely refused the title of the father of his country, 
and the proposal of the senate to swear to his acts lest he should afterwards to his greater shame be found unequal to such extraordinary honors this indeed may be justly inferred from the speeches which he made upon both those occasions as when he says i shall ever be the same and shall never change my conduct so long as i retain my senses but to avoid giving a bad precedent to posterity the senate ought to beware of binding themselves to the acts of any person whatever who might by some accident or other be induced to alter them and again if you should at any time entertain a jealousy of my conduct and my entire affection for you which heaven prevent by putting a period to my days rather than i should live to see such an alteration in your opinion of me the title of father will add no honor to me but be a reproach to you for your rashness in conferring it upon me or inconstancy in altering your opinion of me in person he was large and robust of a stature somewhat above the common size broad in the shoulders and chest and proportionable in the rest of his frame he used his left hand more readily and with more force than his right and his joints were so strong that he could bore a fresh sound apple through with his finger and wound the head of a boy or even a young man with a fillet he was of a fair complexion and wore his hair so long behind that it covered his neck which was observed to be a mark of distinction affected by the family he had a handsome face but it was often full of pimples his eyes which were large had the wonderful faculty of seeing in the night time and in the dark for a short time only and immediately after awaking from sleep but they soon grew dim again he walked with his neck stiff and upright generally with a frowning countenance being for the most part silent when he spoke to those about him it was very slowly and usually accompanied with a slight gesticulation of his fingers all which being repulsive habits and signs of arrogance were remarked by augustus who often endeavored to excuse them to the senate and people declaring that they were natural defects which proceeded from no viciousness of mind he enjoyed a good state of health without interruption almost during the whole period of his rule though from the thirtieth year of his age he treated it himself according to his own discretion without any medical assistance in regard to the gods and matters of religion he discovered much indifference being greatly addicted to astrology and fully persuaded that all things were governed by fate yet he was extremely afraid of lightning and when the sky was in a disturbed state always wore a laurel crown on his head because it is supposed that the leaf of that tree is never touched by the lightning he applied himself with great diligence to the liberal arts both greek and latin in his latin style he affected to imitate messala corvinus a venerable man to whom he had paid much respect in his own early years but he rendered his style obscure by excessive affectation and abstruseness so that he was thought to speak better extempore than in a premeditated discourse he composed likewise a lyric ode under the title of a lamentation upon the death of lucius caesar and also some greek poems in imitation of euphorion rianus and parthenius these poets he greatly admired and placed their works and statues in the public libraries amongst the eminent authors of antiquity on this account most of the learned men of the time veered with each other in publishing observations upon them which they addressed to him his principal study however was the history of the fabulous ages inquiring even into its trifling details in a ridiculous manner for he used to try the grammarians a class of men which as i have already observed he much affected with such questions as these who was hecuba's mother what name did achilles assume among the virgins what was it that the sirens used to sing on the first day that he entered the senate house after the death of augustus as if he intended to pay respect at once to his father's memory and to the gods he made an offering of frankincense and wine but without any music in imitation of minos upon the death of his son though he was ready and conversant with the greek tongue 
yet he did not use it everywhere, but chiefly he avoided it in the Senate House, insomuch that having occasion to employ the word monopolium, monopoly, he first begged pardon for being obliged to adopt a foreign word. And when in a decree of the Senate the word emblema, emblem, was read, he proposed to have it changed, and that the Latin word should be substituted in its room, or, if no proper one could be found, to express the thing by circumlocution. A soldier who was examined as a witness upon a trial, in Greek, he would not allow to reply except in Latin. During the whole time of his seclusion at Capri, twice only he made an effort to visit Rome. Once he came in a galley as far as the gardens near the Naumachia, but placed guards along the banks of the Tiber, to keep off all who should offer to come to meet him. The second time he travelled on the Appian Way, as far as the seventh milestone from the city, but he immediately returned without entering it, having only taken a view of the walls at a distance. For what reason he did not disembark in his first excursion is uncertain, but in the last he was deterred from entering the city by a prodigy. He was in the habit of diverting himself with a snake, and upon going to feed it with his own hand, according to custom, he found it devoured by ants, from which he was advised to beware of the fury of the mob. On this account, returning in all haste to Campania, he fell ill at Astura, but recovering a little, went on to Circei, and to obviate any suspicion of his being in a bad state of health, he was not only present at the sports in the camp, but encountered with javelins a wild boar, which was let loose in the arena. Being immediately seized with a pain in the side, and catching cold upon his overheating himself in the exercise, he relapsed into a worse condition than he was before. He held out, however, for some time, and sailing as far as Missenum, omitted nothing in his usual mode of life, not even in his entertainments and other gratifications, partly from an ungovernable appetite, and partly to conceal his condition. For Heracles, a physician, having obtained leave of absence on his rising from table, took his hand to kiss it, upon which Tiberius, supposing he did it to feel his pulse, desired him to stay and resume his place, and continued the entertainment longer than usual. Nor did he omit his usual custom of taking his station in the centre of the apartment, a lictor standing by him, while he took leave of each of the party by name. Meanwhile, finding, upon looking over the acts of the Senate, that some person under prosecution had been discharged without being brought to a hearing, for he had only written cursorily that they had been denounced by an informer, he complained in a great rage that he was treated with contempt, and resolved at all hazards to return to Capri, not daring to attempt anything until he found himself in a place of security. But being detained by storms, and the increasing violence of his disorder, he died shortly afterwards, at a villa formerly belonging to Lucullus, in the seventy-eighth year of his age, and the twenty-third of his reign, upon the seventeenth of the calends of April, sixteenth March, in the consulship of Cneius Acheronius Proculus and Caius Pontius Niger. Some think that a slow-consuming poison was given him by Caius. Others say that during the interval of the intermittent fever with which he happened to be seized, upon asking for food, it was denied him. Others report that he was stifled by a pillow thrown upon him, when, on his recovering from a swoon, he called for his ring, which had been taken from him in the fit. Seneca writes that, finding himself dying, he took his signet ring off his finger, and held it a while, as if he would deliver it to somebody, but put it again upon his finger, and lay for some time, with his left hand clenched, and without stirring, when suddenly summoning his attendants, and no one answering the call, he rose, but his strength failing him, he fell down at a short distance from his bed. Upon his last birthday he had brought a full-sized statue of the Timenian Apollo from Syracuse, a work of exquisite art, intending to place it in the library of the new temple. But he dreamed that the god appeared to him in the night, and assured him that his statue could not be erected by him. A few days before he died, the pharos at Capri was thrown down by an earthquake, 
and that Misenum, some embers and live coals, which were brought in to warm his apartment, went out, and after being quite cold, burst out into a flame again towards evening, and continued burning very brightly for several hours. The people were so much elated at his death, that when they first heard the news, they ran up and down the city, some crying out, Away with Tiberius to the Tiber, others exclaiming, May the earth, the common mother of mankind, and the infernal gods, allow him no abode in death, but amongst the wicked. Others threatened his body with the hook and the gemonian stairs, their indignation at his former cruelty being increased by recent atrocity. It had been provided by an act of the Senate that the execution of condemned criminals should always be deferred until the tenth day after the sentence. Now this fell on the very day when the news of Tiberius' death arrived, and in consequence of which the unhappy men implored a reprieve for mercy's sake. But as Caius had not yet arrived, and there was no one else to whom application could be made on their behalf, their guards, apprehensive of violating the law, strangled them, and threw them down the Gemonian stairs. This roused the people to a still greater abhorrence of the tyrant's memory, since his cruelty continued in use even after he was dead. As soon as his corpse was begun to be moved from Misenum, many cried out for its being carried to Atella, and being half burnt there in the amphitheatre. It was, however, brought to Rome, and burnt with the usual ceremony. He had made about two years before duplicates of his will, one written by his own hand, and the other by that of one of his freedmen, and both were witnessed by some persons of very mean rank. He appointed his two grandsons, Caius by Germanicus and Tiberius by Drusus, joint heirs to his estate, and upon the death of one of them, the other was to inherit the whole. He gave likewise many legacies, amongst which were bequests to the Vestal Virgins, to all the soldiers, and each one of the people of Rome, and to the magistrates of the several quarters of the city. End of Tiberius One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Caligula, Part 1. Germanicus, the father of Caius Caesar, and son of Drusus and the younger Antonia, was, after his adoption by Tiberius, his uncle, preferred to the quaestorship five years before he had attained the legal age, and immediately upon the expiration of that office, to the consulship. Having been sent to the army in Germany, he restored order among the legions, who, upon the news of Augustus's death, obstinately refused to acknowledge Tiberius as emperor, and offered to place him at the head of the state. In which affair it is difficult to say whether his regard to filial duty, or the firmness of his resolution, was most conspicuous. Soon afterwards he defeated the enemy, and obtained the honours of a triumph. Being then made consul for the second time, before he could enter upon his office, he was obliged to set out suddenly for the east, where, after he had conquered the king of Armenia, and reduced Cappadocia into the form of a province, he died at Antioch, of a lingering distemper, in the thirty-fourth year of his age, not without the suspicion of being poisoned. For besides the livid spots which appeared all over his body, and a foaming at the mouth, when his corpse was burnt, the heart was found entire among the bones, its nature being such, as it is supposed, that when tainted by poison, it is indestructible by fire. It was a prevailing opinion that he was taken off by the contrivance of Tiberius, and through the means of Gnaeus Piso. This person, who was about the same time prefect of Syria, 
and made no secret of his position being such that he must either offend the father or the son, loaded Germanicus, even during his sickness, with the most unbounded and scurrilous abuse, both by word and deed, for which, upon his return to Rome, he narrowly escaped being torn to pieces by the people, and was condemned to death by the Senate. It is generally agreed that Germanicus possessed all the noblest endowments of body and mind in a higher degree than had ever before fallen to the lot of any man. A handsome person, extraordinary courage, great proficiency in eloquence and other branches of learning, both Greek and Roman, besides a singular humanity and a behaviour so engaging as to captivate the affections of all about him. The slenderness of his legs did not correspond with the symmetry and beauty of his person in other respects, but this defect was at length corrected by his habit of riding after meals. In battle he often engaged and slew an enemy in single combat. He pleaded causes, even after he had the honour of a triumph. Among other fruits of his studies he left behind him some Greek comedies. Both at home and abroad he always conducted himself in a manner the most unassuming. On entering any free and confederate town he never would be attended by his lictors. Whenever he heard, in his travels, of the tombs of illustrious men, he made offerings over them to the infernal deities. He gave a common grave, under a mound of earth, to the scattered relics of the legionaries slain under Varus and was the first to put his hand to the work of collecting and bringing them to the place of burial. He was so extremely mild and gentle to his enemies, whoever they were, or on what account soever they bore him enmity, that, although Piso rescinded his decrees, and for a long time severely harassed his dependence, he never showed the smallest resentment, until he found himself attacked by magical charms and imprecations, and even then, the only steps he took was to renounce all friendship with him, according to ancient custom, and to exhort his servants to avenge his death, if anything untoward should befall him. He reaped the fruit of his noble qualities in abundance, being so much esteemed and beloved by his friends, that Augustus, to say nothing of his other relations, being a long time in doubt, whether he should not appoint him his successor, at last ordered Tiberius to adopt him. He was so extremely popular that many authors tell us the crowds of those who went to meet him upon his coming to any place, or to attend him at his departure, were so prodigious that he was sometimes in danger of his life, and that upon his return from Germany, after he had quelled the mutiny in the army there, all the cohorts of the Praetorian Guards marched out to meet him, notwithstanding the order that only two should go, and that all the people of Rome, both men and women, of every age, sex and rank, flocked as far as the twentieth milestone to attend his entrance. At the time of his death, however, and afterwards, they displayed still greater and stronger proofs of their extraordinary attachment to him. The day on which he died, stones were thrown at the temples, the altars of the gods demolished, the household gods in some cases thrown into the streets, and newborn infants exposed. It is even said that barbarous nations, both those engaged in intestine wars and those in hostilities against us, all agreed to a cessation of arms, as if they had been mourning for some very near and common friend, that some petty kings shaved their beards and their wives' heads, in token of their extreme sorrow, and that the king of kings forbore his exercise of hunting and feasting with his nobles, which, amongst the Parthians, is equivalent to a cessation of all business in a time of public mourning with us. At Rome, upon the first news of his sickness, the city was thrown into great consternation and grief, waiting impatiently for further intelligence, when suddenly, in the evening, a report, 
without any certain author, was spread that he was recovered, upon which the people flocked with torches and victims to the capital, and were in such haste to pay the vows they had made for his recovery, that they almost broke open the doors. Tiberius was roused from out of his sleep, with the noise of the people congratulating one another, and singing about the streets, Salve Roma! Salve Patria! Salvus est Germanicus! Rome is safe! Our country safe! For our Germanicus is safe! But when certain intelligence of his death arrived, the mourning of the people could neither be assuaged by consolation, nor restrained by edicts, and it continued during the holidays in the month of December. The atrocities of the subsequent times contributed much to the glory of Germanicus and the endearment of his memory, all people supposing, and with reason, that the fear and awe of him had laid a restraint upon the cruelty of Tiberius, which broke out soon afterwards. Germanicus married Agrippina, the daughter of Marcus Agrippa and Julia, by whom he had nine children, two of whom died in their infancy, and another a few years after, a sprightly boy, whose effigy in the character of a Cupid, Livia set up in the temple of Venus in the capital. Augustus also placed another statue of him in his bedchamber, and used to kiss it as often as he entered the apartment. The rest survived their father, three daughters, Agrippina, Drusilla, and Livilla, who were born in three successive years, and as many sons, Nero, Drusus, and Caius Caesar. Nero and Drusus, at the accusation of Tiberius, were declared public enemies. Caius Caesar was born on the day before the Calends of September, at the time his father and Caius Fontius Capito were consuls. But where he was born is rendered uncertain from the number of places which are said to have given him birth. Gnaeus Lentulus Gaetulicus says that he was born at Tiber. Pliny the Younger, in the country of the Treveri, at a village called Ambiatinus, above Confluentes, and he alleges as a proof of it that altars are there shown with this inscription for Agrippina's childbirth. Some verses which were published in his reign intimate that he was born in the winter quarters of the legions. In Castris Natus, Patrius Notritius in Armis, Iam designati Principis Omen Erat. Born in the camp, and trained in every toil, which taught his sire the haughtiest foes to foil, destined he seemed by fate to raise his name, and rule the empire with Augustan fame. I find in the public registers that he was born at Antium. Pliny charges Gertulicus as guilty of an arrant forgery, merely to soothe the vanity of a conceited young prince, by giving him the luster of being born in a city sacred to Hercules, and says that he advanced this false assertion with the more assurance because the year before the birth of Caius, Germanicus had a son of the same name born at Tiber, concerning whose amiable childhood and premature death I have already spoken. Dates clearly prove that Pliny is mistaken, for the writers of Augustus's history all agree that Germanicus, at the expiration of his consulship, was sent into Gaul after the birth of Caius. Nor will the inscription upon the altar serve to establish Pliny's opinion, because Agrippina was delivered of two daughters in that country, and any childbirth, without regard to sex, is called puerperium, as the ancients were used to call girls pueri and boys pueli. There is also extant a letter written by Augustus, a few months before his death, to his granddaughter Agrippina about the same Caius for there was then no other child of hers living under that name. He writes as follows, I gave orders yesterday for Talarius and Acelius to set out on their journey towards you, if the gods permit, with your child Caius, upon the 15th of the calends of June, 
I also send with him a physician of mine, and I wrote to Germanicus that he may retain him if he pleases. Farewell, my dear Agrippina, and take what care you can to come safe and well to your Germanicus. I imagine it is sufficiently evident that Caius could not be born at a place to which he was carried from the city when almost two years old. The same considerations must likewise invalidate the evidence of the verses, and the rather because the author is unknown. The only authority, therefore, upon which we can depend in this matter is that of the Acts and the public register, especially as he always preferred Antium to every other place of retirement and entertained for it all that fondness which is commonly attached to one's native soil. It is said, too, that upon his growing weary of the city, he designed to have transferred thither the seat of empire. It was to the jokes of the soldiers in the camp that he owed the name of Caligula, he having been brought up among them in the dress of a common soldier. How much his education amongst them recommended him to their favour and affection was sufficiently apparent in the mutiny upon the death of Augustus when the mere sight of him appeased their fury, though it had risen to a great height. For they persisted in it, until they observed that he was sent away to a neighbouring city, to secure him against all danger. Then at last they began to relent, and, stopping the chariot in which he was conveyed, earnestly deprecated the odium to which such a proceeding would expose them. He likewise attended his father in his expedition to Syria. After his return, he lived first with his mother, and, when she was banished, with his great-grandmother, Livia Augusta, in praise of whom, after her decease, though then only a boy, he pronounced a funeral oration in the rostra. He was then transferred to the family of his grandmother, Antonia, and afterwards, in the twentieth year of his age, being called by Tiberius to Capri, he in one and the same day assumed the manly habit, and shaved his beard, but without receiving any of the honours which had been paid to his brothers on a similar occasion. While he remained in that island, many insidious artifices were practised to extort from him complaints against Tiberius but by his circumspection he avoided falling into the snare. He affected to take no more notice of the ill-treatment of his relations than if nothing had befallen them. With regard to his own sufferings, he seemed utterly insensible of them, and behaved with such obsequiousness to his grandfather, and all about him, that it was justly said of him, There never was a better servant nor a worse master. But he could not, even then, conceal his natural disposition to cruelty and lewdness. He delighted in witnessing the infliction of punishments, and frequented taverns and bawdy houses in the night-time, disguised in a periwig and a long coat, and was passionately addicted to the theatrical arts of singing and dancing. All these levities Tiberius readily connived at, in hopes that they might perhaps correct the roughness of his temper, which the sagacious old man so well understood that he often said, That Caius was destined to be the ruin of himself and all mankind, and that he was rearing a hydra for the people of Rome and a phyton for all the world. Not long afterwards, he married Junia Claudilla, the daughter of Marcus Silanus, a man of the highest rank. Being then chosen augur in the room of his brother Drusus, before he could be inaugurated, he was advanced to the pontificate, with no small commendation of his dutiful behaviour and great capacity. The situation of the court likewise was at this time favourable to his fortunes, as it was now left destitute of support. Sejanus being suspected, and soon afterwards taken off, and he was by degrees flattered with the hope of succeeding Tiberius in the empire. In order more effectually to secure this object, 
Upon Junior's dying in childbed, he engaged in a criminal commerce with Enia Nivea, the wife of Macro, at that time prefect of the Praetorian cohorts, promising to marry her if he became emperor, to which he bound himself, not only by an oath, but by a written obligation under his hand. Having by her means insinuated himself into Macro's favour, some are of opinion that he attempted to poison Tiberius, and ordered his ring to be taken from him before the breath was out of his body, and that, because he seemed to hold it fast, he caused a pillow to be thrown upon him, squeezing him by the throat at the same time with his own hand. One of his freedmen crying out at this horrid barbarity, he was immediately crucified. These circumstances are far from being improbable, as some authors relate that, afterwards, though he did not acknowledge his having her hand in the death of Tiberius, yet he frankly declared that he had formerly entertained such a design, and, as a proof of his affection for his relations, he would frequently boast that, to revenge the death of his mother and brothers, he had entered the chamber of Tiberius, when he was asleep, with a poniard, but being seized with a fit of compassion, threw it away and retired, and that Tiberius, though aware of his intention, durst not make any inquiries or attempt revenge. Having thus secured the imperial power, he fulfilled by his elevation the wish of the Roman people, I may venture to say, of all mankind. For he had long been the object of expectation and desire to the greater part of the provincials and soldiers who had known him when a child, and to the whole people of Rome from their affection for the memory of Germanicus, his father, and compassion for the family almost entirely destroyed. Upon his moving from Mycenaeum, therefore, although he was in mourning, and following the corpse of Tiberius, he had to walk amidst altars, victims, and lighted torches, with prodigious crowds of people everywhere attending him, in transports of joy, and calling him, besides other auspicious names, by those of their star, their chick, their pretty puppet, and Bantling. Immediately on his entering the city, by the joint acclamations of the senate and people who broke into the senate house, Tiberius's will was set aside, it having left his other grandson, then a minor, co-heir with him. The whole government and administration of affairs was placed in his hands, so much to the joy and satisfaction of the public, that in less than three months after, above a hundred and sixty thousand victims are said to have been offered in sacrifice. Upon his going, a few days afterwards, to the nearest islands on the coast of Campania, vows were made for his safe return, every person emulously testifying their care and concern for his safety. And when he fell ill, the people hung about the Placium all night long, some vowed, in public handbills, to risk their lives in the combats of the amphitheatre, and others to lay them down for his recovery. To this extraordinary love, entertained for him by his countrymen, was added an uncommon regard by foreign nations. Even Artabanus, king of the Parthians, who had always manifested hatred and contempt for Tiberius, solicited his friendship, came to hold a conference with his consular lieutenant, and passing the Euphrates, paid the highest honours to the eagles, the Roman standards, and the images of the Caesars. Caligula himself inflamed this devotion, by practising all the arts of popularity. After he had delivered, with floods of tears, a speech in praise of Tiberius, and buried him with the utmost pomp, he immediately hastened over to Pandateria and the Pontian Islands, to bring thence the ashes of his mother and brother, and to testify the great regard he had for their memory, he performed the voyage in a very tempestuous season. He approached their remains with profound veneration, and deposited them in the urns with his own hands. 
having brought them in grand solemnity to Ostia, with an ensign flying in the stern of the galley, and thence up the Tiber to Rome, they were borne by persons of the first distinction in the equestrian order, on two byres into the mausoleum at noonday. He appointed yearly offerings to be solemnly and publicly celebrated to their memory, besides Circensian games to that of his mother, and a chariot with her image to be included in the procession. The month of September he called Germanicus in honour of his father. By a single decree of the Senate he heaped upon his grandmother Antonia all the honours which had been ever conferred on the Empress Livia. His uncle Claudius, who till then continued in the equestrian order, he took for his colleague in the consulship. He adopted his brother Tiberius on the day he took upon him the manly habit, and conferred upon him the title of Prince of the Youths. As for his sisters, he ordered these words to be added to the oaths of allegiance to himself. Nor will I hold myself or my own children more dear than I do Caius and his sisters, and commanded all resolutions proposed by the consuls in the Senate to be prefaced thus. May what we are going to do prove fortunate and happy to Caius Caesar and his sisters. With the like popularity he restored all those who had been condemned and banished, and granted an act of indemnity against all impeachments and past offences. To relieve the informers and witnesses against his mother and brothers from all apprehension, he brought the records of their trials into the forum, and there burnt them, calling loudly on the gods to witness that he had not read or handled them. A memorial which was offered him relative to his own security he would not receive, declaring, that he had done nothing to make any one his enemy, and said, at the same time, he had no ears for informers. The Spintriae, those panderers to unnatural lusts, he banished from the city, being prevailed upon not to throw them into the sea, as he had intended. The writings of Titus Labienus, Cortus Cremutius, and Cassius Severus, which had been suppressed by an act of the Senate, he permitted to be drawn from obscurity and universally read, observing that it would be for his own advantage to have the transactions of former times delivered to posterity. He published accounts of the proceedings of the government, a practice which had been introduced by Augustus, but discontinued by Tiberius. He granted the magistrates a full and free jurisdiction, without any appeal to himself. He made a very strict and exact review of the Roman knights, but conducted it with moderation, publicly depriving of his horse every knight who lay under the stigma of anything base and dishonourable, but passing over the names of those knights who were only guilty of venial faults in calling over the list of the order. To lighten the labours of the judges, he added a fifth class, to the former four. He attempted likewise to restore to the people their ancient right of voting in the choice of magistrates. He paid very honourably, and without any dispute, the legacies left by Tiberius in his will, though it had been set aside, as likewise those left by the will of Livia Augusta, which Tiberius had annulled. He remitted the hundredth penny due to the government in all auctions throughout Italy, he made up to many their losses sustained by fire, and when he restored their kingdoms to any princes, he likewise allowed them all the arrears of the taxes and revenues which had accrued in the interval, as in the case of Antiochus of Comagene, where the confiscation would have amounted to a hundred millions of sesterces. To prove to the world that he was ready to encourage good examples of every kind, he gave to a freedwoman eighty thousand sesterces, for not discovering a crime committed by her patron, though she had been put to exquisite torture for that purpose. For all these acts of beneficence, amongst other honours, a golden shield was decreed to him, which the colleges of priests were to carry annually, upon a fixed day into the capital, with the senate attending, and the youth of the nobility, of both sexes, celebrating the praise of his virtues in songs. 
it was likewise ordained that the day on which he succeeded to the empire should be called Palilia, in token of the city's being at that time, as it were, new-founded. He held the consulship four times. The first from the calends of July for two months, the second from the calends of January for thirty days, the third until the Ides of January, and the fourth until the seventh of the same Ides. Of these, the two last he held successively. The third he assumed by his sole authority at Lyon, not, as some are of opinion, from arrogance or neglect of rules, but because at that distance it was impossible for him to know that his colleague had died a little before the beginning of the new year. He twice distributed to the people a bounty of three hundred sesterces a man, and as often gave a splendid feast to the senate and the equestrian order, with their wives and children. In the latter he presented to the men forensic garments, and to the women and children purple scarves. To make a perpetual addition to the public joy for ever, he added to the Saturnalia one day, which he called Juvenalis. He exhibited some combats of gladiators, either in the amphitheatre of Taurus, or in the scepter, with which he intermingled troops of the best pugilists from Campania and Africa. He did not always preside in person upon these occasions, but sometimes gave a commission to magistrates or friends to supply his place. He frequently entertained the people with stage plays of various kinds, and in several parts of the city, and sometimes by night, when he caused the whole city to be lighted. He likewise gave various things to be scrambled for among the people, and distributed to every man a basket of bread with other victuals. Upon this occasion he sent his own chair to a Roman knight who was seated opposite to him, and was enjoying himself by eating heartily. To a senator who was doing the same he sent an appointment of Praetor Extraordinary. He likewise exhibited a great number of Circensian games from morning until night, intermixed with the hunting of wild beasts from Africa, or the Trojan exhibition. Some of these games were celebrated with peculiar circumstances, the circus being overspread with vermilion and chrysolite, and none drove in the chariot races who were not of the senatorian order. For some of these he suddenly gave the signal, when, upon his viewing from the Gelotiana the preparations in the circus, he was asked to do so by a few persons in the neighbouring galleries. He invented besides a new kind of spectacle, such as had never been heard of before, for he made a bridge, of about three miles and a half in length, from Baiae to the Mole of Putioli, collecting trading vessels from all quarters, mooring them in two rows by their anchors, and spreading earth upon them to form a viaduct, after the fashion of the Appian Way. This bridge he crossed and recrossed for two days together, the first day mounted on a horse richly caparisoned, wearing on his head a crown of oak leaves, armed with a battle-axe, a Spanish buckler, and a sword, and in a cloak made of cloth of gold. The day following, in the habit of a charioteer, standing in a chariot drawn by two hybrid horses, having with him a young boy, Darius by name, one of the Parthian hostages, with a cohort of the Praetorian guards attending him and a party of his friends in cars of Gaulish make. Most people, I know, are of opinion that this bridge was designed by Caius in imitation of Xerxes, who, to the astonishment of the world, laid a bridge over the Hellespont, which is somewhat narrower than the distance betwixt Baiae and Puteoli. Others, however, thought that he did it to strike terror in Germany and Britain, which he was upon the point of invading, by the fame of some prodigious work. But for myself, when I was a boy, I heard my grandfather say that the reason assigned by some courtiers who were in habits of the greatest intimacy with him was this. When Tiberius was in some anxiety about the nomination of a successor, and rather inclined to pitch upon his grandson, Thrasyllus the astrologer had assured him, that Caius would no more be emperor than he would ride on horseback across the Gulf of Baiae. 
He likewise exhibited public diversions in Sicily, Grecian games at Syracuse, and Attic plays at Lyon in Gaul, besides a contest for preeminence in the Grecian and Roman eloquence, in which we are told that such as were baffled bestowed rewards upon the best performers, and were obliged to compose speeches in their praise, but that those who performed the worst were forced to blot out what they had written with a sponge or their tongue, unless they preferred to be beaten with a rod, or plunged over head and ears into the nearest river. He completed the works which were left unfinished by Tiberius, namely the Temple of Augustus and the Theatre of Pompey. He began likewise the aqueduct from the neighbourhood of Tiber, at an amphitheatre near the Scepter, of which works one was completed by his successor Claudius, and the other remained as he left it. The walls of Syracuse, which had fallen to decay by length of time, he repaired, as he likewise did the temples of the gods. He formed plans for rebuilding the palace of Polycrates at Samos, finishing the temple of the Didymian Apollo at Miletus, and building a town on a ridge of the Alps, but above all for cutting through the isthmus in Achaea, and even sent a centurion of the first rank to measure out the work. End of Caligula Part 1 Recording by Andrew Coleman Part 2 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Caligula, Part 2 Thus far we have spoken of him as a prince. What remains to be said of him bespeaks him rather a monster than a man. He assumed a variety of titles such as Dutiful, the Pious, the Child of the Camp, the Father of the Armies, and the Greatest and Best Caesar. Upon hearing some kings who came to the city to pay him court, conversing together at supper about their illustrious descent, he exclaimed, Aes Corana Seto, Aes Basilius, let there be but one prince, one king. He was strongly inclined to assume the diadem, and change the form of government from imperial to regal, but being told that he far exceeded the grandeur of kings and princes, he began to arrogate to himself a divine majesty. He ordered all the images of the gods, which were famous either for their beauty or the veneration paid them, among which was that of Jupiter Olympius, to be brought from Greece, that he might take their heads off and put on his own having continued part of the Palatium as far as the Forum, and the Temple of Castor and Pollux being converted into a kind of vestibule to his house, he often stationed himself between the twin brothers, and so presented himself to be worshipped by all votaries, some of whom saluted him by the name of Jupiter Latialis. He also instituted a temple and priests, with choicest victims, in honour of his own divinity. In his temple stood a statue of gold, the exact image of himself, which was daily dressed in garments corresponding with those he wore himself. The most opulent persons in the city offered themselves as candidates for the honour of being his priests, and purchased it successively at an immense price. The victims were flamingos, peacocks, bustards, guinea fowls, turkey and pheasant hens, each sacrificed on their respective days. On nights when the moon was full, he was in the constant habit of inviting her to his embraces and his bed. In the daytime he talked in private to Jupiter Capitolinus, one while whispering to him 
and another turning his ear to him. Sometimes he spoke aloud and in railing language, for he was overheard to threaten the god thus, Hi em anir, hi ego say, raise thou me up, O Aal. Until being at last prevailed upon by the entreaties of the god, as he said, to take up his abode with him, he built a bridge over the temple of the deified Augustus, by which he joined the Palatium to the capital. Afterwards, that he might be still nearer, he laid the foundations of a new palace in the very court of the capital. He was unwilling to be thought or called the grandson of Agrippa because of the obscurity of his birth, and he was offended if any one, either in prose or verse, ranked him amongst the Caesars. He said that his mother was the fruit of an incestuous commerce, maintained by Augustus with his daughter Julia, and not content with this vile reflection upon the memory of Augustus, he forbade his victories at Actium, and on the coast of Sicily, to be celebrated as usual, affirming that they had been most pernicious and fatal to the Roman people. He called his grandmother Livia Augusta, Ulysses in a woman's dress, and had the indecency to reflect upon her in a letter to the Senate, as of mean birth, and descended by the mother's side, from a grandfather who was only one of the municipal magistrates of Vondi, whereas it is certain from the public records that Alphidius Lurco held high offices at Rome. His grandmother Antonia, desiring a private conference with him, he refused to grant it, unless Macro, the prefect of the Praetorian Guards, were present. Indignities of this kind, and ill usage, were the cause of her death. But some think he also gave her poison. Nor did he pay the smallest respect to her memory after her death, but witnessed the burning from his private apartment. His brother Tiberius, who had no expectation of any violence, was suddenly dispatched by a military tribune sent by his order for that purpose. He forced Silenus, his father-in-law, to kill himself, by cutting his throat with a razor. The pretext he alleged for these murders was that the latter had not followed him upon his putting to sea in stormy weather, but stayed behind with a view of seizing the city if he should perish. The other, he said, smelt of an antidote, which he had taken to prevent his being poisoned by him, whereas Silenus was only afraid of being seasick and the disagreeableness of a voyage and Tiberius had merely taken a medicine for an habitual cough, which was continually growing worse. As for his successor Claudius, he only saved him for a laughing stock. He lived in the habit of incest with all his sisters, and at table, when much company was present, he placed each of them in turns below him, whilst his wife reclined above him. It is believed that he deflowered one of them, Drusilla, before he had assumed the robe of manhood, and was even caught in her embraces by his grandmother Antonia, with whom they were educated together. When she was afterwards married to Cassius Longinus, a man of consular rank, he took her from him, and kept her constantly as if she were his lawful wife. In a fit of sickness, he by his will appointed her heiress both of his estate and the empire. After her death, he ordered a public mourning for her, during which it was capital for any person to laugh, use the bath, or sup with his parents, wife, or children. Being inconsolable unto his affliction, he went hastily and in the night-time from the city, going through Campania to Syracuse, and then suddenly returned without shaving his beard or trimming his hair. Nor did he ever afterwards, in matters of the greatest importance, not even in the assemblies of the people or before the soldiers, swear any otherwise than, by the divinity of Drusilla. The rest of his sisters he did not treat with so much fondness or regard but frequently prostituted them to his catamites. He therefore the more readily condemned them in the case of Aemilius Lepidus as guilty of adultery 
and privy to that conspiracy against him. Nor did he only divulge their own handwriting relative to the affair, which he procured by base and lewd means, but likewise consecrated to Mars the Avenger three swords which had been prepared to stab him, with an inscription setting forth the occasion of their consecration. Whether in the marriage of his wives, in repudiating them or retaining them, he acted with greater infamy, it is difficult to say. Being at the wedding of Caius Piso with Livia Oristilla, he ordered the bride to be carried to his own house, but within a few days divorced her, and two years after banished her, because it was thought that upon her divorce she returned to the embraces of her former husband. Some say that being invited to the wedding supper, he sent a messenger to Piso, who sat opposite to him, in these words, Do not be too fond with my wife, and that he immediately carried her off. Next day he published a proclamation importing that he had got a wife as Romulus and Augustus had done. Lolia Paulina, who was married to a man of consular rank in command of an army, he suddenly called from the province where she was with her husband, upon mention being made that her grandmother was formerly very beautiful, and married her, but he soon afterwards parted with her, interdicting her from having ever afterwards any commerce with man. He loved with the most passionate and constant affection Caesonia, who was neither handsome nor young, and was besides the mother of three daughters by another man, but a wanton of unbounded lasciviousness. Her he would frequently exhibit to the soldiers, dressed in a military cloak with shield and helmet, and riding by his side. To his friends he even showed her naked. After she had a child, he honoured her with the title of wife, in one and the same day declaring himself her husband, and father of the child of which she was delivered. He named it Julia Drusilla, and carrying it round the temples of all the goddesses, laid it on the lap of Minerva, to whom he recommended the care of bringing up and instructing her. He considered her as his own child, for no better reason than her savage temper which was such even in her infancy, that she would attack with her nails the face and eyes of the children at play with her. It would be of little importance, as well as disgusting, to add to all this an account of the manner in which he treated his relations and friends. As Ptolemy, King Juba's son, his cousin, for he was the grandson of Mark Antony by his daughter Selene, and especially Macro himself, and Enya likewise, by whose assistance he had obtained the empire, all of whom, for their alliance and eminent services, he rewarded with violent deaths. Nor was he more mild or respectful in his behaviour towards the senate. Some who had borne the highest offices in the government, he suffered to run by his litter in their togas for several miles together, and to attend him at supper, sometimes at the head of his couch, sometimes at his feet, with napkins. Others of them, after he had privately put them to death, he nevertheless continued to send for, as if they were still alive, and after a few days pretended that they had laid violent hands upon themselves. The consuls, having forgotten to give public notice of his birthday, he displaced them, and the Republic was three days without any one in that high office. A quaestor, who was said to be concerned in a conspiracy against him, he scourged severely, having first stripped off his clothes and spread them under the feet of the soldiers employed in the work, that they might stand the more firm. The other orders likewise he treated with the same insolence and violence. Being disturbed by the noise of people taking their places at midnight in the circus, as, as they were to have free admission, he drove them all away with clubs, in this tumult, above twenty Roman knights were squeezed to death with as many matrons with a great crowd besides. When stage plays were acted, to occasion disputes between the people and the knights, he distributed the money tickets sooner than usual, that the seats assigned to the knights might be all occupied by the mob. In the spectacles of gladiators, sometimes, when the sun was violently hot, 
he would order the curtains which covered the amphitheatre to be drawn aside, and forbade any person to be let out, withdrawing at the same time the usual apparatus for the entertainment, and presenting wild beasts almost pined to death, the most sorry gladiators, decrepit with age, and fit only to work the machinery, and decent housekeepers, who were remarkable for some bodily infirmity, sometimes shutting up the public granaries, he would oblige the people to starve for a while. He evinced the savage barbarity of his temper, chiefly by the following indications. When flesh was only to be had at a high price for feeding his wild beasts reserved for the spectacles, he ordered that criminals should be given them to be devoured. And upon inspecting them in a row, while he stood in the middle of the portico, without troubling himself to examine their cases, he ordered them to be dragged away from bald pate to bald pate. Of one person who had made a vow for his recovery to combat with a gladiator, he exacted its performance. Nor would he allow him to desist until he came off conqueror, and after many entreaties. Another, who had vowed to give his life for the same cause, having shrunk from the sacrifice, he delivered, adorned as a victim, with garlands and fillets, to boys, who were to drive him through the streets, calling on him to fulfil his vow, until he was thrown headlong from the ramparts. After disfiguring many persons of honourable rank, by branding them in the face with hot irons, he condemned them to the mines, to work in repairing the highways, or to fight with wild beasts, or tying them by the neck and heels in the manner of beasts carried to slaughter, would shut them up in cages, or saw them asunder. Nor were these severities merely inflicted for crimes of great enormity, but for making remarks on his public games, or for not having sworn by the genius of the emperor. He compelled parents to be present at the execution of their sons, and to one who excused himself on account of indisposition, he sent his own litter. Another he invited to his table immediately after he had witnessed the spectacle, and coolly challenged him to jest and be merry. He ordered the overseer of the spectacles and wild beasts to be scourged in fetters during several days successively in his own presence, and did not put him to death until he was disgusted with the stench of his putrefied brain. He burned alive, in the centre of the arena of the amphitheatre, the writer of a farce, for some witty verse which had a double meaning. A Roman knight, who had been exposed to the wild beasts, crying out that he was innocent, he called him back, and having had his tongue cut out, remanded him to the arena. Asking a certain person, whom he recalled after a long exile, how he used to spend his time, he replied with flattery, I was always praying the gods for what has happened, that Tiberius might die and you be emperor. Concluding, therefore, that those he had himself banished also prayed for his death, he sent orders round the islands to have them all put to death. Being very desirous to have a senator torn to pieces, he employed some persons to call him a public enemy, fall upon him as he entered the senate house, stab him with their steles, and deliver him to the rest to tear asunder. Nor was he satisfied until he saw the limbs and bowels of the man, after they had been dragged through the streets, piled up in a heap before him. He aggravated his barbarous actions by language equally outrageous. There is nothing in my nature, said he, that I commend or approve so much as my adiatrepsia, inflexible rigour. Upon his grandmother Antonia's giving him some advice, as if it was a small matter to pay no regard to it, he said to her, Remember that all things are lawful for me. When about to murder his brother, whom he suspected of taking antidotes against poison, he said, See then an antidote against Caesar. And when he banished his sisters, he told them in a menacing tone that he had not only islands at command, but likewise swords. 
one of Praetorian rank having sent several times from Antikyra, whither he had gone for his health, to have his leave of absence prolonged, he ordered him to be put to death, adding these words, Bleeding is necessary for one that has taken hell-bore so long, and found no benefit. It was his custom every tenth day to sign the lists of prisoners appointed for execution, and this he called clearing his accounts. And having condemned several Gauls and Greeks at one time, he exclaimed in triumph, I have conquered gallo -Grecia. He generally prolonged the sufferings of his victims by causing them to be inflicted by slight and frequently repeated strokes. This being his well-known and constant order, strike so that he may feel himself die. Having punished one person for another, by mistaking his name, he said, he deserved it quite as much. He had frequently in his mouth these words of the tragedian, odorant, dumb metwant. I scorn their hatred, if they do but fear me. He would often inveigh against all the senators without exception as clients of Sejanus, and informers against his mother and brothers, producing the memorials which he had pretended to burn, and excusing the cruelty of Tiberius as necessary, since it was impossible to question the veracity of such a number of accusers. He continually reproached the whole equestrian order, as devoting themselves to nothing but acting on the stage and fighting as gladiators being incensed at the people's applauding a party at the Circensian Games, in opposition to him, he exclaimed, I wish the Roman people had but one neck. When Tetrinius the highwayman was denounced, he said his persecutors too were all Tetriniuses. Five retiari, in tunics, fighting in a company, yielded without a struggle to the same number of opponents, and being ordered to be slain, one of them, taking up his lance again, killed all the conquerors. This he lamented in a proclamation as a most cruel butchery, and cursed all those who had borne the sight of it. He used also to complain aloud of the state of the times, because it was not rendered remarkable by any public calamities. For while the reign of Augustus had been made memorable to posterity by the disaster of Varus, and that of Tiberius by the fall of the theatre at Fidenae, his was likely to pass into oblivion from an uninterrupted series of prosperity. And at times he wished for some terrible slaughter of his troops, a famine, a pestilence, conflagrations, or an earthquake. Even in the midst of his diversions, while gaming or feasting, this savage ferocity, both in his language and actions, never forsook him. Persons were often put to the torture in his presence, whilst he was dining or carousing. A soldier, who was an adept in the art of beheading, used at such times to take off the heads of prisoners, who were brought in for that purpose. At Putioli, at the dedication of the bridge which he planned, as already mentioned, he invited a number of people to come to him from the shore, and then suddenly threw them headlong into the sea, thrusting down with poles and oars those who, to save themselves, had got hold of the rudders of the ships. At Rome, in a public feast, a slave having stolen some thin plates of silver with which the couches were inlaid, he delivered him immediately to an executioner, with orders to cut off his hands and lead him round the guests, with them hanging from his neck before his breast, and a label signifying the cause of his punishment. A gladiator, who was practising with him, and voluntarily threw himself at his feet, he stabbed with a poniard, and then ran about with a palm branch in his hand, after the manner of those who are victorious in the games. When a victim was to be offered upon an altar, he, clad in the habit of the Popeye, and holding the axe aloft for a while, at last, instead of the animal, slaughtered an officer who attended to cut up the sacrifice. And at a sumptuous entertainment he fell suddenly into a violent fit of laughter, and upon the consuls, 
who reclined next to him, respectfully asking him the occasion. Nothing, replied he, but that, upon a single nod of mine, you might both have your throats cut. Among many other jests, this was one. As he stood by the statue of Jupiter, he asked Apelles, the tragedian, which of them he thought was biggest. Upon his demurring about it, he lashed him most severely, now and then commending his voice, whilst he entreated for mercy, as being well modulated, even when he was venting his grief. As often as he kissed the neck of his wife or mistress, he would say, So beautiful a throat must be cut whenever I please. And now and then he would threaten to put his dear Sisonia to the torture that he might discover why he loved her so passionately. In his behaviour towards men of almost all ages, he discovered a degree of jealousy and malignity equal to that of his cruelty and pride. He so demolished and dispersed the statues of several illustrious persons, which had been removed by Augustus for want of room, from the court of the capital into the Campus Martius, that it was impossible to set them up again with their inscriptions entire. And for the future he forbade any statue whatever to be erected without his knowledge and leave. He had thoughts, too, of suppressing Homer's poems. For why, said he, may not I do what Plato has done before me, who excluded him from his commonwealth? He was likewise very near banishing the writings and the busts of Virgil and Livy from all libraries, censuring one of them as a man of no genius and very little learning, and the other as a verbose and careless historian. He often talked of the lawyers as if he intended to abolish their profession. By Hercules, he would say, I shall put it out of their power to answer any questions in law otherwise than by referring to me. He took from the noblest persons in the city the ancient marks of distinction used by their families, as the collar from Torquatus, from Cincinnatus the curl of hair, and from Gnaeus Pompey the surname of Great, belonging to that ancient family. Ptolemy, mentioned before, whom he invited from his kingdom, and received with great honours, he suddenly put to death, for no other reason but because he observed that upon entering the theatre, at a public exhibition, he attracted the eyes of all the spectators by the splendour of his purple robe. As often as he met with handsome men, who had fine heads of hair, he would order the back of their heads to be shaved to make them appear ridiculous. There was one Esius Proculus, the son of a centurion of the first rank, who, for his great stature and fine proportions, was called the Colossal. Him he ordered to be dragged from his seat in the arena, and matched with a gladiator in light armour, and afterwards with another completely armed, and upon his worsting them both, commanded him forthwith to be bound, to be led clothed in rags up and down the streets of the city, and after being exhibited in that plight to the women, to be then butchered. There was no man of so abject or mean condition whose excellency in any kind he did not envy. The Rex Nemorensis, having many years enjoyed the honour of the priesthood, he procured a still stronger antagonist to oppose him. One Porius, who fought in a chariot, having been victorious in an exhibition, and in his joy given freedom to a slave, was applauded so vehemently, that Caligula rose in such haste from his seat, that treading upon the hem of his toga, he tumbled down the steps, full of indignation, and crying out, A people who are masters of the world, pay greater respect to a gladiator for a trifle, than to princes admitted amongst the gods, or to my own majesty, here present amongst them. He never had the least regard, either to the chastity of his own person, or that of others. He is said to have been inflamed with an unnatural passion for Marcus Leptus Mnester, an actor in pantomimes, and for certain hostages, and to have engaged with them in the practice of mutual pollution. Valerius Catullus, a young man of a consular family, 
bawled aloud in public that he had been exhausted by him in that abominable act. Besides his incest with his sisters, and his notorious passion for Pyralis, the prostitute, there was hardly any lady of distinction with whom he did not make free. He used commonly to invite them with their husbands to supper, and as they passed by the couch on which he reclined at table, examined them very closely, like those who traffic in slaves. And if any one from modesty held down her face, he raised it up with his hand. Afterwards, as often as he was in the humour, he would quit the room, send for her he liked best, and in a short time return with marks of recent disorder about them. He would then commend or disparage her in the presence of the company, recounting the charms or defects of her person and behaviour in private. To some he sent a divorce in the name of their absent husbands, and ordered it to be registered in the public acts. In the devices of his profuse expenditure, he surpassed all the prodigals that ever lived. Inventing a new kind of bath, with strange dishes and suppers, washing in precious unguents, both warm and cold, drinking pearls of immense value dissolved in vinegar, and serving up for his guests loaves and other victuals modelled in gold. Often saying, that a man ought either to be a good economist or an emperor. Besides, he scattered money to a prodigious amount among the people, from the top of the Julian Basilica, during several days successively. He built two ships with ten banks of oars, after the Liburnian fashion, the poops of which blazed with jewels, and the sails were of various party colours. They were fitted up with ample bars, galleries, and saloons, and supplied with a great variety of vines and other fruit trees. In these he would sail in the daytime along the coast of Campania, feasting amidst dancing and concerts of music. In building his palaces and villas, there was nothing he desired to effect so much, in defiance of all reason, as what was considered impossible. Accordingly, moles were formed in the deep and adverse sea, rocks of the hardest stone cut away, plains raised to the height of mountains with a vast mass of earth, and the tops of mountains levelled by digging, and all these were to be executed with incredible speed, for the least remissness was a capital offence. Not to mention particulars, he spent enormous sums, and the whole treasures which had been amassed by Tiberius Caesar, amounting to two thousand seven hundred millions of sesterces within less than a year. Having therefore quite exhausted these funds, and being in want of money, he had recourse to plundering the people, by every mode of false accusation, confiscation and taxation that could be invented. He declared that no one had any right to the freedom of Rome, although their ancestors had acquired it for themselves and their posterity, unless they were sons. For that none beyond that degree ought to be considered as posterity. When the grants of the divine Julius and Augustus were produced to him, he only said that he was very sorry they were obsolete and out of date. He also charged all those with making false returns who, after the taking of the census, had by any means whatever increased their property. He annulled the wills of all who had been centurions of the first rank, as testimonies of their base ingratitude, if from the beginning of Tiberius's reign they had not left either that prince or himself their heir. He also set aside the wills of all others, if any person only pretended to say that they designed at their death to leave Caesar their heir. The public Becoming terrified at this proceeding, he was now appointed joint heir with their friends, and in the case of parents with their children, by persons unknown to him. Those who lived any considerable time after making such a will, he said, were only making game of him, and accordingly he sent many of them poisoned cakes. He used to try such courses himself, fixing previously the sum he proposed to raise during the sitting and after he had secured it, quitting the tribunal. 
Impatient of the least delay, he condemned by a single sentence forty persons, against whom there were different charges, boasting to Sazonia, when she awoke, how much business he had dispatched while she was taking her midday sleep. He exposed to sale by auction the remains of the apparatus used in the public spectacles, and exacted such biddings and raised the prices so high that some of the purchasers were ruined and bled themselves to death. There is a well-known story told of Aponius Saturninus, who, happening to fall asleep as he sat on a bench at the sale, Caius called out to the auctioneer not to overlook the praetorian personage who nodded to him so often and accordingly the salesman went on, pretending to take the nods for tokens of assent, until thirteen gladiators were knocked down to him at the sum of nine millions of sesterces, he being in total ignorance of what was doing. End of Caligula Part 2 Recording by Andrew Coleman Caligula, Part 3, From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson, and edited by T. Forrester. Caligula, Part 3 Having also sold in Gaul all the clothes, furniture, slaves, and even freedmen belonging to his sisters, at prodigious prices, after their condemnation, he was so much delighted with his gains that he sent to Rome for all the furniture of the old palace, pressing for its conveyance all the carriages let to hire in the city, with the horses and mules belonging to the bakers, so that they often wanted bread at Rome. And many who had suits at law in progress lost their causes, because they could not make their appearance in due time according to their recognizances. In the sale of this furniture, every artifice of fraud and imposition was employed, Sometimes he would rail at the bidders for being niggardly, and ask them if they were not ashamed to be richer than he was. At another, he would affect to be sorry that the property of princes should be passing into the hands of private persons. He had found out that a rich provincial had given two hundred thousand sesterces to his chamberlains for an underhand invitation to his table, and he was much pleased to find that honour valued at so high a rate. The day following, as the same person was sitting at the sale, he sent him some bauble, for which he told him he must pay two hundred thousand sesterces, and that he should sup with Caesar upon his own invitation. He levied new taxes, and such as were never before known, at first by the publicans, but afterwards, because their profit was enormous, by centurions and tribunes of the Praetorian Guards, no description of property or persons being exempted from some kind of tax or other. For all eatables brought into the city a certain excise was exacted. For all lawsuits or trials in whatever court the fortieth part of the sum in dispute, and such as were convicted of compromising litigations, were made liable to a penalty. Out of the daily wages of the porters he received an eighth, and from the gains of common prostitutes what they received for one favour granted. There was a clause in the law that all boards who kept women for prostitution or sale should be liable to pay, and that marriage itself should not be exempted. These taxes being imposed, but the act by which they were levied never submitted to public inspection, Great grievances were experienced from the want of sufficient knowledge of the law. At length, on the urgent demands of the Roman people, he published the law. 
but it was written in a very small hand, and posted up in a corner, so that no one could make a copy of it. To leave no sort of gain untried, he opened brothels in the Palatium, with a number of cells furnished suitably to the dignity of the place, in which married women and free-born youths were ready for the reception of visitors. He sent likewise his nomenclators about the forums and courts to invite people of all ages, the old as well as the young, to his brothel, to come and satisfy their lusts and he was ready to lend his customers money upon interest, clerks attending to take down their names in public as persons who contributed to the emperor's revenue. Another method of raising money, which he thought not below his notice, was gaming, which by the help of lying and perjury he turned to considerable account. Leaving once the management of his play to his partner in the game, he stepped into the court, and observing two rich Roman knights passing by, he ordered them immediately to be seized, and their estates confiscated. Then returning in great glee, he boasted that he had never made a better throw in his life. After the birth of his daughter, complaining of his poverty, and the burdens to which he was subjected, not only as an emperor, but a father, he made a general collection for her maintenance and fortune. He likewise gave public notice that he would receive New Year's gifts on the calends of January following, and accordingly stood in the vestibule of his house to clutch the presents which people of all ranks threw down before him by handfuls and lapfuls. At last, being seized with an invincible desire of feeling money, Taking off his slippers, he repeatedly walked over great heaps of gold coin spread upon the spacious floor, and then laying himself down, rolled his whole body in gold over and over again. Only once in his life did he take an active part in military affairs, and then not from any set purpose, but during his journey to Mervania, to see the grove and river of Clitumnus, being recommended to recruit a body of Batavians who attended him, he resolved upon an expedition into Germany. Immediately he drew together several legions and auxiliary forces from all quarters, and made everywhere new levies with the utmost rigour. Collecting supplies of all kinds, such as never had been assembled upon the like occasion, he set forward on his march, and pursued it sometimes with so much haste and precipitation, that the Praetorian cohorts were obliged, contrary to custom, to pack their standards on horses or mules, and so follow him. At other times he would march so slow and luxuriously, that he was carried in a litter by eight men, ordering the roads to be swept by the people of the neighbouring towns, and sprinkled with water to lay their dust. On arriving at the camp, in order to show himself an active general and severe disciplinarian, he cashiered the lieutenants who came up late with the auxiliary forces from different quarters. In reviewing the army, he deprived of their companies most of the centurions of the first rank, who had now served their legal time in the wars, and some whose time would have expired in a few days, alleging against them their age and infirmity and railing at the covetous disposition of the rest of them, he reduced the bounty due to those who had served out their time to the sum of six thousand sesterces. Though he only received the submission of Adminius, the son of Cunabeline, a British king, who being driven from his native country by his father, came over to him with a small body of troops, yet, as if the whole island had been surrendered to him, he dispatched magnificent letters to Rome, ordering the bearers to proceed in their carriages directly up to the Forum and the Senate House, and not to deliver their letters, but to the consuls in the Temple of Mars, and in the presence of a full assembly of the senators. Soon after this, there being no hostilities, he ordered a few Germans of his guard to be carried over and placed in concealment on the other side of the Rhine, and word to be brought him after dinner that an enemy was advancing with great impetuosity. 
This being accordingly done, he immediately threw himself, with his friends, and a party of the Praetorian knights, into the adjoining wood, where lopping branches from the trees, and forming trophies of them, he returned by torchlight, upbraiding those who did not follow him with timorousness and cowardice. But he presented the companions, and sharers of his victory, with crowns of a new form, and under a new name, having the sun, moon, and stars represented on them, and which he called Exploratorii. Again, some hostages were by his order taken from the school, and privately sent off, upon notice of which he immediately rose from table, pursued them with the cavalry, as if they had run away, and coming up with them, brought them back in fetters, proceeding to an extravagant pitch of ostentation, likewise, in this military comedy. Upon his again sitting down to table, it being reported to him that the troops were all reassembled, he ordered them to sit down as they were, in their armour, animating them in the words of that well-known verse of Virgil, Durate, et vos met rebus servate secundis. Bear up, and save yourselves for better days. In the meantime, he reprimanded the senate and people of Rome in a very severe proclamation, for revelling and frequenting the diversions of the circus and theatre, and enjoying themselves at their villas, whilst their emperor was fighting and exposing himself to the greatest dangers. At last, as if resolved to make war in earnest, he drew up his army upon the shore of the ocean, with his ballistae and other engines of war, and while no one could imagine what he intended to do, on a sudden commanded them to gather up the sea-shells, and fill their helmets and the folds of their dress with them, calling them the spoils of the ocean due to the capital and the palatium. As a monument of his success, he raised a lofty tower, upon which, as at Pharos, he ordered lights to be burnt in the night-time, for the direction of ships at sea, and then promising the soldiers a donative of a hundred denarii a man, as if he had surpassed the most eminent examples of generosity. Go your ways, said he, and be merry. Go, ye are rich. In making preparations for his triumph, besides the prisoners and deserters from the barbarian armies, he picked out the men of greatest stature in all Gaul such as he said were fittest to grace a triumph, with some of the chiefs, and reserved them to appear in the procession, obliging them not only to dye their hair yellow, and let it grow long, but to learn the German language, and assume the names commonly used in that country. He ordered likewise the galleys in which he had entered the ocean, to be conveyed to Rome a great part of the way by land, and wrote to his comptrollers in the city to make proper preparations for a triumph against his arrival at as small expense as possible, but on a scale such as had never been seen before, since they had full power over the property of every one. Before he left the province, he formed a design of the most horrid cruelty, to massacre the legions which had mutinied upon the death of Augustus for seizing and detaining by force his father, Germanicus, their commander, and himself, then an infant in the camp. Though he was with great difficulty dissuaded from this rash attempt, yet neither the most urgent entreaties nor representations could prevent him from persisting in the design of decimating these legions. Accordingly, he ordered them to assemble unarmed, without so much as their swords, and then surrounded them with armed horse. But finding that many of them, suspecting that violence was intended, were making off to arm in their own defence, he quitted the assembly as fast as he could, and immediately marched for Rome, bending now all his fury against the Senate, whom he publicly threatened to divert the general attention from the clamour excited by his disgraceful conduct. Amongst other pretexts of offence, he complained that he was defrauded of a triumph, which was justly his due, though he had just before forbidden, upon pain of death, any honour to be decreed him. 
In his march he was waited upon by deputies from the senatorian order, entreating him to hasten his return. He replied to them, I will come, I will come, and this with me, striking at the same time the hilt of his sword. He issued likewise this proclamation, I am coming, but for those only who wish for me, the equestrian order and the people, for I shall no longer treat the Senate as their fellow citizen or prince. He forbade any of the senators to come to meet him, and either abandoning or deferring his triumph, he entered the city in ovation on his birthday. Within four months from this period, he was slain, after he had perpetrated enormous crimes, and while he was meditating the execution, if possible, of still greater. He had entertained a design of removing to Antium, and afterwards to Alexandria, having first cut off the flower of the equestrian and senatorian orders. This is placed beyond all question by two books which were found in his cabinet under different titles, one being called The Sword, and the other The Dagger. They both contained private marks and the names of those who were devoted to death. There was also found a large chest filled with a variety of poisons, which being afterwards thrown into the sea by order of Claudius, are said to have so infected the waters that the fish were poisoned and cast dead by the tide upon the neighbouring shores. He was tall, of a pale complexion, ill-shaped, his neck and legs very slender, his eyes and temples hollow, his brows broad and knit, his hair thin, and the crown of the head bald. The other parts of his body were much covered with hair. On this account it was reckoned a capital crime for any person to look down from above as he was passing by, or so much as to name a goat. His countenance, which was naturally hideous and frightful, he purposely rendered more so, forming it before a mirror into the most horrible contortions. He was crazy, both in body and mind, being subject when a boy to the falling sickness. When he arrived at the age of manhood, he endured fatigue tolerably well, but still occasionally he was liable to a faintness, during which he remained incapable of any effort. He was not insensible of the disorder of his mind, and sometimes had thoughts of retiring to clear his brain. It is believed that his wife Caesonia administered to him a love potion which threw him into a frenzy. What most of all disordered him was want of sleep, for he seldom had more than three or four hours rest in a night and even then his sleep was not sound, but disturbed by strange dreams, fancying, among other things, that a form representing the ocean spoke to him. Being therefore often weary with lying awake so long, sometimes he sat up in his bed, at others walked in the longest porticoes about the house, and from time to time invoked and looked out for the approach of day. To this crazy constitution of his mind may, I think, very justly be ascribed two faults which he had, of a nature directly repugnant one to the other, namely an excessive confidence and the most abject timidity. For he, who affected so much to despise the gods, was ready to shut his eyes and wrap up his head in his cloak at the slightest storm of thunder and lightning and if it was violent, he got up and hid himself under his bed. In his visit to Sicily, after ridiculing many strange objects which that country affords, he ran away suddenly in the night from Messini, terrified by the smoke and rumbling at the summit of Mount Etna. And though in words he was very valiant against the barbarians, yet upon passing a narrow defile in Germany in his light car, surrounded by a strong body of his troops, someone happening to say, 
there would be no small consternation amongst us if an enemy were to appear. He immediately mounted his horse and rode towards the bridges in great haste. But finding them blocked up with camp followers and baggage wagons, he was in such a hurry that he caused himself to be carried in men's hands over the heads of the crowd. Soon afterwards, upon hearing that the Germans were again in rebellion, he prepared to quit Rome and equipped a fleet, comforting himself with this consideration that if the enemy should prove victorious and possess themselves of the heights of the Alps, as the Cimbri had done, or of the city, as the Senones formerly did, he should still have in reserve the transmarine provinces. Hence it was, I suppose, that it occurred to his assassins to invent the story intended to pacify the troops who mutinied at his death, that he had laid violent hands upon himself, in a fit of terror occasioned by the news brought him of the defeat of his army. In the fashion of his clothes, shoes, and all the rest of his dress, he did not wear what was either national, or properly civic, or peculiar to the male sex, or appropriate to mere mortals. He often appeared abroad in a short coat of stout cloth, richly embroidered and blazing with jewels, in a tunic with sleeves and with bracelets upon his arms, sometimes all in silks and habited like a woman, at other times in the crepidae or buskins, sometimes in the sort of shoes used by the light-armed soldiers, or in the sock used by women, and commonly with a golden beard fixed to his chin, holding in his hand a thunderbolt, a trident, or a caducaeus, marks of distinction belonging to the gods only. Sometimes, too, he appeared in the habit of Venus. He wore very commonly the triumphal ornaments, even before his expedition and sometimes the breastplate of Alexander the Great, taken out of his coffin. With regard to the liberal sciences, he was little conversant in philology, but applied himself with assiduity to the study of eloquence, being indeed, in point of enunciation, tolerably elegant and ready, and in his perorations, when he was moved to anger, there was an abundant flow of words and periods. In speaking, his action was vehement, and his voice so strong that he was heard at a great distance. When winding up an harangue, he threatened to draw the sword of his lucubration, holding a loose and smooth style in such contempt that he said Seneca, who was then much admired, wrote only detached essays and that his language was nothing but sand, without line. He often wrote answers to the speeches of successful orators, and employed himself in composing accusations or vindications of eminent persons, who were impeached before the Senate, and gave his vote for or against the party accused, according to his success in speaking, inviting the equestrian order by proclamation, to hear him. He also zealously applied himself to the practice of several other arts of different kinds, such as fencing, charioteering, singing, and dancing. In the first of these he practiced with the weapons used in war, and drove the chariot in circuses built in several places. He was so extremely fond of singing and dancing, that he could not refrain in the theatre from singing with the tragedians, and imitating the gestures of the actors, either by way of applause or correction. A night exhibition which he had ordered the day he was slain, was thought to be intended for no other reason than to take the opportunity afforded by the licentiousness of the season, to make his first appearance upon the stage. Sometimes also he danced in the night. Summoning once to the Palatium, in the second watch of the night, three men of consular rank, who feared the words from the message, 
he placed them on the proscenium of the stage, and then suddenly came bursting out with a loud noise of flutes and castanets, dressed in a mantle and tunic reaching down to his heels. Having danced out a song, he retired. Yet he who had acquired such dexterity in other exercises never learnt to swim. Those for whom he once conceived a regard, he favoured even to madness. He used to kiss Mnesta, the pantomimic actor, publicly in the theatre, and if any person made the least noise while he was dancing, he would order him to be dragged from his seat and scourged him with his own hand. A Roman knight once making some bustle, he sent him, by a centurion, an order to depart forthwith for Ostia, and carry a letter from him to King Ptolemy in Mauritania. The letter was comprised in these words, Do neither good nor harm to the bearer. He made some gladiators, captains of his German guards. He deprived the gladiators called Mermelones of some of their arms. One Columbus coming off with the victory in a combat, but being slightly wounded, he ordered some poison to be infused in the wound, which he thence called Columbinum, for thus it was certainly named with his own hand in a list of other poisons. He was so extravagantly fond of the party of charioteers whose colours were green, that he supped and lodged for some time constantly in the stable where their horses were kept. At a certain revel he made a present of two millions of sesterces to one Cythicus, a driver of a chariot. The day before the Circensian games he used to send his soldiers to enjoin silence in the neighbourhood, that the repose of his horse in Cittatus might not be disturbed. For this favourite animal, besides a marble stable, an ivory manger, purple housings and a jewelled frontlet, he appointed a house, with a retinue of slaves and fine furniture for the reception of such as were invited in the horse's name to sup with him. It is even said that he intended to make him consul. In this frantic and savage career, numbers had formed designs for cutting him off. But one or two conspiracies being discovered, and others postponed for want of opportunity, at last two men concerted a plan together, and accomplished their purpose, not without the privity of some of the greatest favourites amongst his freedmen, and the prefects of the Praetorian Guards, because, having been named, though falsely, as concerned in one conspiracy against him, they perceived that they were suspected, and become objects of his hatred, for he had immediately endeavoured to render them obnoxious to the soldiery, drawing his sword and declaring that he would kill himself if they thought him worthy of death. And ever after he was continually accusing them to one another and setting them all mutually at variance. The conspirators having resolved to fall upon him as he returned at noon from the Palatine Games, Cassius Caria, tribune of the Praetorian Guards, claimed the part of making the onset. This Caria was now an elderly man, and had been often reproached by Caius for effeminacy. When he came for the watchword, the latter would give Priapus, or Venus, and if on any occasion he returned thanks, would offer him his hand to kiss, making with his fingers an obscene gesture. His approaching fate was indicated by many prodigies. The statue of Jupiter at Olympia, which he had ordered to be taken down and brought to Rome, suddenly burst out into such a violent fit of laughter that the machines employed in the work giving way, the workmen took to their heels. When this accident happened, there came up a man named Cassius, who said that he was commanded in a dream to sacrifice a bull to Jupiter. The capital at Capua was struck with lightning upon the Ides of March, as was also, at Rome, 
the apartment of the chief porter of the Palatium. Some construed the latter into a presage that the master of the place was in danger from his own guards, and the other they regarded as a sign that an illustrious person would be cut off, as had happened before on that day. Scylla the astrologer, being consulted by him respecting his nativity, assured him that death would unavoidably and speedily befall him. The oracle of fortune at Antium likewise forewarned him of Cassius, on which account he had given orders for putting to death Cassius Longinus, at that time proconsul of Asia, not considering that Chiria bore also that name. The day preceding his death, he dreamt that he was standing in heaven, near the throne of Jupiter, who, giving him a push with the great toe of his right foot, he fell headlong upon the earth. Some things which happened the very day of his death, and only a little before it, were likewise considered as ominous presages of that event. Whilst he was at sacrifice, he was bespattered with the blood of a flamingo. At Menester, the pantomimic actor performed in a play which the tragedian Neoptolemus had formerly acted at the games in which Philip, the king of Macedon, was slain. And in the piece called Laureolus, in which the principal actor, running out in a hurry and falling, vomited blood, several of the inferior actors, vying with each other to give the best specimen of their art, made the whole stage flow with blood. A spectacle had been purposed to be performed that night, in which the fables of the infernal regions were to be represented by Egyptians and Ethiopians. On the ninth of the calends of February, at about the seventh hour of the day, after hesitating whether he should rise to dinner, as his stomach was disordered by what he had eaten the day before, at last, by the advice of his friends, he came forth. In the vaulted passage through which he had to pass were some boys of noble extraction, who had been brought from Asia to act upon the stage, waiting for him in a private corridor, and he stopped to see and speak to them. And had not the leader of the party said that he was suffering from cold, he would have gone back and made them act immediately. Respecting what followed, two different accounts are given. Some say that whilst he was speaking to the boys, Carrier came behind him and gave him a heavy blow on the neck with his sword, first crying out, Take this! That then a tribune, by name Cornelius Sabinus, another of the conspirators, ran him through the breast. Others say that the crowd being kept at a distance by some centurions who were in the plot, Sabinus came according to custom for the word, and that Caius gave him Jupiter, upon which Caria cried out, Be it so! and then on his looking round, clove one of his jaws with a blow. As he lay on the ground, crying out that he was still alive, the rest dispatched him with thirty wounds. For the word agreed upon among them all was, Strike again! Some likewise ran their swords through his privy parts. Upon the first bustle, the litter-bearers came running in with their poles to his assistance, and immediately afterwards his German bodyguards, who killed some of the assassins, and also some senators who had no concern in the affair. He lived twenty-nine years, and reigned three years, ten months, and eight days. His body was carried privately into the Lamian Gardens, where it was half burnt upon a pile hastily raised and then had some earth carelessly thrown over it. It was afterwards disinterred by his sisters, on their return from banishment, burnt to ashes, and buried. Before this was done, it is well known that the keepers of the gardens were greatly disturbed by apparitions, and that not a night passed without some terrible alarm or other in the house where he was slain until it was destroyed by fire. His wife Sazonia was killed with him, 
being stabbed by a centurion, and his daughter had her brains knocked out against a wall. Of the miserable condition of those times, any person may easily form an estimate from the following circumstances. When his death was made public, it was not immediately credited. People entertained a suspicion that a report of his being killed had been contrived and spread by himself with a view of discovering how they stood affected towards him. Nor had the conspirators fixed upon any one to succeed him. The senators were so unanimous in their resolution to assert the liberty of their country that the consuls assembled them at first not in the usual place of meeting, because it was named after Julius Caesar, but in the capital. Some proposed to abolish the memory of the Caesars and level their temples with the ground. It was particularly remarked on this occasion that all the Caesars who had the prinomen of Caius, died by the sword, from the Caius Caesar who was slain in the times of Cinna. End of Caligula Recording by Andrew Coleman The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Steely. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson. And edited by T. Forrester. Claudius Part 1. Paragraphs 1 to 15. Livia, having married Augustus when she was pregnant, was within three months afterwards delivered of Drusus, the father of Claudius Caesar, who had at first the premonon of Decimus, but afterwards that of Nero, and it was suspected that he was begotten in adultery by his father-in-law. The following verse, however, was immediately in every one's mouth, Tos uticus cae primina padia, poetically translated as, Nine months for the common birth the fates decree, but for the great reduce the term to three. This Drusus, during the time of his quiesta and praetor, commanded in Rattan and German wars, and was the first of all Roman generals who navigated the northern ocean. He made likewise some prodigious trenches beyond the Rhine, which to this day are called by his name. He overthrew the enemy in several battles, and drove them far back into the depths of the desert. Nor did he desist from pursuing them until an apparition, in the form of a barbarian woman of more than human size, appeared to him, and in the Latin tongue forbade him to proceed any further. For these achievements he had the honour of innovation and the triumphal ornaments. After his praetorship, he immediately entered into the office of consul, and returning again to Germany, died of disease in the summer encampment, which thence obtained the name of the unlucky camp. His corpse was carried to Rome by the principal persons of the several municipalities and colonies upon the road, being met and received by the recorders of each place, and buried in the Campus Martius. In honour of his memory, the army erected a monument, around which the soldiers used annually, upon a certain day, to march in solemn procession, and persons deputed from the several cities of Gaul performed religious rites. The Senate likewise, among various other honours, decreed for him a triumphal arch of marble with, with trophies in the Appian Way, and gave the cognomen of Germanicus to him and his prosperity. In him the civil and military virtues were equally displayed, for, besides his victories, he gained from the enemy the spolia opima, and frequently marked out the German chiefs in the midst of their army, and encountered them in single combat, at the utmost hazard of his life. He likewise often declared that he would, some time or other, if possible, restore the ancient government. In this account, I suppose, 
some have ventured to affirm that Augustus was jealous of him, and recalled him, and because he made no haste to comply with the order, took him off by poison. This I mention that I may not be guilty of any omission, more than because I think it is either true or probable, since Augustus loved him so much when living that he always in his wills made him joint heir with his sons, as he once declared in the Senate, and, upon his decease, extolling him in a speech to the people, to the degree that he prayed the guards to make his Caesars like him, and to grant himself as honourable an exit out of this world as they had given him and, not satisfied with inscribing upon his tomb an epitaph in the verse composed by himself, he wrote likewise the history of his life in prose. He had by the younger Atonia several children, but left behind him only three, namely Germanicus, Livilia, and Claudius. Claudius was born at Lyons in the consulship of Julius Antonius and Fabius Africanus, upon the 1st of August, at the very day upon which an altar was first dedicated there to Augustus. He was named Tiberius Claudius Drusus, but soon afterwards, upon the adoption of his elder brother into the Julian family, he assumed the cognomen Germanicus. He was left an infant by his father, and during almost the whole of his minority, and for some time after, he attained the age of manhood, was afflicted with a variety of obstinate disorders, insomuch that his mind and body being greatly impaired, he was, even after his arrival at the years of maturity, never thought sufficiently qualified for any public or private employment. He was therefore, during a long time, and even after the expiration of his minority, under the direction of a pedagogue, who, he complains in a certain memoir, was a barbarous wretch, and formerly superintendent of the mule drivers, who was selected for his governor on the purpose to correct him severely on every trifling occasion. On account of this crazy constitution of body and mind, at the spectacle of gladiators which he gave the people jointly with his brother, in honour of his father's memory, he presided, muffled up, in a pallium, a new fashion. When he assumed the manly habit, he was carried in a litter, at midnight, to the capital, without the usual ceremony. He applied himself, however, from an early age, with great assiduity to the study of the liberal sciences, and frequently published specimens of his skill in each of them. But never, with all his endeavours, could he attain to any public post in the government, or afford any hope of arriving at distinction thereafter. His mother, Antonia, frequently called him an abortion of a man that has only been begun, but never finished by nature. And when she would upbraid any one with dullness, she said, he was a greater fool than her son Claudius. His grandmother, Augusta, always treated him with the utmost contempt. Very rarely spoke to him, when she did admonish him upon any occasion, it was in writing, very briefly and severely, or by messengers. His sister Livilia, upon hearing that he was about to be created emperor, openly and loudly expressed her indignation that the Roman people should experience a fate so severe and so much below their grandeur. To exhibit the opinion both favourable and otherwise entertained concerning him by Augustus, his great uncle, I have here subjoined some extracts from the letters of that emperor. They begin. I have had some conversation with Tiberius according to your desire, my dear Livia, as to what must be done with your grandson Tiberius at the games of Mars. We are both agreed in this, that once for all we ought to determine what course to take with him. For if he be really sound, and, so to speak, quite right in his intellects, why should we hesitate to promote him by the same steps and degrees we did his brother? But if we find him below par and deficient both in body and mind, we must beware of giving occasion for him and ourselves to be laughed at by the world, which is ready enough to make such things the subject of mirth and derision. For we shall never be easy if we are always to be debating upon every occasion of this kind, without settling in the first instance whether he be really capable of public offices or not. With regard to what you consult me about at present moment, I am not against his superintending the feasts of the priests in the games of Mars, if he will suffer himself to be governed by his kinsman, Silius's son. 
that he may do nothing to make the people stare and laugh at him. But I do not approve of his witnessing the Circian games from the Pulvinar. He will there be exposed to view in the very front of the theatre. Nor do I like that he should go to the Albion Mount, or be at Rome during the Latin festivals, for if he be capable of attending his brother to the Mount, why has he not made prefect of the city? Thus, my dear Livia, you have my thoughts upon the matter. In my opinion, we ought to settle this affair for once and for all, that we may not always be in suspense between hope and fear. You may, if you think proper, give your kinsman Antonia this part of my letter to read. In another letter he writes as follows, I shall invite the youth, Tiberius, every day during your absence to supper, that he may not sup alone with his friends, Sulpicius and Athendonorus. I wish the poor creature was more cautious and attentive in the choice of someone whose manners, air, and gait might be proper for his imitation. Atuki panu tu sporadicus leon. In things of consequence he sadly fails. Where his mind does not run astray, he discovers a noble disposition. In a third letter, he says, Let me die, my dear Livia, if I am not astonished that the declamation of your grandson Tiberius should please me. For how he who talks so ill should be able to declaim so clearly and properly, I cannot imagine. There is no doubt, but Augustus, after this, came to the resolution upon the subject, and accordingly left him invested with no other honour than that of augural priesthood, naming him among the heirs of the third degree who were but distantly allied to his family, for a sixth part of his estate only, with a legacy of no more than eight hundred thousand sesterces. Upon his requesting some office in the state, Tiberius granted him the honorary appendages of the consulship, and when he pressed for a legitimate appointment, the emperor wrote word back that, he sent him forty gold pieces for his expenses during the festivals of Saturnalia and Siglaria. Upon this, laying aside all hope of advancement, he resigned himself entirely to an indolent life, living in great privacy, one with his gardens or a villa which he had near the city, another while in Campania, where he passed his time in the lowliest society, by which means Beside his former character of a dull, heavy fellow, he acquired that of drunkard and gamester. Notwithstanding this sort of life, much respect was shown him both in public and in private. The equestrian order twice made a choice of him to intercede on their behalf, once to obtain from the consuls the favour of bearing on their shoulders the corpse of Augustus to Rome, and a second time to congratulate him upon the death of Sejanus. When he entered the theatre, they used to rise and pull off their cloaks. The Senate likewise decreed that he should be added to the number of Augustal College of Priests, who were chosen by lot, and soon afterwards, when his house was burned down, that it should be rebuilt at the public charge, and that he should have the privilege of giving his vote among the men of the consular rank. This decree was, however, repealed, Tiberius insisting to have him excused on account of his imbecility and promising to make good his loss at his own expense. But at his death, he named him in his will among his third heirs for a third part of his estate, leaving him beside a legacy of two millions of sesterces, and expressly recommending him to the armies, the senate, and the people of Rome amongst his other relations. At last Caius, his brother's son, upon his advancement to the empire, Endeavouring to gain the affections of the public by all arts of popularity, Claudius also was admitted to the public offices, and held the consulship jointly with his nephew for two months. As he was entering the forum for the first time in the Fasius, an eagle, which was flying that way, alighted upon his right shoulder. A second consulship was allotted to him to commence at the expiration of the fourth year, he sometimes presided at the public spectacles as the representative of Caius, being always on those occasions complimented with the acclamations of the people, wishing him all happiness, sometimes under the title of the emperor's uncle, and sometimes under that of Germanicus's brother. Still, he was subject to many slights. 
If at any time he came in late to supper, he was obliged to walk around the room some time before he could get a place at the table. When he indulged himself with sleep after eating, which was common practice with him, the company used to throw olive stones and dates at him, and the buffoons who attended would wake him, as if only in jest, with a cane or a whip. Sometimes they would put slippers upon his hands, as he lay snoring, that he might upon awaking rub his face with them. He was not only exposed to contempt, but sometimes likewise to considerable danger. First in his consulship, for having been too remiss in providing and erecting the statues of Cassius's brothers, Nero and Drusus, he was very near being deprived of his office, and afterwards he was continually harassed with informations against him by one or other, sometimes even of his own domestics. When the conspiracy of Lepius and Gluticulus was discovered being sent with some other deputies into Germany to congratulate the emperor upon the occasion, he was in danger of his life, Caius being greatly enraged and loudly complaining that his uncle was sent to him as if he was a boy who wanted a governor. Some even say that he was thrown into a river in his travelling dress. From this period he voted in the Senate, always the last of the members of the consular rank, being called upon after the rest on purpose to disgrace him. A charge of the forgery of the will was also allowed to be prosecuted, though he only signed it as a witness, at last being obliged to pay eight million of sesterces on entering upon a new office of the priesthood. He was reduced to such straits in his private affairs that in order to discharge his bond to the treasury, he was under the necessity of exposing to sale his whole estate by the order of the prefects. Having spent the greater part of his life under these and like circumstances, he came at last to the empire in the fiftieth year of his age, by a very surprising turn of fortune. Being, as well as the rest, prevented from approaching Caius by the conspirators who dispersed the crowd, under the pretext of his desiring to be private, he retired to an apartment called the Hermium, and soon afterwards, terrified by the report of Caius being slain, he crept into the adjoining balcony, where he hid himself behind the hangings of the door. A common soldier, who happened to pass by that way, spying his feet, and desirous to discover who he was, pulled him out. When immediately recognising him, he threw himself in great fright at his feet, and saluted him by the title of emperor. He then conducted him to his fellow soldiers, who were all in a great rage, and irresolute what they should do. They put him into a litter, and as the slaves of the palace had all fled, took their turns in carrying him on their shoulders, and brought him into the camp, sad and trembling. The people who met him lamented his situation, as if the poor innocent was being carried to execution. Being received within the ramparts, he continued all night, with the sentries on guard, recovering somewhat from his fright, but in no great hopes of the succession. For the consuls, with the senate and civil troops, had possessed themselves of the forum and capital, with the determination to assert the public liberty, and he being sent for likewise by a tribune of the people to the senate house, to give his advice upon the present juncture of affairs, returned the answer, I am under constraint and cannot possibly come. The day afterwards, the senate being dilatory to their proceedings, and worn out by divisions amongst themselves, while the people who surrounded the senate house shouted that they should have one master, naming Claudius. He suffered the soldiers assembled under the arms to swear allegiance to him, promising them fifteen thousand sesterces a man he being the first of the Caesars who purchased the submission of the soldiers with money. Having thus established himself in power, his first object was to abolish all remembrance of the two preceding days in which a revolution in the state had been canvassed. Accordingly, he passed an act of perpetual oblivion and pardon for everything said or done during that time, and this he faithfully observed, with the exception only of putting to death a few tribunes and centurions concerned in the conspiracy against Caius, both as an example and because he understood that they had also planned his own death. 
he now turned his thoughts towards paying respect to the memory of his relations. His most solemn and usual oath was, by Augustus. He prevailed upon the Senate to decree a divine honours to his grandmother Livia, with a chariot in the Circensian procession drawn by elephants, as had been appointed for Augustus, and public offerings to the shades of his parents. Besides which, he instituted Circensian games for his father, to be celebrated every year upon his birthday, and for his mother a chariot to be drawn through the circus, with the title of Augusta, which had been refused by his grandmother. To the memory of his brother, to which upon all occasions he showed a great regard, he gave a Greek comedy to be exhibited in the public diversions at Naples, and awarded the crown for it, according to the sentence of the judges in that solemnity. Nor did he omit to make honour and grateful mention to Mark Antony, declaring by proclamation that he the more earnestly insisted upon the observation of his father Drusius's birthday, because it was likewise that of his grandfather Antony. He completed the marble arch near Pompey's theatre, which had formerly been decreed by the Senate in honour of Tiberius, but which had been neglected, and though he cancelled all the acts of Caius, yet he forbade the day of his assassination. Notwithstanding, it was that of his own accession to the empire to be reckoned among the festivals. But with regard to his own aggrandizement, he was sparing and modest, declining the title of emperor, and refusing all excessive honours. He celebrated the marriage of his daughter, and the birthday of a grandson, with great privacy at home. He recalled none of those who had been banished without a decree of the senate, and requested of them permission for the prefect of the military tribunes and praetorian guards to attend him in the senate house, and also that they would be pleased to bestow upon his procurators judicial authority in the provinces. He asked of the consuls likewise the privilege of holding fairs upon his private estate. He frequently assisted the magistrates in the trial of causes as one of their assessors, and when they gave public spectacles, he would rise up with the rest of the spectators and salute them both by words and gestures. When the tribunes of people came to him while he was on the tribunal, he excused himself, because, on account of the crowd, he could not hear them unless they stood. In a short time, by his conduct, he wrought himself so much into the favour and affection of the public, that when upon his going to Ostia, a report was spread in the city that he had been waylaid and slain, the people never ceased cursing the soldiers for traitors, and the senate as parricides, until one or two persons, and presently after several others, were brought by the magistrate upon the rostra, who assured them that he was alive and not far from the city on his way home. Conspiracies, however, were formed against him, not only by individuals separately, but by a faction, and at last his government was disturbed with civil war. A low fellow was found with a poniard about him, near his chamber at midnight. Two men of the equestrian order were discovered waiting for him in the streets, armed with a tuck and a huntsman's dagger. One of them intended to attack him as he came out of the theatre, and the other as he was sacrificing in the temple of Mars. Gallus Asinius and Statilius Corvinus, grandsons of the two orators Pollio and Messala, formed a conspiracy against him, in which they engaged many of his free men and slaves. Ferius Camillius Scribonianus, his lieutenant in the Dalmatia, broke into the rebellion, but was reduced in the space of five days. The legions, which he had seduced from their oath of fidelity, relinquishing their purpose upon an alarm occasioned by ill omens, for when orders were given them to march to meet their new emperor, the eagles could not be decorated, nor the standards pulled out of the ground, whether it was by accident or a divine interposition. Besides his former consulship, he held the office afterwards four times, the first two successively, but the following after an interval of four years each, the last for six months, the others for two, and the third upon his being chosen in the room of a consul who died, which had never been done by any of the emperors before him. Whether he was a consul or out of office, he constantly attended the courts for the administration of justice, 
even upon such days as were solemnly observed as days of rejoicing in his family, or by his friends, and sometimes upon the public festivals of ancient institution. Nor did he always adhere strictly to the letter of the laws, but overruled the rigour or lenity of many of their enactments, according to his sentiments of justice and equality. For where persons lost their suits by insisting upon more than appeared to be their due before the judges of private causes, he granted them the indulgence of a second trial. And with regard to such as were convicted of any great delinquency, he even exceeded the punishment appointed by law, and condemned them to be exposed to wild beasts. But in hearing and determining causes, he exhibited a strange inconsistency of temper, being at one time circumspect and sagacious, at another inconsiderate and rash, and sometimes frivolous, and like one out of his mind. In correcting the role of judges, he struck off the name of one who, concealing the privilege his children gave him to be excused from serving, had answered to his name, as too eager for the office. Another, who was summoned before him in a cause of his own, but alleged that the affair did not properly come under the emperor's cognizance, but that of ordinary judges, he ordered to plead the cause himself immediately before him, and show him, in a case of his own, how equitable a judge he would prove in that of other persons. A woman refusing to acknowledge her own son, and there being no clear proof on either side, he obliged her to confess the truth by ordering her to marry the young man. He was much inclined to determine causes in favour of parties who appeared against those who did not, without inquiring whether their absence was occasioned by their own fault or by real necessity. On proclamation of a man's being convicted of forgery, and that he ought to have his hands cut off, he insisted that an executioner should be immediately sent for, with a Spanish sword and a block. A person being prosecuted for falsely assuming the freedom of Rome, and a frivolous dispute arising between the advocates in the cause, whether he ought to make his appearance in the Rome or the Grecian dress. To show his impartiality, he commanded him to change his clothes several times, according to the character he assumed in the accusation or defence. An anecdote is related of him, and believed to be true, that in a particular cause he delivered his sentence in writing thus, I am in favour of those who have spoken the truth. By this he so much forfeited the good opinion of the world, that he was everywhere and openly despised. A person making an excuse for the non-appearance of a witness whom he had sent for from the provinces, declared it was impossible for him to appear, concealing the reason for some time. At last, after several interrogatories were put to him on the subject, he answered, The man is dead. To which Claudius replied, I think that this is a sufficient excuse. Another thanking him for suffering a person who was prosecuted to make his defence by counsel added, and yet it is no more than what is usual. I have likewise heard old men say that the advocates used to abuse his patience so grossly that they would not only call him back as he was quitting the tribunal, but would seize him by the lap of his coat and sometimes catch him by his heels to make him stay. Some obscure Greek, who was litigant, had an altercation with him, in which he called out, You are an old fool! That such behaviour, however strange, is not incredible, will appear from this anecdote. It is certain that a Roman knight, who was prosecuted by the impotent device of his enemies on the false charge of abominable obscenity with women, observing that the common strumpets were summoned against him, and allowed to give evidence, upbraided Claudius in very harsh and severe terms, with his folly and cruelty, and threw his style and some books which he had in his hands, in his face, with such violence as to wound him severely in the cheek. End of Claudius Part 1 Recording by Alan Steely, Bristol, UK Of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Steely. 
He likewise assumed the censorship which had been discontinued since the time that Paulus and Plancus had jointly held it. But this he also administered very unequally, and with a strange variety of humour and conduct. In his review of the knights he passed over, without any mark of disgrace, a profligate young man, only because his father spoke of him in the highest terms. For, said he, his father is his proper censor. Another, who was infamous for debauching youths and for adultery, he only admonished to indulge his youthful inclinations more sparingly, or at least more cautiously, adding, Why must I know what mistress you keep? When, at the request of his friends, he had taken off a mark of infamy, which he had set upon one knight's name, he said, Let the blot, however, remain. He not only struck out of the list of judges, but likewise deprived of the freedom of Rome, an illustrious man of the highest provincial rank in Greece, only because he was ignorant of the Latin language. Nor in this review did he suffer any one to give an account of his conduct by an advocate, but obliged each man to speak for himself in the best way he could. He disgraced many, and some that little expected it, and for a reason entirely new namely, for going out of Italy without his license. And one likewise, for having in his providence been the familiar companion of a king, observing that in former times Rabirius Posthumus had been prosecuted for treason, although he only went after Ptolemy to Alexandria for the purpose of securing payment of a debt. Having tried to brand with disgrace several others, he, to his own greater shame, found them generally innocent, through the negligence of the persons employed to inquire into their characters, those whom he charged with living in celibacy, with want of children, or estate, proving themselves to be husbands, parents, and in affluent circumstances. One of the knights who was charged with stabbing himself laid his bosom bare, to show that there was not the least mark of violence upon his body. The following incidents were remarkable in his censorship. He ordered a car, plated with silver and of a very sumptuous workmanship, which was exposed for sale in the Sigillaria, to be purchased and broken in pieces before his eyes. He published twenty proclamations in one day, in one of which he advised the people, since the vintage was very plentiful, to have their casks well secured at the bung with pitch. And in another he told them that nothing would sooner cure the bite of a viper than the sap of a yew tree. He undertook one expedition, and that was of short duration. The triumphal ornaments decreed him by Senate he considered as beneath the imperial dignity, and was therefore resolved to have the honour of a real triumph. For this purpose he selected Britain, which had never been attempted by anyone since Julius Caesar, and was then chafing with rage, because the Romans would not give up some deserters. Accordingly he set sail from Ostia but was twice very nearly wrecked by the boisterous wind called Circius upon the coast of Liguria, and near the islands called Stockades. Having marched by land from Marseilles to Gessorium, he thence passed over to Britain, and part of the island submitted to him within a few days after his arrival, without battle or bloodshed. He returned to Rome in less than six months from the time of his departure, and triumphed in the most solemn manner to witness which he not only gave leave to the governors of provinces to come to Rome, but even to some of the exiles. Among the spoils taken from the enemy, he fixed upon the bedament of his house in the Patium, a naval crown, in token of his having passed, and, as it were, conquered the ocean, and had it suspended near the civic crown, which was there before. Messalina, his wife, followed his chariot in a covered litter, those who had attended the honour of triumphal ornaments in the same wall rode behind. The rest followed on foot, wearing the robe with the broad stripes. Crassus Frugi was mounted upon a horse, richly caparisoned in a robe embroidered with palm leaves, because this was the second time of his obtaining that honour. He paid particular attention to the care of the city, and to have it well supplied with provisions. A dreadful fire happened in Ameliana, which lasted some time. He passed two nights in the Dribitorium, and the soldiers and the gladiators not being in sufficient numbers to extinguish it, he caused the magistrates to summon the people out of all the streets in the city to their assistance. Placing bags of money before him, he encouraged them to do their utmost, declaring that he would reward everyone on the spot according to their exertions. 
during a scarcity of provisions occasioned by bad crops for several successive years, he was stopped in the middle of the forum by a mob, who so abused him at the same time pelting him with fragments of bread, that he had some difficulty in escaping into the palace by the back door. He therefore used all possible means to bring provisions into the city, even in the winter. He proposed to the merchants a sure profit, by indemnifying them against any loss that might befall them by storms at sea, and granted great privileges to those who built ships for that traffic. To a citizen of Rome he gave an exemption from the Papia Popian law, to one who had only the privilege of Latium, the freedom of the city, and to women the rights which by law belonged to those who had four children, which enactments are in force to this day. He completed some important public works, which, though not numerous, were very useful. The principal were an aqueduct, which had been begun by Caius, an emissary for the discharge of waters of the Fusian lake, and the harbour of Ostia. Although he knew that Augustus had refused to comply with a repeated application from the Marcians for one of these, and that the other had been several times intended by Julius Caesar, but as often abandoned on account of difficulty of its execution. He brought to the city the cool and plentiful springs of the Claudian water, one of which is called Curulius, and the other Curtius and Albundius, as likewise the river of the new Anio in a stone canal, and distributed them into many magnificent reservoirs. The canal from the Fusian lake was undertaken as much for the sake of profit as for the honour of the enterprise, for there were parties who offered to drain it at their own expense, on condition of their having a grant of the land laid dry. With great difficulty he completed a canal three miles in length, partly by cutting through and partly by tunnelling a mountain, thirty thousand men being constantly employed in the work for eleven years. He formed the harbour at Ostia, by carrying out circular piers on the right and on the left, with a mole protecting, in deep water, the entrance to the port. To secure the foundation of this mole, he sunk the vessel in which the great obelisk had been brought from Egypt, and built upon piles a very lofty tower, in imitation of the pharaohs at Alexandria, on which lights were burnt to direct mariners in the night. He often distributed largesses of corn and money amongst the people, and entertained them with a great variety of public magnificent spectacles, not only such as were usual and in the accustomed places, but some of new invention and others revived from ancient models, and exhibited in places where nothing of the kind had ever before been attempted. In the games which he presented at the dedication of Pompey's theatre, which had been burnt down, and was rebuilt by him, he presided upon a tribunal, erected for him in the orchestra, having first paid his devotions in the temple above, and then coming down through the centre of the circle, while all the people kept their seats in profound silence. He likewise exhibited the secular games, giving out that Augustus had anticipated the regular period, though he himself says in his history that they had been omitted before the age of Augustus, who had calculated the years with great exactness, and again brought them to their regular period. The crier was therefore ridiculed when he invited people in the usual form to games which no person had ever before seen, nor ever would again, when many were still living, who had already seen them, and some of the performers who had formerly acted in them were now again brought upon the stage. He likewise frequently celebrated the Circean games in the Vatican, sometimes exhibiting a hunt of wild beasts after every five courses. He embellished the Circus Maximus with marble barriers and gilded golds which before were of common stone and wood, and assigned proper places for the senators who were used to sitting promiscuously with the other spectators. Besides the chariot races he exhibited there the Trojan game, and wild beasts from Africa which were encountered by a troop of Praetorian knights with their tribunes and even the prefect at the head of them besides Thessalian horse, who drive fierce bulls around the circus, leaping upon their backs when they have exhausted their fury, and drag them by their horns to the ground. He gave exhibitions of gladiators in several places and of various kinds, one yearly on the anniversary of his accession in the Praetorian camp, but without any hunting or the usual apparatus, another in the scepter as usual, and in the same place, another out of the common way, and of a few days' continuance only, which he called Sportula, 
because when he was going to present it, he informed the people by proclamation that he had invented them to a late supper, that he had invited them to a late supper, got up in haste and without ceremony. Nor did he lend himself to any kind of public diversion with more freedom and hilarity, insomuch that he would hold out his left hand, and joined by the common people count upon his fingers aloud the gold pieces presented to those who came off conquerors. He would earnestly invite the company to be merry, sometimes calling them his masters, with a mixture of insipid, far-fetched jests. Thus, when the people called for Palumbus, he said, he would give them one when he could catch it. The following was well intended and well timed, having amidst great applause spared a gladiator on the intercession of his four sons. He sent a billet immediately around to the theatre, to remind the people how much it behoved them to get children, since they had before them an example of how useful they had been in procuring favour and security for a gladiator. He likewise represented in the Campus Martius the assault and sacking of a town and the surrender of the British kings, presiding in his general's cloak. Immediately before he drew off the waters from the Fusian lake, he exhibited upon it a naval fight. But the combatants on board the fleets cried out, Health attend you, noble emperor! We who are about to peril our lives salute you. And he replying, Health attend you too! And they all refused to fight, as if by that response he had meant to excuse them. Upon this he hesitated for a time whether he should not destroy them all with fire and sword. At last, leaping from his seat and running along the shore of the lake with tottering steps, the result of his foul excesses, he partly by fair words and partly by threats persuaded them to engage. This spectacle represented an engagement between the fleets of Sicily and Rhodes, consisting each of twelve ships of war of three banks of oars. The signal for the encounter was given by the silver triton, raised by machinery from the middle of the lake. With regard to religious ceremonies, the administration of affairs both civil and military, and the condition of all orders of the people at home and abroad, some practices he corrected, others which had been laid aside he revived, and some regulations he introduced which were entirely new. In appointing new priests for the several colleges, he made no appointments without being sworn. When an earthquake happened in the city, he never failed to summon the people together by the praetor, and appoint holidays for sacred rites. And upon the sight of any ominous bird in the city or capital, he issued an order for the supplication, the words of which, by virtue of his office of high priest, after an exhortation from the rostra, he recited in the presence of the people, who repeated them after him, all workmen and slaves being first ordered to withdraw. The courts of Judicata, whose sittings had been formally divided between the summer and winter months, he ordered for dispatch of business to sit the whole year round. The jurisdiction in matters of trust, which used to be granted annually by a special commission to certain magistrates, and in the city only, he made permanent, and extended the provincial judges likewise. He altered the clause added by Tiberius to the Papia Popian law, which inferred that men of sixty years of age were incapable of begetting children. He ordered that out of the ordinary course of proceeding, orphans might have guardians appointed to them by the consuls, and that those who were banished from any province by the chief magistrate should be debarred from coming into the city or any part of Italy. He inflicted upon certain persons a new sort of banishment, by forbidding them to depart further than three miles from Rome. When any affair of importance came before the Senate, he used to sit between the two consuls upon the seats of the tribunes, he reserved for himself the power of granting license to travel out of Italy, which before had belonged to the Senate. He likewise granted the consular ornaments to his Ducenarian procurators. From those who declined the senatorian dignity, he took away the equestrian. Although he had in the beginning of his reign declared that he would admit no man into the Senate who was not the great-grandson of a Roman citizen, Yet he gave the broad hem to the son of a freed man, on condition that he should be adopted by a Roman knight. Being afraid, however, of incurring censure by such an act, he informed the public that his ancestor, Appius Caius, the censor, had elected the sons of the freemen into the senate, for he was ignorant, it seems, that in the times of Appius, and a long time afterwards, persons manumitted were not called freemen, but only their sons who were freeborn. 
Instead of the expense which the College of Questors was obliged to incur in paving the highways, he ordered them to give the people an exhibition of gladiators, and relieving them of the provinces of Ostia and Gaul, he reinstated them in charge of the treasury, which, since it had been taken from them, had been managed by praetors, or those who had formerly filled that office. He gave the triumphal ornaments to Silanus, who was betrothed to his daughter, though he was under age, and in other cases he bestowed them on so many, and with so little reserve, that there is extant a letter unanimously addressed to him by all the legions, begging him to grant his consular lieutenants the triumphal ornaments at the time of their appointment to commands, in order to prevent their seeking occasion to engage in unnecessary wars. He decreed to Alanus Plautius the honour of the ovation, going to meet him at his entering the city, and walking with him in the procession to the capital and back, in which he took the left side, giving him the post of honour. He allowed Gabinius Secundus, upon his conquest of Chaucy, a German tribe, to assume the cognomen of Chaucius. His military organisation of the equestrian order was this. After having the command of the cohort, they were promoted to a wing of auxiliary horse, and subsequently received the commission of tribune of a legion. He raised a body of militia who were called supernumeraries, who, though they were a sort of soldier and kept in reserve, yet received pay. He procured an act of the senate to prohibit all soldiers from attending senators at their houses, in the way of respect and compliment. He confiscated the estates of all freed men who presumed to take upon themselves the equestrian rank. Such of them as were ungrateful to their patrons, and were complained of by them, he reduced to their former condition of slavery, and declared to their advocates that he would always give judgment against the freed men, in a suit at law, which the masters might happen to have with them. Some persons, having exposed their sick slaves in a languishing condition on the island of Asculapius, because of the tedious nature of their cure, he declared all who were so exposed perfectly free, never more to return, if they should recover, to their former servitude, and that if any one chose to kill at once rather than expose a slave, he should be liable for murder. He purchased a proclamation forbidding all travellers to pass through towns of Italy, any otherwise than on foot, or in a litter or chair. He quartered a cohort of soldiers at Puteoli, and another at Ostia, to be in readiness against any accidents from fire. He prohibited foreigners from adopting Roman names, especially those which belonged to families. Those who falsely pretended to the freedom of Rome he beheaded on the Esquiline. He gave up to the Senate the provinces of Achaia and Macedonia, which Tiberius had transferred to his own administration. He deprived the Lycians from their liberties, as a punishment for their fatal dissensions, but restored to the Rhodians their freedom upon their repenting of their former misdemeanours. He exonerated forever the people of Ilium from the payment of taxes, as being the founders of the Roman race, reciting upon the occasion a letter in Greek from the Senate and people of Rome to King Seleucus, on which they promised him their friendship and alliance, provided that he would grant their kinsmen, Hellensians, immunity from all burdens. He banished from Rome all Jews who were continually making disturbances at the instigation of one Crestus. He allowed the ambassadors of the Germans to sit at the public spectacles in seats assigned to the senators, being induced to grant them favours by their frank and honourable conduct. For, having been seated in rows of benches, which were common to the people, on observing the Parthian and Armenian ambassadors sitting among the senators, they took upon themselves to cross over into the same seats as being, they said, no way inferior to the others, in point either of merit or rank. The religious rites of the Druids, solemnized with such horrid cruelties, which had only been forbidden the citizens of Rome during the reign of Augustus, he utterly abolished among the Gauls. On the other hand, he attempted to transfer the Eleusian mysteries from Attica to Rome. He likewise ordered the temple of Venus, Erosina, in Sicily, which was old and in ruinous condition, to be repaired at the expense of the Roman people. He concluded treaties with foreign princes in the Forum, with the sacrifice of a sow and the form of words used by the heralds in former times. But in these and other things, and indeed the greater part of his administration, he was directed not so much by his own judgment 
as by the influence of his wives and freed men, from the most part acting in conformity to what their interests or fancies dictated. He was twice married at the very early age, first to Amelia Lepida, the granddaughter of Augustus, and afterwards to Livia Medulina, who had the cognomen of Camilla, and was descended from the old dictator Camillus. The former he divorced while still a virgin, because her parents had incurred the displeasure of Augustus, and he lost the latter by sickness on the day fixed for their nuptials. He next married Plotia Ergulanilla, whose father had enjoyed the honour of a triumph, and soon afterwards Aelia Paetina, the daughter of a man of consular rank, but he divorced them both, Paetina upon some trifling cause of disgust, and Ergulanilla for scandalous lewdness, and the suspicion of murder. After them he took in marriage Valeria Messalina, the daughter of Barbatus Messalana, his cousin, but finding that besides her other shameful debaucheries, she had even gone so far as to marrying in his own absence Caius Silas, the settlement of her dower being formally signed in the presence of Augurs, he put her to death. Then summoning his praetorians to his presence, he made them this declaration, As I have been so unhappy in my unions, I am resolved to continue in future unmarried, and if I should not, I give you leave to stab me. He was, however, unable to persist in this resolution, for he began immediately to think of another wife, and even of taking back Petina, whom he had formerly divorced. He thought also of Lolia Paulia, who had been married to Caius Caesar, but being ensnared by the arts of Agrippina, the daughter of his brother Germanicus, who took advantage of the kisses and endearments which their near relationship admitted to inflame his desires, he got someone to propose at the next meeting of the Senate that they should oblige the Emperor to marry Agrippina, as a measure highly conducive to the public interest, and that in future liberty should be given for such marriages, which until that time had been considered incestuous. In less than twenty-four hours after this, he married her. No person was found, however, to follow the example, excepting one freedman, and a centurion of the first rank, at the solemnization of whose nuptials both he and Agrippina attended. He had children by three of his wives, by Pergularnilla, Drusus, and Claudia, by Petina, Antonia, and by Messalinia, Octavia, and also a son, whom at first he called Germanicus, but afterwards Britannicus. He lost Drusus at Pompey when he was very young, he being choked with a pear, which in his play he tossed into the air and caught in his mouth, and a few days before he had betrothed him to one of Sejanus' daughters, and I am therefore surprised that some authors should say he lost his life by treachery of Sejanus. Claudia, who was in truth the daughter of Bota, his freed man, though she was born five months before his divorce, he ordered to be thrown naked at her mother's door. He married Antonia to Snaeus Pompey the Great, and afterwards to Fastus Scylla, both youths of very noble parentage, Octavia to his stepson Nero, and after she had been contracted to Silanus. Britannicus was born upon the twelfth day of his reign, and in his second consulship. He often earnestly commended him to the soldiers, holding him in his arms before their ranks, and would likewise show him to the people in the theatre, setting him upon his lap, or holding him out whilst he was still very young, and was sure to receive their acclamations and good wishes on his behalf. Of his sons-in-law, he adopted Nero. He not only dismissed from his favour both Pompey and Solanus, but put them to death. End of Claudius, Part 2 Recording by Alan Steely, Bristol, UK Claudius, Part 3 of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Steely. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Claudius Part 3, Paragraphs 28 to 46. Amongst his freed men, the greatest favourite was the eunuch Poseides, whom, in his British triumph, he presented with the pointless spear, 
classing him among the military men. Next to him, if not equal in favour, was Felix, whom he not only preferred to commands both the cohorts and troops, but to government of the provenance of Judea, and he became, in consequence of his elevation, the husband of three queens. Another favourite was Harpocrus, to whom he granted the privilege of being carried in a litter within the city, and of holding public spectacles for the entertainment of people. In this class he was likewise Polybius, who assisted him in his studies, and had often the honour of walking between the two consuls, but above all others Narcissus, his secretary, and Pallius, the controller of his accounts, were in high favour with him. He not only allowed them to receive by decree of the senate immense presents, but also to be decorated with the quaestorian and praetorian ensigns of honour. So much did he indulge them in amassing wealth and, and plundering the public, that upon his complaining once at the lowness of his exchequer, some one said, with great reason, it would be full enough if those two freed men of his would take him into partnership with them. Being entirely governed by these freed men, and as I have already said, by his wives, he was a tool of others rather than a prince. He distributed offices, or the command of armies, pardoned or punished, according as it suited their interests, their passions, or their caprice, and for the most part without knowing or being sensible of what he did. Not to enter into the minute details relative to the revocation of grants, the reversal of judicial decisions, obtaining his signature to fictitious appointments, or the bare-faced alteration of them after his signing, he put to death Appius Silanus, the father of his son-in-law, and the two Julias, the daughters of Drusus and Germanicus, without any positive proof of their crimes, with which they were charged, or so much as permitting them to make any defence. He also cut off Sneus Pompey, the husband of his eldest daughter, and Lucius Silanus, who was betrothed to the younger Pompey, was stabbed in the act of unnatural lewdness with a favourite paramour. Silanus was obliged to quit the office of Praetor upon the 4th of the Calends of January, and to kill himself on the news day following, the very same on which Claudius and Agrippina were married. He condemned to death five and thirty senators, and above three hundred Roman knights, with so little attention to what he did, that when a centurion brought him word of the execution of a man of consular rank, who was one of a number, and told him that he had executed his order, he declared, he had ordered no such thing, but he had approved of it, because his freed men, it seems, had said that the soldiers did nothing more than their duty in dispatching the emperor's enemies without waiting for a warrant. But it is beyond all belief that he himself, at the marriage of Messalina, with the adulteress Salinus, would actually sign the writings relative to her dowry, induced as it is pretended by the design of diverting from himself and transferring upon another the danger which some omens seemed to threaten him. Either standing or sitting, but especially where he lay asleep, he had a majestic and graceful appearance, for he was tall but not slender. His grey looks became him well, and he had a full neck, but his knees were feeble and failed him in walking, so that his gait was ungainly, both when he assumed state and when he was taking diversion. He was outrageous with his laughter, and still more so in his wrath, for then he foamed at the mouth and discharged from his nostrils. He also stammered in his speech and had tremulous motion of the head at all times, but particularly when he was engaged in any business, however trifling. Although his health was very infirm during the former part of his life, yet after he became emperor he enjoyed a good state of health, except only that he was subject to a pain in the stomach. In a fit of this complaint he said that he had thoughts of killing himself. He gave entertainments as frequently as they were splendid, and generally when there was such ample room that very often six hundred guests sat down together. At a feast he gave on the banks of the canal for draining the Fusian lake, he narrowly escaped being drowned, the water at its discharge rushing out with such violence that it overflowed the conduit. At supper he had always his own children, with those of several of the nobility, who, according to an ancient custom, sat at the feet of the couches. One of his guests, having been suspected of purloining a golden cup, he invited him again the next day, but served him with a porcelain jug. It is said, too, that he intended to publish an edict, 
allowing all people the liberty of giving vent at the table to any distension occasioned by flatulence, upon hearing of a person whose modesty, when under restraint, had nearly cost him his life. He was always ready to eat and drink at any time or in any place. One day, as he was hearing causes in the forum of Augustus, he smelt the dinner which was preparing for the salai in the temple of Mars adjoining, whereupon he quitted the tribunal and went to partake of the feast with the priests. He scarcely ever left the table until he had thoroughly crammed himself and drank to intoxication, and then he would immediately fall asleep, lying upon his back with his mouth open. While in this condition, a feather was put down his throat to make him throw up the contents of his stomach. Upon composing himself to rest, his sleep was short, and he usually woke around midnight, but he would sometimes sleep in the daytime, and that even when he was upon the tribunal, so that advocates often found it difficult to wake him, though they raised their voices for that purpose. He set no bounds on his libidious intercourse with women. He never betrayed any unnatural desires for the other sex. He was fond of gaming, and published a book upon the subject. He even used to play as he rode in his chariot, having the table so fitted that the game was not disturbed by the motion of the carriage. His cruel and sanguine disposition was exhibited upon great as well as trifling occasions. When any person was to be put to torture, or criminal punished for parricide, he was impatient for the execution, and would have it performed in his own presence. When he was at Tiber, being desirous of seeing an example of the old way of putting malefactors to death, some were immediately bound to a stake for the purpose. But there being no executioner to be had at the place, he sent for one from Rome and waited for his coming until night. In any exhibition of gladiators presented either by himself or others, if any of the combatants chanced to fall, he ordered them to be butchered, especially the retiari, that he might see their faces in the agonies of death. Two gladiators happening to kill each other, he immediately ordered some little knives to be made of their swords for his own use. He took great pleasure in seeing men engage with wild beasts and the combatants who appeared on the stage at noon. He would therefore come to the theatre by break of day, and at noon, dismissing the people to dinner, continued sitting himself, and besides those who were devoted to the sanguinary fate, he would match others with beasts upon sight or such occasions as, for instance, the carpenters and their assistants, and the people of that sort, if a machine or any piece of work in which they had been employed about the theatre did not answer the purpose for which it was intended. To this desperate kind of encounter he forced one of his nomenclators, even encumbered as he was by wearing the toga. But the characteristics most prominent in him were fear and distrust. In the beginning of his reign, although he much affected a modest and humble appearance, as has been already observed, yet he durst not venture himself at an entertainment without being attended by a guard or spearsman, and made soldiers wait upon him at the table instead of servants. He never visited a sick person until the chamber had been first searched and the bed and bedding thoroughly examined. At other times all persons who came to pay their court to him were strictly searched by officers appointed for that purpose, nor was it until a long time, and with much difficulty, was he prevailed upon to excuse women, boys, and girls from such rude handling, or suffer their attendants or writing masters to retain their cases for pens and styles. When Camillus formed his plot against him, not doubting but his timidity might be worked upon without a war, he wrote to him a scurrilous, petulant, and threatening letter desiring him to resign the government and betake himself to a life of privacy, Upon receiving this requisition, he had some thoughts of complying with it, and summoned together the principal men of the city to consult them on the subject. Having heard some loose reports of conspiracies formed against him, he was so much alarmed that he thought of immediately abdicating the government, and when, as I have before related, a man armed with a dagger was discovered near him while he was sacrificing, he instantly ordered the heralds to convoke the senate, and with tears and dismal exclamations lamented that such was his condition, that he was safe nowhere, and for a long time afterwards he abstained from appearing in public. He smothered his ardent love for Messalina, not so much on account of her infamous conduct, as from the apprehension of danger, believing that she was aspired to share with Salinas, her partner in adultery, the imperial dignity. Upon this occasion he ran in a great fright, and a very shameful manner, to the camp, asking all the way he went, 
if the empire were indeed safely his. No suspicion was too trifling, no person on whom it rested too contemptible to throw him into a panic, and induce him to take precautions for his safety, and meditate revenge. A man engaged in litigation before his tribunal, having saluted him, drew him aside, and told him he had dreamt that he saw him murdered, and shortly afterwards, when his adversary came to deliver his plea to the emperor, the plaintiff pretended to have discovered the murderer, pointed to him as the man he had seen in his dream, whereupon, as if he had been taken in the act, he was hurried away to execution. We are informed that Appius Salinus was got rid of in the same manner by the contrivance betwixt Messalina and Narcissus, in which they had their several parts assigned to them. Narcissus therefore burst into his lord's chamber before the daylight, apparently in great fright, and told him that he had dreamt that Appius Salinus had murdered him. The empress, upon this affecting great surprise, declared that she had the like dream for several nights successively. Presently afterwards, word was brought, as it had been agreed on, that Appius was come, he having indeed received orders the preceding day to be there at that time, and as if the truth of the dream was sufficiently confirmed by his appearance at that juncture, he was immediately ordered to be prosecuted and put to death. The day following, Claudius related the whole affair to the Senate, and acknowledged his great obligation to his freed men for watching over him, even in his sleep. Sensible of his being subject to passions and resentment, he excused himself in both instances by the proclamation assuring the public that the former should be short and harmless, the latter never without good cause. After severely reprimanding the people of Ostia for not sending some boats to meet him upon his entering the mouth of the Tiber, in terms which might expose them to public resentment, he wrote to Rome that he had been treated as a private person, yet immediately afterwards he pardoned them, and that in a way which had appearance of making them satisfaction, or begging pardon for some injury he had done them. Some people who addressed him unseasonably in public he pushed away with his own hand. He likewise banished a person who had been secretary to a quaestor, and even a senator who had filled the office of praetor without hearing. And although they were innocent, the former only because he had treated him with rudeness while he was in a private station, the other because in his adulship he had fined some tenants of his for selling cooked victuals contrary to the law, and ordered his steward, who interfered, to be whipped. On this account, likewise, he took from the Adais the jurisdiction they had over Cook's shops. He did not scruple to speak of his own absurdities, and declared in some short speeches which he published that he had only feigned imbecility in the reign of Caius, because otherwise it would have been impossible for him to have escaped and arrived at the station he had then attained. He could not, however, gain credit for this assertion, for a short time afterwards, a book was published under the title of Moron Anastasis, The Resurrection of Fools, the design of which was to show that nobody ever counterfeited folly. Amongst other things, people admired in him his indifference and unconcern, or to express it in Greek, his meteoria and apopepsia. Placing him at a table a little after Messalina's death, he inquired why the empress did not come. Many of those whom he had condemned to death, he ordered the day after to be invited to his table, and to game with him, and sent to reprimand them as sluggish fellows for not making greater haste. When he was meditating his incestuous marriage with Agrippina, he was perpetually calling her, My daughter, my nursling, born and brought up upon my lap. And when he was going to adopt Nero, as if there was little cause for censure in his adopting a son-in-law, when he had a son of his own arrived at the years of maturity, he continually gave out in public that no one had ever been admitted by adoption into the Claudian family. He frequently appeared so careless in what he said, and so inattentive to circumstances, that it was believed he never reflected who he himself was, or amongst whom, or at what time, or in what place he spoke. In a debate in Senate, relative to the butchers and vintners, he cried out, I ask you, who can live without a bit of meat? And mentioned the great plenty of the old taverns from which he himself used formerly to have his wine. Among other reasons for his supporting a certain person who was candidate for the questorship, he gave this. His father once gave me, very seasonably, a draught of cold water when I was sick. Upon his bringing a woman as a witness in some cause before the Senate, he said, This woman was my mother's freed woman and dresser, but she always considered me as her master, 
and this I say because there are some still in my family that do not look upon me as such. The people of Ostia addressing him in open court with a petition, he flew into a rage at them and said, There is no reason why I should oblige you. If any one else is free to act as he pleases, surely I am. The following expression he had in his mouth every day, and at all hours and seasons. What, you take me for a theologus? And in Greek, speak but do not touch me. Besides many other familiar sentences, below the dignity of a private person, much more of an emperor, who was not deficient either in eloquence or learning, as having applied himself very closely to the liberal sciences. By the encouragement of Titus Livius, and with the assistance of Sulpicus Flavus, he attempted at an early age the composition of a history, and having called together a numerous adultery to hear and give their judgment upon it, he read it over with such difficulty, and frequently interrupting himself, for after he had begun a great laugh was raised among the company, by the breaking of several benches from the weight of very fat men, and even when order was restored he could not forbear bursting out into violent fits of laughter at the remembrance of the accident. After he became emperor, likewise, he wrote several things which he was careful to have recited to his friends by a reader. He commenced his history from the death of the dictator Caesar, but afterwards he took a later period and began at the conclusion of the civil wars, because he found he could not speak with freedom and due regard to truth concerning the former period, having been often taken to task both by his mother and grandmother. Of the earlier history he left only two books, but of the latter one and forty. He compiled likewise the history of his own life in eight books, full of absurdities, but in no bad style. Also a defence of Cero against the books of Asinius Gallus, which exhibited a considerable degree of learning. He besides invented three new letters and added them to the former alphabet, as highly necessary. He published a book to recommend them while he was yet only a private person, but on his elevation to imperial power he had little difficulty in introducing them into common use, and these letters are still extant in a variety of books, registers, and inscriptions upon buildings. He applied himself with no less attention to the study of Grecian literature, asserting upon all occasions his love of that language, and its surpassed excellency. A stranger once holding a discourse, both in Greek and Latin, he addressed him thus, Since you are skilled in both our tongues, and recommended Achaia to the favour of the Senate, he said, I have a particular attachment to that province on account of our common studies. In the Senate he often made long replies to ambassadors in that language. On the tribunal he frequently quoted the verses of Homer. When at any time he had taken vengeance on an enemy or a conspirator, he scarcely ever gave to the tribunal on God, who, according to the custom, came for the word any other than this, Andra epinasti ot tis proturus shalpani, tis time to strike when wrong demands the blow. To conclude, he wrote some histories likewise in Greek, namely twenty books on Tuscan affairs and eight on the Carthaginian in consequence of which another museum was founded at Alexandria, in addition to the old one, and called after his name. And it was ordered that upon certain days in every year his Tuscan history should be read over in one of these, and his Carthaginian in another, as in a school, each history being read through by persons who took it in turn. Towards the close of his life he gave some manifest indications that he repented of his marriage with Agrippina, and his adoption of Nero. For some of his freed men, noticing with approbation his having condemned the day before a woman accused of adultery, he remarked, It has been my misfortune to have wives who have been unfaithful to my bed, but they did not escape punishment. Often, when he happened to meet Britannicus, he would embrace him tenderly and express a desire that he might grow apace, and receive from him an account of all his actions using the Greek phrase Otrosus kai hyasetai, he who was wounded will also heal, and intending to give him the manly habit while he was yet under age and tender youth, because his stature would allow it, he added, I do so, and the Roman people may at last have a real Caesar. Soon afterwards he made his will, and had it signed by all the magistrates as witnesses, but he was prevented from proceeding further by Agrippina, accused by her own guilty conscience, as well as by informers of a variety of crimes. 
it was agreed that he was taken off by poison, but where and by whom administered remains in uncertainty. Some authors also say that it was given him as he was feasting with the priests in the capital, by the eunuch Halotus, his taster, others said by Agrippina, at his own table in mushrooms, a dish of which he was very fond. The accounts of what followed likewise differ. Some relate that he instantly became speechless, was racked with pain through the night, and died about daybreak. Others, that at first he fell into a sound sleep, and afterwards, his food rising, he threw up the hole, but had another dose given him, whether in water gruel, under pretense of refreshment, after his exhaustion, or in a cloister, as if designed to relieve his bowels, is likewise uncertain. His death was kept secret until everything was settled relative to his successor. Accordingly, vows were made for his recovery, and the comedians were called to amuse him, as it was pretended by his own desire. He died upon the 3rd of the Ides of October, 13th of October, in the consulship of Icinius Marcellus and Achilles Aviola, in the 64th year of his age and the 14th of his reign. His funeral was celebrated with the customary imperial pomp, and he was ranked amongst the guards. His honour was taken from him by Nero, but restored by Vespasian. The chief passages of his death were the appearance of a comet, his father Drusus's monument being struck by lightning, and the death of most of the magistrates of all ranks that year. It appears from several circumstances that he was sensible of his approaching dissolution, and made no secret of it, for when he nominated the consuls, he appointed no one to fill the office beyond the month in which he had died. At the last assembly of the Senate in which he had made his appearance, he earnestly exhorted his two sons to unity with each other, and with earnest entreaties commanded to the fathers the care of their tender years, and in the last cause that he heard from the tribunal he repeatedly declared in open court that he was now arrived at the last stage of mortal existence, while all who heard it shrunk at hearing these ominous words. End of Claudius Recording by Alan Steely, Bristol Hero, Part 1 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester Nero, Part 1, Paragraphs 1 to 18 Two celebrated families, the Calvini and Ahenobarbi, sprung from the race of the Domitii. The Ahenobarbi derive both their extraction and their cognomen from one Lucius Domitius, of whom we have this tradition. As he was returning out of the country to Rome, he was met by two young men of a most august appearance, who desired him to announce to the Senate and people a victory of which no certain intelligence had yet reached the city. To prove that they were more than mortals, they stroked his cheeks and thus changed his hair, which was black, to a bright colour resembling that of brass, which mark of distinction descended to his posterity, for they had generally red beards. This family had the honour of seven consulships, one triumph and two censorships, and being admitted into the patrician order, they continued the use of the same cognomen, with no other prinomina than those of Cnaeus and Lucius. These, however, they assumed with singular irregularity, three persons in succession sometimes adhering to one of them, and then they were changed alternately. For the first, second, and third of the Ahenobarbi had the prinomen of Lucius, and again the three following, successively, that of Cnaeus, while those who came after were called by turns one Lucius and the other Cnaeus. It appears to me proper to give a short account of several of the family, to show that Nero so far degenerated from the noble qualities of his ancestors that he retained only their vices, as if those alone had been transmitted to him by his descent. To begin, therefore, at a remote period, his great-grandfather's grandfather, Cnaeus Domitius, when he was tribune of the people, being offended with the high priests for electing another than himself in the room of his father, obtained the transfer of the right of election from the colleges of the priests to the people. 
In his consulship, having conquered the Allobroges and the Arverni, he made a progress through the province, mounted upon an elephant, with a body of soldiers attending him in a sort of triumphal pomp. Of this person the orator Licinius Crassus said, It was no wonder he had a brazen beard, who had a face of iron and a heart of lead. His son, during his praetorship, proposed that Cnaeus Caesar, upon the expiration of his consulship, should be called to account before the Senate for his administration of that office, which was supposed to be contrary both to the omens and the laws. Afterwards, when he was consul himself, he tried to deprive Cnaeus of the command of the army, and having been by intrigue and cabal appointed his successor, he was made prisoner at Corsinium, in the beginning of the civil war. Being set at liberty, he went to Marseilles, which was then besieged, where, having by his presence animated the people to hold out, he suddenly deserted them, and at last was slain in the Battle of Pharsalia. He was a man of little constancy, and of a sullen temper. In despair of his fortunes, he had recourse to poison, but was so terrified at the thoughts of death, that immediately repenting he took a vomit to throw it up again, and gave freedom to his physician, for having with great prudence and wisdom given him only a gentle dose of the poison. When Cnaeus Pompey was consulting with his friends in what manner he should conduct himself towards those who were neuter and took no part in the contest, he was the only one who proposed that they should be treated as enemies. He left a son, who was without doubt the best of the family. By the Pedian law he was condemned, although innocent, amongst others who were concerned in the death of Caesar. Upon this he went over to Brutus and Cassius, his near relations, and after their death not only kept together the fleet, the command of which had been given him some time before, but even increased it. At last, when the party had everywhere been defeated, he voluntarily surrendered it to Mark Antony, considering it as a piece of service for which the latter owed him no small obligations. Of all those who were condemned by the law above mentioned, he was the only man who was restored to his country, and filled the highest offices. When the civil war again broke out, he was appointed lieutenant under the same Antony, and offered the chief command by those who were ashamed of Cleopatra. But not daring, on account of a sudden indisposition with which he was seized, either to accept or refuse it, he went over to Augustus, and died a few days later, not without an aspersion cast upon his memory. For Antony gave out that he was induced to change sides by his impatience to be with his mistress, Servilia Nais. This Cnaeus had a son, named Domitius, who was afterwards well known as the nominal purchaser of the family property left by Augustus's will, and no less famous in his youth for his dexterity in chariot driving than he was afterwards for the triumphal ornaments which he obtained in the German war. But he was a man of great arrogance, prodigality, and cruelty. When he was aedile he obliged Lucius Plancus, the censor, to give him the way, and in his praetorship and consulship he made Roman knights and married women act on the stage. He gave hunts of wild beasts, both in the circus and in all the wards of the city, as also a show of gladiators, but with such barbarity that Augustus, after privately reprimanding him to no purpose, was obliged to restrain him by a public edict. By the elder Antonia he had Nero's father, a man of execrable character in every part of his life. During his attendance upon Caius Caesar in the east, he killed a freedman of his own for refusing to drink as much as he ordered him. Being dismissed for this from Caesar's society, he did not mend his habits, for in a village upon the Appian Road he suddenly whipped his horses and drove his chariot on purpose over a poor boy, crushing him to pieces. At Rome he struck out the eye of a Roman knight in the Forum, only for some free language in a dispute between them. He was likewise so fraudulent that he not only cheated some silversmiths of the price of goods he had bought of them, but, during his praetorship, defrauded the owners of chariots in the Circensian games of the prizes due to them for their victory. His sister jeering him for the complaints made by the leaders of the several parties, he agreed to sanction a law that, for the future, the prizes should be immediately paid. 
A little before the death of Tiberius, he was prosecuted for treason, adulteries, and incest with his sister Lepida, but escaped in the timely change of affairs, and died of a dropsy at Pyrgi, leaving behind him his son Nero, whom he had by Agrippina, the daughter of Germanicus. Nero was born at Antium, nine months after the death of Tiberius, upon the 18th of the calends of January, 15th of December, just as the sun rose, so that its beams touched him before they could well reach the earth. While many fearful conjectures, in respect to his future fortune, were formed by different persons from the circumstances of his nativity, a saying of his father Domitius was regarded as an ill presage, who told his friends, who were congratulating him upon the occasion, that nothing but what was detestable and pernicious to the public could ever be produced of him and Agrippina. Another manifest prognostic of his future infelicity occurred upon his lustration day, for Caius Caesar being requested by his sister to give the child what name he thought proper, looking at his uncle Claudius, who afterwards when emperor adopted Nero, he gave his, and this not seriously but only in jest, Agrippina treating it with contempt because Claudius at that time was a mere laughing-stock at the palace. He lost his father when he was three years old, being left heir to a third part of his estate, of which he never got possession, the whole being seized by his co-heir Caius. His mother being soon after banished, he lived with his aunt Lepida, in a very necessitous condition, under the care of two tutors, a dancing-master, and a barber. After Claudius came to the empire, he not only recovered his father's estate, but was enriched by the additional inheritance of that of his stepfather, Crispus Passienus. Upon his mother's recall from banishment, he was advanced to such favour, through Nero's powerful interest with the emperor, that it was reported assassins were employed by Messalina, Claudius's wife, to strangle him as Britannicus's rival, whilst he was taking his noonday repose. In addition to the story, it was said that they were frightened by a serpent, which crept from under his cushion, and ran away. The tale was occasioned by finding on his couch, near the pillow, the skin of a snake, which, by his mother's order, he wore for some time upon his right arm, enclosed in a bracelet of gold. This amulet at last he laid aside, from aversion to her memory, but he sought for it again in vain at the time of his extremity. When he was yet a mere boy, before he arrived at the age of puberty, during the celebration of the Circensian Games he performed his part in the Trojan play with a degree of firmness which gained him great applause. In the eleventh year of his age he was adopted by Claudius, and placed under the tuition of Aeneas Seneca, who had been made a senator. It is said that Seneca dreamt the night after that he was giving a lesson to Caius Caesar. Nero soon verified his dream betraying the cruelty of his disposition in every way he could. For he attempted to persuade his father that his brother, Britannicus, was nothing but a changeling, because the latter had saluted him, notwithstanding his adoption, by the name of Aenobarbus, as usual. When his aunt Lepida was brought to trial, he appeared in court as a witness against her, to gratify his mother, who persecuted the accused. On his introduction to the forum, at the age of manhood, he gave a largesse to the people, and a donative to the soldiers. For the Praetorian cohorts he appointed a solemn procession under arms, and marched at the head of them, with a shield in his hand, after which he went to return thanks to his father in the Senate. Before Claudius, likewise, at the time he was consul, he made a speech for the Bolognese in Latin, and for the Rhodians and people of Ilium in Greek. He had the jurisdiction of prefect of the city for the first time during the Latin festival, during which the most celebrated advocates brought before him not short and trifling causes, as is usual in that case, but trials of importance, notwithstanding they had instructions from Claudius himself to the contrary. Soon afterwards he married Octavia, and exhibited the Circensian games and hunting of wild beasts in honour of Claudius. He was seventeen years of age at the death of that prince, and as soon as that event was made public, he went out to the cohort on guard between the hours of six and seven, for the omens were so disastrous that no earlier time of the day was judged proper. 
On the steps before the palace gate he was unanimously saluted by the soldiers as their emperor, and then carried in a litter to the camp, thence, after making a short speech to the troops, into the senate house, where he continued until the evening, of all the immense honours which were heaped upon him, refusing none but the title of father of his country, on account of his youth. He began his reign with an ostentation of dutiful regard to the memory of Claudius, whom he buried with the utmost pomp and magnificence, pronouncing the funeral oration himself, and then had him enrolled amongst the gods. He paid likewise the highest honours to the memory of his father Domitius. He left the management of affairs, both public and private, to his mother. The word which he gave the first day of his reign to the tribune on guard was the best of mothers and afterwards he frequently appeared with her in the streets of Rome in her litter. He settled a colony at Antium, in which he placed the veteran soldiers belonging to the guards, and obliged several of the richest centurions of the first rank to transfer their residence to that place, where he likewise made a noble harbour at a prodigious expense. To establish still further his character, he declared that he designed to govern according to the model of Augustus, and omitted no opportunity of showing his generosity, clemency, and complacence. The more burthensome taxes he either entirely took off or diminished. The rewards appointed for informers by the Papian law he reduced to a fourth part, and distributed to the people four hundred sesterces a man. To the noblest of the senators, who were much reduced in their circumstances, he granted annual allowances, in some cases as much as five hundred thousand sesterces and to the Praetorian cohorts a monthly allowance of corn, gratis. When called upon to subscribe the sentence, according to custom, of a criminal condemned to die, I wish, said he, I had never learnt to read and write. He continually saluted people of the several orders by name without a prompter. When the Senate returned him their thanks for his good government, he replied to them, It will be time enough to do so when I shall have deserved it. He admitted the common people to see him perform his exercises in the Campus Martius. He frequently declaimed in public, and recited verses of his own composing, not only at home, but in the theatre, so much to the joy of all the people that public prayers were appointed to be put up to the gods upon that account, and the verses which he had publicly read were, after being written in gold letters, consecrated to Jupiter Capitolinus. He presented the people with a great number and variety of spectacles, as the juvenile and Circensian games, stage plays, and an exhibition of gladiators. In the juvenile he even admitted senators and aged matrons to perform parts. In the Circensian games he assigned the equestrian order seats apart from the rest of the people, and had races performed by chariots drawn each by four camels. In the games which he instituted for the eternal duration of the empire, and therefore ordered to be called Maximi, many of the senatorian and equestrian order of both sexes performed. A distinguished Roman knight descended on the stage by a rope mounted on an elephant. A Roman play, likewise, composed by Afranius, was brought upon the stage. It was entitled The Fire, and in it the performers were allowed to carry off and to keep to themselves the furniture of the house which, as the plot of the play required, was burnt down in the theatre. Every day during the solemnity many thousand articles of all descriptions were thrown amongst the people to scramble for, such as fowls of different kinds, tickets for corn, clothes, gold, silver, gems, pearls, pictures, slaves, beasts of burden, wild beasts that had been tamed, at last ships, Lots of houses and lands were offered as prizes in a lottery. These games he beheld from the front of the proscenium. In the show of gladiators, which he exhibited in a wooden amphitheatre, built within a year in the district of the Campus Martius, he ordered that none should be slain, not even the condemned criminals employed in the combats. He secured four hundred senators and six hundred Roman knights, amongst whom were some of unbroken fortunes and unblemished reputation, to act as gladiators. From the same orders he engaged persons to encounter wild beasts, and for various other services in the theatre. He presented the public with the representation of a naval fight upon sea-water, with huge fishes swimming in it, 
as also with the Pyrrhic dance performed by certain youths, to each of whom, after the performance was over, he granted the freedom of Rome. During this diversion, a bull covered pacify, concealed within a wooden statue of a cow, as many of the spectators believed. Icarus, upon his first attempt to fly, fell on the stage, close to the emperor's pavilion, and bespattered him with blood. For he very seldom presided in the games, but used to view them reclining on a couch, at first through some narrow apertures, but afterwards with the podium quite open. He was the first who instituted, in imitation of the Greeks, a trial of skill in the three several exercises of music, wrestling, and horse-racing, to be performed at Rome every five years, and which he called Neronia. Upon the dedication of his bath and gymnasium, he furnished the senate and the equestrian order with oil. He appointed as judges of the trial men of consular rank, chosen by lot, who sat with the praetors. At this time he went down into the orchestra amongst the senators, and received the crown for the best performance in Latin prose and verse, for which several persons of the greatest merit contended, but they unanimously yielded to him. The crown for the best performer on the harp being likewise awarded to him by the judges, he devoutly saluted it, and ordered it to be carried to the statue of Augustus. In the gymnastic exercises, which he presented in the sceptre, while they were preparing the great sacrifice of an ox, he shaved his beard for the first time, and, putting it up in a casket of gold studded with pearls of great price, consecrated it to Jupiter Capitolinus. He invited the Vestal Virgins to see the wrestlers perform, because at Olympia the priestesses of Ceres are allowed the privilege of witnessing that exhibition. Amongst the spectacles presented by him, the solemn entrance of Tiridates into the city deserves to be mentioned. This personage, who was king of Armenia, he invited to Rome by very liberal promises. But being prevented by unfavourable weather from showing him to the people upon the day fixed by proclamation, he took the first opportunity which occurred, several cohorts being drawn up under arms about the temples in the forum, while he was seated on a curule chair on the rostra, in a triumphal dress, amidst the military standards and ensigns. Upon Tiridates advancing towards him, on a stage made shelving for the purpose, he permitted him to throw himself at his feet, but quickly raised him with his right hand and kissed him. The emperor then, at the king's request, took the turban from his head and replaced it by a crown, whilst a person of praetorian rank proclaimed in Latin the words in which the prince addressed the emperor as a suppliant. After this ceremony the king was conducted to the theatre, where, after renewing his obeisance, Nero seated him on his right hand. Being then greeted by universal acclamation with the title of emperor, and sending his laurel crown to the capital, Nero shut the temple of the two-faced Janus, as though there now existed no war throughout the Roman Empire. He filled the consulship four times, the first for two months, the second and last for six, and the third for four. The two intermediate ones he held successively, but the others after an interval of some years between them. In the administration of justice he scarcely ever gave his decision on the pleadings before the next day, and then in writing. His manner of hearing causes was not to allow any adjournment, but to dispatch them in order as they stood. When he withdrew to consult his assessors, he did not debate the matter openly with them, but silently and privately reading over their opinions, which they gave separately in writing, he pronounced sentence from the tribunal according to his own view of the case, as if it was the opinion of the majority. For a long time he would not admit the sons of freedmen into the senate, and those who had been admitted by former princes he excluded from all public offices. To supernumerary candidates he gave command in the legions, to comfort them under the delay of their hopes. The consulship he commonly conferred for six months, and one of the two consuls dying a little before the 1st of January, he substituted no one in his place, disliking what had been formerly done for Caninius Rebilus on such an occasion, who was consul for one day only. He allowed the triumphal honours only to those who were of quaestorian rank, and to some of the equestrian order, and bestowed them without regard to military service. And instead of the quaestors, whose office it properly was, 
he frequently ordered that the addresses which he sent to the Senate on certain occasions should be read by the consuls. He devised a new style of building in the city, ordering piazzas to be erected before all houses, both in the streets and detached, to give facilities from their terraces, in case of fire, for preventing it from spreading, and these he built at his own expense. He likewise designed to extend the city walls as far as Ostia, and bring the sea from thence by a canal into the old city. Many severe regulations and new orders were made in his time. A sumptuary law was enacted, public suppers were limited to the sportuli, and victualling houses restrained from selling any dressed victuals except pulse and herbs, whereas before they sold all kinds of meat. He likewise inflicted punishments on the Christians, a sort of people who held a new and impious superstition. He forbade the revels of the charioteers, who had long assumed a license to stroll about, and established for themselves a kind of prescriptive right to cheat and thieve, making a jest of it. The partisans of the rival theatrical performers were banished, as well as the actors themselves. To prevent forgery, a method was then first invented of having writings bored, run through three times with a thread, and then sealed. It was likewise provided that in wills, the two first pages with only the testator's name upon them should be presented blank to those who were to sign them as witnesses, and that no one who wrote a will for another should insert any legacy for himself. It was likewise ordained that clients should pay their advocates a certain reasonable fee, but nothing for the court, which was to be gratuitous, the charges for it being paid out of the public treasury. That causes, the cognizance of which before belonged to the judges of the exchequer, should be transferred to the forum and the ordinary tribunals, and that all appeals from the judges should be made to the senate. He never entertained the least ambition or hope of augmenting and extending the frontiers of the empire, on the contrary, he had thoughts of withdrawing the troops from Britain, and was only restrained from so doing by the fear of appearing to detract from the glory of his father. All that he did was to reduce the kingdom of Pontus, which was ceded to him by Polemon, and also the Alps, upon the death of Cotius, into the form of a province. End of Nero, Part 1《Part Two of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Nero, Part Two. Paragraphs 19-31 to 31. Twice only he undertook any foreign expeditions, one to Alexandria and the other to Achaia, but he abandoned the prosecution of the former on the very day fixed for his departure, by being deterred both by ill omens and the hazard of the voyage. For while he was making the circuit of the temples, having seated himself in that of Vesta, when he attempted to rise, the skirt of his robe stuck fast and he was instantly seized with such a dimness in his eyes that he could not see a yard before him. In Achaia he attempted to make a cut through the isthmus, and having made a speech encouraging his praetorians to set about the work, on a signal given by sound of trumpet, he first broke ground with a spade, and carried off a basket full of earth upon his shoulders. He made preparations for an expedition to the pass of the Caspian Mountains, forming a new legion out of his late levies in Italy, of men all six feet high, which he called the phalanx of Alexander the Great. These transactions, in part unexceptionable and in part highly commendable, I have brought into one view, in order to separate them from the scandalous and criminal part of his conduct, of which I shall now give an account. Among the other liberal arts which he was taught in his youth, he was instructed in music, and immediately after his advancement to the empire, he sent for Terpnus, a performer upon the harp, who flourished at that time with the highest reputation. Sitting with him for several days following, as he sang and played after supper until late at night, he began by degrees to practice upon the instrument himself. 
nor did he omit any of those expedients which artists in music adopt for the preservation and improvement of their voices. He would lie upon his back, with a sheet of lead upon his breast, clear his stomach and bowels by vomits and clisters, and forbear the eating of fruits, or food prejudicial to the voice. Encouraged by his proficiency, though his voice was naturally neither loud nor clear, he was desirous of appearing upon the stage, frequently repeating amongst his friends a Greek proverb to this effect, that no one had any regard for music which they never heard. Accordingly he made his first public appearance at Naples, and although the theatre quivered with the sudden shock of an earthquake, he did not desist until he had finished the piece of music he had begun. He played and sung in the same place several times, and for several days together, taking only now and then a little respite to refresh his voice. Impatient of retirement, it was his custom to go from the bath to the theatre, and after dining in the orchestra, amidst a crowded assembly of the people, he promised them in Greek that after he had drunk a little he would give them a tune which would make their ears tingle. Being highly pleased with the songs that were sung in his praise by some Alexandrians belonging to the fleet just arrived at Naples, he sent for more of the like singers from Alexandria. At the same time he chose young men of the equestrian order, and about five thousand robust young fellows from the common people, on purpose to learn various kinds of applause, called bombi, imbriques, and testi, which they were to practice in his favour whenever he performed. They were divided into several parties, and were remarkable for their fine heads of hair, and were extremely well dressed with rings upon their left hands. The leaders of these bands had salaries of forty thousand sesterces allowed them. At Rome, also being extremely proud of his singing, he ordered the games called Neronia to be celebrated before the time fixed for their return. All now becoming importunate to hear his heavenly voice, he informed them that he would gratify those who desired it at the gardens. But the soldiers then on guard, seconding the voice of the people, he promised to comply with their request immediately and with all his heart. He instantly ordered his name to be entered upon the list of musicians who proposed to contend, and having thrown his lot into the urn among the rest, took his turn, and entered, attended by the prefects of the Praetorian cohorts bearing his harp, and followed by the military tribunes and several of his intimate friends. After he had taken his station and made the usual prelude, he commanded Cluvius Rufus, a man of consular rank, to proclaim in the theatre that he intended to sing the story of Niobe. This he accordingly did, and continued it until nearly ten o'clock, but deferred the disposal of the crown and the remaining part of the solemnity until the next year, that he might have more frequent opportunities of performing. But that being too long, he could not refrain from often appearing as a public performer during the interval. He made no scruple of exhibiting on the stage, even in the spectacles presented to the people by private persons, and was offered by one of the praetors no less than a million of sesterces for his services. He likewise sang tragedies in a mask, the visors of the heroes and gods, as also of the heroines and goddesses, being formed into a resemblance of his own face and that of any woman he was in love with. Amongst the rest he sang Kanake in Labour. Orestes the murderer of his mother, Oedipus blinded, and Hercules mad. In the last tragedy it is said that a young sentinel, posted at the entrance of the stage, seeing him in a prison dress and bound with fetters, as the fable of the play required, ran to his assistance. He had from his childhood an extravagant passion for horses, and his constant talk was of the Circensian races, notwithstanding it was prohibited him. Lamenting once among his fellow pupils the case of a charioteer of the Green Party, who was dragged around the circus at the tail of his chariot, and being reprimanded by his tutor for it, he pretended that he was talking of Hector. In the beginning of his reign he used to amuse himself daily with chariots drawn by four horses made of ivory upon a table. He attended at all the lesser exhibitions in the circus, at first privately, but at last openly so that nobody ever doubted of his presence on any particular day, nor did he conceal his desire to have the number of the prizes doubled, so that the races being increased accordingly, the diversion continued until a late hour, the leaders of parties refusing now to bring out their companies for any time less than the whole day. 
Upon this he took a fancy for driving the chariot himself, and that even publicly. Having made his first experiment in the gardens, amidst crowds of slaves and other rabble, he at length performed in the view of all the people in the Circus Maximus, whilst one of his freedmen dropped the napkin in the place where the magistrates used to give the signal. Not satisfied with exhibiting various specimens of his skill in those arts at Rome, he went over to Achaia, as has been already said, principally for this purpose. The several cities in which solemn trials of musical skill used to be publicly held had resolved to send him the crowns belonging to those who bore away the prize. These he accepted so graciously that he not only gave the deputies who brought them an immediate audience, but even invited them to his table. Being requested by some of them to sing at supper, and prodigiously applauded, he said, the Greeks were the only people who had an ear for music, and were the only good judges of him and his attainments. Without delay he commenced his journey, and on his arrival at Cassiope exhibited his first musical performance before the altar of Jupiter Cassius. He afterwards appeared at the celebration of all public games in Greece, for such as fell in different years he brought within the compass of one, and some he ordered to be celebrated a second time in the same year. At Olympia, likewise, contrary to custom, he appointed a public performance in music, and that he might meet with no interruption in this employment, when he was informed by his freedman Helius that affairs at Rome required his presence, he wrote to him in these words, Though now all your hopes and wishes are for my speedy return, yet you ought rather to advise and hope that I may come back with a character worthy of Nero. During the time of his musical performance, nobody was allowed to stir out of the theatre upon any account, however necessary, insomuch that it is said some women with child were delivered there. Many of the spectators being quite wearied with hearing and applauding him, because the town gates were shut, slipped privately over the walls, or, counterfeiting themselves dead, were carried out for their funeral. With what extreme anxiety he engaged in these contests, with what keen desire to bear away the prize, and with how much awe of the judges, is scarcely to be believed. As if his adversaries had been on a level with himself, he would watch them narrowly, defame them privately, and sometimes upon meeting them rail at them in very scurrilous language, or bribe them if they were better performers than himself. He always addressed the judges with the most profound reverence before he began, telling them he had done all things that were necessary by way of preparation, but that the issue of the approaching trial was in the hand of fortune, and that they, as wise and skilful men, ought to exclude from their judgment things merely accidental. Upon their encouraging him to have a good heart, he went off with more assurance, but not entirely free from anxiety, interpreting the silence and modesty of some of them into sourness and ill-nature, and saying that he was suspicious of them. In these contests he adhered so strictly to the rules, that he never durst spit, nor wipe the sweat from his forehead in any other way than with his sleeve. Having in the performance of a tragedy dropped his sceptre, and not quickly recovering it, he was in a great fright lest he should be set aside for the miscarriage, and could not regain his assurance until an actor who stood by swore he was certain it had not been observed in the midst of the acclamations and exultations of the people. When the prize was adjudged to him, he always proclaimed it himself, and even entered the lists with the heralds. That no memory or the least monument might remain of any other victor in the sacred Grecian games, he ordered all their statues and pictures to be pulled down, dragged away with hooks, and thrown into the common sewers. He drove the chariot with various numbers of horses, and at the Olympic Games with no fewer than ten, though in a poem of his he had reflected upon Mithridates for that innovation. Being thrown out of his chariot, he was again replaced, but could not retain his seat, and was obliged to give up before he reached the goal, but was crowned notwithstanding. On his departure he declared the whole province a free country, and conferred upon the judges in the several games the freedom of Rome with large sums of money. All these favours he proclaimed himself with his own voice from the middle of the stadium during the solemnity of the Isthmian games. 
on his return from Greece, arriving at Naples, because he had commenced his career as a public performer in that city, he made his entrance in a chariot drawn by white horses through a breach in the city wall, according to the practice of those who were victorious in the sacred Grecian games. In the same manner he entered Antium, Alba, and Rome. He made his entry into the city, riding in the same chariot in which Augustus had triumphed, in a purple tunic and a cloak embroidered with golden stars, having on his head the crown won at Olympia, and in his right hand that which was given him at the Parthian Games, the rest being carried in a procession before him, with inscriptions denoting the places where they had been won, from whom, and in what plays or musical performances, whilst a train followed him with loud acclamations, crying out that they were the emperor's attendants and the soldiers of his triumph. Having then caused an arch of the Circus Maximus to be taken down, he passed through the breach, as also through the Velabrum and the Forum, to the Palatine Hill and the Temple of Apollo. Everywhere as he marched along, victims were slain, while the streets were strewed with saffron, and birds, chaplets, and sweetmeats scattered abroad. He suspended the sacred crowns in his chamber about his beds, and caused statues of himself to be erected in the attire of a harper and as his likeness stamped upon the coin in the same dress. After this period he was so far from abating anything of his application to music, that for the preservation of his voice he never addressed the soldiers but by messages, or with some person to deliver his speeches for him, when he thought fit to make his appearance amongst them. Nor did he ever do anything, either in jest or earnest, without a voice-master standing by, to caution him against overstraining his vocal organs, and to apply a handkerchief to his mouth when he did. He offered his friendship or avowed open enmity to many, according as they were lavish or sparing in giving him their applause. Petulancy, lewdness, luxury, avarice, and cruelty he practised at first with reserve and in private, as if prompted to them only by the folly of youth but even then the world was of opinion that they were the faults of his nature, and not of his age. After it was dark he used to enter the taverns, disguised in a cap or a wig, and ramble about the streets in sport, which was not void of mischief. He used to beat those he met coming home from supper, and if they made any resistance, would wound them and throw them into the common sewer. He broke open and robbed shops, establishing an auction at home for selling his booty, in the scuffles which took place on those occasions, he often ran the hazard of losing his eyes and even his life, being beaten almost to death by a senator for handling his wife indecently. After this adventure he never again ventured abroad at that time of night without some tribunes following him at a little distance. In the daytime he would be carried to the theatre, incognito, in a litter, placing himself upon the upper part of the proscenium, where he not only witnessed the quarrels which arose on account of the performances, but also encouraged them. When they came to blows, and stones and pieces of broken benches began to fly about, he threw them plentifully amongst the people, and once even broke a praetor's head. His vices gaining strength by degrees, he laid aside his jocular amusements and all disguise, breaking out into enormous crimes without the least attempt to conceal them. His revels were prolonged from midday to midnight, while he was frequently refreshed by warm baths, and in the summer time by such as were cooled with snow. He often supped in public, in the Naumachia with the sluices shut, or in the Campus Martius, or the Circus Maximus, being waited upon at table by common prostitutes of the town, and Syrian strumpets and glee girls. As often as he went down the Tiber to Ostia, or coasted through the Gulf of Baiae, Booths furnished as brothels and eating-houses were erected along the shore and river-banks, before which stood matrons who, like boards and hostesses, allured him to land. It was also his custom to invite himself to supper with his friends, at one of which was expended no less than four millions of sesterces in chaplets, and at another something more in roses. Besides the abuse of free-born lads, and the debauch of married women, he committed a rape upon Rubria, a vestal virgin. He was upon the point of marrying Acte, his freedwoman, having suborned some men of consular rank to swear that she was of royal descent. 
he gelded the boy Sporus, and endeavoured to transform him into a woman. He even went so far as to marry him with all the usual formalities of a marriage settlement, the rose-coloured nuptial veil, and a numerous company at the wedding. When the ceremony was over, he had him conducted like a bride to his own house, and treated him as his wife. It was jocularly observed by some person that it would have been well for mankind had such a wife fallen to the lot of his father, Domitius. This Sporus he carried about with him in a litter round the solemn assemblies and fairs of Greece, and afterwards at Rome through the Sigillaria, dressed in the rich attire of an empress, kissing him from time to time as they rode together. That he entertained an incestuous passion for his mother, but was deterred by her enemies, for fear that this haughty and overbearing woman should by her compliance get him entirely into her power and govern in everything, was universally believed especially after he had introduced amongst his concubines a strumpet who was reported to have a strong resemblance to Agrippina. He prostituted his own chastity to such a degree that after he had defiled every part of his person with some unnatural pollution, he at last invented an extraordinary kind of diversion, which was to be let out of a den in the arena, covered with the skin of a wild beast, and then assail with violence the private parts both of men and women, while they were bound to stakes. After he had vented this furious passion upon them, he finished the play in the embraces of his freedman Doriphorus, to whom he was married in the same way that Sporus had been married to himself, imitating the cries and shrieks of young virgins when they are ravished. I have been informed from numerous sources that he firmly believed no man in the world to be chaste or any part of his person undefiled, but that most men concealed that vice, and were cunning enough to keep it secret. To those, therefore, who frankly owned their unnatural lewdness, he forgave all other crimes. He thought that there was no other use of riches and money than to squander them away profusely, regarding all those as sordid wretches who kept their expenses within due bounds and extolling those as truly noble and generous souls who lavished away and wasted all they possessed. He praised and admired his uncle Caius upon no account more than for squandering in a short time the vast treasure left him by Tiberius. Accordingly he was himself extravagant and profuse beyond all bounds. He spent upon Tiridates eight hundred thousand sesterces a day, a sum almost incredible, and at his departure presented him with upwards of a million. He likewise bestowed upon Menecrates the harper, and Spicillus a gladiator, the estates and houses of men who had received the honour of a triumph. He enriched the usurer, Cercopithecus Penerotes, with estates both in town and country, and gave him a funeral in pomp and magnificence little inferior to that of princes. He never wore the same garment twice. He has been known to stake four hundred thousand sesterces on a throw of the dice. It was his custom to fish with a golden net drawn by silken cords of purple and scarlet. It is said that he never travelled with less than a thousand baggage carts, the mules being all shod with silver, and the drivers dressed in scarlet jackets of the finest Canusian cloth, with a numerous train of footmen and troops of mazacans with bracelets on their arms, and mounted upon horses in splendid trappings. In nothing was he more prodigal than in his buildings. He completed his palace by continuing it from the Palatine to the Esquiline Hill, calling the building at first only the Passage, but after it was burnt down and rebuilt, the Golden House. Of its dimensions and furniture it may be sufficient to say thus much. The porch was so high that there stood in it a colossal statue of himself a hundred and twenty feet in height, and the space included in it was so ample that it had triple porticoes a mile in length, and a lake like a sea, surrounded with buildings which had the appearance of a city. Within its area were cornfields, vineyards, pastures, and woods, containing a vast number of animals of various kinds, both wild and tame. In other parts it was entirely overlaid with gold, and adorned with jewels and mother-of-pearl. The supper-rooms were vaulted, and compartments of the ceilings, inlaid with ivory, 
were made to revolve and scatter flowers, while they contained pipes which shed unguents upon the guests. The chief banqueting room was circular, and revolved perpetually, night and day, in imitation of the motion of the celestial bodies. The baths were supplied with water from the sea and the albula. Upon the dedication of this magnificent house after it was finished, all he said in approval of it was, that he had now a dwelling fit for a man. He commenced making a pond for the reception of all the hot streams from Baie, which he designed to have continued from Misenum to the Avernian Lake, in a conduit, enclosed in galleries, and also a canal from Avernum to Ostia, that ships might pass from one to the other without a sea voyage. The length of the proposed canal was one hundred and sixty miles, and it was intended to be of breadth sufficient to permit ships with five banks of oars to pass each other. For the execution of these designs, he ordered all prisoners in every part of the empire to be brought to Italy, and that even those who were convicted of the most heinous crimes, in lieu of any other sentence, should be condemned to work at them. He was encouraged to all this wild and enormous profusion, not only by the great revenue of the empire, but by the sudden hopes given him of an immense hidden treasure, which Queen Dido, upon her flight from Tyre, had brought with her to Africa. This, a Roman knight pretended to assure him on good grounds, was still hid there in some deep caverns, and might with a little labour be recovered. End of Nero Part 2《》of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. — The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. — Nero, Part 3. Paragraphs 32 to 40. But being disappointed in his expectations of this resource, and reduced to such difficulties for want of money, that he was obliged to defer paying his troops, and the rewards due to the veterans, he resolved upon supplying his necessities by means of false accusations and plunder. In the first place he ordered that if any freedman, without sufficient reason, bore the name of the family to which he belonged, the half, instead of three-fourths of his estate, should be brought into the exchequer at his decease, also that the estates of all such persons as had not in their wills been mindful of their prince should be confiscated, and that the lawyers who had drawn or dictated such wills should be liable to a fine. He ordained likewise that all words and actions upon which any informer could ground a prosecution should be deemed treason. He demanded an equivalent for the crowns which the cities of Greece had at any time offered him in the solemn games. Having forbade any one to use the colours of amethyst and Tyrian purple, he privately sent a person to sell a few ounces of them upon the day of the Nundinae, and then shut up all the merchant's shops on the pretext that his edict had been violated. It is said that as he was playing and singing in the theatre, observing a married lady dressed in the purple which he had prohibited, he pointed her out to his procurators, upon which she was immediately dragged out of her seat, and not only stripped of her clothes, but her property. He never nominated a person to any office without saying to him, You know what I want, and let us take care that nobody has anything he can call his own. At last he rifled many temples of the rich offerings with which they were stored, and melted down all the gold and silver statues, and amongst them those of the Penates, which Galba afterwards restored. He began the practice of parricide and murder with Claudius himself, for although he was not the contriver of his death, he was privy to the plot. Nor did he make any secret of it, but used afterwards to commend in a Greek proverb mushrooms as food fit for the gods, because Claudius had been poisoned with them. He traduced his memory both by word and deed in the grossest manner, one while charging him with folly, another with cruelty. For he used to say by way of jest that he had ceased morari amongst men, pronouncing the first syllable long, 
and treated as null many of his decrees and ordinances, as made by a doting old blockhead. He enclosed the place where his body was burnt with only a low wall of rough masonry. He attempted to poison Britannicus, as much out of envy because he had a sweeter voice as from apprehension of what might ensue from the respect which the people entertained for his father's memory. He employed for this purpose a woman named Locusta, who had been a witness against some persons guilty of like practices. But the poison she gave him, working more slowly than he expected, and only causing a purge, he sent for the woman, and beat her with his own hand, charging her with administering an antidote instead of poison, and upon her alleging an excuse that she had given Britannicus but a gentle mixture in order to prevent suspicion, "'Think you,' said he, "'that I am afraid of the Julian law,' and obliged her to prepare in his own chamber and before his eyes as quick and strong a dose as possible. This he tried upon a kid, but the animal lingering for five hours before it expired, he ordered her to go to work again, and when she had done he gave the poison to a pig, which dying immediately he commanded the potion to be brought into the eating-room and given to Britannicus while he was at supper with him. The prince had no sooner tasted it than he sunk on the floor, Nero, meanwhile, pretending to the guests that it was only a fit of the falling sickness, to which he said he was subject. He buried him the following day, in a mean and hurried way, during violent storms of rain. He gave Locusta a pardon, and rewarded her with a great estate in land, placing some disciples with her to be instructed in her trade. His mother, being used to make strict inquiry into what he said or did, and to reprimand him with the freedom of a parent, he was so much offended that he endeavoured to expose her to public resentment by frequently pretending a resolution to quit the government and retire to Rhodes. Soon afterwards he deprived her of all honour and power, took from her the guard of Roman and German soldiers, banished her from the palace and from his society, and persecuted her in every way he could contrive, employing persons to harass her when at Rome with lawsuits, and to disturb her in her retirement from town with the most scurrilous and abusive language, following her about by land and sea. But being terrified with her menaces and violent spirit, he resolved upon her destruction, and thrice attempted it by poison. Finding, however, that she had previously secured herself by antidotes, he contrived machinery by which the floor over her bedchamber might be made to fall upon her while she was asleep in the night. This design miscarrying likewise, through the little caution used by those who were in the secret, his next stratagem was to construct a ship which could be easily shivered, in hopes of destroying her either by drowning, or by the deck above her cabin crushing her in its fall. Accordingly, under colour of a pretended reconciliation, he wrote her an extremely affectionate letter, inviting her to Baye to celebrate with him the festival of Minerva. He had given private orders to the captains of the galleys which were to attend her to shatter to pieces the ship in which she had come, by falling foul of it, but in such a manner that it might appear to be done accidentally. He prolonged the entertainment for the more convenient opportunity of executing the plot in the night, and at her return from Bauli, instead of the old ship which had conveyed her to Baye, he offered that which he had contrived for her destruction. He attended her to the vessel in a very cheerful mood, and at parting with her kissed her breasts, after which he sat up very late in the night, waiting with great anxiety to learn the issue of his project. But receiving information that everything had fallen out contrary to his wish, and that she had saved herself by swimming, not knowing what course to take, upon her freedman, Lucius Agarinus, bringing word with great joy that she was safe and well, he privately dropped a poniard by him. He then commanded the freedman to be seized and put in chains, under pretense of his having been employed by his mother to assassinate him, at the same time ordering her to be put to death, and giving out that, to avoid punishment for her intended crime, she had laid violent hands upon herself. Other circumstances still more horrible are related on good authority, as that he went to view her corpse, and handling her limbs pointed out some blemishes, and commended other points and that, growing thirsty during the survey, he called for drink. Yet he was never afterwards able to bear the stings of his own conscience for this atrocious act, although encouraged by the congratulatory addresses of the army, the senate, and people. 
he frequently affirmed that he was haunted by his mother's ghost, and persecuted with the whips and burning torches of the Furies. Nay, he attempted by magical rites to bring up her ghost from below and soften her rage against him. When he was in Greece he durst not attend the celebration of the Eleusinian mysteries, at the initiation of which impious and wicked persons are warned by the voice of the herald from approaching the rites. Besides the murder of his mother, he had been guilty of that of his aunt, for being obliged to keep her bed in consequence of a complaint in her bowels, he paid her a visit, and she, being then advanced in years, stroking his downy chin in the tenderness of affection, said to him, May I but live to see the day when this is shaved for the first time, and I shall then die contented. He turned, however, to those about him, made a jest of it, saying that he would have his beard immediately taken off, and ordered the physicians to give her more violent purgatives. He seized upon her estate before she had expired, suppressing her will, that he might enjoy the whole himself. He had besides Octavia two other wives, Poppaea Sabina, whose father had borne the office of Quaestor, and who had been married before to a Roman knight, and after her Statilia Messalina, great-granddaughter of Taurus, who was twice consul, and received the honour of a triumph. To obtain possession of her he put to death her husband, Atticus Vestinus, who was then consul. He soon became disgusted with Octavia, and ceased from having any intercourse with her, and being censured by his friends for it, he replied, She ought to be satisfied with having the rank and appendages of his wife. Soon afterwards he made several attempts, but in vain, to strangle her, and then divorced her for barrenness. But the people disapproving of the divorce, and making severe comments upon it, he also banished her. At last he put her to death upon a charge of adultery so impudent and false, that when all those who were put to the torture positively denied their knowledge of it, he suborned his pedagogue, Anicetus, to affirm that he had secretly intrigued with and debauched her. He married Poppaea twelve days after the divorce of Octavia, and entertained a great affection for her, but nevertheless killed her with a kick which he gave her when she was big with child and in bad health, only because she found fault with him for returning late from driving his chariot. He had by her a daughter, Claudia Augusta, who died an infant. There was no person at all connected with him who escaped his deadly and unjust cruelty. Under pretense of her being engaged in a plot against him, he put to death Antonia, Claudius's daughter, who refused to marry him after the death of Poppaea. In the same way he destroyed all who were allied to him either by blood or marriage, amongst whom was young Aulus Plautinus. He first compelled him to submit to his unnatural lust, and then ordered him to be executed, crying out, Let my mother bestow her kisses on my successor thus defiled, pretending that he had been his mother's paramour, and by her encouraged to aspire to the empire. His stepson Rufinus Crispinus, Poppaea's son, though a minor, he ordered to be drowned in the sea, while he was fishing, by his own slaves, because he was reported to act frequently amongst his playfellows the part of a general or an emperor. He banished Tuscus, his nurse's son, for presuming, when he was procurator of Egypt, to wash in the baths which had been constructed in expectation of his own coming. Seneca, his preceptor, he forced to kill himself, though upon his desiring leave to retire, and offering to surrender his estate, he solemnly swore that there was no foundation for his suspicions, and that he would perish himself sooner than hurt him. Having promised Burrus, the Praetorian prefect, a remedy for a swelling in his throat, he sent him poison. Some old rich freedmen of Claudius, who had formerly not only promoted his adoption, but were also instrumental to his advancement to the empire, and had been his governors, he took off by poison, given them in their meat or drink. Nor did he proceed with less cruelty against those who were not of his family. A blazing star, which is vulgarly supposed to portend destruction to kings and princes, appeared above the horizon several nights successively. He felt great anxiety on account of this phenomenon, and being informed by one Babylus, an astrologer, that princes were used to expiate such omens by the sacrifice of illustrious persons, and so avert the danger foreboded to their own persons, by bringing it on the heads of their chief men, 
he resolved on the destruction of the principal nobility in Rome. He was the more encouraged to do this because he had some plausible pretense for carrying it into execution from the discovery of two conspiracies against him, the former and more dangerous of which was that formed by Piso and discovered at Rome, the other was that of Vinicius at Beneventum. The conspirators were brought to their trials loaded with triple fetters. Some ingenuously confessed the charge, others avowed that they thought the design against his life an act of favour for which he was obliged to them, as it was impossible in any other way than by death to relieve a person rendered infamous by crimes of the greatest enormity. The children of those who had been condemned were banished the city, and afterwards either poisoned or starved to death. It is asserted that some of them, with their tutors, and the slaves who carried their satchels, were all poisoned together at one dinner, and others not suffered to seek their daily bread. From this period he butchered, without distinction or quarter, all whom his caprice suggested as objects for his cruelty, and upon the most frivolous pretenses. To mention only a few. Salvidianus or Fetus was accused of letting out three taverns attached to his house in the Forum to some cities for the use of their deputies at Rome. The charge against Cassius Longinus, a lawyer who had lost his sight, was that he kept amongst the busts of his ancestors that of Caius Cassius, who was concerned in the death of Julius Caesar. The only charge objected against Paetus Thrasea was that he had a melancholy cast of features and looked like a schoolmaster. He allowed but one hour to those whom he obliged to kill themselves, and to prevent delay he sent them physicians, to cure them immediately if they lingered beyond that time, for so he called bleeding them to death. There was at that time an Egyptian of a most voracious appetite, who would digest raw flesh or anything else that was given him. It was credibly reported that the emperor was extremely desirous of furnishing him with living men to tear and devour. Being elated with his great success in the perpetration of crimes, he declared that no prince before himself ever knew the extent of his power. He threw out strong intimations that he would not even spare the senators who survived, but would entirely extirpate that order, and put the provinces and armies into the hands of the Roman knights and his own freedmen. It is certain that he never gave or vouchsafed to allow anyone the customary kiss, either on entering or departing, or even returned a salute. And at the inauguration of a work, the cut through the isthmus, he, with a loud voice amidst the assembled multitude, uttered a prayer, that the undertaking might prove fortunate for himself and the Roman people, without taking the smallest notice of the Senate. He spared, moreover, neither the people of Rome nor the capital of his country. Somebody in conversation saying, Emuta nontos gaia micteto puri, when I am dead let fire devour the world. Nay, said he, let it be while I am living, emus dontos. And he acted accordingly, for, pretending to be disgusted with the old buildings and the narrow and winding streets, he set the city on fire so openly that many of consular rank caught his own household servants on their property, with tow and torches in their hands, but durst not meddle with them. There being near his golden house some granaries, the sight of which he exceedingly coveted, they were battered as if with machines of war, and set on fire, the walls being built of stone. During six days and seven nights this terrible devastation continued, the people being obliged to fly to the tombs and monuments for lodging and shelter. Meanwhile a vast number of stately buildings, the houses of generals celebrated in former times, and even then still decorated with the spoils of war, were laid in ashes, as well as the temples of the gods, which had been vowed and dedicated by the kings of Rome, and afterwards in the Punic and Gallic wars. In short, everything that was remarkable and worthy to be seen which time had spared. This fire he beheld from a tower in the house of Mechinus, and, being greatly delighted, as he said, with the beautiful effects of the conflagration, he sung a poem to the ruin of Troy, in the tragic dress he used on the stage. To turn this calamity to his own advantage by plunder and rapine, he promised to remove the bodies of those who had perished in the fire, and clear the rubbish at his own expense, 
suffering no one to meddle with the remains of their property. But he not only received but exacted contributions on account of the loss, until he had exhausted the means both of the provinces and private persons. To these terrible and shameful calamities brought upon the people by their prince were added some proceeding from misfortune. Such were a pestilence, by which within the space of one autumn there died no less than thirty thousand persons, as appeared from the registers in the temple of Libitina, a great disaster in Britain, where two of the principal towns belonging to the Romans were plundered, and a dreadful havoc made both amongst our troops and allies, a shameful discomfiture of the army of the East, where in Armenia the legions were obliged to pass under the yoke, and it was with great difficulty that Syria was retained. Amidst all these disasters it was strange, and indeed particularly remarkable, that he bore nothing more patiently than the scurrilous language and railing abuse which was in every one's mouth, treating no class of persons with more gentleness than those who assailed him with invective and lampoons. Many things of that kind were posted up about the city, or otherwise published, both in Greek and Latin, such as these. Neron, Orestes, Alcmaion, Metroctonoi. Neonymphon Neron, Idian Meter Apectenin. Orestes and Alcmaion, Nero too, the lustful Nero, worst of all the crew, fresh from his bridal, their own mothers slew. Quis neget Aeneae magna de stirpe Neronem, sustulit hic matrem, sustulit ille patrem sprung from Aeneas, pious, wise, and great, who says that Nero is degenerate? Safe through the flames one bore his sire, the other, to save himself, took off his loving mother. Dum tendit citaram noster, dum cornua partus, noster erit paean, ille hecate belletes. His lyre to harmony our Nero strings, his arrows o'er the plain the Parthian wings, ours call the tuneful Paean famed in war, the other Phoebus name, the god who shoots afar. Roma domus fiet, veos migrate quidites, si non et veos occupat ista domus. All Rome will be one house, to vei fly, should it not stretch to vei by and by. But he neither made any inquiry after the authors, nor when information was laid before the Senate against some of them, would he allow a severe sentence to be passed. Isidorus, the cynic philosopher, said to him aloud as he was passing along the streets, You sing the misfortunes of Nauplius well, but behave badly yourself. And Datus, a comic actor, when repeating these words in the piece, Farewell, father, farewell, mother mimicked the gestures of persons drinking and swimming, significantly alluding to the deaths of Claudius and Agrippina, and on uttering the last clause, Orcus vobis sucit pedes, you stand this moment on the brink of Orcus, he plainly intimated his application of it to the precarious position of the Senate. Yet Nero only banished the player and philosopher from the city and Italy, either because he was insensible to shame, or from apprehension that if he discovered his vexation, still keener things might be said of him. The world, after tolerating such an emperor for little less than fourteen years, at length forsook him. The Gauls, headed by Julius Vindex, who at that time governed the province as Propraetor, being the first to revolt. Nero had been formally told by astrologers that it would be his fortune to be at last deserted by all the world, and this occasioned that celebrated saying of his, an artist can live in any country, by which he meant to offer as an excuse for his practice of music, that it was not only his amusement as a prince, but might be his support when reduced to a private station. Yet some of the astrologers promised him in his forlorn state the rule of the East, and some in express words the kingdom of Jerusalem. But the greater part of them flattered him with assurances of his being restored to his former fortune, and being most inclined to believe the latter prediction, upon losing Britain and Armenia, he imagined he had run through all the misfortunes which the fates had decreed him. But when, upon consulting the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, he was advised to beware of the seventy-third year, 
as if he were not to die till then, never thinking of Galba's age, he conceived such hopes not only of living to advanced years, but of constant and singular good fortune, that having lost some things of great value by shipwreck, he scrupled not to say amongst his friends that the fishes would bring them back to him. At Naples he heard of the insurrection in Gaul, on the anniversary of the day on which he killed his mother, and bore it with so much unconcern as to excite a suspicion that he was really glad of it, since he had now a fair opportunity of plundering those wealthy provinces by the right of war. Immediately going to the gymnasium, he witnessed the exercise of the wrestlers with the greatest delight. Being interrupted at supper with letters which brought yet worse news, he expressed no greater resentment than only to threaten the rebels. For eight days together he never attempted to answer any letters nor give any orders, but buried the whole affair in profound silence. End of Nero, Part 3《Of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Nero, Part 4. Paragraphs 41 to 57. Being roused at last by numerous proclamations of Vindex, treating him with reproaches and contempt, he, in a letter to the Senate, exhorted them to avenge his wrongs and those of the Republic, desiring them to excuse his not appearing in the Senate House, because he had got cold. But nothing so much galled him as to find himself railed at as a pitiful harper, and instead of Nero, styled Aenobarbus, which being his family name, since he was upbraided with it, he declared that he would resume it and lay aside the name he had taken by adoption. Passing by the other accusations as wholly groundless, he earnestly refuted that of his want of skill in an art upon which he had bestowed so much pains, and in which he had arrived at such perfection, asking frequently those about him if they knew any one who was a more accomplished musician. But being alarmed by messengers after messengers of ill news from Gaul, he returned in great consternation to Rome. On the road his mind was somewhat relieved by observing the frivolous omen of a Gaulish soldier defeated and dragged by the hair by a Roman knight, which was sculptured on a monument, so that he leapt for joy and adored the heavens. Even then he made no appeal either to the Senate or people, but calling together some of the leading men at his own house, he held a hasty consultation upon the present state of affairs, and then, during the remainder of the day, carried them about with him to view some musical instruments of a new invention, which were played by water, exhibiting all the parts and discoursing upon the principles and difficulties of the contrivance, which, he told them, he intended to produce in the theatre, if Vindex would give him leave. Soon afterwards he received intelligence that Galba and the Spaniards had declared against him, upon which he fainted, and losing his reason lay a long time speechless, apparently dead. As soon as recovered from this state of stupefaction, he tore his clothes, beat his head, crying out, It is all over with me. His nurse endeavouring to comfort him, and telling him that the like things had happened to other princes before him, he replied, I am beyond all example wretched for I have lost an empire whilst I am still living. He nevertheless abated nothing of his luxury and inattention to business. Nay, on the arrival of good news from the provinces, he, at a sumptuous entertainment, sung with an air of merriment some jovial verses upon the leaders of the revolt, which were made public, and accompanied them with suitable gestures. Being carried privately to the theatre, he sent word to an actor who was applauded by the spectators, that he had it all his own way, now that he himself did not appear on the stage. At the first breaking out of these troubles, it is believed that he had formed many designs of a monstrous nature, although conformable enough to his natural disposition. These were to send new governors and commanders to the provinces and the armies, and employ assassins to butcher all the former governors and commanders, as men unanimously engaged in a conspiracy against him, to massacre the exiles in every quarter, and all the Gaulish population in Rome, the former lest they should join the insurrection, 
the latter as privy to the designs of their countrymen and ready to support them. To abandon Gaul itself, to be wasted and plundered by his armies, to poison the whole senate at a feast, to fire the city and then let loose the wild beasts upon the people in order to impede their stopping the progress of the flames. But being deterred from the execution of these designs, not so much by remorse of conscience as by despair of being able to effect them, and judging an expedition into Gaul necessary, he removed the consuls from their office before the time of its expiration was arrived, and in their room assumed the consulship himself, without a colleague, as if the fates had decreed that Gaul should not be conquered but by a consul. Upon assuming the Fasces, after an entertainment at the palace, as he walked out of the room leaning on the arms of some of his friends, he declared that as soon as he arrived in the province he would make his appearance amongst the troops, unarmed, and do nothing but weep, and that after he had brought the mutineers to repentance, he would the next day, in the public rejoicings, sing songs of triumph, which he must now, without loss of time, apply himself to compose. In preparing for this expedition, his first care was to provide carriages for his musical instruments, and machinery to be used upon the stage, to have the hair of the concubines he carried with him dressed in the fashion of men, and to supply them with battle-axes and Amazonian bucklers. He summoned the city tribes to enlist, but no qualified persons appearing, he ordered all masters to send a certain number of slaves, the best they had, not excepting their stewards and secretaries. He commanded the several orders of the people to bring in a fixed proportion of their estates, as they stood in the censor's books, all tenants of houses and mansions to pay one year's rent forthwith into the exchequer, and with unheard of strictness, would receive only new coin of the purest silver and the finest gold, insomuch that most people refused to pay, crying out unanimously that he ought to squeeze the informers and oblige them to surrender their gains. The general odium in which he was held received an increase by the great scarcity of corn and an occurrence connected with it. For, as it happened just at that time, there arrived from Alexandria a ship which was said to be freighted with dust for the wrestlers belonging to the emperor. This so much inflamed the public rage that he was treated with the utmost abuse and scurrility. Upon the top of one of his statues was placed the figure of a chariot, with a Greek inscription, that now indeed he had a race to run, let him be gone. A little bag was tied about another with a ticket containing these words, what could I do? Truly thou hast merited the sack. Some person likewise wrote on the pillars in the forum that he had even woke the cocks with his singing, and many in the night-time, pretending to find fault with their servants, frequently called for a vindex. He was also terrified with manifest warnings, both old and new, arising from dreams, auspices, and omens. He had never been used to dream before the murder of his mother. After that event he fancied in his sleep that he was steering a ship, and that the rudder was forced from him, that he was dragged by his wife Octavia into a prodigiously dark place, and was at one time covered over with a vast swarm of winged ants, and at another surrounded by the national images which were set up near Pompey's theatre, and hindered from advancing farther, that a Spanish genet he was fond of had his hinder parts so changed as to resemble those of an ape, and having his head only left unaltered, neighed very harmoniously. The doors of the mausoleum of Augustus flying open of themselves, there issued from it a voice calling on him by name. The lares, being adorned with fresh garlands on the calends, the first of January, fell down during the preparations for sacrificing to them. While he was taking the omens, Sporus presented him with a ring, the stone of which had carved upon it the rape of Proserpine. When a great multitude of the several orders was assembled to attend at the solemnity of making vows to the gods, it was a long time before the keys of the capital could be found. And when, in a speech of his to the senate against Vindex, these words were read, that the miscreants should be punished and soon make the end they merited, they all cried out, You will do it, Augustus. It was likewise remarked that the last tragic piece which he sung was Oedipus in exile, and that he fell as he was repeating this verse, Tanen manorge singamos meter pater, Wife, mother, father, force me to my end. 
Meanwhile, on the arrival of the news that the rest of the armies had declared against him, he tore to pieces the letters which were delivered to him at dinner, overthrew the table, and dashed with violence against the ground two favourite cups, which he called Homer's, because some of that poet's verses were cut upon them. Then, taking from Locusta a dose of poison which he put up in a golden box, he went into the civilian gardens, and thence dispatching a trusty freedman to Ostia with orders to make ready a fleet, he endeavoured to prevail with some tribunes and centurions of the Praetorian guards to attend him in his flight, but part of them showing no great inclination to comply, others absolutely refusing, and one of them crying out aloud, Usque adione mori miserum est? Say, is it then so sad a thing to die? He was in great perplexity whether he should submit himself to Galba, or apply to the Parthians for protection, or else appear before the people dressed in mourning, and upon the rostra in the most piteous manner beg pardon for his past misdemeanours, and, if he could not prevail, request of them to grant him at least the government of Egypt. A speech to this purpose was afterwards found in his writing-case. But it is conjectured that he durst not venture upon this project for fear of being torn to pieces before he could get to the forum. Deferring, therefore, his resolution until the next day, he awoke about midnight, and finding the guards withdrawn, he leapt out of bed and sent round for his friends. But none of them vouchsafing any message in reply, he went with a few attendants to their houses. The doors being everywhere shut and no one giving him any answer, he returned to his bedchamber whence those who had the charge of it had all now eloped, some having gone one way and some another, carrying off with them his bedding and box of poison. He then endeavoured to find Spiculus, the gladiator, or some one to kill him, but not being able to procure any one, what, said he, have I then neither friend nor foe? And immediately ran out as if he would throw himself into the Tiber. But, this furious impulse subsiding, he wished for some place of privacy where he might collect his thoughts, and his freedman Phaeon offering him his country house, between the Salarian and Nomenton roads, about four miles from the city, he mounted a horse, barefoot as he was and in his tunic, only slipping over it an old soiled cloak, with his head muffled up and a handkerchief before his face, and four persons only to attend him, of whom Sporus was one. He was suddenly struck with horror by an earthquake and by a flash of lightning which darted full in his face, and heard from the neighbouring camp the shouts of the soldiers wishing his destruction and prosperity to Galba. He also heard a traveller they met on the road say, They are in pursuit of Nero, and another ask, Is there any news in the city about Nero? Uncovering his face when his horse was started by the scent of a carcass which lay in the road, he was recognised, and saluted by an old soldier, who had been discharged from the guards. When they came to the lane which turned up to the house, they quitted their horses, and with much difficulty he wound among bushes and briars, and along a track through a bed of rushes, over which they spread their cloaks for him to walk on. Having reached a wall at the back of the villa, Theon advised him to hide himself a while in a sand-pit, when he replied, I will not go underground alive. Staying there some little time while preparations were made for bringing him privately into the villa, he took up some water out of a neighbouring tank in his hand to drink, saying, This is Nero's distilled water. Then, his cloak having been torn by the brambles, he pulled out the thorns which stuck in it. At last, being admitted, creeping upon his hands and knees through a hole made for him in the wall, he lay down in the first closet he came to, upon a miserable pallet with an old coverlet thrown over it, and, being both hungry and thirsty, though he refused some coarse bread that was brought him, he drank a little warm water. All who surrounded him, now pressing him to save himself from the indignities which were ready to befall him, he ordered a pit to be sunk before his eyes, of the size of his body, and the bottom to be covered with pieces of marble put together, if any could be found about the house, and water and wood to be got ready for immediate use about his corpse weeping at everything that was done, and frequently saying, What an artist is now about to perish! Meanwhile letters being brought in by a servant belonging to Phaon, he snatched them out of his hand, and there read, That he had been declared an enemy by the Senate, and that search was making for him, that he might be punished according to the ancient custom of the Romans. He then inquired what kind of punishment that was, 
and being told that the practice was to strip the criminal naked and scourge him to death while his neck was fastened within a forked stake, he was so terrified that he took up two daggers which he had brought with him, and after feeling the points of both, put them up again, saying, The fatal hour is not yet come. One while he begged of Sporus to wail and lament, another while he entreated that one of them would set an example by killing himself, and then again he condemned his own want of resolution in these words, I yet live to my shame and disgrace. This is not becoming for Nero. It is not becoming. Thou oughtest in such circumstances to have a good heart. Come then, courage, man." The horsemen, who had received orders to bring him away alive, were now approaching the house. As soon as he heard them coming, he uttered with a trembling voice the following verse, Hippon, mo cupodon, ampictipos o atabale. The noise of swift-heeled steeds assails my ears. He drove a dagger into his throat, being assisted in the act by Epaphroditus, his secretary. A centurion bursting in just as he was half dead, and applying his cloak to the wound, pretending that he was come to his assistance, he made no other reply but this, "'Tis too late," and, "'Is this your loyalty?' Immediately after pronouncing these words he expired, with his eyes fixed and starting out of his head to the terror of all who beheld him. He had requested of his attendants, as the most essential favour, that they would let no one have his head, but that by all means his body might be burnt entire. And this Icelus, Galba's freedman, granted. He had but a little before been discharged from the prison into which he had been thrown when the disturbances first broke out. The expenses of his funeral amounted to two hundred thousand sesterces, the bed upon which his body was carried to the pile and burnt being covered with the white robes interwoven with gold which he had worn upon the calends of January preceding. His nurses, Eclogae and Alexandra, with his concubine Acte, deposited his remains in the tomb belonging to the family of the Domitii, which stands upon the top of the hill of the gardens, and is to be seen from the Campus Martius. In that monument, a coffin of porphyry, with an altar of marble of Luna over it, is enclosed by a wall built of stone brought from Thassos. In stature he was a little below the common height. His skin was foul and spotted, his hair inclined to yellow, his features were agreeable rather than handsome, his eyes grey and dull, his neck was thick, his belly prominent, his legs very slender his constitution sound, for though excessively luxurious in his mode of living, he had in the course of fourteen years only three fits of sickness, which were so slight that he neither forbore the use of wine, nor made any alteration in his usual diet. In his dress and the care of his person he was so careless that he had his hair cut in rings one above another, and when in a chia he let it grow long behind, and he generally appeared in public in the loose dress which he used at table with a handkerchief about his neck, and without either a girdle or shoes. He was instructed when a boy in the rudiments of almost all the liberal sciences, but his mother diverted him from the study of philosophy as unsuited to one destined to be an emperor, and his preceptor, Seneca, discouraged him from reading the ancient orators, that he might longer secure his devotion to himself. Therefore, having a turn for poetry, he composed verses, both with pleasure and ease, nor did he, as some think, publish those of other writers as his own. Several little pocket-books and loose sheets have come into my possession which contain some well-known verses in his own hand, and written in such a manner that it was very evident, from the blotting and interlining, that they had not been transcribed from a copy, nor dictated by another, but were written by the composer of them. He had likewise great taste for drawing and painting, as well as for moulding statues in plaster, but above all things he most eagerly coveted popularity, being the rival of every man who obtained the applause of the people for anything he did. It was the general belief that after the crowns he won by his performances on the stage, he would the next lustrum have taken his place among the wrestlers at the Olympic Games, for he was continually practising that art, nor did he witness the gymnastic games in any part of Greece otherwise than sitting upon the ground in the stadium, as the umpires do 
and if a pair of wrestlers happened to break the bounds, he would with his own hands drag them back into the centre of the circle. Because he was thought to equal Apollo in music and the sun in chariot driving, he resolved also to imitate the achievements of Hercules, and they say that a lion was got ready for him to kill, either with a club or with a close hug, in view of the people in the amphitheatre, which he was to perform naked. Towards the end of his life he publicly vowed that if his power in the state was securely re-established, he would, in the spectacles which he intended to exhibit in honour of his success, include a performance upon organs, as well as upon flutes and bagpipes, and on the last day of the games would act in the play, and take the part of Turnus, as we find it in Virgil. And there are some who say that he put to death the player Paris as a dangerous rival. He had an insatiable desire to immortalise his name, and acquire a reputation which should last through all succeeding ages, but it was capriciously directed. He therefore took from several things and places their former appellations, and gave them new names, derived from his own. He called the month of April Neroneus, and designed changing the name of Rome into that of Neropolis. He held all religious rites in contempt, except those of the Syrian goddess, but at last he paid her so little reverence that he made water upon her, being now engaged in another superstition, in which only he obstinately persisted. For having received from some obscure plebeian a little image of a girl, as a preservative against plots, and discovered a conspiracy immediately after, he constantly worshipped his imaginary protectress as the greatest amongst the gods, offering to her three sacrifices daily. He was also desirous to have it supposed that he had, by revelations from this deity, a knowledge of future events. A few months before he died, he attended a sacrifice according to the Etruscan rites, but the omens were not favourable. He died in the thirty-second year of his age, upon the same day on which he had formerly put Octavia to death and the public joy was so great upon the occasion that the common people ran about the city with caps upon their heads. Some, however, were not wanting, who for a long time decked his tomb with spring and summer flowers. Sometimes they placed his image upon the rostra, dressed in robes of state, at another they published proclamations in his name as if he were still alive, and would shortly return to Rome and take vengeance on all his enemies. Vologesus, king of the Parthians, when he sent ambassadors to the Senate to renew his alliance with the Roman people, earnestly requested that due honour should be paid to the memory of Nero, and to conclude when twenty years afterwards, at which time I was a young man, some person of obscure birth gave himself out for Nero, that name secured him so favourable a reception from the Parthians that he was very zealously supported, and it was with much difficulty that they were prevailed upon to give him up. End of Nero Part 1 From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Andrew Coleman The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester Galba, Part 1 The race of the Caesars became extinct in Nero, an event prognosticated by various signs, two of which were particularly significant. Formerly, when Livia, after her marriage with Augustus, was making a visit to her villa at Veii, an eagle flying by let drop upon her lap a hen, with a sprig of laurel in her mouth, just as she had seized it. Livia gave orders to have the hen taken care of, and the sprig of laurel set, and the hen reared such a numerous brood of chickens that the villa, to this day, is called the Villa of the Hens. The laurel groves flourished so much that the Caesars procured thence the boughs and crowns they bore at their triumphs. It was also their constant custom to plant others on the same spot, immediately after a triumph. 
and it was observed that, a little before the death of each prince, the tree which had been set by him died away. But in the last year of Nero, the whole plantation of laurels perished to the very roots, and the hens all died. About the same time, the temple of the Caesars being struck with lightning, the heads of all the statues in it fell off at once, and Augustus's sceptre was dashed from his hands. Nero was succeeded by Galba, who was not in the remotest degree allied to the family of the Caesars, but, without doubt, of very noble extraction, being descended from a great and ancient family for he always used to put amongst his other titles, upon the basis of his statues, his being great-grandson to Quintus Catulus Capitolinus. And when he came to be emperor, he set up the images of his ancestors in the hall of the palace, according to the inscriptions on which he carried up his pedigree on the father's side to Jupiter, and by the mother's to Pacify, the wife of Minos. To give even a short account of the whole family would be tedious. I shall therefore only slightly notice that branch of it from which he was descended. Why or whence the first of the Sulpicii, who had the cognomen of Galba, was so called, is uncertain. Some were of opinion that it was because he set fire to a city in Spain, after he had a long time attacked it to no purpose, with torches dipped in the gum called Galbanum. Others said he was so named, because in a lingering disease he made use of it as a remedy, wrapped up in wool. Others, on account of his being prodigiously corpulent, such a one being called, in the language of the Gauls, Galba, or, on the contrary, because he was of a slender habit of body, like those insects which breed in a sort of oak, and are called Galbi. Sergius Galba, a person of consular rank, and the most eloquent man of his time, gave a luster to the family. History relates that when he was propraetor of Spain, he perfidiously put to the sword 30,000 Lusitanians, and by that means gave occasion to the war of Viriatus. His grandson being incensed against Julius Caesar, whose lieutenant he had been in Gaul, because he was through him disappointed of the consulship, joined with Cassius and Brutus in the conspiracy against him, for which he was condemned by the Pedian law. From him were descended the grandfather and father of the Emperor Galba. The grandfather was more celebrated for his application to study than for any figure he made in the government, for he rose no higher than the praetorship, but published a large and not uninteresting history. His father attained to the consulship, he was a short man and hump-backed, but a tolerable orator, and an industrious pleader. He was twice married. The first of his wives was Mummia Achaica, daughter of Catulus, and great-granddaughter of Lucius Mummius, who sacked Corinth. And the other, Livia Ocalina, a very rich and beautiful woman, by whom it is supposed he was courted for the nobleness of his descent. They say that she was further encouraged to persevere in her advances, by an incident which evinced the great ingenuousness of his disposition. Upon her pressing her suit, he took an opportunity, when they were alone, of stripping off his toga and showing her the deformity of his person, that he might not be thought to impose on her. He had by Achaica two sons, Caius and Sergius. The elder of these, Caius, having very much reduced his estate, retired from town, and being prohibited by Tiberius from standing for a proconsulship in his year, put an end to his own life. The Emperor Sergius Galba was born in the consulship of Marcus Valerius Messala at Nias Lentulus, upon the ninth of the Calends of January, in a villa standing upon a hill near Terracina, on the left-hand side of the road to Fundi. Being adopted by his stepmother, he assumed the name of Livius, with the cognomen of Archella, and changed his prinomen, for he afterwards used that of Lucius instead of Sergius, until he arrived at the imperial dignity. 
It is well known that when he came once, amongst other boys of his own age, to pay his respects to Augustus, the latter, pinching his cheek, said to him, And thou, child, too, wilt taste our imperial dignity. Tiberius, likewise, being told that he would come to be emperor, but at an advanced age, exclaimed, Let him live, then, since that does not concern me. When his grandfather was offering sacrifice to avert some ill omen from lightning, the entrails of the victim were snatched out of his hand by an eagle, and carried off into an oak tree loaded with acorns. Upon this, the soothsayer said that the family would come to be masters of the empire, but not until many years had elapsed, at which he, smiling, said, Ay, when a mule comes to bear a foal. When Galba first declared against Nero, nothing gave him so much confidence of success as a mule's happening at that time to have a foal. And whilst all others were shocked at the occurrence as a most inauspicious prodigy, he alone regarded it as a most fortunate omen, calling to mind the sacrifice and saying of his grandfather. When he took upon him the manly habit, he dreamt that the goddess Fortune said to him, I stand before your door weary, and unless I am speedily admitted, I shall fall into the hands of the first who comes to seize me. On his awaking, when the door of the house was opened, he found a brazen statue of the goddess, above a cubit long, close to the threshold, which he carried with him to Tusculum, where he used to pass the summer season. And having consecrated it in an apartment of his house, he ever after worshipped it with a monthly sacrifice and an anniversary vigil. Though but a very young man, he kept up an ancient but obsolete custom, and now nowhere observed, except in his own family, which was to have his freedmen and slaves appear in a body before him twice a day, morning and evening, to offer him their salutations. Amongst other liberal studies, he applied himself to the law. He married Lepida, by whom he had two sons, but the mother and children all dying, he continued a widower. Nor could he be prevailed upon to marry again, not even Agrippina herself, at that time left a widow by the death of Domitius, who had employed all her blandishments to allure him to her embraces, while he was a married man. Insomuch that Lepida's mother, when in company with several married women, rebuked her for it, and even went so far as to cuff her. Most of all, he courted the Empress Livia, by whose favour, while she was living, he made a considerable figure, and narrowly missed being enriched by the will which he left at her death in which she distinguished him from the rest of the legatees by a legacy of fifty millions of sesterces. But because the sum was expressed in figures, and not in words at length, it was reduced by her heir, Tiberius, to five hundred thousand, and even this he never received. Filling the great offices before the age required for it by law during his praetorship, at the celebration of games in honour of the goddess Flora, he presented the new spectacle of elephants walking upon ropes. He was then governor of the province of Aquitania for near a year, and soon afterwards took the consulship in the usual course, and held it for six months. It so happened that he succeeded Lucius Domitius, the father of Nero, and was succeeded by Selvius Otho, father to the emperor of that name, so that his holding it between the sons of these two men looked like a presage of his future advancement to the empire. Being appointed by Caius Caesar to supersede Gaetulicus in his command, the day after his joining the legions he put a stop to their plaudits in a public spectacle by issuing an order that they should keep their hands under their cloaks. Immediately upon which the following verse became very common in the camp, Disque miles militare, galba est, non gatulicus. Learn, soldier, now in arms to use your hands, tis galba, not gatulicus.
commands. With equal strictness, he would allow of no petitions for leave of absence from the camp. He hardened the soldiers, both old and young, by constant exercise. And having quickly reduced within their own limits the barbarians who had made inroads into Gaul, upon Caius's coming into Germany, he so far recommended himself and his army to that emperor's approbation, that amongst the innumerable troops drawn from all the provinces of the empire, none met with higher commendation or greater rewards from him. He likewise distinguished himself by heading an escort with a shield in his hand, and running at the side of the emperor's chariot twenty miles together. Upon the news of Caius's death, though many earnestly pressed him to lay hold of that opportunity of seizing the empire, he chose rather to be quiet. On this account he was in great favour with Claudius, and being received into the number of his friends, stood so high in his good opinion, that the expedition to Britain was for some time suspended, because he was suddenly seized with a slight indisposition. He governed Africa as proconsul for two years, being chosen out of the regular course to restore order in the province, which was in great disorder from civil dissensions and the alarms of the barbarians. His administration was distinguished by great strictness and equity, even in matters of small importance. A soldier upon some expedition, being charged with selling, in a great scarcity of corn, a bushel of wheat, which was all he had left, for a hundred denarii, he forbade him to be relieved by anybody when he came to be in want himself, and accordingly he died of famine. When sitting in judgment, a cause being brought before him about some beast of burden, the ownership of which was claimed by two persons, the evidence being slight on both sides, and it being difficult to come at the truth, he ordered the beast to be led to a pond at which he had used to be watered, with his head muffled up, and the covering being there removed, that he should be the property of the person whom he followed of his own accord, after drinking. For his achievements, both at this time in Africa and formerly in Germany, he received the triumphal ornaments and three sacerdotal appointments, one among the fifteen, another in the College of Titius, and a third amongst the Augustals. And from that time to the middle of Nero's reign, he lived for the most part in retirement. He never went abroad so much as to take the air, without a carriage attending him, in which there was a million of sesterces in gold ready at hand, until at last, at the time he was living in the town of Fundi, the province of Hispania Terraconensis was offered him. After his arrival in the province, whilst he was sacrificing in a temple, a boy who attended with a censor became all on a sudden grey-headed. This incident was regarded by some as a token of an approaching revolution in the government, and that an old man would succeed a young one. That is, that he would succeed Nero. And not long after, a thunderbolt falling into a lake in Cantabria, twelve axes were found in it, a manifest sign of the supreme power. He governed the province during eight years, his administration being of an uncertain and capricious character. At first he was active, vigorous, and indeed excessively severe in the punishment of offenders. For, a money-dealer having committed some fraud in the way of his business, he cut off his hands and nailed them to his counter. Another, who had poisoned an orphan to whom he was guardian and next heir to the estate, he crucified. On this delinquent imploring the protection of the law, and crying out that he was a Roman citizen, he affected to afford him some alleviation, and to mitigate his punishment by a mark of honour, ordered a cross higher than usual and painted white to be erected for him. But, by degrees, he gave himself up to a life of indolence and inactivity, from the fear of giving Nero any occasion of jealousy, and because, as he used to say, nobody was obliged to render an account of their leisure hours. 
He was holding a court of justice on the circuit at New Carthage when he received intelligence of the insurrection in Gaul, and while the lieutenant of Aquitania was soliciting his assistance, letters were brought from Vindex requesting him to assert the rights of mankind and put himself at their head to relieve them from the tyranny of Nero. Without any long demur, he accepted the invitation from a mixture of fear and hope, for he had discovered that private orders had been sent by Nero to his procurators in the province to get him dispatched, and he was encouraged to the enterprise as well by several auspices and omens, as by the prophecy of a young woman of good family. The more so because the priest of Jupiter at Clunia, admonished by a dream, had discovered in the recesses of the temple some verses similar to those in which she had delivered her prophecy. These had also been uttered by a girl under divine inspiration, about two hundred years before. The import of the verses was, that in time Spain should give the world a lord and master. Taking his seat on the tribunal, therefore, as if there was no other business than the manumitting of slaves, he had the effigies of a number of persons who had been condemned and put to death by Nero, set up before him, whilst a noble youth stood by, who had been banished, and whom he had purposely sent for from one of the neighbouring Balearic Isles, and lamenting the condition of the times, and being thereupon unanimously saluted by the title of emperor, he publicly declared himself only the lieutenant of the senate and people of Rome. Then, shutting the courts, he levied legions and auxiliary troops among the provincials, besides his veteran army consisting of one legion, two wings of horse, and three cohorts. Out of the military leaders most distinguished for age and prudence, he formed a kind of senate, with whom to advise upon all matters of importance, as often as occasion should require. He likewise chose several young men of the equestrian order, who were to be allowed the privilege of wearing the gold ring, and being called the reserve, should mount guard before his bedchamber instead of the legionary soldiers. He likewise issued proclamations throughout the provinces of the empire, exhorting all to rise in arms unanimously, and aid the common cause by all the ways and means in their power, about the same time, in fortifying a town which he had pitched upon for a military post, a ring was found, of antique workmanship, in the stone of which was engraved the goddess Victory with a trophy. Presently after, a ship of Alexandria arrived at Dertosa, loaded with arms, without any person to steer it, or so much as a single sailor or passenger on board. From this instant nobody entertained the least doubt, but the war upon which they were entering was just and honourable, and favoured likewise by the gods, when all on a sudden the whole design was exposed to failure. One of the two wings of horse, repenting of the violation of their oath to Nero, attempted to desert him upon his approach to the camp, and were with some difficulty kept in their duty and some slaves who had been presented to him by a freedman of Nero's, on purpose to murder him, had liked to have killed him as he went through a narrow passage to the bath. Being overheard to encourage one another not to lose the opportunity, they were called to an account concerning it, and recourse being had to the torture, a confession was extorted from them. End of Galba Part 1 Recording by Andrew Coleman Part 2 From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Andrew Coleman the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson, and edited by T. Forrester. Galba, Part 2 
these dangers were followed by the death of Vindex, at which being extremely discouraged, as if fortune had quite forsaken him, he had thoughts of putting an end to his own life, but receiving advice by his messengers from Rome that Nero was slain, and that all had taken an oath to him as emperor, he laid aside the title of lieutenant, and took upon him that of Caesar. Putting himself upon his march in his general's cloak, and a dagger hanging from his neck before his breast, he did not resume the use of the toga, until Nymphidius Sabinus, prefect of the Praetorian Guards at Rome, with the two lieutenants, Fontius Capito in Germany, and Claudius Massa in Africa, who opposed his advancement, were all put down. Rumours of his cruelty and avarice had reached the city before his arrival, such as that he had punished some cities of Spain and Gaul, for not joining him readily, by the imposition of heavy taxes, and some by levelling their walls, and had put to death the governors and procurators with their wives and children. Likewise that a golden crown of fifteen pounds weight, taken out of the temple of Jupiter, with which he was presented by the people of Tarracona, he had melted down, and had exacted from them three ounces, which were wanting in the weight. This report of him was confirmed and increased as soon as he entered the town, for some seamen who had been taken from the fleet and enlisted among the troops by Nero, he obliged to return to their former condition. But they, refusing to comply, and obstinately clinging to the more honourable service under their eagles and standards, he not only dispersed them by a body of horse, but likewise decimated them. He also disbanded a cohort of Germans, which had been formed by the preceding emperors, for their bodyguard, and upon many occasions found very faithful, and sent them back into their own country without giving them any gratuity, pretending that they were more inclined to favour the advancement of Gnaeus Dolabella, near whose gardens they encamped, than his own. The following ridiculous stories were also related of him, but whether with or without foundation I know not, such as that when a more sumptuous entertainment than usual was served up, he fetched a deep groan. That when one of the stewards presented him with an account of his expenses, he reached him a dish of legumes from his table as a reward for his care and diligence. And when Canus the piper had played much to his satisfaction, he presented him with his own hand five denarii taken out of his pocket. His arrival, therefore, in town was not very agreeable to the people and this appeared at the next public spectacle. For when the actors in a farce began a well-known song, Venit, yo, Simus Savilla, lo, clod pate from his village comes. All the spectators, with one voice, went on with the rest, repeating and acting the first verse several times over. He possessed himself of the imperial power with more favour and authority, than he administered it, although he gave many proofs of his being an excellent prince, but these were not so grateful to the people, as his misconduct was offensive. He was governed by three favourites, who, because they lived in the palace and were constantly about him, obtained the name of his pedagogues. These were Titus Vinius, who had been his lieutenant in Spain, a man of insatiable avarice, Cornelius Laco, who, from an assessor to the prince, was advanced to be prefect of the Praetorian Guards, a person of intolerable arrogance as well as indolence, and his freedman Icellus, dignified a little before with the privilege of wearing the gold ring and the use of the cognomen Martianus, who became a candidate for the highest honour within the reach of any person of the equestrian order he resigned himself so implicitly into the power of those three favourites who governed in everything according to the capricious impulse of their vices and tempers, and his authority was so much abused by them that the tenor of his conduct was not very consistent with itself. At one time he was more rigorous and frugal, at another more lavish and negligent, 
than became a prince who had been chosen by the people, and was so far advanced in years. He condemned some men of the first rank in the senatorian and equestrian orders, upon a very slight suspicion, and without trial. He rarely granted the freedom of the city to any one, and the privilege belonging to such as had three children, only to one or two, and that with great difficulty, and only for a limited time. When the judges petitioned to have a sixth decury added to their number, he not only denied them, but abolished the vacation which had been granted them by Claudius for the winter and the beginning of the year. It was thought that he likewise intended to reduce the offices held by senators and men of the equestrian order to a term of two years' continuance, and to bestow them only on those who were unwilling to accept them, and had refused them. All the grants of Nero he recalled, saving only the tenth part of them. For this purpose he gave a commission to fifty Roman knights, with orders that if players or wrestlers had sold what had been formerly given them, it should be exacted from the purchasers, since the others, having no doubt spent the money, were not in a condition to pay. But on the other hand, he suffered his attendants and freedmen to sell or give away the revenue of the state, or immunities from taxes, and to punish the innocent or pardon criminals at pleasure. Nay, when the Roman people were very clamorous for the punishment of Halotus and Tigellinus, two of the most mischievous amongst all the emissaries of Nero, he protected them, and even bestowed on Halotus one of the best procurations in his disposal. And as to Tigellinus, he even reprimanded the people for their cruelty by a proclamation. By this conduct, he incurred the hatred of all orders of the people, but especially of the soldiery. For their commanders, having promised them in his name a donative larger than usual, upon their taking the oath to him before his arrival at Rome, he refused to make it good, frequently bragging that it was his custom to choose his soldiers, not buy them. Thus the troops became exasperated against him in all quarters. The Praetorian guards he alarmed with apprehensions of danger and unworthy treatment, disbanding many of them occasionally as disaffected to his government and favourers of Nymphidius. But most of all, the army in Upper Germany was incensed against him, as being defrauded of the rewards due to them for the service they had rendered in the insurrection of the Gauls under Vindex. They were, therefore, the first who ventured to break into open mutiny, refusing upon the calends of January to take any oath of allegiance except to the Senate. And they immediately dispatched deputies to the Praetorian troops to let them know they did not like the emperor who had been set up in Spain, and to desire that they would make choice of another who might meet with the approbation of all the armies. Upon receiving intelligence of this, imagining that he was slighted not so much on account of his age as for having no children, he immediately singled out of a company of young persons of rank who came to pay their compliments to him, Piso Frugi Licinianus, a youth of noble descent and great talents, for whom he had before contracted such a regard that he had appointed him in his will the heir both of his estate and name. Him he now styled his son, and taking him to the camp, adopted him in the presence of the assembled troops, but without making any mention of a donative. This circumstance afforded the better opportunity to Marcus Salvius Otho of accomplishing his object six days after the adoption. Many remarkable prodigies had happened from the very beginning of his reign, which forewarned him of his approaching fate. In every town through which he passed in his way from Spain to Rome, victims were slain on the right and left of the roads, and one of these, which was a bull, being maddened with the stroke of the axe, broke the rope with which it was tied, and running straight against his chariot, with his forefeet elevated, bespattered him with blood. 
Likewise, as he was alighting, one of the guard, being pushed forward by the crowd, had very nearly wounded him with his lance. And upon his entering the city, and afterwards the palace, he was welcomed with an earthquake, and a noise like the bellowing of cattle. These signs of ill fortune were followed by some that were still more apparently such. Out of all his treasures he had selected a necklace of pearls and jewels, to adorn his statue of fortune at Tusculum. But it suddenly occurring to him that it deserved a more august place, he consecrated it to the Capitoline Venus, and next night he dreamt that fortune appeared to him, complaining that she had been defrauded of the present intended her, and threatening to resume what she had given him. Terrified at this denunciation, at break of day he sent forward some persons to Tusculum to make preparations for a sacrifice which might avert the displeasure of the goddess. And when he himself arrived at the place, he found nothing but some hot embers upon the altar, and an old man in black standing by, holding a little incense in a glass, and some wine in an earthen pot. It was remarked, too, that whilst he was sacrificing upon the calends of January, the chaplet fell from his head, and upon his consulting the pullets for romance, they flew away. Further, upon the day of his adopting Piso, when he was to harangue the soldiers, the seat which he used upon those occasions, through the neglect of his attendants, was not placed, according to custom, upon his tribunal and in the Senate House his curled chair was set with the back forward. The day before he was slain, as he was sacrificing in the morning, the augur warned him from time to time to be upon his guard, for that he was in danger from assassins, and that they were near at hand. Soon after he was informed that Otho was in possession of the Praetorian camp, and though most of his friends advised him to repair thither immediately, in hopes that he might quell the tumult by his authority and presence, he resolved to do nothing more than keep close within the palace, and secure himself by guards of the legionary soldiers, who were quartered in different parts about the city. He put on a linen coat of mail, however, remarking at the same time that it would avail him little against the points of so many sorts. But being tempted out by false reports which the conspirators had purposely spread to induce him to venture abroad, some few of those about him, too hastily assuring him that the tumult had ceased, the mutineers were apprehended, and the rest coming to congratulate him, resolved to continue firm in their obedience. He went forward to meet them, with so much confidence that upon a soldier's boasting that he had killed Otho, he asked him, By what authority? and proceeded as far as the forum. There, the knights appointed to dispatch him, making their way through the crowd of citizens, upon seeing him at a distance, halted a while, after which, galloping up to him, now abandoned by all his attendants, they put him to death. Some authors relate that upon their first approach he cried out, What do you mean, fellow soldiers? I am yours and you are mine, and promised them a donative. But the generality of writers relate that he offered his throat to them, saying, Do your work and strike, since you are resolved upon it. It is remarkable that not one of those who were at hand ever made any attempt to assist the emperor and all who were sent for disregarded the summons, except a troop of Germans. They, in consideration of his late kindness, in showing them particular attention during a sickness which prevailed in the camp, flew to his aid, but came too late. For, being not well acquainted with the town, they had taken a circuitous route. He was slain near the Curtian Lake, and there left, until a common soldier, returning from the receipt of his allowance of corn, throwing down the load which he carried, 
cut off his head. There being upon it no hair by which he might hold it, he hid it in the bosom of his dress, but afterwards thrusting his thumb into the mouth, he carried it in that manner to Otho, who gave it to the drudges and slaves who attended the soldiers, and they, fixing it upon the point of a spear, carried it in derision round the camp, crying out as they went along, You take your fill of joy in your old age. They were irritated to this pitch of rude banter, by a report spread a few days before, that upon someone's commending his person as still florid and vigorous, he replied, Eti moi minos em pedoi estin. My strength as yet has suffered no decay. A freedman of Petrobius's, who himself had belonged to Nero's family, purchased the head from them at the price of a hundred gold pieces, and threw it into the place where, by Galba's order, his patron had been put to death. At last, after some time, his steward Argius buried it, with the rest of his body, in his own gardens near the Aurelian Way. In person he was of a good size, bald before, with blue eyes and an aquiline nose, and his hands and feet were so distorted with the gout that he could neither wear a shoe, nor turn over the leaves of a book, or so much as hold it. He had likewise an excrescence in his right side, which hung down to that degree that it was with difficulty kept up by a bandage. He is reported to have been a great eater, and usually took his breakfast in the winter time before day. At supper he fed very heartily, giving the fragments which were left by handfuls to be distributed amongst the attendants. In his lust he was more inclined to the male sex, and such of them too as were old. It is said of him that in Spain, when Icelus, an old catamite of his, brought him the news of Nero's death, he not only kissed him lovingly before company, but begged of him to remove all impediments, and then took him aside into a private apartment. He perished in the seventy-third year of his age, and the seventh month of his reign. The Senate, as soon as they could with safety, ordered a statue to be erected for him upon the naval column, in that part of the forum where he was slain. But Vespasian cancelled the decree, upon a suspicion that he had sent assassins from Spain into Judea to murder him. End of Galba Recording by Andrew Coleman Otho From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Andrew Coleman The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester Otho The ancestors of Otho were originally of the town of Ferentum, of an ancient and honourable family, and indeed one of the most considerable in Etruria. His grandfather, Marcus Salvius Otho, whose father was Roman knight, but his mother of mean extraction, for it is not certain whether she was free-born, by the favour of Livia Augusta, in whose house he had his education, was made a senator, but never rose higher than the praetorship. His father, Lucius Otho, was by the mother's side nobly descended, allied to several great families, and so dearly beloved by Tiberius, and so much resembled him in his features, that most people believed Tiberius was his father. He behaved with great strictness and severity, not only in the city offices, but in the proconsulship of Africa, and some extraordinary commands in the army. He had the courage to punish with death 
some soldiers in Illyricum, who, in the disturbance attempted by Camillus, upon changing their minds, had put their generals to the sword as promoters of that insurrection against Claudius. He ordered the execution to take place in the front of the camp and under his own eyes, though he knew they had been advanced to higher ranks in the army by Claudius on that very account. By this action he acquired fame, but lessened his favour at court, which, however, he soon recovered by discovering to Claudius a design upon his life carried on by a Roman knight, and which he had learnt from some of his slaves. For the Senate ordered a statue of him to be erected in the palace, an honour which had been conferred but upon very few before him, and Claudius advanced him to the dignity of a patrician, commending him at the same time in the highest terms, and concluding with these words, A man than whom I don't so much as wish to have children that should be better. He had two sons by a very noble woman, Albia Terentia, namely, Lucius Titianus, and a younger called Marcus, who had the same cognomen as himself. He had also a daughter, whom he contracted to Drusus, Germanicus's son, before she was of marriageable age. The Emperor Otho was born upon the 4th of the Canons of May, in the consulship of Camillus Aruntius and Domitius Enobarbus. He was, from his earliest youth, so riotous and wild, that he was often severely scourged by his father. He was said to run about in the night-time, and seize upon any one he met who was either drunk or too feeble to make resistance, and toss him in a blanket. After his father's death, to make his court the more effectually to a freedwoman about the palace, who was in great favour, he pretended to be in love with her, though she was old and almost decrepit. Having by her means got into Nero's good graces, he soon became one of the principal favourites, by the congeniality of his disposition to that of the emperor, or, as some say, by the reciprocal practice of mutual pollution. He had so great a sway at court, that when a man of consular rank was condemned for bribery, having tampered with him for a large sum of money to procure his pardon, before he had quite effected it, he scrupled not to introduce him into the Senate to return his thanks. Having, by means of this woman, insinuated himself into all the emperor's secrets, he, upon the day designed for the murder of his mother, entertained them both at a very splendid feast, to prevent suspicion. Poppaea Sabina, for whom Nero entertained such a violent passion that he had taken her from her husband and entrusted her to him, he received and went through the form of marrying her. And not satisfied with obtaining her favours, he loved her so extravagantly that he could not with patience bear Nero for his rival. It is certainly believed that he not only refused admittance to those who were sent by Nero to fetch her, but that on one occasion he shut him out, and kept him standing before the door, mixing prayers and menaces in vain, and demanding back again what was entrusted to his keeping. His pretended marriage, therefore, being dissolved, he was sent lieutenant into Lusitania. This treatment of him was thought sufficiently severe, because harsher proceedings might have brought the whole farce to light, which, notwithstanding, at last came out, and was published to the world in the following distich. Cur otho mentitus sit, quaritis exolonore, oxoris moitus caeperat esse suae. You ask why Otho's banished? No, the cause comes not within the verge of vulgar laws. Against all rules of fashionable life, the rogue had dared to sleep 
with his own wife. He governed the province in quality of quaestor for ten years, with singular moderation and justice. As soon as an opportunity of revenge offered, he readily joined in Galba's enterprises, and at the same time conceived hopes of obtaining the imperial dignity for himself. To this he was much encouraged by the state of the times, but still more by the assurances given him by Sir Lucas the astrologer, who, having formerly told him that he would certainly outlive Nero, came to him at that juncture unexpectedly, promising him again that he should succeed to the empire, and that in a very short time. He therefore let slip no opportunity of making his court to every one about him by all manner of civilities. As often as he entertained Galba at supper, he distributed to every man of the cohort which attended the emperor on guard a gold piece, endeavouring likewise to oblige the rest of the soldiers in one way or another being chosen an arbitrator by one who had a dispute with his neighbour about a piece of land. He bought it and gave it him, so that now almost everybody thought and said that he was the only man worthy of succeeding to the empire. He entertained hopes of being adopted by Galba, and expected it every day, but finding himself disappointed, by Piso's being preferred before him, he turned his thoughts to obtaining his purpose by the use of violence, and to this he was instigated as well by the greatness of his debts as by resentment at Galba's conduct towards him, for he did not conceal his conviction that he could not stand his ground unless he became emperor, and that it signified nothing whether he fell by the hands of his enemies in the field or of his creditors in the forum. He had a few days before squeezed out of one of the emperor's slaves a million of sesterces for procuring him a stewardship, and this was the whole fund he had for carrying on so great an enterprise. At first the design was entrusted to only five of the guard, but afterwards to ten others, each of the five naming two, they had every one ten thousand sesterces paid down, and were promised fifty thousand more. By these others were drawn in, but not many, from a confident assurance that when the matter came to the crisis they should have enough to join them. His first intention was, immediately after the departure of Piso, to seize the camp and fall upon Galba whilst he was at supper in the palace but he was restrained by a regard for the cohort at that time on duty, lest he should bring too great an odium upon it. Because it happened that the same cohort was in guard before, both when Caius was slain and Nero deserted. For some time afterwards he was restrained also by scruples about the omens, and by the advice of Seleucus. Upon the day fixed at last for the enterprise, having given his accomplices notice to wait for him in the forum near the temple of Saturn, at the gilded milestone, he went in the morning to pay his respects to Galba, and being received with a kiss as usual, he attended him at sacrifice and heard the predictions of the augur. A freedman of his, then bringing him word that the architects were come, which was the signal agreed upon, he withdrew, as if it were with a design to view a house upon sale, and went out by a back door of the palace to the place appointed. Some say he pretended to be seized with an ague fit, and ordered those about him to make that excuse for him, if he was inquired after. Being then quickly concealed in a woman's litter, he made the best of his way for the camp. But the bearers growing tired, he got out and began to run. His shoe becoming loose, he stopped again, but being immediately raised by his attendants upon their shoulders, and unanimously saluted by the title of Emperor, 
he came amidst auspicious acclamations and drawn swords into the Principia in the camp, all who met him joining in the cavalcade as if they had been privy to the design. Upon this, sending some soldiers to dispatch Galba and Piso, he said nothing else in his address to the soldiery to secure their affections than these few words. I shall be content with whatever ye think fit to leave me. Towards the close of the day, he entered the Senate, and after he had made a short speech to them, pretending that he had been seized in the streets, and compelled by violence to assume the imperial authority, which he designed to exercise in conjunction with them, he retired to the palace. Besides other compliments which he received from those who flocked about him to congratulate and flatter him, he was called Nero by the mob, and manifested no intention of declining that cognomen. Nay, some authors relate that he used it in his official act and the first letters he sent to the governors of provinces. He suffered all his images and statues to be replaced, and restored his procurators and freedmen to their former posts. And the first writing which he signed as emperor was a promise of fifty millions of sesterces to finish the golden house. He is said to have been greatly frightened that night in his sleep and to have groaned heavily, and being found by those who came running in to see what the matter was, lying upon the floor before his bed, he endeavoured by every kind of atonement to appease the ghost of Galba, by which he had found himself violently tumbled out of bed. The next day, as he was taking the omens, a great storm arising and sustaining a grievous fall, he muttered to himself from time to time, Tigar moi kaimakois aulois. What business have I the loud trumpets to sound? About the same time the armies in Germany took an oath to Vitellius as emperor. Upon receiving this intelligence, he advised the senate to send thither deputies to inform them that a prince had been already chosen, and to persuade them to peace and a good understanding. By letters and messages, however, he offered Vitellius to make him his colleague in the empire, and his son-in-law. But a war being now unavoidable, and the generals and troops sent forward by Vitellius advancing, he had a proof of the attachment and fidelity of the Praetorian guards which had nearly proved fatal to the senatorian order. It had been judged proper that some arms should be given out of the stores and conveyed to the fleet by the marine troops. While they were employed in fetching these from the camp in the night, some of the guards suspecting treachery excited a tumult, and suddenly the whole body, without any of their officers at their head, ran to the palace, demanding that the entire senate should be put to the sword and having repulsed some of the tribunes who endeavoured to stop them, and slain others, they broke, all bloody as they were, into the banqueting room, inquiring for the emperor, nor would they quit the place until they had seen him. He now entered upon his expedition against Vitellius, with great alacrity, but too much precipitation, and without any regard to the ominous circumstances which attended it for the Ancilia had been taken out of the Temple of Mars for the usual procession, but were not yet replaced, during which interval it had of old been looked upon as very unfortunate to engage in any enterprise. He likewise set forward upon the day when the worshippers of the Mother of the Gods begin their lamentations and wailing. Besides these, other unlucky omens attended him, for in a victim offered to Father Dis, he found the signs, such as upon all other occasions are regarded as favourable, whereas in that sacrifice the contrary intimations are judged the most propitious. At his first setting forward he was stopped by inundations of the Tiber, and at twenty miles distance from the city, 
found the road blocked up by the fall of houses. Though it was the general opinion that it would be proper to protract the war, as the enemy were distressed by famine and the strictness of their quarters, yet he resolved with equal rashness to force them to an engagement as soon as possible, whether from impatience of prolonged anxiety, and in the hope of bringing matters to an issue before the arrival of Vitellius, or because he could not resist the ardour of the troops who were all clamorous for battle. He was not, however, present at any of those which ensued, but stayed behind at Brixellum. He had the advantage in three slight engagements near the Alps, about Placentia, at a place called Castors, but was, by a fraudulent stratagem of the enemy, defeated in the last and greatest battle at Bedriacum. For, some hopes of a conference being given, and the soldiers being drawn up to hear the conditions of peace declared, very unexpectedly, and amidst their mutual salutations, they were obliged to stand their arms. Immediately upon this, he determined to put an end to his life, more as many think, and not without reason, out of shame, at persisting in a struggle for the empire to the hazard of the public interest and so many lives, than from despair or distrust of his troops. For he had still in reserve and in full force those whom he had kept about him for a second trial of his fortune, and others were coming up from Dalmatia, Pannonia, and Moesia, nor were the troops lately defeated so far discouraged as not to be ready, even of themselves, to run all risks in order to wipe off their recent disgrace. My father, Suetonius Lenis, was in this battle, being at that time an Angostoclavian tribune in the 13th legion. He used frequently to say that Otho, before his advancement to the empire, had such an abhorrence of civil war, that once, upon hearing an account given at table of the death of Cassius and Brutus, he fell into a trembling, and that he never would have interfered with Galba, but that he was confident of succeeding in his enterprise without a war. Moreover, that he was then encouraged to despise life by the example of a common soldier, who, bringing news of the defeat of the army, and finding that he met with no credit, but was railed at for a liar and a coward, as if he had run away from the field of battle, fell upon his sword at the emperor's feet. Upon the sight of which, my father said that Otho cried out that he would expose to no further danger such brave men who had deserved so well at his hands. Advising therefore his brother, his brother's son, and the rest of his friends to provide for their security in the best manner they could, after he had embraced and kissed them, he sent them away, and then withdrawing into a private room by himself, he wrote a letter of consolation to his sister, containing two sheets. He likewise sent another to Messalina, Nero's widow, whom he had intended to marry, committing to her the care of his relics and memory. He then burnt all the letters which he had by him, to prevent the danger and mischief that might otherwise befall the writers from the conqueror. What ready money he had, he distributed among his domestics. And now, being prepared, and just upon the point of dispatching himself, he was induced to suspend the execution of his purpose, by a great tumult which had broken out in the camp. Finding that some of the soldiers who were making off had been seized and detained as deserters, let us add, said he, this night to our life. These were his very words. He then gave orders that no violence should be offered to any one, and keeping his chamber door open until late at night, he allowed all who pleased the liberty to come and see him. At last, after quenching his thirst with a draught of cold water, he took up two poniards, and having examined the points of both, put one of them under his pillow, and shutting his chamber door, slept very soundly, until, awaking about break of day, 
he stabbed himself under the left pap. Some persons bursting into the room upon his first groan, he at one time covered, and at another exposed his wound to the view of the bystanders. And thus life soon ebbed away. His funeral was hastily performed, according to his own order, in the thirty-eighth year of his age, and ninety-fifth day of his reign. The person and appearance of Otho no way corresponded to the great spirit he displayed on this occasion, for he is said to have been of low stature, splay-footed, and bandy-legged. He was, however, effeminately nice in the care of his person. The hair on his body he plucked out by the roots, and because he was somewhat bald, he wore a kind of peruke so exactly fitted to his head that nobody could have known it for such. He used to shave every day, and rub his face with soaked bread, the use of which he began when the down first appeared upon his chin, to prevent his having any beard. It is said, likewise, that he celebrated publicly the sacred rites of Isis, clad in a linen garment such as is used by the worshippers of that goddess. These circumstances, I imagine, caused the world to wonder the more that his death was so little in character with his life. Many of the soldiers who were present, kissing and bedewing with their tears his hands and feet as he lay dead, and celebrating him as a most gallant man at an incomparable emperor, immediately put an end to their own lives upon the spot, not far from his funeral pile. Many of those likewise, who were at a distance, upon hearing the news of his death, in the anguish of their hearts, began fighting amongst themselves until they dispatched one another. To conclude, the generality of mankind, though they hated him whilst living, yet highly extolled him after his death, insomuch that it was the common talk and opinion that Galba had been driven to destruction by his rival, not so much for the sake of reigning himself, as of restoring Rome to its ancient liberty. End of Otho Recording by Andrew Coleman From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Vitellius Very different accounts are given of the origin of the Vitellian family. Some describe it as ancient and noble, others as recent and obscure, nay, extremely mean. I am inclined to think that these several representations have been made by the flatterers and detractors of Vitellius after he became emperor unless the fortunes of the family varied before. There is extant a memoir addressed by Quintus Eulogius to Quintus Vitellius, quaestor to the divine Augustus, in which it is said that the Vitellii were descended from Faunus, king of the Aborigines, and Vitellia, who was worshipped in many places as a goddess, and that they reigned formerly over the whole of Latium, that all who were left of the family removed out of the country of the Sabines to Rome, and were enrolled among the patricians, that some monuments of the family continued a long time, as the Vitellian Way, reaching from the Janiculum to the sea, and likewise a colony of that name, which, at a very remote period of time, they desired leave from the government to defend against the Iquicoli, with a force raised by their own family only, also that, in the time of the war with the Samnites, some of the Vitellii who went with the troops levied for the security of Apulia, settled at Nucaria, and their descendants, a long time afterwards, returned again to Rome, 
and were admitted into the patrician order. On the other hand, the generality of writers say that the founder of the family was a freedman. Cassius Severus and some others relate that he was likewise a cobbler, whose son, having made a considerable fortune by agencies and dealings in confiscated property, begot, by a common strumpet, daughter of one Antiochus, a baker, a child, who afterwards became a Roman knight. Of these different accounts, the reader is left to take his choice. It is certain, however, that Publius Vitellius of Nucaria, whether of an ancient family or of low extraction, was a Roman knight and a procurator to Augustus. He left behind him four sons, all men of very high station, who had the same cognomen, but the different prinomena of Aulus, Quintus, Publius, and Lucius. Aulus died in the enjoyment of the consulship, which office he bore jointly with Domitius, the father of Nero Caesar. He was elegant to excess in his manner of living, and notorious for the vast expense of his entertainments. Quintus was deprived of his rank of senator, when, upon a motion made by Tiberius, a resolution passed to purge the senate of those who were, in any respect, not duly qualified for that honour. Publius, an intimate friend and companion of Germanicus, prosecuted his enemy and murderer, Gnaeus Piso, and procured sentence against him. After he had been made proctor, being arrested among the accomplices of Sejanus, and delivered into the hands of his brother to be confined in his house, he opened a vein with a penknife, intending to bleed himself to death. He suffered, however, the wound to be bound up and cured, not so much from repenting the resolution he had formed, as to comply with the importunity of his relations. He died afterwards a natural death during his confinement. Lucius, after his consulship, was made governor of Syria, and by his politic management not only brought Artabanus, king of the Parthians, to give him an interview, but to worship the standards of the Roman legions. He afterwards filled two ordinary consulships, and also the censorship, jointly with the emperor Claudius. Whilst that prince was absent upon his expedition into Britain, the care of the empire was committed to him, being a man of great integrity and industry. But he lessened his character not a little, by his passionate fondness for an abandoned freedwoman, with whose spittle, mixed with honey, he used to anoint his throat and jaws, by way of remedy for some complaint, not privately nor seldom, but daily and publicly. Being extravagantly prone to flattery, it was he who gave rise to the worship of Caius Caesar as a god, when upon his return from Syria he would not presume to accost him any otherwise than with his head covered, turning himself round and then prostrating himself upon the earth, and to leave no artifice untried to secure the favour of Claudius, who was entirely governed by his wives and freedmen, he requested as the greatest favour for Messalina that she would be pleased to let him take off her shoes, which when he had done, he took her right shoe and wore it constantly betwixt his toga and his tunic, and from time to time covered it with kisses. He likewise worshipped golden images of Narcissus and Pallas among his household gods. It was he, too, who, when Claudius exhibited the secular games, in his compliments to him upon that occasion, used this expression, May you often do the same. He died of palsy, the day after his seizure with it, leaving behind him two sons, whom he had by a most excellent and respectable wife, Sextilia. He had lived to see them both consuls, the same year and during the whole year also, the younger succeeding the elder for the last six months. The Senate honoured him after his decease with a funeral at the public expense, and with a statue in the rostra, which had this inscription upon the base, 
one who was steadfast in his loyalty to his prince. The Emperor Aulus Vitellius, the son of this Lucius, was born upon the 8th of the canons of October, or, as some say, upon the 7th of the Ides of September, in the consulship of Drusus Caesar and Norbanus Flaccus. His parents were so terrified with the predictions of astrologers upon the calculation of his nativity, that his father used his utmost endeavours to prevent his being sent governor into any of the provinces whilst he was alive. His mother, upon his being sent to the legions, and also upon his being proclaimed emperor, immediately lamented him as utterly ruined. He spent his youth amongst the Catamites of Tiberius at Capri, was himself constantly stigmatised with the name of Spintria, and was supposed to have been the occasion of his father's advancement by consenting to gratify the emperor's unnatural lust. In the subsequent part of his life, being still most scandalously vicious, he rose to great favour at court, being upon a very intimate footing with Caius, because of his fondness for chariot-driving, and with Claudius for his love of gaming. But he was in a still higher degree acceptable to Nero, as well on the same accounts, as for a particular service which he rendered him. When Nero presided in the games instituted by himself, though he was extremely desirous to perform amongst the harpers, yet his modesty would not permit him, notwithstanding the people entreated much for it. Upon his quitting the theatre, Vitellius fetched him back again, pretending to represent the determined wishes of the people, and so afforded him the opportunity of yielding to their entreaties. By the favour of these three princes, he was not only advanced to the great offices of state, but to the highest dignities of the sacred order, after which he held the proconsulship of Africa, and had the superintendence of the public works, in which appointment his conduct, and consequently his reputation, were very different. For he governed the province with singular integrity during two years, in the latter of which he acted as deputy to his brother, who succeeded him. But in his office in the city he was said to pillage the temples of their gifts and ornaments, and to have exchanged brass and tin for gold and silver. He took to wife Petronia, the daughter of a man of consular rank, and had by her a son named Petronius, who was blind of an eye. The mother being willing to appoint this youth her heir, upon condition that he should be released from his father's authority, the latter discharged him accordingly. But shortly after, as was believed, murdered him, charging him with a design upon his life, and pretending that he had, from consciousness of his guilt, drank the poison he had prepared for his father. Soon afterwards he married Galeria Fundana, the daughter of a man of Praetorian rank, and had by her both sons and daughters. Among the former was one who had such a stammering in his speech that he was little better than if he had been dumb. He was sent by Galba into Lower Germany, contrary to his expectation. It is supposed that he was assisted in procuring this appointment by the interest of Titus Junius, a man of great influence at that time, whose friendship he had long before gained by favouring the same set of charioteers with him in the Circensian Games. But Galba openly declared that none were less to be feared than those who only cared for their bellies, and that even his enormous appetite must be satisfied with the plenty of that province, so that it is evident he was selected for that government more out of contempt than kindness. It is certain that when he was to set out, he had not money for the expenses of his journey, he being at that time so much straitened in his circumstances, that he was obliged to put his wife and children, whom he left at Rome, into a poor lodging which he hired for them, in order that he might let his own house for the remainder of the year. And he pawned a pearl taken from his mother's earring to defray his expenses on the road. A crowd of creditors who were waiting to stop him, and amongst them the people of Sinusa and Formia, 
and whose taxes he had converted to his own use, he eluded, by alarming them with the apprehension of false accusation. He had, however, sued a certain freedman, who was clamorous in demanding a debt of him, under pretense that he had kicked him, which action he would not withdraw, until he had wrung from the freedman fifty thousand sesterces. Upon his arrival in the province, the army, which was disaffected to Galba and ripe for insurrection, received him with open arms, as if he had been sent to them from heaven. It was no small recommendation to their favour that he was the son of a man who had been thrice consul, was in the prime of life, and of an easy, prodigal disposition. This opinion, which had been long entertained of him, Vitellius confirmed by some late practices. Having kissed all the common soldiers whom he met with upon the road, and been excessively complacent in the inns and stables to the muleteers and travellers, asking them in a the morning if they had got their breakfasts, and letting them see, by belching, that he had eaten his. After he had reached the camp, he denied no man anything he asked for, and pardoned all who lay under sentence for disgraceful conduct or disorderly habits. Before a month, therefore, had passed, without regard to the day or season, he was hurried by the soldiers out of his bedchamber, although it was evening, and he in an undress, and unanimously saluted by the title of Emperor. He was then carried round the most considerable towns in the neighbourhood, with the sword of the divine Julius in his hand, which had been taken by some person out of the Temple of Mars, and presented to him when he was first saluted. Nor did he return to the Praetorium until his dining-room was in flames from the chimneys taking fire. Upon this accident, all being in consternation, and considering it as an unlucky omen, he cried out, Courage, boys! It shines brightly upon us! and this was all he said to the soldiers. The army of the upper province likewise, which had before declared against Galba for the senate, joining in the proceedings, he very eagerly accepted the cognomen of Germanicus, offered him by the unanimous consent of both armies, but deferred assuming that of Augustus, and refused for ever that of Caesar. Intelligence of Galba's death, arriving soon after, when he had settled his affairs in Germany, he divided his troops into two bodies, intending to send one of them before him against Otho, and to follow with the other himself. The army he sent forward had a lucky omen, for suddenly an eagle came flying up to them on the right, and having hovered round the standards, flew gently before them on their road. But, on the other hand, when he began his own march, all the equestrian statues, which were erected for him in several places, fell suddenly down with their legs broken, and the laurel crown which he had put on as emblematical of auspicious fortune fell off his head into a river. Soon afterwards, at Vienne, as he was upon the tribunal administering justice, a cock perched upon his shoulder, and afterwards upon his head. The issue corresponded to these omens for he was not able to keep the empire, which had been secured for him by his lieutenants. He heard of the victory at Bedriacum, and the death of Otho, while he was yet in Gaul, and without the least hesitation, by a single proclamation, disbanded all the Praetorian cohorts, as having, by their repeated treasons, set a dangerous example to the rest of the army, commanding them to deliver up their arms to his tribunes a hundred and twenty of them, under whose hands he had found petitions presented to Otho for rewards of their service in the murder of Galba, he besides ordered to be sought out and punished. So far his conduct deserved approbation, and was such as to afford hope of his becoming an excellent prince, had he not managed his other affairs in a way more corresponding with his own disposition, and his former manner of life, than to the imperial dignity. For, having begun his march, he rode through every city in his route in a triumphal procession, and sailed down the rivers in ships, fitted out with the greatest elegance, and decorated with various kinds of crowns, amidst the most extravagant entertainments. Such was the want of discipline, and the licentiousness both in his family and army, 
that, not satisfied with the provision everywhere made for them at the public expense, they committed every kind of robbery and insult upon the inhabitants, setting slaves at liberty as they pleased, and if any dared to make resistance, they dealt blows and abuse, frequently wounds, and sometimes slaughter amongst them. When he reached the plains on which the battles were fought, some of those around him being offended at the smell of the carcasses which lay rotting upon the ground, he had the audacity to encourage them by a most detestable remark, that a dead enemy smelt not amiss, especially if he were a fellow citizen. To qualify, however, the offensiveness of the stench, he quaffed in public a goblet of wine, and with equal vanity and insolence distributed a large quantity of it among his troops. On his observing a stone with an inscription upon it to the memory of Otho, he said, It was a mausoleum good enough for such a prince. He also sent the poniard, with which Otho killed himself, to the colony of Agrippina, to be dedicated to Mars. Upon the Apennine hills he celebrated a Bacchanalian feast. At last he entered the city with trumpets sounding, in his general's cloak, and girded with his sword, amidst a display of standards and banners, his attendants being all in the military habit, and the arms of the soldiers unsheathed. Acting more and more in open violation of all laws, both divine and human, he assumed the office of Pontifex Maximus, upon the day of the defeat at the Alia ordered the magistrates to be elected for ten years of office, and made himself consul for life. To put it out of all doubt what model he intended to follow in his government of the empire, he made his offerings to the shade of Nero in the midst of the campus Martius, and with a full assembly of the public priests attending him and at a solemn entertainment he desired a harper, who pleased the company much, to sing something in praise of Domitius, and upon his beginning some songs of Nero's, he started up in presence of the whole assembly, and could not refrain from applauding him by clapping his hands. After such a commencement of his career, he conducted his affairs, during the greater part of his reign, entirely by the advice and direction of the vilest amongst the players and charioteers, and especially his freedman Asiaticus. This fellow had, when young, been engaged with him in a course of mutual and unnatural pollution, but being at last quite tired of the occupation, ran away. His master, some time after, caught him at Putioli, selling a liquor called Posca, and put him in chains, but soon released him, and retained him in his former capacity. Growing weary, however, of his rough and stubborn temper, he sold him to a strolling fencing-master, after which, when the fellow was to have been brought up to play his part at the conclusion of an entertainment of gladiators, he suddenly carried him off, and at length, upon his being advanced to the government of a province, gave him his freedom. The first day of his reign, he presented him with the gold rings at supper, though in the morning, when all about him requested that favour in his behalf, he expressed the utmost abhorrence of putting so great a stain upon the equestrian order. He was chiefly addicted to the vices of luxury and cruelty. He always made three meals a day, sometimes four, breakfast, dinner, and supper and a drunken revel after all. This load of victuals he could well enough bear, from a custom to which he had inured himself, of frequently vomiting. For these several meals he would make different appointments at the houses of his friends on the same day. None ever entertained him at less expense than four hundred thousand sesterces. The most famous was a set entertainment given him by his brother, at which it is said there were served up no less than two thousand choice fishes and seven thousand birds. Yet even this supper he himself outdid at a feast which he gave upon the first use of a dish which had been made for him, and which, for its extraordinary size, he called the Shield of Minerva. 
In this dish there were tossed up together the livers of charfish, the brains of pheasants and peacocks, with the tongues of flamingos, and the entrails of lampreys, which had been brought in ships of war as far as from the Carpathian Sea and the Spanish Straits. He was not only a man of an in insatiable appetite, but would gratify it likewise at unseasonable times, and with any garbage that came in his way so that, at a sacrifice, he would snatch from the fire flesh and cakes, and eat them upon the spot. When he travelled, he did the same at the inns upon the road, whether the meat was fresh, dressed, and hot, or what had been left the day before, and was half eaten. He delighted in the infliction of punishments, and even those which were capital, without any distinction of persons or occasions, Several noblemen, his schoolfellows and companions, invited by him to court, he treated with such flattering caresses as seemed to indicate an affection short only of admitting them to share the honours of the imperial dignity. Yet he put them all to death by some base means or other. To one he gave poison with his own hand in a cup of cold water which he called for in a fever. He scarcely spared one of all the usurers, notaries, and publicans who had ever demanded a debt of him at Rome, or any toll or custom upon the road. One of these, while in the very act of saluting him, he ordered for execution, but immediately sent for him back, upon which all about him, applauding his clemency, he commanded him to be slain in his own presence, saying, I have a mind to feed my eyes. Two sons who interceded for their father, he ordered to be executed with him. A Roman knight, upon his being dragged away for execution, and crying out to him, You are my heir! He desired to produce his will, and finding that he had made his freedman joint heir with him, he commanded that both he and the freedman should have their throats cut. He put to death some of the common people for cursing aloud the blue party in the Circensian games, supposing it to be done in contempt of himself and the expectation of a revolution in the government. There were no persons he was more severe against than jugglers and astrologers, and as soon as any one of them was informed against, he put him to death without the formality of a trial. He was enraged against them, because, after his proclamation, by which he commanded all astrologers to quit home, and Italy also, before the calends of October, a bill was immediately posted about the city, with the following words, Take notice! The Chaldeans also decree that Vitellius Germanicus shall be no more by the day of the said calends. He was even suspected of being accessory to his mother's death by forbidding sustenance to be given her when she was unwell. A German witch, whom he held to be oracular, having told him that he would long reign in security if he survived his mother. But others say that being quite weary of the state of affairs and apprehensive of the future, she obtained without difficulty a dose of poison from her son. In the eighth month of his reign, the troops, both in Mosia and Pannonia, revolted from him, as did likewise of the armies beyond sea, those in Judea and Syria, some of which swore allegiance to Vespasian as emperor in his own presence, and others in his absence. In order, therefore, to secure the favour and affection of the people, Vitellius lavished on all around whatever he had it in his power to bestow, both publicly and privately, in the most extravagant manner. He also levied soldiers in the city, and promised all who enlisted as volunteers not only their discharge after the victory was gained, but all the rewards due to veterans who had served their full time in the wars the enemy now pressing forward, both by sea and land. On one hand he opposed against them his brother with a fleet, the new levies, and a body of gladiators, and in another quarter the troops and generals who were engaged at Bedriacum. But being beaten, 
or betrayed in every direction, he agreed with Flavius Sabinus, Vespasian's brother, to abdicate on condition of having his life spared, and a hundred millions of sesterces granted him, and he immediately, upon the palace steps, publicly declared to a large body of soldiers there assembled, that he resigned the government which he had accepted reluctantly. But they, all remonstrating against it, he deferred the conclusion of the treaty. Next day, early in the morning, he came down to the forum in a very mean habit, and with many tears repeated the declaration from a writing which he held in his hand. But the soldiers and people again interposing, and encouraging him not to give way, but to rely on their zealous support, he recovered his courage, and forced Sabinus, with the rest of the Flavian party, who now thought themselves secure, to retreat into the capital, where he destroyed them all by setting fire to the temple of Jupiter, whilst he beheld the contest, and the fire from Tiberius's house, where he was feasting. Not long after, Repenting of what he had done, and throwing the blame of it upon others, he called a meeting, and swore that nothing was dearer to him than the public peace, which oath he also obliged the rest to take. Then drawing a dagger from his side, he presented it first to the consul, and upon his refusing it, to the magistrates, and then to every one of the senators, but none of them being willing to accept it, he went away as if he meant to lay it up in the temple of Concord. But some crying out to him, You are Concord! He came back again, and said that he would not only keep his weapon, but for the future use the cognomen of Concord. He advised the Senate to send deputies, accompanied by the Vestal Virgins, to desire peace, or at least time for consultation. The day after, while he was waiting for an answer, he received intelligence by a scout that the enemy was advancing. Immediately, therefore, throwing himself into a small litter, borne by hand with only two attendants, a baker and a cook, he privately withdrew to his father's house on the Aventine Hill, intending to escape thence into Campania. But a groundless report being circulated that the enemy was willing to come to terms, he suffered himself to be carried back to the palace. Finding, however, nobody there, and those who were with him stealing away, he girded round his waist a belt full of gold pieces, and then ran into the porter's lodge, tying the dog before the door, and piling up against it the bed and bedding. By this time, the forerunners of the enemy's army had broken into the palace, and meeting with nobody, searched, as was natural, every corner, being dragged by them out of his cell, and asked, who he was, for they did not recognize him, and if he knew where Vitellius was, he deceived them by a falsehood. But at last being discovered, he begged hard to be detained in custody, even were it in a prison, pretending to have something to say which concerned Vespasian's security. Nevertheless, he was dragged half-naked into the forum, with his hands tied behind him, a rope about his neck, and his clothes torn, amidst the most contemptuous abuse, both by word and deed, along the Via Sacra, his head being held back by the hair, in the manner of condemned criminals, and the point of a sword put under his chin, that he might hold up his face to public view. Some of the mob, meanwhile, pelting him with dung and mud, whilst others called him an incendiary and glutton. They also upbraided him with the defects of his person, for he was monstrously tall, and had a face usually very red with hard drinking, a large belly, and one thigh weak, occasioned by a chariot running against him, as he was attending upon Caius while he was driving. At length, upon the Scalae Gemoniae, he was tormented and put to death in lingering tortures, and then dragged by a hook into the Tiber. He perished with his brother and son in the fifty-seventh year of his age, and verified the prediction of those who, from the omen which happened to him at Vienne, as before related, foretold that he would be made prisoner by some man of Gaul, for he was seized by Antoninus Primus, a general of the adverse party, who was born at Toulouse, 
and, when a boy, have the cognomen of Becco, which signifies a cock's beak. End of Vitellius Recording by Andrew Coleman Thirty Vespasian Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Icy Jumbo. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Vespasian, Part 1, Paragraphs 1 to 7. The empire, which had long been thrown into a disturbed and unsettled state by the rebellion and violent death of its last three rulers, was at length restored to peace and security by the Flavian family, whose descent was indeed obscure and which boasted no ancestral honours. But the public had no cause to regret its elevation, though it is acknowledged that Domitian met with the just reward of his avarice and cruelty. Titus Flavius Petro, a townsman of Reate, whether a centurion or an evocatus of Pompey's party in the civil war is uncertain, fled out of the battle of Pharsalia and went home, where, having at last obtained his pardon and discharge, he became a collector of the money raised by public sales in the way of auction. His son, surnamed Sabinus, was never engaged in the military service, though some say he was a centurion of the first order, and others that whilst he held that rank he was discharged on account of his bad state of health. This Sabinus, I say, was a publican, and received the tax of the fortieth penny in Asia. And there were remaining, at the time of the advancement of the family, several statues which had been erected to him by the cities of that province with this inscription, To the Honest Tax Farmer. He afterwards turned to usurer amongst the Helvetii, and there died, leaving behind him his wife, Vespasia Polla, and two sons by her, the elder of whom, Sabinus, came to be prefect of the city, and the younger, Vespasian, to be emperor. Polla, descended of a good family, at Nursia, had for her father Vespasius Pollio, thrice-appointed military tribune, and at last prefect of the camp, and her brother was a senator of praetorian dignity. There is to this day, about six miles from Nursia, on the road to Spoletum, a place on the summit of a hill called Vespasii, where are several monuments of the Vespasii, a sufficient proof of the splendour and antiquity of the family. I will not deny that some have pretended to say that Petro's father was a native of Gallia Transpadana, whose employment was to hire workpeople who used to emigrate every year from the country of the Umbria into that of the Sabines, to assist them in their husbandry, but who settled at last in the town of Reate, and there married. But of this I have not been able to discover the least proof upon the strictest inquiry. Vespasian was born in the country of the Sabines, beyond Reate, in a little country seat called Falacrine, upon the 5th of the Calends of December, 27th of November, in the evening, in the consulship of Quintus Sulpicius Camerinus and Caius Poppius Sabinus, five years before the death of Augustus, and was educated under the care of Tertulla, his grandmother by the father's side, upon an estate belonging to the family at Cosa. After his advancement to the empire, he used frequently to visit the place where he had spent his infancy, and the villa was continued in the same condition, that he might see everything about him just as he had been used to do. And he had so great a regard for the memory of his grandmother that, upon solemn occasions and festival days, he constantly drank out of a silver cup which she had been accustomed to use. After assuming the manly habit, he had a long time a distaste for the senatorian toga, though his brother had obtained it, nor could he be persuaded by any one but his mother to sue for that badge of honour. She at length drove him to it, more by taunts and reproaches than by her entreaties and authority, calling him now and then, by way of reproach, his brother's footman. 
he served as military tribune in Thrace. When made quaestor, the province of Crete and Cyrene fell to him by lot. He was candidate for the aedileship, and soon after for the praetorship, but met with a repulse in the former case, though at last, with much difficulty, he came in sixth on the poll books. But the office of praetor he carried upon his first canvas, standing amongst the highest at the poll. Being incensed against the senate, and desirous to gain, by all possible means, the good graces of Caius, he obtained leave to exhibit extraordinary games for the emperor's victory in Germany, and advised them to increase the punishment of the conspirators against his life by exposing their corpses unburied. He likewise gave him thanks in that august assembly for the honour of being admitted to his table. Meanwhile he married Flavia Domitilla, who had formerly been the mistress of Statilius Capella, a Roman knight of Sobrata in Africa, who, Domitilla, enjoyed Latin rites, and was soon after declared fully and freely a citizen of Rome, on a trial before the court of recovery brought by her father Flavius Liberalis, a native of Ferentum, but no more than secretary to a quaestor. By her he had the following children, Titus, Domitian, and Domitilla. He outlived his wife and daughter, and lost them both before he became emperor. After the death of his wife, he renewed his union with his former concubine Cynis, the freedwoman of Antonia, and also her amanuensis, and treated her, even after he was emperor, almost as if she had been his lawful wife. In the reign of Claudius, by the interest of Narcissus, he was sent to Germany in command of a legion, whence being removed into Britain, he engaged the enemy in thirty several battles. He reduced under subjection to the Romans two very powerful tribes, and above twenty great towns, with the Isle of Wight, which lies close to the coast of Britain, partly under the command of Aulus Plautius, the consular lieutenant, and partly under Claudius himself. For this success he received the triumphal ornaments, and in a short time after two priesthoods, besides the consulship, which he held during the last two months of the year. The interval between that and his proconsulship he spent in leisure and retirement, for fear of Agrippina, who still held great sway over her son, and hated all the friends of Narcissus, who was then dead. Afterwards he got by lot the province of Africa, which he governed with great reputation, excepting that once, in an insurrection at Adramitum, he was pelted with turnips. It is certain that he returned thence nothing richer, for his credit was so low that he was obliged to mortgage his whole property to his brother, and was reduced to the necessity of dealing in mules for the support of his rank, for which reason he was commonly called the muleteer. He is said, likewise, to have been convicted of extorting from a young man of fashion two hundred thousand sesterces for procuring him the broad stripe, contrary to the wishes of his father, and was severely reprimanded for it. While in attendance upon Nero in Achaia, he frequently withdrew from the theatre while Nero was singing, and went to sleep if he remained, which gave so much offence that he was not only excluded from his society, but debarred the liberty of saluting him in public. Upon this he retired to a small out-of-the-way town, where he lay skulking in constant fear of his life, until a province, with an army, was offered him. A firm persuasion had long prevailed through all the East that it was fated for the empire of the world, at that time, to devolve on some who should go forth from Judea. This prediction referred to a Roman emperor, as the event showed, but the Jews, applying it to themselves, broke out into rebellion, and having defeated and slain their governor, routed the lieutenant of Syria, a man of consular rank, who was advancing to his assistance, and took an eagle, the standard of one of his legions. As the suppression of this revolt appeared to require a stronger force, and an active general who might safely be trusted in an affair of so much importance, Vespasian was chosen in preference to all others, both for his known activity and on account of the obscurity of his origin and name, being a person of whom there could not be the least jealousy. Two legions, therefore, eight squadrons of horse and ten cohorts being added to the former troops in Judea, and taking with him his eldest son as lieutenant, 
as soon as he arrived in his province, he turned the eyes of the neighbouring provinces upon him, by reforming immediately the discipline of the camp, and engaging the enemy once or twice with such resolution, that, in the attack of a castle, he had his knee hurt by the stroke of a stone, and received several arrows in his shield. After the deaths of Nero and Galba, whilst Otho and Vitellius were contending for the sovereignty, he entertained hopes of obtaining the empire, with the prospect of which he had long before flattered himself, from the following omens. Upon an estate belonging to the Flavian family, in the neighbourhood of Rome, there was an old oak, sacred to Mars, which, at the several deliveries of Vespasia, put out each time a new branch, evident imitations of the future fortune of each child. The first was but a slender one, which quickly withered away, and accordingly the girl that was born did not live long. The second became vigorous, which portended great good fortune. But the third grew like a tree. His father, Sabinus, encouraged by these omens, which were confirmed by the augurs, told his mother that her grandson would be the emperor of Rome, at which she laughed heartily, wondering, she said, that her son should be in his dotage, whilst she continued still in full possession of her faculties. Afterwards in his aedileship, when Caius Caesar, being enraged at his not taking care to have the streets kept clean, ordered the soldiers to fill the bosom of his gown with dirt, some persons at that time construed it into a sign that the government, being trampled under foot and deserted in some civil commotion, would fall under his protection, and as it were, into his lap. Once, while he was at dinner, a strange dog, that wandered about the streets, brought a man's hand, and laid it under the table. And another time, while he was at supper, a plough-ox, throwing the yoke off his neck, broke into the room, and after he had frightened away all the attendants, on a sudden, as if he was tired, fell down at his feet, as he lay still upon his couch, and hung down his neck. A cypress tree, likewise, in a field belonging to the family, was torn up by the roots, and laid flat upon the ground, when there was no violent wind. But next day it rose again fresher and stronger than before. He dreamt in Achaia that the good fortune of himself and his family would begin when Nero had a tooth drawn, and it happened that the day after, a surgeon coming into the hall showed him a tooth which he had just extracted from Nero. In Judea, upon his consulting the oracle of the divinity at Carmel, the answer was so encouraging as to assure him of success in anything he projected, however great or important it might be. And when Josephus, one of the noble prisoners, was put in chains, he confidently affirmed that he should be released in a very short time by the same Vespasian, but he would be emperor first. Some omens were likewise mentioned in the news from Rome, and among others that Nero, towards the close of his days, was commanded in a dream to carry Jupiter's sacred chariot out of the sanctuary where it stood to Vespasian's house, and conduct it thence into the circus. Also, not long afterwards, as Galba was going to the election, in which he was created consul for the second time, a statue of the divine Julius turned towards the east, and in the field of Bedriacum, before the battle began, two eagles engaged in the sight of the army, and one of them being beaten, a third came from the east, and drove away the conqueror. He made, however, no attempt upon the sovereignty, though his friends were very ready to support him, and even pressed him to the enterprise, until he was encouraged to it by the fortuitous aid of persons unknown to him and at a distance. Two thousand men, drawn out of the three legions in the Moesian army, had been sent to the assistance of Otho. While they were upon their march, news came that he had been defeated, and had put an end to his life, notwithstanding which they continued their march as far as Aquileia, pretending that they gave no credit to the report. There, tempted by the opportunity which the disorder of the times afforded them, they ravaged and plundered the country at discretion until at length, fearing to be called to an account on their return, and punished for it, they resolved upon choosing and creating an emperor. For they were no ways inferior, they said, to the army which made Galba emperor, nor to the Praetorian troops which had set up Otho, nor the army in Germany to whom Vitellius owed his elevation. 
The names of all the consular lieutenants, therefore, being taken into consideration, and one objecting to one, and another to another, for various reasons, at last some of the third legion, which a little before Nero's death had been removed out of Syria into Moesia, extolled Vespasian in high terms, and all the rest assenting, his name was immediately inscribed on their standards. The design was nevertheless quashed for a time, the troops being brought to submit to Vitellius a little longer. However, the fact becoming known, Tiberius Alexander, governor of Egypt, first obliged the legions under his command to swear obedience to Vespasian as their emperor, on the Calends, the first of July, which was observed ever after as the day of his accession to the empire, and upon the fifth of the Ides of the same month, the army in Judea, where he then was, also swore allegiance to him. What contributed greatly to forward the affair was a copy of a letter, whether real or counterfeit, which was circulated, and said to have been written by Otho before his decease, to Vespasian, recommending to him in the most urgent terms to avenge his death, and entreating him to come to the aid of the commonwealth, as well as a report which was circulated, that Vitellius, after his success against Otho, proposed to change the winter quarters of the legions, and remove those in Germany to a less hazardous station and a warmer climate. Moreover, amongst the governors of provinces, Licinius Mucianus, dropping the grudge arising from the jealousy of which he had hitherto made no secret, promised to join him with the Syrian army, and among the allied kings, Volugesus, king of the Parthians, offered him a reinforcement of forty thousand archers. Having therefore entered on a civil war, and sent forward his generals and forces into Italy, he himself in the meantime passed over to Alexandria, to obtain possession of the key of Egypt. Here, having entered alone, without attendance, the temple of Serapis, to take the auspices respecting the establishment of his power, and having done his utmost to propitiate the deity, upon turning round, his freedman Basilides appeared before him, and seemed to offer him the sacred leaves, chaplets, and cakes, according to the usage of the place. Although no one had admitted him, and he had long laboured under a muscular debility which would hardly have allowed him to walk into the temple, besides which, it was certain that at the very time he was far away. Immediately after this arrived letters with intelligence that Vitellius's troops had been defeated at Cremona, and he himself slain at Rome. Vespasian, the new emperor, having been raised unexpectedly from a low estate, wanted something which might clothe him with divine majesty and authority. This likewise was now added. A poor man who was blind, and another who was lame, came both together before him, when he was seated on the tribunal, imploring him to heal them, and saying that they were admonished in a dream by the god Serapis to seek his aid, who assured them that he would restore sight to the one by anointing his eyes with his spittle, and give strength to the leg of the other, if he vouchsafed but to touch it with his heel. At first he could scarcely believe that the thing would anyhow succeed, and therefore hesitated to venture on making the experiment. At length, however, by the advice of his friends, he made the attempt publicly, in the presence of the assembled multitudes, and it was crowned with success in both cases. About the same time, at Tegea in Arcadia, by the direction of some soothsayers, several vessels of ancient workmanship were dug out of a consecrated place, on which there was an effigy resembling Vespasian. End of Vespasian, Part 1《ヴェスパジアン Part II》of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Icy Jumbo. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Vespasian, Part 2, Paragraphs 8 to 25. Returning now to Rome, under these auspices, and with a great reputation, after enjoying a triumph for victories over the Jews, he added eight consulships to his former one. 
he likewise assumed the censorship, and made it his principal concern, during the whole of his government, first to restore order in the state, which had been almost ruined, and was in a tottering condition, and then to improve it. The soldiers, one part of them emboldened by victory, and the other smarting with the disgrace of their defeat, had abandoned themselves to every species of licentiousness and insolence. Nay, the provinces too, and free cities, and some kingdoms in alliance with Rome, were all in a disturbed state. He therefore disbanded many of Vitellius's soldiers, and punished others, and so far was he from granting any extraordinary favours to the sharers of his success, that it was late before he paid the gratuities due to them by law. That he might let slip no opportunity of reforming the discipline of the army, upon a young man's coming much perfumed to return him thanks for having appointed him to command a squadron of horse, he turned away his head in disgust, and giving him this sharp reprimand, I had rather you smelt of garlic, revoked his commission. When the men belonging to the fleet, who travelled by turns from Ostia and Puteoli to Rome, petitioned for an addition to their pay, under the name of shoe-money, thinking that it would answer little purpose to send them away without a reply, he ordered them for the future to run barefooted, and so they have done ever since. He deprived of their liberties Achaia, Lycia, Rhodes, Byzantium, and Samos, and reduced them into the form of provinces, Thrace also, and Cilicia, as well as Comagene, which at that time had been under the government of kings. He stationed some legions in Cappadocia on account of the frequent inroads of the barbarians, and instead of a Roman knight, appointed as governor of it a man of consular rank. The ruins of houses which had been burnt down long before, being a great de-site to the city, he gave leave to any one who would to take possession of the void ground and build upon it, if the proprietors should hesitate to perform the work themselves. He resolved upon building the capital, and was the foremost to put his hand to clearing the ground of the rubbish, and removed some of it upon his own shoulder. And he undertook likewise to restore the three thousand tables of brass which had been destroyed in the fire which consumed the capital, searching in all quarters for copies of those curious and ancient records, in which were contained the decrees of the Senate, almost from the building of the city, as well as the acts of the people, relative alliances, treaties, and privileges granted to any person. He likewise erected several new public buildings, namely the Temple of Peace near the Forum, that of Claudius on the Coelian Mount, which had been begun by Agrippina, but almost entirely demolished by Nero, and an amphitheatre in the middle of the city, upon finding that Augustus had projected such a work. He purified the senatorian and equestrian orders, which had been much reduced by the havoc made amongst them at several times, and was fallen into disrepute by neglect. He expelled the most unworthy, he chose in their room the most honourable persons in Italy and the provinces. And to let it be known that these two orders differed not so much in privileges as in dignity, he declared publicly, when some altercation passed between a senator and a Roman knight, that senators ought not to be treated with scurrilous language, unless they were the aggressors, and then it was fair and lawful to return it. The business of the courts had prodigiously accumulated, partly from old lawsuits which, on account of the interruption that had been given to the course of justice, still remained undecided, and partly from the accession of new suits arising out of the disorder of the times. He therefore chose commissioners by lot to provide for the restitution of what had been seized by violence during the war, and others with extraordinary jurisdiction to decide cases belonging to the Kenton Weary, and reduce them to as small a number as possible, for the dispatch of which, otherwise, the lives of the litigants could scarcely allow sufficient time. Lust and luxury, from the license which had long prevailed, had also grown to an enormous height. He therefore obtained a decree of the Senate, that a woman who formed an union with the slave of another person, should be considered a bondwoman herself and that usurers should not be allowed to take proceedings at law for the recovery of money lent to young men whilst they lived in their father's family, not even after their fathers were dead. In other affairs, 
from the beginning to the end of his government, he conducted himself with great moderation and clemency. He was so far from dissembling the obscurity of his extraction that he frequently made mention of it himself. When some affected to trace his pedigree to the founders of Reate and a companion of Hercules, whose monument is still to be seen on the Salarian road, he laughed at them for it. And he was so little fond of external and adventitious ornaments that, on the day of his triumph, being quite tired of the length and tediousness of the procession, he could not forbear saying he was rightly served for having in his old age been so silly as to desire a triumph, as if it was either due to his ancestors or had ever been expected by himself. Nor would he for a long time accept of the tribunitian authority or the title of father of his country, and in regard to the custom of searching those who came to salute him, he dropped it even in the time of the civil war. He bore with great mildness the freedom used by his friends, the satirical allusions of advocates, and the petulance of philosophers. Licinius Mucianus, who had been guilty of notorious acts of lewdness, but, presuming upon his great services, treated him very rudely, he reproved only in private, and when complaining of his conduct to a common friend of theirs, he concluded with these words, However, I am a man. Salvius Liberalis, in pleading the cause of a rich man under prosecution, presuming to say, What is it to Caesar if Hipparchus possesses a hundred millions of sesterces? He commended him for it. Demetrius, the cynic philosopher who had been sentenced to banishment, meeting him on the road, and refusing to rise up or salute him, nay, snarling at him in scurrilous language, he only called him a cur. He was little disposed to keep up the memory of affronts or quarrels, nor did he harbour any resentment on account of them. He made a very splendid marriage for the daughter of his enemy Vitellius, and gave her, besides, a suitable fortune and equipage. Being in a great consternation after he was forbidden the court in the time of Nero, and asking those about him what he should do, or whither he should go, one of those whose office it was to introduce people to the emperor, thrusting him out, bid him go to Morbonia. But when this same person came afterwards to beg his pardon, he only vented his resentment in nearly the same words. He was so far from being influenced by suspicion or fear to seek the destruction of any one that, when his friends advised him to beware of Metius Pomposianus, because it was commonly believed, on his nativity being cast, that he was destined by fate to the empire, he made him consul, promising for him that he would not forget the benefit conferred. It will scarcely be found that so much as one innocent person suffered in his reign, unless in his absence, and without his knowledge, or at least contrary to his inclination, and when he was imposed upon. Although Helvidius Priscus was the only man who presumed to salute him on his return from Syria by his private name of Vespasian, and, when he came to be praetor, omitted any mark of honour to him, or even any mention of him in his edicts, yet he was not angry, until Helvidius proceeded to inveigh against him with the most scurrilous language. Though he did indeed banish him, and afterwards ordered him to be put to death, yet he would gladly have saved him notwithstanding, and accordingly dispatched messengers to fetch back the executioners, and he would have saved him had he not been deceived by a false account brought that he had already perished. He never rejoiced at the death of any man, nay he would shed tears and sigh at the just punishment of the guilty. The only thing deservedly blamable in his character was his love of money for, not satisfied with reviving the imposts which had been repealed in the time of Galba, he imposed new and onerous taxes, augmented the tribute of the provinces, and doubled that of some of them. He likewise openly engaged in a traffic which is discreditable even to a private individual, buying great quantities of goods for the purpose of retailing them again to advantage. Nay, he made no scruple of selling the great offices of the state to candidates, and pardons to persons under prosecution, whether they were innocent or guilty. It is believed that he advanced all the most rapacious among the procurators to higher offices, with the view of squeezing them after they had acquired great wealth. He was commonly said to have used them as sponges, because it was his practice, as we may say, to wet them when dry, and squeeze them when wet. 
It is said that he was naturally extremely covetous, and was upbraided with it by an old herdsman of his, who, upon the emperor's refusing to enfranchise him gratis, which on his advancement he humbly petitioned for, cried out, that the fox changed his hair, but not his nature. On the other hand, some are of opinion that he was urged to his rapacious proceedings by necessity, and the extreme poverty of the treasury and exchequer, of which he took public notice in the beginning of his reign, declaring that no less than four hundred thousand millions of sesterces were wanting to carry on the government. This is the more likely to be true, because he applied to the best purposes what he procured by bad means. His liberality, however, to all ranks of people was excessive. He made up to several senators the estate required by law to qualify them for that dignity, relieving likewise such men of consular rank as were poor, with a yearly allowance of five hundred thousand sesterces, and rebuilt, in a better manner than before, several cities in different parts of the empire, which had been damaged by earthquakes or fires. He was a great encourager of learning and the liberal arts. He first granted to the Latin and Greek professors of rhetoric the yearly stipend of a hundred thousand sesterces each out of the exchequer. He also bought the freedom of superior poets and artists, and gave a noble gratuity to the restorer of the cone of Venus, and to another artist who repaired the Colossus. Someone offering to convey some immense columns into the capital at a small expense by a mechanical contrivance, he rewarded him very handsomely for his invention, but would not accept his service, saying, Suffer me to find maintenance for the poor people. In the games celebrated when the stage scenery of the theatre of Marcellus was repaired, he restored the old musical entertainments. He gave Apollinaris, the tragedian, four hundred thousand sesterces, and to Terpinus and Diodorus, the harpers, two hundred thousand. To some a hundred thousand, and the least he gave to any of the performers was forty thousand, besides many golden crowns. He entertained company constantly at his table, and often in great state, and very sumptuously, in order to promote trade. As in the Saturnalia he made presents to the men which they were to carry away with them, so did he to the women upon the calends of March, notwithstanding which he could not wipe off the disrepute of his former stinginess. The Alexandrians called him constantly Caibiosactes, a name which had been given to one of their kings who was sordidly avaricious. Nay, at his funeral, Favo, the principal mimic, personating him and imitating, as actors do, both his manner of speaking and his gestures, asked aloud of the procurators how much his funeral and the procession would cost, and being answered ten millions of sesterces, he cried out, Give him but a hundred thousand sesterces, and they might throw his body into the Tiber, if they would. He was broad-set, strong-limbed, and his features gave the idea of a man in the act of straining himself. In consequence, one of the city wits, upon the emperors desiring him to say something droll respecting himself, facetiously answered, I will, when you have done relieving your bowels. He enjoyed a good state of health, though he used no other means to preserve it than repeated friction, as much as he could bear, on his neck and other parts of his body, in the tennis court attached to the baths, besides fasting one day in every month. His method of life was commonly this. After he became emperor, he used to rise very early, often before daybreak. Having read over his letters, and the briefs of all the departments of the government offices, he admitted his friends, and while they were paying him their compliments, he would put on his own shoes and dress himself with his own hands. Then, after the dispatch of such business as was brought before him, he rode out, and afterwards retired to repose, lying on his couch with one of his mistresses, of whom he kept several after the death of Kynis. Coming out of his private apartments, he passed to the bath, and then entered the supper-room. They say he was never more good-humoured and indulgent than at that time, and therefore his attendants always seized that opportunity when they had any favour to ask. At supper, and indeed at other times, he was extremely free and jocose, for he had humour but of a low kind, and he would sometimes use indecent language, such as is addressed to young girls about to be married. 
yet there are some things related of him not void of ingenious pleasantry, amongst which are the following. Being once reminded by Mestrius Florus that plaustra was a more proper expression than plostra, he the next day saluted him by the name of Flaurus. A certain lady, pretending to be desperately enamoured of him, he was prevailed upon to admit her to his bed, and after he had gratified her desires, he gave her four hundred thousand sesterces. When his steward desired to know how he would have the sum entered in his accounts, he replied, Four Vespasians being seduced. He used Greek verses very wittily, speaking of a tall man who had enormous parts, Maxi Bibas, Cradon Dolikoskion Enkos, still shaking as he strode his vast long spear, and of Cerylus, a freedman, who being very rich had begun to pass himself off as freeborn, to elude the exchequer at his decease, and assumed the name of Larches, he said, O Larches, Larches, Apan Apothanais, Althes ex Archais, Esai Kyrilos. Ah, Larches, Larches, when thou art no more, thou'lt Cerylus be called, just as before. He chiefly affected wit upon his own shameful means of raising money, in order to wipe off the odium by some joke, and turn it into ridicule. One of his ministers, who was much in his favour, requesting of him a stewardship for some person, under pretence of being his brother, he deferred granting him his petition, and in the meantime sent for the candidate, and having squeezed out of him as much money as he had agreed to give his friend at court, he appointed him immediately to the office. The minister soon after renewing his application, "'You must,' said he, "'find another brother, for the one you adopted is in truth mine.' Suspecting once during a journey that his mule-driver had alighted to shoe his mules only in order to have an opportunity for allowing a person they met, who was engaged in a lawsuit, to speak to him, he asked him how much he got for shoeing his mules, and insisted on having a share of the profit. When his son Titus blamed him for even laying a tax upon urine, he applied to his nose a piece of the money he received in the first instalment, and asked him if it stunk, and he replying no, and yet, said he, it is derived from urine. Some deputies, having come to acquaint him that a large statue, which would cost a vast sum, was ordered to be erected for him at the public expense, he told them to pay it down immediately, holding out the hollow of his hand, and saying, there was a base ready for the statue. Not even when he was under the immediate apprehension and peril of death could he forbear jesting. For when, among other prodigies, the mausoleum of the Caesars suddenly flew open, and a blazing star appeared in the heavens, one of the prodigies, he said, concerned Julia Calvina, who was of the family of Augustus, and the other, the king of the Parthians, who wore his hair long. And when his distemper first seized him, I suppose, said he, I shall soon be a god. In his ninth consulship, being seized, while in Campania, with a slight indisposition, and immediately returning to the city, he soon afterwards went thence to Cutiliae, and his estates in the country about Reate, where he used constantly to spend the summer. Here, though his disorder much increased, and he injured his bowels by too free use of the cold waters, he nevertheless attended to the dispatch of business, and even gave audience to ambassadors in bed. At last, being taken ill of a diarrhoea, to such a degree that he was ready to faint, he cried out, An emperor ought to die standing upright. In endeavouring to rise, he died in the hands of those who were helping him up, upon the 8th of the calends of July, 24th of June, being sixty-nine years, one month, and seven days old. All are agreed that he had such confidence in the calculations on his own nativity, and that of his son's, that after several conspiracies against him, he told the Senate that either his sons would succeed him, or nobody. It is said likewise that he once saw in a dream a balance in the middle of the porch of the Palatine house exactly poised, in one scale of which stood Claudius and Nero, in the other himself and his sons. The event corresponded to the symbol, for the reigns of the two parties were precisely of the same duration. End of Vespasian Titus from the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson, and edited by T. Forrester. Titus, paragraphs 1 through 11. Titus, who had the same cognomen with his father, was the darling and delight of mankind. So much did the natural genius, address, or good fortune he possessed tend to conciliate the favor of all. This was indeed extremely difficult after he became emperor, as before that time, and even during the reign of his father, he lay under public odium and censure. He was born upon the third of the calends of January, in the year remarkable for the death of Caius, near the Septizonium, in a mean house and a very small and dark room, which still exists and is shown to the curious. He was educated in the palace with Britannicus, and instructed in the same branches of learning and under the same masters. During this time, they say, that a physiognomist being introduced by Narcissus, the freedman of Claudius, to examine the features of Britannicus, positively affirmed that he would never become emperor, but that Titus, who stood by, would. They were so familiar that Titus, being next him at table, is thought to have tasted of the fatal potion which put an end to Britannicus' life, and to have contracted from it a distemper which hung about him a long time. In remembrance of all these circumstances, he afterwards erected a golden statue of him in the Palatium, and dedicated to him an equestrian statue of ivory, attending it in the Circensian procession, in which it is still carried to this day. While yet a boy, he was remarkable for his noble endowments both of body and mind, and as he advanced in years they became still more conspicuous. He had a fine person, combining an equal mixture of majesty and grace, was very strong, though not tall, and somewhat corpulent. Gifted with an excellent memory and a capacity for all the arts of peace and war, he was a perfect master of the use of arms and riding, very ready in the Latin and Greek tongues, both in verse and prose, and such was the facility he possessed in both, that he would harangue and versify extempore. Nor was he unacquainted with music, but could both sing and play upon the harp sweetly and scientifically. I have likewise been informed by many persons that he was remarkably quick in writing shorthand, would in merriment and jest engage with his secretaries in the imitation of any handwriting he saw, and often say that he was admirably qualified for forgery. He filled with distinction the rank of a military tribune both in Germany and Britain, in which he conducted himself with the utmost activity and no less modesty and reputation, as appears evident from the great number of statues with honorable inscriptions erected to him in various parts of both those provinces. After serving in the wars, he frequented the courts of law, but with less assiduity than applause. About the same time he married Aricidia, the daughter of Tertullus, who was only a knight, but had formerly been prefect of the Praetorian Guards. After her decease he married Marcia Fernilla, of a very noble family, but afterwards divorced her, taking from her the daughter he had by her. Upon the expiration of his questorship he was raised to the rank of commander of a legion, and took the two strong cities of Terakia and Gamala in Judea and having his horse killed under him in a battle, he mounted another, whose rider he had encountered and slain. Soon afterwards, when Galba came to be emperor, he was sent to congratulate him, and turned the eyes of all people upon himself, wherever he came, it being the general opinion amongst them that the emperor had sent for him with a design to adopt him for his son. But finding all things again in confusion, he turned back upon the road, and going to consult the oracle of Venus at Paphos about his voyage, he received assurances of obtaining the empire for himself. These hopes were speedily strengthened, and being left to finish the reduction of Judea, in the final assault of Jerusalem he slew seven of its defenders, with the like number of arrows, and took it upon his daughter's birthday. 
So great was the joy and attachment of the soldiers that in their congratulations they unanimously saluted him by the title of emperor, and upon his quitting the province soon afterwards would needs have detained him, earnestly begging him, and that not without threats, either to stay or take them all with him. This occurrence gave rise to the suspicion of his being engaged in a design to rebel against his father, and claim for himself the government of the East. And the suspicion increased, when on his way to Alexandria he wore a diadem at the consecration of the ox apis at Memphis, and though he did it only in compliance with an ancient religious usage of the country, yet there was some who put a bad construction upon it. Making therefore what haste he could into Italy, he arrived first at Regium, and sailing thence in a merchant ship to Puteoli, went to Rome with all possible expedition. Presenting himself unexpectedly to his father, he said, by way of contradicting the strange reports raised concerning him, I am come, father, I am come. From that time he constantly acted as colleague with his father, and indeed as regent of the empire. He triumphed with his father, bore jointly with him the office of censor, and was besides his colleague not only in the tribunician authority, but in seven consulships. Taking upon himself the care and inspection of all offices, he dictated letters, wrote proclamations in his father's name, and pronounced his speeches in the Senate in place of the quaestor. He likewise assumed the command of the Praetorian Guards, although no one but a Roman knight had ever before been their prefect. In this he conducted himself with great haughtiness and violence, taking off without scruple or delay all those he had most reason to suspect after he had secretly sent his emissaries into the theatres and camp to demand, as if by general consent, that the suspected persons should be delivered up to punishment. Among these he invited to supper A. Caecina, a man of consular rank, whom he ordered to be stabbed at his departure, immediately after he had gone out of the room. To this act, indeed, he was provoked by an imminent danger, for he had discovered a writing under the hand of Caecina containing an account of a plot hatched among the soldiers. By these acts, though he provided for his future security, yet for the present he so much incurred the hatred of the people that scarcely ever any one came to the empire with a more odious character or more universally disliked. Besides his cruelty, he lay under the suspicion of giving way to habits of luxury, as he often prolonged his revels till midnight with the most riotous of his acquaintance. Nor was he unsuspected of lewdness, on account of the swarms of catamites and eunuchs about him, and his well-known attachment to Queen Bernice, who received from him, as it is reported, a promise of marriage. He was supposed, besides, to be of a rapacious disposition for it is certain that in causes which came before his father he used to offer his interest for sale and took bribes. In short, people publicly expressed an unfavorable opinion of him, and said he would prove another Nero. This prejudice, however, turned out in the end to his advantage, and enhanced his praises to the highest pitch when he was found to possess no vicious propensities, but, on the contrary, the noblest virtues. His entertainments were agreeable rather than extravagant, and he surrounded himself with such excellent friends that the succeeding princes adopted them as most serviceable to themselves and the state. He immediately sent away Bernice from the city, much against both their inclinations. Some of his old eunuchs, though such accomplished dancers that they bore an uncontrollable sway upon the stage, he was so far from treating with any extraordinary kindness that he would not so much as witness their performances in the crowded theater. He violated no private right, and if ever man refrained from injustice, he did. Nay, he would not accept of the allowable and customary offerings. Yet, in munificence, he was inferior to none of the princes before him. Having dedicated his amphitheater, and built some warm baths close by it with great expedition, he entertained the people with most magnificent spectacles. He likewise exhibited a naval fleet in the old Naumachia, besides a combat of gladiators, and in one day brought into the theatre five thousand wild beasts of all kinds. He was by nature extremely benevolent, for whereas all the emperors after Tiberius, according to the example he had set them, would not admit the grants made by former princes to be valid unless they received their own sanction, he confirmed them all by one general edict, without waiting for any applications respecting them. 
Of all who petitioned for any favor, he sent none away without hopes. And when his ministers represented to him that he promised more than he could perform, he replied, No one ought to go away downcast from an audience with his prince. Once at supper, reflecting that he had done nothing for any that day, he broke out into that memorable and justly admired saying, My friends, I have lost a day. More particularly, he treated the people on all occasions with so much courtesy that on presenting them with a show of gladiators, he declared he should manage it not according to his own fancy, but that of the spectators, and did accordingly. He denied them nothing, and very frankly encouraged them to ask what they pleased. Espousing the cause of the Thracian party among the gladiators, he frequently joined in the popular demonstrations in their favor, but without compromising his dignity or doing injustice. To omit no opportunity of acquiring popularity, he sometimes made use himself of the baths he had erected without excluding the common people. There happened in his reign some dreadful accidents, an eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Campania, and a fire in Rome which continued during three days and three nights, besides a plague such as was scarcely ever known before. Amidst these many great disasters he not only manifested the concern which might be expected from a prince, but even the affection of a father for his people. One while comforting them by his proclamations, and another while relieving them to the utmost of his power. He chose by lot from amongst the men of consular rank commissioners for repairing the losses in Campania. The estates of those who had perished by the eruption of Vesuvius and who had left no heirs, he applied to the repair of the ruined cities. With regard to the public buildings destroyed by fire in the city, he declared that nobody should be a loser but himself. Accordingly, he applied all the ornaments of his palaces to the decoration of the temples and purposes of public utility, and appointed several men of the equestrian order to superintend the work. For the relief of the people during the plague, he employed, in the way of sacrifice and medicine, all means both human and divine. Amongst the calamities of the times were informers and their agents, a tribe of miscreants who had grown up under the license of former reigns. These he frequently ordered to be scourged or beaten with sticks in the forum, and then, after he had obliged them to pass through the amphitheater as a public spectacle, commanded them to be sold for slaves, or else banished them to some rocky islands. And to discourage such practices for the future, amongst other things, he prohibited actions to be successively brought under different laws for the same cause, or the state of affairs of deceased persons to be inquired into after a certain number of years. Having declared that he accepted the office of Pontifex Maximus for the purpose of preserving his hands undefiled, he faithfully adhered to his promise. For after that time he was neither directly nor indirectly concerned in the death of any person, though he sometimes was justly irritated, he swore that he would perish himself rather than prove the destruction of any man. Two men of patrician rank being convicted of aspiring to the empire, he only advised them to desist, saying that the sovereign power was disposed of by fate, and promised them that if there was anything else they desired of him, he would grant it. He also immediately sent messengers to the mother of one of them, who was at a great distance and in deep anxiety about her son, to assure her of his safety. Nay, he not only invited them to sup with him, but next day, at a show of gladiators, purposely placed them close by him, and handed to them the arms of the combatants for his inspection. It is said likewise that having had their nativities cast, he assured them that a great calamity was impending on both of them, but from another hand and not from his. Though his brother was continually plotting against him, almost openly stirring up the armies to rebellion, and contriving to get away, yet he could not endure to put him to death, or to banish him from his presence, nor did he treat him with less respect than before. But from his first accession to the empire, he constantly declared him his partner in it, and that he should be his successor, begging of him sometimes in private, with tears in his eyes, to return the affection he had for him. Amidst all these favorable circumstances, he was cut off by an untimely death, more to the loss of mankind than himself. At the close of the public spectacles, he wept bitterly in the presence of the people, and then retired into the Sabine country, rather melancholy,
because a victim had made its escape while he was sacrificing, and loud thunder had been heard while the atmosphere was serene. At the first resting place on the road he was seized with a fever, and being carried forward in a litter, they say that he drew back the curtains and looked up to heaven, complaining heavily that his life was taken from him, though he had done nothing to deserve it, for there was no action of his that he had occasion to repent of but one. What that was he neither disclosed himself, nor is it easy for us to conjecture. Some imagine that he alluded to the connection which he had formerly had with his brother's wife, but Domitia solemnly denied it on oath, which she would never have done had there been any truth in the report. Nay, she would certainly have gloried in it, as she was forward enough to boast of all her scandalous intrigues. He died in the same villa where his father had died, before him, upon the Ides of September, two years, two months, and twenty days after he had succeeded his father, and in the one and fortieth year of his age. As soon as the news of his death was published, all people mourned for him, as for the loss of some near relative. The Senate assembled in haste, before they could be summoned by proclamation, and locking the doors of their house at first, but afterwards opening them, gave him such thanks, and heaped upon him such praises, now he was dead, as they never had done whilst he was alive and present among them. End of Titus Domitian, Part One, From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester Domitian, Part 1, Paragraphs 1-10 through 10. Domitian was born upon the ninth of the calends of November, when his father was consul-elect, being to enter upon his office the month following, in the sixth region of the city, at the pomegranate, in the house which he afterwards converted into a temple of the Flavian family. He is said to have spent the time of his youth in so much want and infamy that he had not one piece of plate belonging to him, and it is well known that Clodius Polio, a man of Praetorian rank, against whom there is a poem of Nero's extant, entitled Lucio, kept a note in his handwriting, which he sometimes produced, in which Domitian made an assignation with him for the foulest purposes. Some, likewise, have said that he prostituted himself to Nerva, who succeeded him. In the war with Vitellius, he fled into the capital with his uncle Sabinus, and a part of the troops they had in the city. But the enemy breaking in, and the temple being set on fire, he hid himself all night with the sacristan, and next morning, assuming the disguise of a worshipper of Isis, and mixing with the priests of that idle superstition, he got over the Tiber, with only one attendant, to the house of a woman who was the mother of one of his schoolfellows, and lurked there so close that, though the enemy who were at his heels searched very strictly after him, they could not discover him. At last, after the success of his party, appearing in public and being unanimously saluted by the title of Caesar, he assumed the office of praetor of the city, with consular authority, but in fact had nothing but the name, for the jurisdiction he transferred to his next colleague. He used, however, his absolute power so licentiously that even then he plainly discovered what sort of prince he was likely to prove. Not to go into details, after he had made free with the wives of many men of distinction, he took Domitia Longina from her husband, Aelius Lamia, and married her, and in one day disposed of about twenty offices in the city and the provinces, upon which Vespasian said several times he wondered he did not send him a successor too. He likewise designed an expedition into Gaul and Germany, without the least necessity for it, and contrary to the advice of all his father's friends, and this he did only with the view of equaling his brother in military achievements and glory. But for this he was severely reprimanded, and that he might the more effectually be reminded of his age and position, 
was made to live with his father, and his litter had to follow his father's and brother's carriage as often as they went abroad. But he attended them in their triumph for the conquest of Judea, mounted on a white horse. Of the six consulships which he held, only one was ordinary, and that he obtained by the session and interest of his brother. He greatly affected a modest behavior, and, above all, a taste for poetry, insomuch that he rehearsed his performances in public, though it was an art he had formerly little cultivated, and which he afterwards despised and abandoned. Devoted, however, as he was at this time to poetical pursuits, yet when Vologesus, king of the Parthians, desired succors against the Alani, with one of Vespasian's sons to command them, he labored hard to procure for himself that appointment. But the scheme proving abortive, he endeavored by presents and promises to engage other kings of the East to make a similar request. After his father's death, he was for some time in doubt whether he should not offer the soldiers a donative double to that of his brother, and made no scruple of saying frequently that he had been left his partner in the empire, but that his father's will had been fraudulently set aside. From that time forward, he was constantly engaged in plots against his brother, both publicly and privately, until, falling dangerously ill, he ordered all his attendants to leave him, under pretense of his being dead, before he really was so, and, at his decease, paid him no other honor than that of enrolling him amongst the gods, and he often, both in speeches and edicts, carped at his memory by sneers and insinuations. In the beginning of his reign, he used to spend daily an hour by himself in private, during which time he did nothing else but catch flies and stick them through the body with a sharp pin. When someone therefore inquired whether anyone was with the emperor, it was significantly answered by Vibius Crispus, not so much as a fly. Soon after his advancement, his wife Domitia, by whom he had a son in his second consulship, and whom the year following he complimented with the title of Augusta, being desperately in love with Paris, the actor, he put her away. But within a short time afterwards, being unable to bear the separation, he took her again, under pretense of complying with the people's importunity. During some time there was in his administration a strange mixture of virtue and vice, until at last his virtues themselves degenerated into vices being, as we may reasonably conjecture concerning his character, inclined to avarice through want, and to cruelty through fear. He frequently entertained the people with most magnificent and costly shows, not only in the amphitheater, but the circus, where, besides the usual races with chariots drawn by two or four horses abreast, he exhibited the representation of an engagement between both horse and foot, and a sea fight in the amphitheater, the people were also entertained with the chase of wild beasts and the combat of gladiators, even in the night time, by torchlight. Nor did men only fight in these spectacles, but women also. He constantly attended at the games given by the questors, which had been disused for some time, but were revived by him, and upon those occasions always gave the people the liberty of demanding two pairs of gladiators out of his own school, who appeared last in court uniforms. Whenever he attended the shows of gladiators, there stood at his feet a little boy dressed in scarlet, with a prodigiously small head, with whom he used to talk very much, and sometimes seriously. We are assured that he was overheard asking him if he knew for what reason he had in the late appointment made Metius Rufus governor of Egypt. He presented the people with naval fights, performed by fleets almost as numerous as those usually employed in real engagements, making a vast lake near the Tiber, and building seats round it. And he witnessed them himself during a very heavy rain. He likewise celebrated the secular games, reckoning not from the year in which they had been exhibited by Claudius, but from the time of Augustus's celebration of them. In these, upon the day of the Circensian sports, in order to have a hundred races performed, he reduced each course from seven rounds to five. He likewise instituted, in honor of Jupiter Capitolinus, a solemn contest in music to be performed every five years, besides horse racing and gymnastic exercises, with more prizes than are at present allowed. 
There was also a public performance in elocution, both Greek and Latin, and besides the musicians who sung to the harp, there were others who played concerted pieces or solos, without vocal accompaniment. Young girls also ran races in the stadium, at which he presided in his sandals, dressed in a purple robe, made after the Grecian fashion, and wearing upon his head a golden crown bearing the effigies of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. With the flamen of Jupiter, and the college of priests sitting by his side in the same dress, excepting only that their crowns had also his own image on them. He celebrated also upon the Alban Mount every year the festival of Minerva, for whom he had appointed a college of priests, out of which were chosen by lot persons to preside as governors over the college, who were obliged to entertain the people with extraordinary chases of wild beasts and stage plays, besides contests for prizes in oratory and poetry. He thrice bestowed upon the people a largesse of three hundred sesterces each man, and at a public show of gladiators a very plentiful feast. At the festival of the Seven Hills he distributed large hampers of provisions to the senatorian and equestrian orders, and small baskets to the common people, and encouraged them to eat by setting them the example. The day after, he scattered among the people a variety of cakes and other delicacies to be scrambled for, and on the greater part of them falling amidst the seats of the crowd, he ordered five hundred tickets to be thrown into each range of benches belonging to the senatorian and equestrian orders. He rebuilt many noble edifices which had been destroyed by fire, and amongst them the capital, which had been burnt down a second time but all the inscriptions were in his own name, without the least mention of the original founders. He likewise erected a new temple in the capital to Jupiter Custos, and a forum, which is now called Nervas, as also the temple of the Flavian family, a stadium, an odium, and an amachia, out of the stone dug from which the sides of the Circus Maximus, which had been burnt down, were rebuilt. He undertook several expeditions, some from choice, and some from necessity. That against the Cati was unprovoked, but that against the Sarmatians was necessary, an entire legion, with its commander, having been cut off by them. He sent two expeditions against the Dacians, the first upon the defeat of Oppius Sabinus, a man of consular rank, and the other upon that of Cornelius Fuscus, prefect of the Praetorian cohorts, to whom he had entrusted the conduct of that war. After several battles with the Cati and Daci, he celebrated a double triumph. But for his successes against the Sarmatians, he only bore in procession the laurel crown to Jupiter Capitolinus. The civil war, begun by Lucius Antonius, governor of Upper Germany, he quelled, without being obliged to be personally present at it, with remarkable good fortune. For, at the very moment of joining battle, the Rhine suddenly thawing, the troops of the barbarians which were ready to join L. Antonius were prevented from crossing the river. Of this victory he had noticed by some presages, before the messengers who brought the news of it arrived, for upon the very day the battle was fought, a splendid eagle spread its wings round his statue at Rome, making most joyful cries, and shortly after a rumor became common that Antonius was slain, Nay, many positively affirmed that they saw his head brought to the city. He made many innovations in common practices. He abolished the sportula, and revived the old practice of regular suppers. To the four former parties in the Circensian games he added two new, who were gold and scarlet. He prohibited the players from acting in the theatre, but permitted them the practice of their art in private houses. He forbade the castration of males, and reduced the price of the eunuchs who were still left in the hands of the dealers in slaves. On the occasion of a great abundance of wine, accompanied by a scarcity of corn, supposing that the tillage of the ground was neglected for the sake of attending too much to the cultivation of vineyards, he published a proclamation forbidding the planting of any new vines in Italy, and ordering the vines in the provinces to be cut down, nowhere permitting more than one half of them to remain. But he did not persist in the execution of this project. Some of the greatest offices he conferred upon his freedmen and soldiers. He forbade two legions to be quartered in the same camp, and more than a thousand sesterces to be deposited by any soldier with the standards, because it was thought that Lucius Antonius had been encouraged in his late project by the large sum deposited in the military chest by the two legions which he had in the same winter quarters. 
he made an addition to the soldier's pay of three gold pieces a year. In the administration of justice he was diligent and assiduous, and frequently sat in the forum out of course to cancel the judgments of the court of the one hundred which had been procured through favor or interest. He occasionally cautioned the judges of the court of recovery to beware of being too ready to admit claims for freedom brought before them. He set a mark of infamy upon judges who were convicted of taking bribes, as well as upon their assessors. He likewise instigated the tribunes of the people to prosecute a corrupt edile for extortion, and to desire the Senate to appoint judges for his trial. He likewise took such effectual care in punishing magistrates of the city, and governors of provinces, guilty of malversation, that they never were at any time more moderate or more just. Most of these, since his reign, we have seen prosecuted for crimes of various kinds. Having taken upon himself the reformation of the public manners, he restrained the license of the populace in sitting promiscuously with the knights in the theatre. Scandalous libels, published to defame persons of rank of either sex, he suppressed, and inflicted upon their authors a mark of infamy. He expelled a man of Questorian rank from the Senate for practicing mimicry and dancing. He debarred infamous women the use of litters, as also the right of receiving legacies or inheriting estates. He struck out of the list of judges a Roman knight for taking again his wife whom he had divorced and prosecuted for adultery. He condemned several men of the senatorian and equestrian orders upon the Scantinian law. The lewdness of the Vestal Virgins, which had been overlooked by his father and brother, he punished severely, but in different ways, viz., offenses committed before his reign with death and those since its commencement according to ancient custom. For to the two sisters called Osolati he gave liberty to choose the mode of death which they preferred, and banished their paramours. But Cornelia, the president of the Vestals, who had formerly been acquitted upon a charge of incontinence, being a long time after again prosecuted and condemned, he ordered to be buried alive, and her gallants to be whipped to death with rods in the Comitium excepting only a man of praetorian rank, to whom, because he confessed the fact while the case was dubious, and it was not established against him, though the witnesses had been put to the torture, he granted the favor of banishment. And to preserve pure and undefiled the reverence due to the gods, he ordered the soldiers to demolish a tomb, which one of his freedmen had erected for his son out of the stones designed for the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, and to sink in the sea the bones and relics buried in it. Upon his first succeeding to power, he felt such an abhorrence for the shedding of blood, that before his father's arrival in Rome, calling to mind the verse of Virgil, Impia quam caesis gens est epulata juvensis, ere impious man, restrained from blood in vain, began to feast on flesh of bullocks slain, he designed to have published a proclamation to forbid the sacrifice of oxen before his accession to the imperial authority, and during some time afterwards, he scarcely ever gave the least grounds for being suspected of covetousness or avarice, but on the contrary he often afforded proofs, not only of his justice, but his liberality. To all about him he was generous even to profusion, and recommended nothing more earnestly to them than to avoid doing anything mean. He would not accept the property left him by those who had children, he also set aside a legacy bequeathed by the will of Ruscus Caepio, who had ordered his heir to make a present yearly to each of the senators upon their first assembling. He exonerated all those who had been under prosecution from the treasury for above five years before, and would not suffer suits to be renewed, unless it was done within a year, and on condition that the prosecutor should be banished if he could not make good his cause. The secretaries of the quaestors having engaged in trade, according to custom, but contrary to the Clodian law, he pardoned them for what was past. Such portions of land as had been left when it was divided amongst the veteran soldiers, he granted to the ancient possessors, as belonging to them by prescription. He put a stop to false prosecutions in the exchequer, by severely punishing the prosecutors, and this saying of his was much taken notice of, that a prince who does not punish informers encourages them. But he did not long persevere in this course of clemency and justice, although he sooner fell into cruelty than into avarice. He put to death a scholar of Paris, the pantomimic, 
though a minor and then sick, only because, both in person and the practice of his art, he resembled his master, as he did likewise Hermogenes of Tarsus for some oblique reflections in his history, crucifying, besides, the scribes who had copied the work. One who was a master of a band of gladiators, happening to say that a thrax was a match for a marmillo, but not so for the exhibitor of the games, he ordered him to be dragged from the benches into the arena and exposed to the dogs, with this label put upon him, a parmularian guilty of talking impiously. He put to death many senators, and amongst them several men of consular rank. In this number were Civica Serialis, when he was proconsul in Africa, Salvidianus Orphetus, and Asilius Glabrio in exile, under the pretense of their planning to revolt against him. The rest he punished upon very trivial occasions, as Aelius Lamia for some jocular expressions which were of old date and perfectly harmless, because, upon his commending his voice after he had taken his wife from him, he replied, Alas, I hold my tongue. And when Titus advised him to take another wife, he answered him thus, What, have you a mind to marry? Salvius Cocceanus was condemned to death for keeping the birthday of his uncle Otho, the emperor, Metius Pomposianus because he was commonly reported to have an imperial nativity, and to carry about with him a map of the world upon vellum, with the speeches of kings and generals extracted out of Titus Livius, and for giving his slaves the name of Mago and Hannibal. Salustius Luculus, lieutenant in Britain, for suffering some lances of a new invention to be called Luculian, and Junius Rusticus, for publishing a treatise in praise of Pytius Thracia and Helvidius Priscus, and calling them both most upright men. Upon this occasion he likewise banished all the philosophers from the city and Italy. He put to death the younger Helvidius for writing a farce in which, under the character of Paris and Oinoni, he reflected upon his having divorced his wife, and also Flavius Sabinus, one of his cousins, because, upon his being chosen at the consular election to that office, the public crier had, by a blunder, proclaimed him to the people not consul, but emperor. Becoming still more savage after his success in the civil war, he employed the utmost industry to discover those of the adverse party who absconded. Many of them he racked with a new invented torture, inserting fire through their private parts, and from some he cut off their hands. It is certain that only two of any note were pardoned, a tribune who wore the narrow stripe, and a centurion who, to clear themselves from the charge of being concerned in any rebellious project, proved themselves to have been guilty of prostitution, and consequently incapable of exercising any influence either over the general or the soldiers. End of Domitian, Part 1「2. From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Domitian, Part 2, Paragraphs 11 through 23. His cruelties were not only excessive, but subtle and unexpected. The day before he crucified a collector of his rents, he sent for him into his bedchamber, made him sit down upon the bed by him, and sent him away well pleased, and, so far as could be inferred from his treatment, in a state of perfect security, having vouchsafed him the favor of a plate of meat from his own table. When he was on the point of condemning to death Aretinus Clemens, a man of consular rank, and one of his friends and emissaries, he retained him about his person in the same or greater favor than ever, until at last, as they were riding together in the same litter, upon seeing the man who had informed against him, he said, Are you willing that we should hear this base slave to-morrow? Contemptuously abusing the patience of men, he never pronounced a severe sentence without prefacing it with words which gave hopes of mercy. 
so that at last there was not a more certain token of a fatal conclusion than a mild commencement. He brought before the Senate some person accused of treason, declaring that he should prove that day how dear he was to the Senate, and so influenced them that they condemned the accused to be punished according to the ancient usage. Then, as if alarmed at the extreme severity of their punishment, to lessen the odiousness of the proceeding, he interposed in these words, for it is not foreign to the purpose to give them precisely as they were delivered, Permit me, conscript fathers, so far to prevail upon your affection for me, however extraordinary the request may seem, as to grant the condemned criminals the favor of dying in the manner they choose. For by so doing, ye will spare your own eyes, and the world will understand that I interceded with the Senate on their behalf. Having exhausted the exchequer by the expense of his buildings and public spectacles, with the augmentation of pay lately granted to the troops, he made an attempt at the reduction of the army in order to lessen the military charges. But reflecting that he should, by this measure, expose himself to the insults of the barbarians, while it would not suffice to extricate him from his embarrassments, he had recourse to plundering his subjects by every mode of exaction. The estates of the living and the dead were sequestered upon any accusation by whomsoever preferred. The unsupported allegation of any one person, relative to a word or action construed to affect the dignity of the emperor, was sufficient. Inheritances, to which he had not the slightest pretension, were confiscated. If there was found so much as one person to say, he had heard from the deceased when living, that he had made the emperor his heir. Besides the exactions from others, the poll tax on the Jews was levied with extreme rigor both on those who lived after the manner of Jews in the city, without publicly professing themselves to be such, and on those who, by concealing their origin, avoided paying the tribute imposed upon that people. I remember, when I was a youth, to have been present when an old man, ninety years of age, had his person exposed to view in a very crowded court, in order that, on inspection, the procurator might satisfy himself whether he was circumcised. From his earliest years Domitian was anything but courteous, of a forward, assuming disposition, and extravagant both in his words and actions. When Caenis, his father's concubine, upon her return from Istria, offered him a kiss, as she had been used to do, he presented her his hand to kiss, being indignant that his brother's son-in-law should be waited on by servants dressed in white, he exclaimed, Uc agathon polykoi ranyi. Too many princes are not good. After he became emperor, he had the assurance to boast in the Senate that he had bestowed the empire on his father and brother, and they had restored it to him. And upon taking his wife again after the divorce, he declared by proclamation that he had recalled her to his pulviner. He was not a little pleased, too, at hearing the acclamations of the people in the amphitheater on a day of festival, all happiness to our Lord and Lady. But when, during the celebration of the Capitoline trial of skill, the whole concourse of people entreated him with one voice to restore Palforius Sura to his place in the Senate, from which he had been long before expelled, he having then carried away the prize of eloquence from all the orators who had contended for it, he did not vouchsafe to give them any answer, but only commanded silence to be proclaimed by the voice of the crier. With equal arrogance, when he dictated the form of a letter to be used by his procurators, he began it thus, Our Lord and God commands so-and-so, whence it became a rule that no one should style him otherwise either in writing or speaking. He suffered no statues to be erected for him in the capital, unless they were of gold and silver, and of a certain weight. He erected so many magnificent gates and arches, surmounted by representations of chariots drawn by four horses, and other triumphal ornaments, in different quarters of the city, that a wag inscribed on one of the arches the Greek word axke, it is enough. He filled the office of consul seventeen times, which no one had ever done before him, and for the seven middle occasions in successive years, but in scarcely any of them had he more than the title for he never continued in office beyond the calends of May, and for the most part only till the Ides of January. 
After his two triumphs, when he assumed the cognomen of Germanicus, he called the months of September and October Germanicus and Domitian, after his own names, because he commenced his reign in the one and was born in the other. Becoming by these means universally feared and odious, he was at last taken off by a conspiracy of his friends and favorite freedmen, in concert with his wife. He had long entertained a suspicion of the year and day when he should die, and even of the very hour and manner of his death, all which he had learned from the Chaldeans, when he was a very young man. His father once at supper laughed at him for refusing to eat some mushrooms, saying that if he knew his fate he would rather be afraid of the sword. Being therefore in perpetual apprehension and anxiety, he was keenly alive to the slightest suspicions, insomuch that he is thought to have withdrawn the edict ordering the destruction of the vines, chiefly because the copies of it which were dispersed had the following lines written upon them. Keen me fagis epi rizanomos epi cartophoriso. Gnaw thou my root, yet shall my juice suffice to pour on Caesar's head in sacrifice. It was from the same principle of fear that he refused a new honor, devised and offered him by the Senate, though he was greedy of all such compliments. It was this, that as often as he held the consulship, Roman knights, chosen by lot, should walk before him, clad in the trabia, with lances in their hands, amongst his lictors and apparitors. As the time of the danger which he apprehended drew near, he became daily more and more disturbed in mind, insomuch that he lined the walls of the porticos in which he used to walk with the stone called Fengates, by the reflection of which he could see every object behind him. He seldom gave an audience to persons in custody, unless in private, being alone, and he himself holding their chains in his hand. To convince his domestics that the life of a master was not to be attempted upon any pretext, however plausible, he condemned to death Epaphroditus his secretary, because it was believed that he had assisted Nero, in his extremity, to kill himself. His last victim was Flavius Clemens, his cousin German, a man below contempt for his want of energy, whose sons, then of a very tender age, he had avowedly destined for his successors, and discarding their former names, had ordered one to be called Vespasian, and the other Domitian. Nevertheless, he suddenly put him to death upon some very slight suspicion, almost before he was well out of his consulship. By this violent act he very much hastened his own destruction. During eight months together there was so much lightning at Rome, and such accounts of the phenomenon were brought from other parts, that at last he cried out, Let him now strike whom he will. The capital was struck by lightning, as well as the temple of the Flavian family, with the Palatine house, and his own bedchamber. The tablet also, inscribed upon the base of his triumphal statue, was carried away by the violence of the storm, and fell upon a neighboring monument. The tree which just before the advancement of Vespasian had been prostrated, and rose again, suddenly fell to the ground. The goddess Fortune of Prineste, to whom it was his custom on New Year's Day to commend the empire for the ensuing year, and who had always given him a favorable reply, at last returned him a melancholy answer, not without mention of blood. He dreamt that Minerva, whom he worshipped even to a superstitious excess, was withdrawing from her sanctuary, declaring she could protect him no longer, because she was disarmed by Jupiter. Nothing, however, so much affected him as an answer given by Ascletario, the astrologer, and his subsequent fate. This person had been informed against, and did not deny his having predicted some future events of which, from the principles of his art, he confessed he had a foreknowledge. Domitian asked him what end he thought he should come to himself, to which replying, I shall in short time be torn to pieces by dogs, he ordered him immediately to be slain, and in order to demonstrate the vanity of his art, to be carefully buried. But during the preparations for executing this order, it happened that the funeral pile was blown down by a sudden storm, and the body, half burnt, was torn to pieces by dogs, which being observed by Latinus, the comic actor, as he chanced to pass that way, he told it, amongst the other news of the day, to the emperor at supper. 
The day before his death he ordered some dates served up at table, to be kept till the next day, adding, if I have the luck to use them. And turning to those who were nearest him, he said, Tomorrow the moon in Aquarius will be bloody instead of watery, and an event will happen, which will be much talked of all the world over. About midnight he was so terrified that he leaped out of bed. That morning he tried and passed sentence on a soothsayer sent from Germany, who being consulted about the lightning that had lately happened, predicted from it a change of government. The blood running down his face as he scratched an ulcerous tumor on his forehead, he said, Would this were all that is to befall me. Then, upon his asking the time of the day, instead of five o'clock, which was the hour he dreaded, they purposely told him it was six. Overjoyed at this information, as if all danger were now past, and hastening to the bath, Parthenius, his chamberlain, stopped him, by saying that there was a person come to wait upon him about a matter of great importance, which would admit of no delay. Upon this, ordering all persons to withdraw, he retired into his chamber, and was there slain. Concerning the contrivance and mode of his death, the common account is this. The conspirators being in some doubt when and where they should attack him, whether he was in the bath or at supper, Stephanus, a steward of Domitila's, then under prosecution for defrauding his mistress, offered them his advice and assistance, and wrapping up his left arm as if it was hurt in wool and bandages for some days to prevent suspicion, at the hour appointed he secreted a dagger in them. Pretending then to make a discovery of conspiracy, and being for that reason admitted, he presented to the emperor a memorial, and while he was reading it in great astonishment, stabbed him in the groin. But Domitian, though wounded, making resistance, Clodianus, one of his guards, Maximus, a freedman of Parthenius's, Satorius, his principal chamberlain, with some gladiators, fell upon him and stabbed him in seven places. A boy who had the charge of the lares in his bedchamber, and was then in attendance as usual, gave these further particulars that he was ordered by Domitian, upon receiving his first wound, to reach him a dagger which lay under his pillow, and call in his domestics, but that he found nothing at the head of the bed excepting the hilt of a poniard, and that all the doors were fastened. That the emperor in the meantime got hold of Stephanus, and throwing him upon the ground, struggled a long time with him, one while endeavoring to wrench the dagger from him, another while, though his fingers were miserably mangled, to tear out his eyes. He was slain upon the fourteenth of the calends of October, in the forty-fifth year of his age, and the fifteenth of his reign. His corpse was carried out upon a common bier by the public bearers, and buried by his nurse Phyllis at his suburban villa on the Latin Way but she afterwards privately conveyed his remains to the temple of the Flavian family, and mingled them with the ashes of Julia, the daughter of Titus, whom she had also nursed. He was tall in stature, his face modest and very ruddy. He had large eyes, but was dim-sighted. Naturally graceful in his person, particularly in his youth, excepting only that his toes were bent somewhat inward, he was at last disfigured by baldness, corpulence, and the slenderness of his legs, which were reduced by a long illness. He was so sensible how much the modesty of his countenance recommended him, that he once made this boast to the Senate, Thus far you have approved both of my disposition and my countenance. His baldness so much annoyed him, that he considered it an affront to himself, if any other person was reproached with it, either in jest or in earnest, though in a small tract he published, addressed to a friend, concerning the preservation of the hair, he uses for their mutual consolation the words following, Uch oraas oios cago kalos te megas te, seest thou my graceful mien, my stately form? And yet the fate of my hair awaits me, however I bear with fortitude this loss of my hair while I am still young. Remember that nothing is more fascinating than beauty, but nothing of shorter duration. He so shrunk from undergoing fatigue that he scarcely ever walked through the city on foot. In his expeditions and on a march, he seldom rode on horseback, but was generally carried in a litter. 
He had no inclination for the exercise of arms, but was very expert in the use of the bow. Many persons have seen him often kill a hundred wild animals, of various kinds, at his Alban retreat, and fix his arrows in their heads with such dexterity that he could, in two shots, plant them, like a pair of horns, in each. He would sometimes direct his arrows against the hand of a boy standing at a distance, and expanded as a mark, with such precision that they all passed between the boy's fingers without hurting him. In the beginning of his reign he gave up the study of the liberal sciences, though he took care to restore, at a vast expense, the libraries which had been burnt down, collecting manuscripts from all parts, and sending scribes to Alexandria, either to copy or correct them. Yet he never gave himself the trouble of reading history or poetry, or of employing his pen even for his private purposes. He perused nothing but the commentaries and acts of Tiberius Caesar. His letters, speeches, and edicts were all drawn up for him by others, though he could converse with elegance, and sometimes expressed himself in memorable sentiments. I could wish, said he once, that I was but as handsome as Metius fancies himself to be, and of the head of some one whose hair was partly reddish and partly gray, he said that it was snow sprinkled with mead. The lot of princes, he remarked, was very miserable, for no one believed them when they discovered a conspiracy until they were murdered. When he had leisure, he amused himself with dice, even on days that were not festivals, and in the morning. He went to the bath early, and made a plentiful dinner, insomuch that he seldom ate more at supper than a Matian apple, to which he added a draught of wine out of a small flask. He gave frequent and splendid entertainments, but they were soon over, for he never prolonged them after sunset, and indulged in no revel after. For till bedtime he did nothing else but walk by himself in private. He was insatiable in his lusts, calling frequent commerce with women, as if it was a sort of exercise, clinopaline, bed-wrestling. And it was reported that he plucked the hair from his concubines and swam about in company with the lowest prostitutes. His brother's daughter was offered him in marriage when she was a virgin, but being at that time enamored of Domitia, he obstinately refused her. Yet not long afterwards, when she was given to another, he was ready enough to debauch her, and that even while Titus was living. But after she had lost both her father and her husband, he loved her most passionately, and without disguise, insomuch that he was the occasion of her death by obliging her to procure a miscarriage when she was with child by him. The people showed little concern at his death but the soldiers were roused by it to great indignation, and immediately endeavored to have him ranked among the gods. They were also ready to revenge his loss, if there had been any to take the lead. However, they soon after effected it, by resolutely demanding the punishment of all those who had been concerned in his assassination. On the other hand, the Senate was so overjoyed that they met in all haste, and in a full assembly reviled his memory in the most bitter terms, ordering ladders to be brought in, and his shields and images to be pulled down before their eyes, and dashed in pieces upon the floor of the Senate House passing at the same time a decree to obliterate his titles everywhere, and abolish all memory of him. A few months before he was slain, a raven on the Capitol uttered these words, All will be well. Some person gave the following interpretation of this prodigy, Nuper tarpeo quae sedit comine cornix, est bene, non potuit dicere, dixit, erit. Late croaked the raven from Tarpeia's height, all is not yet, but shall be right. They say likewise that Domitian dreamed that a golden hump grew out of the back of his neck, which he considered as a certain sign of happy days for the empire after him. Such an auspicious change indeed shortly afterwards took place, through the justice and moderation of the succeeding emperors. End of Domitian The Eminent Grammarians, Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lini. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Lives of the Eminent Grammarians, Part 1 The science of grammar was, in ancient times, far from being in vogue at Rome. Indeed, it was of little use in a rude state of society, when the people were engaged in constant wars, and had not much time to bestow on the cultivation of the liberal arts. At the outset, its pretensions were very slender, for the earliest men of learning, who were both poets and orators, may be considered as half Greek. I speak of Livius and Aeneas, who are acknowledged to have taught both languages as well at Rome as in foreign parts. But they only translated from the Greek, and if they composed anything of their own in Latin, it was only from what they had before read. For although there are those who say that this Aeneas published two books, one on letters and syllables, and the other on meters, Lucius Cotta has satisfactorily proved that they are not the works of the poet Aeneas, but of another writer of the same name, to whom also the treatise on the rules of augury is attributed. Crates of Malus, then, was, in our opinion, the first who introduced the study of grammar at Rome. He was contemporary with Aristarchus, and having been sent by King Attalus as envoy to the Senate, in the interval between the Second and Third Punic Wars, soon after the death of Aeneas, he had the misfortune to fall into an open sewer in the Palatine quarter of the city and broke his leg. After which, during the whole period of his embassy and convalescence, he gave frequent lectures, taking much pains to instruct his hearers, and he has left us an example well worthy of imitation. It was so far followed that poems, hitherto little known, the works either of deceased friends of, or other approved writers, were brought to light, and, being read and commented on, were explained to others. Thus, Caius Octavius Lampadio edited the Punic War of Nevius, which, having been written in one volume without any break in the manuscript, had divided into seven books. After that, Quintus Vargantius undertook the Annals of Aeneas, which he read on certain fixed days to crowded audiences. So Lelius Archelaus and Vectius Philocomus read and commented on the satires of their friend Lucilius, which Linnaeus Pompeius, a freedman, tells us he studied under Archelaus, and Valerius Cato under Philocomus. Two others also taught and promoted grammar in various branches, namely, Lucius Elius Lanovinus, the son-in-law of Quintus Elius, and Servius Claudius, both of whom were Roman knights, and men who rendered great services both to learning and the Republic. Lucius Elius had a double cognomen, for he was called Precanius, because his father was a herald, Stilo, because he was in the habit of composing orations for most of the speakers of highest rank. Indeed, he was so strong a partisan of the nobles that he accompanied Quintus Metellus Nemidicus in his exile. Servius, having clandestinely obtained his father-in-law's book before it was published, was disowned for the fraud, which he took so much to heart, that, overwhelmed with shame and distress, he retired from Rome. And being seized with a fit of the gout, in his impatience, he applied a poisonous ointment to his feet, which half killed him, so that his lower limbs mortified while he was still alive. After this, more attention was paid to the science of letters, and it grew in public estimation, insomuch that men of the highest rank did not hesitate 
in undertaking to write something on the subject. And it is related that sometimes there were no less than twenty celebrated scholars in Rome. So high was the value, and so great were the rewards of grammarians, that Latatius Daphnides, jocularly called Pan's Herd, by Linnaeus Melissus, was purchased by Quintus Catullus for two hundred thousand sesterces, and shortly afterwards made a freedman. And that Lysias Apuleius, who was taken into the pay of Apicius Calvinus, a wealthy Roman knight, at the annual salary of ten thousand crowns, had many scholars. Grammar also penetrated into the provinces, and some of the most eminent amongst the learned taught it in foreign parts, particularly in Gallia Togata. In the number of these we may reckon Octavius Teucer, Sicenius Jacus, and Oppius Caris, who persisted in teaching to a most advanced period of his life, at a time when he was not only unable to walk, but his sight failed. The appellation of grammarian was borrowed from the Greeks, but at first the Latins called such persons literati. Cornelius Nepus, also in his book, where he draws a distinction between a literate and a philologist, says that in common phrase those are properly called literati, who are skilled in speaking or writing with care or accuracy, and those more specially deserve the name who translated the poets and were called grammarians by the Greeks. It appears that they were named literators by Massala Corvinus in one of his letters, when he says, that it does not refer to Furius Bibaculus, not even to Sigida, nor to Cato the literator, meaning, doubtless, that Valerius Cato was both a poet and an eminent grammarian. Some there are who draw a distinction between a literati and a literator, as the Greeks do between a grammarian and a grammatist, applying the former term to men of real erudition, the latter to those whose pretensions to learning are moderate. And this opinion Orbilius supports by examples. For he says that in old times, when a company of slaves was offered for sale by any person, it was not customary, without good reason, to describe either of them in the catalogue as a literati, but only as a literator, meaning that he was not a proficient in letters, but had a smattering of knowledge. The early grammarians taught rhetoric also, and we have many of their treatises which include both sciences. Whence it arose, I think, that in later times, although the two professions had then become distinct, the old custom was retained, or the grammarians introduced into their teaching some of the elements required for public speaking, such as the problem, the periphrasis, the choice of words, description of character, and the like. In order that they might not transfer their pupils to the rhetoricians no better than ill-taught boys. But I perceive that these lessons are now given up in some cases, on account of the want of application, or the tender years of the scholar, for I do not believe that it arises from any dislike in the master. I recollect that when I was a boy it was the custom of one of these, whose name was Princeps, to take alternate days for declaiming and disputing, and sometimes he would lecture in the morning and declaim in the afternoon, when he had his pulpit removed. I heard also that even within the memories of our own fathers, some of the pupils of the grammarians passed directly from the schools to the courts, and at once took a high place in the ranks of the most distinguished advocates. The professors at that time were, indeed, men of great eminence, of some of whom I may be able to give an account in the following chapters. Savius Nicanor first acquired fame and reputation by his teaching, and besides he made commentaries, the greater part of which, however, are said to have been borrowed. He also wrote a satire, in which he informs us that he was a freedman, and had a double cognomen, in the following verses. Saevius Nicanor Marci Libertus negabit, Saevius Postumius idem, said Marcus, docebit. What Saevius Nicanor, the freedman of Marcus, will deny, the same Saevius, 
called also Posthumius Marcus, will assert. It is reported that, in consequence of some infamy attached to his character, he retired to Sardinia, and there ended his days. Aurelius Apilius, the freedman of some Epicurean, first taught philosophy, then rhetoric, and last of all, grammar. Having closed his school, he followed Rutilius Rufus when he was banished to Asia, and there the two friends grew old together. He also wrote several volumes on a variety of learned topics, nine books of which he distinguished by the number and names of the nine muses. As he says, not without reason, they being the patrons of authors and poets. I observe that its title is given in several indexes by a single letter, but he uses two in the heading of a book called Pinnix. Marcus Antonius Nepho, a free-born native of Gaul, was exposed in his infancy, and afterwards received his freedom from his foster father, and, as some say, was educated at Alexandria, where Dionysius Scytobrachion was his fellow pupil. This, however, I am not very ready to believe, as the times at which they flourished scarcely agree. He is said to have been a man of great genius, of singular memory, well read in Greek as well as Latin, and of a most obliging and agreeable temper, who never haggled about remuneration, but generally left it to the liberality of his scholars. He first taught in the house of Julius Caesar, when the latter was yet but a boy, and afterwards in his own private house. He gave instruction in rhetoric also, teaching the rules of eloquence every day, but declaiming only on festivals. It is said that some very celebrated men frequented his school, and, among others, Marcus Cicero, during the time he held the praetorship. He wrote a number of works, although he did not live beyond his fiftieth year. But Ateus, the philologist, says that he left only two volumes, De Latino Sermone, and that the other works ascribed to him were composed by his disciples, and were not his, although his name is sometimes to be found in them. Marcus Pompilius Andronicus, a native of Syria, while he professed to be a grammarian, was considered an idle follower of the Epicurean sect, and little qualified to be a master of a school. Finding, therefore, that at Rome, not only Antonius Nepho, but even other teachers of less note were preferred to him, he retired to Cume, where he lived at his ease. And, though he wrote several books, he was so needy and reduced to such straits as to be compelled to sell that excellent little work of his, the Index to the Annals, for 16,000 sesterces. Orbilius had informed us that he redeemed this work from the oblivion into which it had fallen, and took care to have it published with the author's name. Orbilius Papillus of Beneventum, being left an orphan by the death of his parents, who both fell a sacrifice to the plots of their enemies on the same day, acted at first as a paritor to the magistrates. He then joined the troops in Macedonia, when he was first decorated with the plumed helmet, and afterwards promoted to serve on horseback. Having completed his military service, he resumed his studies, which he had pursued with no small diligence from his youth upwards. And, having been a professor for a long period in his own country, at last, during the consulship of Cicero, made his way to Rome, where he taught with more reputation than profit. For, in one of his works, he says that he was then very old and lived in a garret. He also published a book with the title of Periologus, containing complaints of the injurious treatment to which professors submitted, without seeking redress at the hands of parents. His sour temper betrayed itself, not only in his disputes with the sophists opposed to him, whom he lashed on every occasion, but also towards his scholars, as Horace tells us, who calls him a flogger, and the Mischus Marsus, who says of him, Si quos orbilius ferulas cuticaque cecidit, if those orbilius with rod or ferule thrashed. And not even men of rank escaped his sarcasms, for, 
before he became noticed, happening to be examined as a witness in a crowded court, Varro, the advocate on the other side, put the question to him, what he did, and by what profession he gained his livelihood. He replied that he lived by removing hunchbacks from the sunshine into the shade, alluding to Morena's deformity. He lived till he was near a hundred years old, but he had long lost his memory, as the verse of Bibaculus informs us. Orbilius ubinam est literarum oblivio. Where's Orbilius now, that rack of learning lost? His statue is shown in the capital at Beneventum. It stands on the left hand and is sculptured in marble, representing him in a sitting posture, wearing the pallium, with two writing cases in his hand. He left a son, named also Orbilius, who, like his father, was a professor of grammar. Ateus, the philologist of Friedman, was born at Athens. Of him, Capito Ateus, the well-known jurisconsul, says that he was a rhetorician among the grammarians, and a grammarian among the rhetoricians. Asinius Pollio, in the book in which he finds fault with the writings of Sallust for his great affectation of obsolete words, speaks thus. In this work, his chief assistant was a certain Ateus, a man of rank, a splendid Latin grammarian, the aider and preceptor of those who studied the practice of declamation. In short, one who claimed from himself the cognomen of Philologus. Writing to Lysias Hermas, he says, that he had made great proficiency in Greek literature and some in Latin, that he had been a hearer of Antonius Nepho and his Hermas, and afterwards began to teach others. Moreover, that he had for pupils many illustrious youths, among whom were the two brothers Appius and Pulcher Claudius, and that he even accompanied them to their province. He appears to have assumed the name of Philologus, because, like Eratosthenes, who first adopted that cognomen, he was in high repute for his rich and varied stores of learning, which indeed it was evident from his commentaries, though but few of them are extant. Another letter, however, to the same Hermas, shows that they were very numerous. Remember, it says, to recommend generally our extracts, which we have collected, as you know, of all kinds, into eight hundred books. He afterwards formed an intimate acquaintance with Caius Celestius, and on his death with Azinius Polio. And when they undertook to write a history, he supplied the one with short annals of all Roman affairs, from which he could select at pleasure, and the other with rules on the art of composition. I am, therefore, surprised that Asinius Polio should have supposed that he was in the habit of collecting old words and figures of speech for Sallust, when he must have known that his own advice was that none but well-known and common and appropriate expressions should be made use of, and that, above all things, the obscurity of the style of Sallust and his bold freedom in translations should be avoided. End of Lives of the Eminent Grammarians Part 1 Recording by Lenny, Rio de Janeiro, 2008The Eminent Grammarians, Part Two, of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lini. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Lives of Eminent Grammarians, Part 2 Valerio Scato was, as some have informed us, the freedman of one Bersanus, a native of Gaul. He himself tells us in his little work called Indignatio that he was born free, and being left an orphan, was exposed to be easily stripped of his patrimony during the license of Silla's administrations. He had a great number of distinguished pupils, and was highly esteemed as a preceptor suited to those who had a poetical turn, 
as appears from these short lines. Cato grammaticus latina siren, qui solus legit ac facit poetas. Cato, the Latin siren, grammar taught and verse, to form the poet skilled and poetry rehearse. Besides his treatise on grammar, he composed some poems, of which his Lydia and Diana are most admired. Tessida mentions his Lydia. Lydia, doctorum maxima cura liber. Lydia, a work to men of learning dear. Sina thus notices the Diana. Secula permaneat nostri Diana catonis. Immortal be our Cato song of Diana. He lived to extreme old age, but in the lowest state of penury, and almost in actual want, having retired to a small cottage when he gave up his Tusculan villa to his creditors, as Bibaculus tells us. Si quis forte mei domum catonis, de pictas minio asulas et illos, custodis vidit hortulos priapi, miratur, vibus ille disciplinis, tantam sit sapientiam assecutus, quam tres cauliculi et celebra faris, racemi duo, tegula sub una, ad summam propri nutriant senectam. If perchance any one has seen the house of my Cato, with marble slabs of the richest hues, and his gardens worthy of having Priapus for their guardian, he may well wonder by what philosophy he has gained so much wisdom, that a daily allowance of three cohorts, half a pound of meal, and two bunches of grapes under a narrow roof, should serve for his subsistence to extreme old age. And he says in another place, Catonis modo gale tusculanum, tota creditor urbe venditabat, mirati sumus unicum magistrum, sumum grammaticum, optimum poetam, omnes solvere posse quaestionis, unum difficile expedire nomen, en corts eno doti, en iecur cratetis. We lately saw, my Gallus, Cato's Tusculan villa exposed to public sale by his creditors, and wondered that such an unrivaled master of the schools, most eminent grammarian and accomplished poet, could solve all propositions, and yet found one question too difficult for him to settle, how to pay his debts. We find in him the genius of Xenodotus, the wisdom of Crates. Cornelius Epicadius a freedman of Lysias Cornelius Scylla, the dictator, was his apparitor in the augural priesthood, and much beloved by his son Faustus, so that he was proud to call himself the freedman of both. He completed the last book of Scylla's commentaries, which his patron had left unfinished. Liberius Hiera was bought by his master out of a slave dealer's cage, and obtained his freedom on account of his devotion to learning. It is reported that his disinterestedness was such that he gave gratuitous instruction to the children of those who were prescribed in the time of Scylla. Curtius Nicia was the intimate friend of Gnaeus Pompeius and Caius Memmius, but, having carried notes from Memmius to Pompey's wife when she was debauched by Memmius, Pompey was indignant and forbade him his house. He was also on familiar terms with Marcus Cicero, who thus speaks of him in his epistle to Dolabella. I have more need of receiving letters from you than you have of desiring them from me. For there is nothing going on at Rome in which I think you would take any interest, except, perhaps, that you may like to know that I am appointed umpire between our friends Nicias and Vidius. The one, it appears, alleges in two short verses that Nicias owes him money. The other, like an Aristarchus, cavils at them. I, like an old critic, am to decide whether they are Nicias or Spurius. Again, in a letter to Atticus, he says, As to what you write about Nicias, 
nothing could give me greater pleasure than to have him with me if i was in a position to enjoy his society but my province is to me a place of retirement and solitude Seca easily reconciled himself to this state of things, and therefore I would prefer having him. Besides, you are well aware of the feebleness, and the nice and luxurious habits of our friend Nicias. Why should I be the means of making him uncomfortable, when he can afford me no pleasure? At the same time, I value his goodwill. Leneus was a freedman of Pompey the Great and attended him in most of his expeditions. On the death of his patron and his sons, he supported himself by teaching in a school which he opened near the temple of Tellus in the Carium, in the quarter of the city where the house of the Pompey stood. Such was his regard for his patron's memory that when Sallust described him as having a brazen face and a shameless mind, he lashed the historian in a most bitter satire, as a bull spizzle, a gormandizer, a braggart, and a tippler, a man whose life and writings were equally monstrous, besides charging him with being a most unskillful plagiarist who borrowed the language of Cato and other old writers. It is related that, in his youth, having escaped from slavery by the contrivance of some of his friends, he took refuge in his own country, and that after he had applied himself to the liberal arts, he brought the price of his freedom to his former master, who, however, struck by his talents and learning, gave him manumission gratuitously. Quintus Cecilius, and a pirate by descent, but born at Tusculum, was a freedman of Atticus Satrius, a Roman knight, to whom Cicero addressed his epistles. He became the tutor of his patron's daughter, who was contracted to Marcus Agrippa, but, being suspected of an illicit intercourse with her, and sent away on that account, he betook himself to Cornelius Gallus, and lived with him on terms of the greatest intimacy, which, indeed, was imputed to Gallus as one of his heaviest offences by Augustus. Then, after the condemnation and death of Gallus, he opened a school, but had few pupils, and those very young, nor any belonging to the higher orders, excepting the children of those he could not refuse to admit. He was the first, it is said, who held disputations in Latin, and who began to lecture on Virgil and the other modern poets, which the verse of Domitius Marsus points out. Epirota tenelorum nutricula vatum. The epirate who, with tender care, are unfledged poets nursed. Various Flaccus, a freedman, distinguished himself by a new mode of teaching, for it was his practice to exercise the wits of his scholars by encouraging emulation among them not only proposing the subjects on which they were to write, but offering rewards for those who were successful in the contest. These consisted of some ancient, handsome, or rare book. Being, in consequence, selected by Augustus as preceptor to his grandsons, he transferred his entire school to the Palatium, but with the understanding that he should admit no fresh scholars. The hall in Catiline's house, which had then been added to the palace, was assigned him for his school, with a yearly allowance of one hundred thousand sesterces. He died of old age, in the reign of Tiberius. There is a statue of him in Priniste, in the semicircle at the lower side of the forum, where he had set up calendars arranged by himself and inscribed on slabs of marble. Lucius Cursitius, a native of Tarentum, and in rank a freedman, had the cognomen of Pasidus, which he afterwards changed for Pansa. His first employment was connected with the stage, and his business was to assist the writers of farces. After that, he took to giving lessons in a gallery attached to a house, until his commentary on the Smyrna so brought him into notice that the following lines were written on him. Uni crassitio se credere smirna probavit, desinite indocti coniugio hanc petere, 
soli casitio se dixit nubere vele, intima cui soli nota sua extiterint. Crisitius only counts on Smyrna's love. Fruitless the wooings of the unlettered prove. Crisitius she receives with loving arms, for he alone unveiled her hidden charms. However, after having taught many scholars, some of whom were of high rank, and amongst others Julius Antonius, the triumvir's son, so that he might even be compared with various Flaccus, he suddenly closed his school, and joined the sect of Quintus Septimius the philosopher. Scribanius Aphrodisius, the slave and disciple of Urbilius, who was afterwards redeemed and presented with his freedom by Scribonia, the daughter of Libo, who had been the wife of Augustus, taught in the time of Varius. His books on orthography he also revised, not without some severe remarks on his pursuits and conduct. Gnaeus Julius Hyginus, a freedman of Augustus, was a native of Spain, although some say he was born at Alexandria, and that when that city was taken, Caesar brought him, then a boy, to Rome. He closely and carefully imitated Cornelius Alexander, a Greek grammarian, who, for his antiquarian knowledge, was called by many polyhistor, and by some history. He had the charge of the Palatine Library, but that did not prevent him from having many scholars, and he was one of the most intimate friends of the poet Ovid, and of Caius Licinius, the historian, a man of consular rank, who was related that Hyginus died very poor, and was supported by his liberality as long as he lived. Julius Modestus, who was a freedman of Hyginus, followed the footsteps of his patron in his studies and learning. Caius Melissus, a native of Spoletum, was freeborn, but having been exposed by his parents in consequence of quarrels between them, he received a good education from his foster father, by whose care and industry he was brought up, and was made a present of to Messenus as a grammarian. Finding himself valued and treated as a friend, he preferred to continue in his state of servitude, although he was claimed by his mother, choosing rather his present condition than that which his real origin entitled him to. In consequence, his freedom was speedily given him, and he even became a favorite with Augustus. By his appointment, he was made curator of the library in the portico of Octavia, and, as he himself informs us, undertook to compose, when he was a sexagenarian, his books of witticisms, which are now called the Book of Jests. Of these, he accomplished 150, to which he afterwards added several more. He also composed a new kind of story about those who were the toga, and called it Trabeat. Marcus Pomponius Marcellus, a very severe critic of the Latin tongue, who sometimes pleaded causes, in a certain address on the plaintiff's behalf, persisted in charging his adversary with making a solecism, until Cassius Severus appealed to the judges to grant an adjournment, until his client should produce another grammarian, as he was not prepared to enter into a controversy respecting a solecism, instead of defending his client's rights. On another occasion, when he had found fault with some expression in a speech made by Tiberius, Ateus Capito affirmed that if it was not Latin, at least it would be so in time to come. Capito is wrong, cried Marcellus. It is certainly in your power, Caesar, to confer the freedom of the city on whom you please, but you cannot make words for us. Asinius Gallus tells us that he was formerly a pugilist in the following epigram. We caput ad laivam decit glossemata nobis, praecipit, os nullum vel potius pugilis, who ducked his head to shun another's fist, though he expound old saws, yet, well I wist, with pummeled nose and face, he is but a pugilist. Remius Palaemon of Vicentia, the offspring of a bondwoman, acquired the rudiments of learning, first as the companion of a weaver's, and then of his master's son at school. Being afterwards made free, he taught at Rome, where he stood highest in the rank of the grammarians. 
but he was so infamous for every sort of vice that tiberius and his successor claudius publicly denounced him as an improper person to have the education of boys and young men entrusted to him still his powers of narrative and agreeable style of speaking made him very popular besides which he had the gift of making extempore verses he also wrote a great many in various and uncommon meters his insolence was such that he called marcus varro a hog and bragged that letters were born and would perish with him and that his name was not introduced inadvertently in the bucolics as virgil divined that the polymon would some day be the judge of all poets and poems he also boasted that having once fallen into the hands of robbers they spared him on account of the celebrity his name had acquired he was so luxurious that he took the bath many times in a day nor did his means suffice for his extravagance although his school brought him in forty thousand sesterces yearly and he received not much less from his private estate which he managed with great care he also kept a broker's shop for the sale of old clothes and it is well known that a vine he planted himself yielded three hundred and fifty bottles of wine but the greatest of all his vices was his unbridled licentiousness in his commerce with women which he carried to the utmost pitch of foul indecency they tell a droll story of some one who met him in a crowd and upon his offering to kiss him could not escape the salute master said he do you want to mouth every one you meet within a hurry marcus valerius prebus of Beritus, after long aspiring to the rank of centurion being at last tired of waiting devoted himself to study he had met with some old authors at a bookseller's shop in the provinces, where the memory of ancient times still lingers, and is not quite forgotten as it is at Rome. Being anxious carefully to reproduce these, and afterwards to make acquaintance with other works of the same kind, he found himself an object of contempt and was laughed at for his lectures, instead of their gaining him fame or profit. Still, however, he persisted in his purpose and employed himself in correcting illustrating and adding notes to many works which he had collected his labors being confined to the province of a grammarian and nothing more he had properly speaking no scholars but some few followers for he never taught in such a way as to maintain the character of a master but was in the habit of admitting one or two perhaps at most three or four disciples in the afternoon and while he lay at ease and chatted freely on ordinary topics he occasionally read some book to them but that did not often happen he published a few slight treatises on some subtle questions besides which he left a large collection of observations on the language of the ancients end of lives of the eminent grammarians recording by Lini in rio de janeiro 2008《Lives of the Eminent Rhetoricians from the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Vitonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Cheng. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Vitonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Lies of the Eminent Rhetoricians, paragraphs 1 through 6. Rhetoric also, as well as grammar, was not introduced amongst us till a late period, and with still more difficulty, inasmuch as we find that at times the practice of it was even prohibited. In order to leave no doubt of this, I will subjoin an ancient decree of the Senate, as well as an edict of the censors. In the consulship of Gaius Fannius Strabo at Marcus Palerius Messila, the praetor Marcus Pomponius moved the Senate that an act be passed respecting philosophers and rhetoricians. In this matter they have decreed as follows. It shall be lawful for Marcus Pomponius the praetor to take such measures and make such provisions as the good of the Republic and the duty of his office require, that no philosophers or rhetoricians be suffered at Rome. After some interval, 
the censor Cnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus and Lucius Licinius Crassus issued the following edict upon the same subject. It is reported to us that certain persons have instituted a new kind of discipline, that our youth resort to their schools, that they have assumed the title of Latin rhetoricians, and that young men waste their time there for whole days together. Our ancestors have ordained what instruction it is fitting their children should receive, and what schools they should attend. These novelties, contrary to the customs and instructions of our ancestors, we neither approve, nor do they appear to us good. Wherefore it appears to be our duty that we should notify our judgment both to those who keep such schools, and those who are in the practice of frequenting them, that they meet our disapprobation. However, by slow degrees, rhetoric manifested itself to be a useful and honourable study, and many persons devoted themselves to it, both as a means of defence and of acquiring a reputation. Cicero declaimed in Greek until his praetorship, but afterwards, as he grew older, in Latin also, and even in the consulship of Hurtius and Pansa, whom he calls his great and noble disciples. Some historians state that Gnaeus Pompey resumed the practice of declaiming even during the Civil War, in order to be better prepared to argue against Gaius Curio, a young man of great talents, to whom the defence of Caesar was entrusted. They say, likewise, that it was not forgotten by Mark Antony, nor by Augustus, even during the War of Modena. Nero also declaimed, even after he became emperor, in the first year of his reign, which he had done before in public but twice. Many speeches of orators were also published. In consequence, public favour was so much attracted to the study of rhetoric that a vast number of professors and learned men devoted themselves to it, and it flourished to such a degree that some of them raised themselves by it to the rank of senators and the highest offices. But the same mode of teaching was not adopted by all, nor indeed did individuals always confine themselves to the same system but each varied his plan of teaching according to circumstances. For they were accustomed in stating their argument with the utmost clearness to use figures and apologies, to put cases as circumstances required, and to relate facts, sometimes briefly and succinctly, and at other times more at large and with greater feeling. Nor did they omit on occasion to resort to translations from the Greek, and to expatiate in the praise, or to launch their censures on the faults of illustrious men. They also dealt with matters connected with everyday life, pointing out such as are useful and necessary, and such as are hurtful and needless. They had occasion often to support the authority of fabulous accounts, and to detract from that of historical narratives, which sort the Greeks call propositions, refutations, and corroboration until by a gradual process they have exhausted these topics and arrive at the gist of the argument. Among the ancients, subjects of controversy were drawn either from history, as indeed some are even now, or from actual facts of recent occurrence. It was therefore the custom to state them precisely with details of the names of places. We certainly so find them collected and published, and it may be well to give one or two of them literally by way of example. A company of young men from the city, having made an excursion to Ostia in the summer season, and going down to the beach, fell in with some fishermen who were casting their nets in the sea. Having bargained with them for the haul, whatever it might turn out to be, for a certain sum, they paid down the money. They waited a long time while the nets were being drawn, and when at last they were dragged on shore, there was no fish in them, but some gold sewn up in a basket. The buyers claimed the haul as theirs, the fishermen assert that it belongs to them. Again, some dealers having to land from a ship at Brindisium a cargo of slaves, among which there was a handsome boy of great value, they, in order to deceive the collectors of the customs, smuggled him ashore in the dress of a free-born youth, with a bullum hung about his neck. The fraud easily escaped detection. They proceed to Rome. The affair becomes a subject of judicial inquiry, it is alleged that the boy was entitled to his freedom because his master had voluntarily treated him as free. Formerly, they called these by a Greek term, syntaxis, but of late controversies. But they may be either fictitious cases or those which come under trial in the courts. Of the eminent professors of this science, of whom any memorials are extant, 
it would not be easy to find many others than those of whom I shall now proceed to give an account. Lucius Plotius Gallus. Of him Marcus Tullius Cicero thus writes to Marcus Titinius, I remember well that when we were boys, when Lucius Plotius first began to teach Latin, and as great numbers flocked to his school, so that all who were most devoted to study were eager to take lessons from him, it was a great trouble to me that I too was not allowed to do so. I was prevented, however, by the decided opinion of men of the greatest learning, who considered that it was best to cultivate the genius by the study of Greek. This same Gallus, for he lived to a great age, was pointed at by Marcus Tylius in a speech which he was forced to make in his own cause, as having supplied his accuser, Atrachinus, with materials for his charge. Suppressing his name, he says that such a rhetorician was like barley bread, compared to a wheaten loaf, windy, chaffy, and coarse. Lucius Octacinius Pilatus is said to have been a slave, and according to the old custom, a chained to the door like a watchdog, until, having been presented with his freedom for his genius and devotion to learning, he drew up for his patron the act of accusation in a cause he was prosecuting. After that, becoming a professor of rhetoric, he gave instructions to Gnaeus Pompey the Great, and composed an account of his actions, as well as those of his father, being the first freedman, according to the opinion of Cornelius Depos, who ventured to write history, which before his time had not been done by anyone who was not of the highest ranks in society. About this time, Epidius, having fallen into disgrace for bringing a false accusation, opened a school of instruction, in which he taught, among others, Mark Antony and Augustus. On one occasion, Gaius Canutius jeered them for presuming to belong to the party of the consul Isauricus in his administration of the Republic, upon which he replied that he would rather be the disciple of Isauricus than of Apidius, the false accuser. This Apidius claimed to be descended from Apidius Nuncio, who, as ancient traditions assert, fell into the fountain of the river Sarnus when the streams were overflown and not being afterwards found, was reckoned among the number of the gods. Sextus Clodius, a native of Sicily, a professor both of Greek and Latin eloquence, had bad eyes and a facetious tongue. It was a saying of his that he lost a pair of eyes from his intimacy with Mark Antony, the triumvir. Of his wife Fulvia, when there was a swelling in one of her cheeks, he said that she tempted the point of his style. Nor did Antony think any of the worse of him for the joke, but quite enjoyed it. And soon afterwards, when Antony was consul, he even made him a large grant of land, which Cicero charges him with in his Philippics. You patronise, he said, a master of the schools for the sake of his buffoonery, and make a rhetorician one of your pot companions, allowing him to cut his jokes on any one he pleased. A witty man, no doubt, but it was an easy matter to say smart things of such as you and your companions. But listen, conscript fathers, while I tell you what reward was given to this rhetorician, and let the wounds of the Republic be laid bare to view. You assign two thousand acres of the Leontine territory to Sextus Clodius the rhetorician, and, not content with that, exonerated the estate from all taxes. Hear this, and learn from the extravagance of the grant how little wisdom is displayed in your acts. Gaius Albutius Silas of Novara, while in the execution of the office of Edal in his native place, he was sitting for the administration of justice, was dragged by the feet from the tribunal by some persons against whom he was pronouncing a decree. In great indignation at this usage, he made straight for the gate of the town and proceeded to Rome. There he was admitted to fellowship and lodged with Plancus the orator, whose practice it was before he made a speech in public to set up someone to take the contrary side in the argument. The office was undertaken by Albutius, with such success that he silenced Plancus, who did not venture to put himself in competition with him. This bringing him into notice, he collected an audience of his own, and it was his custom to open the question proposed for debate sitting. But as he warmed with the subject, he stood up and made his peroration in that posture. His declamations were of different kinds, sometimes brilliant and polished, at others, that they might not be thought to savour too much of the schools, he curtailed them of all ornament, and used only familiar phrases. He also pleaded causes, but rarely, being employed in such as were of the highest importance, and in every case undertaking the peroration only. In the end he gave up practising in the forum, partly from shame, partly from fear, 
for in a certain trial before the court of the one hundred, having lashed the defendant as a man void of natural affection for his parents, he called upon him by a bold figure of speech to swear by the ashes of his mother and father which lay unburied. His adversary taking him up for the suggestion, and the judges frowning upon it, he lost his cause and was much blamed. At another time, on a trial for murder at Milan, before Lucius Piso the proconsul, having to defend the culprit, he worked himself up to such a pitch of vehemence, that in a crowded court who loudly applauded him, notwithstanding all the efforts of the lictor to maintain order, he broke out into a lamentation on the miserable state of Italy, then in danger of being again reduced, he said, into the form of a province and, turning to the statue of Marcus Brutus, which stood in the forum, he invoked him as the founder and vindicator of the liberties of the people. For this he narrowly escaped a prosecution. Suffering at an advanced period of life from an ulcerated tumour, he returned to Navarra, and calling the people together in a public assembly, addressed them in a set speech of considerable length, explaining the reasons which induced him to put an end to existence. And this he did, by abstaining from food. End of Lives of the Eminent Rhetoricians From the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. The Lives of the Poets. The Life of Terence. Publius Terentius Afer, a native of Carthage, was a slave at Rome, of the senator Terentius Lucanus, who, struck by his abilities and handsome person, gave him not only a liberal education in his youth, but his freedom when he arrived at years of maturity. Some say that he was a captive taken in war, but this, as Finestella informs us, could by no means have been the case, since both his birth and death took place in the interval between the termination of the Second Punic War and the commencement of the Third, nor, even supposing that he had been taken prisoner by the Numidian or Gutellian tribes, could he have fallen into the hands of a Roman general, as there was no commercial intercourse between the Italians and Africans until after the fall of Carthage. Terence lived in great familiarity with many persons of high station, and especially with Scipio Africanus and Caius Delius, whose favour he is even supposed to have purchased by the foulest means. But Fenestella reverses the charge, contending that Terence was older than either of them. Cornelius Nepos, however, informs us that they were all of nearly equal age, and Portius intimates a suspicion of this criminal commerce in the following passage. While Terence plays the wanton with the great, and recommends himself to them by the matricious ornaments of his person, while, with greedy ears, he drinks in the divine melody of Africanus's voice, while he thinks of being a constant guest at the table of Furius and the handsome Lelius, while he thinks that he is fondly loved by them, and often is invited to Albanum for his youthful beauty, he finds himself stripped of his property and reduced to the lowest state of indigence. Then, withdrawing from the world, he betook himself to Greece, where he met his end, dying at Stromphalos, a town in Arcadia. What availed him the friendship of Scipio, of Laelius, or of Furius, three of the most affluent nobles of that age? They did not even minister to his necessities so much as provide to him a hired house, to which his slave might return with the intelligence of his master's death. He wrote comedies, the earliest of which, the Andrea, having to be performed at the public spectacles, is given by the Adeles. He was commanded to read it first before Cacelius, having been introduced while Cacelius was at supper, and being meanly dressed, he is reported to have read the beginning of the play seated on a low stool near the great man's couch. But after reciting a few verses, he was invited to take his place at table, and having supped with his host, went through the rest to his great delight. This play and five others were received by the public with similar applause, although Volcatius, in his enumeration of them, says that the Hakira must not be reckoned among these. The eunuch was even acted twice in the same day, and earned more money than any comedy, whoever was the writer, had ever done before, namely eight thousand sesterces, besides which a certain sum accrued to the author for the title. 
but Varro prefers the opening of the Adelphi to that of Menander. It is very commonly reported that Terence was assisted in his works by Lelius and Scipio, with whom he lived in such great intimacy. He gave some currency to this report himself, nor did he ever attempt to defend himself against it, except in a light way, as in the prologue to the Adelphi. Nam quod isti duncat malavi, hominis nohilis, hunc ajure, astodec una scribere, quod ili maledictum vehemens existimat, em laudem hic ducit maximum, cum illis placet, qui vobus universis e populo placent, quorum opera in bello, in otio, in negatio, suo quisque tempore usus est sine superia. For this, which malice tells that certain noble persons assist the bard, and ride in concert with him, that which they deem a heavy slander, he esteems his greatest praise, that he can please those who in war, in peace, as counsellors, have rendered you the dearest services, and ever borne their faculties so meekly. Common. He appears to have protested against this imputation with less earnestness, because the notion was far from being disagreeable to Laelius and Scipio. It therefore gained ground, and prevailed in after times. Quintus Memmius, in his speech in his own defence, says, Publius Africanus, who borrowed from Terence a character, which he had acted in private, brought it on the stage in his name. Nepos tells us he found in some book that C. Lelius, when he was on some position at Puteoli, on the Calends, the first, of March, being requested by his wife to rise early, begged her not to suffer him to be disturbed, as he had gone to bed late, having been engaged in writing with more than usual success. On her asking him to tell her what he had been writing, he repeated the verses which are found in the Hutin Timorominos. Satis pol proterve, misiri promessa, Hutin, 4, 4, 1. In faith, the rogue serious is impudent pretenses. Santra is of opinion that if Terence required any assistance in his compositions, he would not have had recourse to Scipio and Lelius, who were then very young men, but rather to Sulpicius Gallus, an accomplished scholar, who had been the first to introduce his plays at the games given by the consuls, or to Q. Fabius Lobio, or Marcus Popilius, both men of consular rank, as well as poets. It was for this reason that, in alluding to the assistance he had received, he did not speak of his coadjutors as very young men, but as persons of whose services the people had full experience in peace, in war, and in the administration of affairs. After he had given his comedies to the world, at a time when he had not passed his thirty-fifth year, in order to avoid suspicion, as he found others publishing their works under his name, or else to make himself acquainted with the modes of life and habits of the Greeks, for the purpose of exhibiting them in his plays, he withdrew from home, to which he never returned. Volcatius gives this account of his death. Sudit affer se populo dedit commodius, iter hic in asiem fecit, navem cum semel consinit, visus non quam est, sic vita vacit. When Offer had produced six plays for the entertainment of the people, he embarked for Asia, but from the time he went on board ship he was never seen again. Thus he ended his life. Q. Consequentus reports that he perished at sea on his voyage back from Greece, and that one hundred and eight plays, of which he had made a version from Menander, were lost with him. Others say that he died at Stymphalos in Arcadia, or in Leucadia, during the consulship of Sen Cornius Dalabella and Marcus Fulvius Nobilior, worn out with a severe illness, and with a grief and regret for the loss of his baggage, which he had sent forward in a ship that was wrecked, and contained the last new plays he had written. In person, Terence is reported to have been rather short and slender, with a dark complexion. He had an only daughter, who was afterwards married to a Roman knight, and he left also twenty acres of garden ground on the Appian Way, at the Villa of Mars. I therefore wonder the more how Portius could have written the verses, Nihil Publius, Scipio Prefuit, Nihil et Lelius, Nihil Furius, Tres per edem tempus qui agitabant nobilis facilime, Iorum ille opera nidomum quidem habituet conductitaeum, saltum et esset, quo referet obitum domini servilis. Africanus places him at the head of all the comic writers, declaring in his Compitalia, 
Terentio non similum disis quempium, Terence's equal cannot soon be found. On the other hand, Volcatius reckons him inferior not only to Navius, Plautus, and Cicelius, but also to Licinius. Cicero pays him this high compliment in his limo, Tu quoque qui solus lecto sermone terenti, conversum expressumque latine voce mandrenum, in medio populi sedatis vocibus offers, quid quid cum loquens, ac omnia dulcia decens. You only, Terence, translated into Latin, and clothed in choice language, the plays of Menander, and brought them before the public, who in crowded audiences hung upon hushed applause, grace marked each line, and every period charmed. So also Caius Caesar, tu quoque tu in summis, o dimidiate Menander, poneris et merito puri sermonis amator, lenibus atque atinam scriptus adjuncta foret vis, comica ut aquato virtus polaret honore, cum graces neca in hoc despectus parte jaceres, unum hoc maseror, et doleo tibi dice terenti. You, too, who divide your honours with Menander, will take your place among poets of the highest order, and justly, too, such is the purity of your style. Would only that to your graceful diction was added more comic force, that your works might equal in merit the Greek masterpieces, and your inferiority in this particular should not expose you to censure. This is my only regret. In this, Terence, I grieve to say you are wanting. THE LIFE OF JUVENAL D. Junius Juvenalis, who was either the son of a wealthy freedman, or brought up by him, it is not known which, declaimed till the middle of life, more from the bent of his inclination, than from any desire to prepare himself either for the schools or the forum. But having composed a short satire, which was clever enough, on Paris, the actor of pantomimes, and also on the poet of Claudius Nero, who was puffed up by having held some inferior military rank for six months only, he afterwards devoted himself with much zeal to that style of writing. For a while, indeed, he had not the courage to read them even to a small circle of auditors, but it was not long before he recited his satires to crowded audiences, and with entire success, and this he did twice or thrice, inserting new lines among those which he had originally composed. Quod non dant proceris, dabit histrio, tu camerinos, et barius, tu nobilum magna atria curus, prefectos pelopia facet, philomena tribunos. Behold, an actor's patronage affords a surer means of rising than a lord's, and wilt thou still the camerinos court, or the halls of barius resort, when tribunes philopia can create, and philomela prefix, who shall rule the state? At that time the player was in high favour at court, and many of those who fawned upon him were daily raised to posts of honour. Juvenal therefore incurred the suspicion of having covertly satirised occurrences which were then passing, and although eighty years old at that time, he was immediately removed from the city, being sent into honourable banishment as a prefect of a cohort, which was under orders to proceed to a station at the extreme frontier of Egypt. That sort of punishment was selected, as it appeared severe enough for an offence which was venial, and a mere piece of drollery. However, he died very soon afterwards, worn down by grief, and weary of his life. THE LIFE OF PERSEUS Aulus Perseus Flaccus was born on the day before the Nones of December, 4th December, in the consulship of Fabius Persicus and L. Vitellius. He died on the 8th of the Calends of December, in the consulship of Rubius Marius and Asinius Gallus. Though born at Volterra, in Etruria, he was a Roman knight, allied both by blood and marriage to persons of the highest rank. He ended his days at an estate he had at the eighth milestone on the Appian Way. His father, Flaccus, who died when he was barely six years old, left him under the care of guardians, and his mother, Fulvia Selena, who afterwards married Fusius, a Roman knight, buried him also in a very few years. Perseus Flaccus pursued his studies at Volterra till he was twelve years old, and then continued them at Rome, under Remius Pelamon, the grammarian, and Virginius Flaccus, the rhetorician. Arriving at the age of twenty-one, he formed a friendship with Aeneas Cortunus, which lasted through life, 
and from him he learned the rudiments of philosophy. Among his earliest friends were Cassius Bassus and Colpernius Datura, the latter of whom died while Perseus himself was yet in his youth. Servilius Numanus he reverenced as a father. Through Cornutus he was introduced to Aeneas, as well as to Lucan, who was of his own age, and also a disciple of Cornutus. At that time Cornutus was a tragic writer. He belonged to the sect of the Stoics, and left behind him some philosophical works. Lucan was so delighted with the writings of Perseus Flaccus that he could scarcely refrain from giving loud tokens of applause while the author was reciting them, and declared that they had the true spirit of poetry. It was late before Perseus made the acquaintance of Seneca, and then he was not much struck with his natural endowments. At the house of Cornutus he enjoyed the society of two very learned and excellent men, who were then zealously devoting themselves to philosophical inquiries, namely, Claudius Agriternus, a physician from Lacedaemon, and Petronius Aristocrates, of Magnesia, men whom he held in the highest esteem, and with whom he vied in their studies, as they were of his own age, being younger than Cornutus. During nearly the last ten years of his life, he was much beloved by Thracius, so that he sometimes travelled abroad in his company, and his cousin Aria was married to him. Perseus was remarkable for gentle manners, for a modesty amounting to bashfulness, a handsome form, and an attachment to his mother, sister, and aunt, which was most exemplary. He was frugal and chaste. He left his mother and sister twenty thousand sesterces, requesting his mother, in a written codicil, to present to Cornutus, as some say, one hundred sesterces, or as others, twenty pounds of wrought silver, besides about seven hundred books, which indeed included his whole library. Cornutus, however, would only take the books, and gave up the legacy to the sisters, whom his brother had constituted his heirs. He wrote seldom, and not very fast, even the work we possessed he left incomplete. Some verses are wanting at the end of the book, but Cornutus thoughtlessly recited it, as if it was finished, and on Cassius Bassus requesting to be allowed to publish it, he delivered it to him for that purpose. In his younger days Perseus had written a play, as well as an itinerary, with several copies of verses on Thracius's father-in-law, and Aria's mother, who had made away with herself before her husband. But Cornutus used his whole influence with the mother of Perseus to prevail upon her to destroy these compositions. As soon as his book of satires was published, all the world began to admire it, and were eager to buy it up. He died of a disease in the stomach, in the thirtieth year of his age. But no sooner had he left school and his masters than he set to work with great vehemence to compose satires, from having read the tenth book of Lucilius, and made the beginning of that book his model presently launching his invectives all around with so little scruple that he did not spare cotemporary poets and orators, and even lashed Nero himself, who was then the reigning prince. The verse ran as follows. Auriculus asini mede rex habit. King Midas has an ass's ears. But Cornutus altered it thus. Auriculus asini quis non hehet. Who has not an ass's ears? In order that it might not be supposed that it was meant to apply to Nero. THE LIFE OF Horus. Horatius Flaccus was a native of Venetium, his father having been, by his own account, a freedman and collector of taxes, but, as it is generally believed, a dealer in salted provisions, for some one with whom Horus had a quarrel, jeered him by saying, How often have I seen your father wiping his nose with his fist? In the Battle of Philippi he served as a military tribune, which post he filled at the instance of Marcus Brutus, the general, and having obtained a pardon, on the overthrow of his party, he purchased the office of scribe to a quaestor. Afterwards insinuating himself first into the good graces of Macanus, and then of Augustus, he secured no small share in the regard of both. And first, how much Macanus loved him may be seen by the epigram in which he says, Nita viceribus meus horati, plus jam diligo, titium soldalum, gino tividius Strigo Siorum. But it was more strongly exhibited by Augustus, in a short sentence uttered in his last moments, Be as mindful of Horatius Flaccus as you are of me. Augustus offered to appoint him as secretary, signifying his wishes to Macanus in a letter to the following effect, Hitherto I have been able to write my own epistles to friends, but now I am too much occupied, and in an infirm state of health. 
I wish, therefore, to deprive you of our Horace. Let him leave, therefore, your luxurious table, and come to the palace, and he shall assist me in writing my letters. And upon his refusing to accept the office, he neither exhibited the smallest displeasure, nor ceased to heap upon him tokens of his regard. Letters of his are extant, from which I will make some short extracts to establish this. Use your influence over me with the same freedom as you would do if we were living together as friends. In so doing you will be perfectly right, and guilty of no impropriety, for I could wish that our intercourse should be on that footing, if your health admitted of it. And again, how I hold you in memory you may learn from our friend Septimius, for I happened to mention you when he was present, and if you are so proud as to scorn my friendship, that is no reason why I should lightly esteem yours in return. Besides this, among other drolleries, he often called him his most immaculate penis, and his charming little man, and loaded him from time to time with proofs of his munificence. He admired his works so much, and was so convinced of their enduring fame, that he directed him to compose the secular poem, as well as that on the victory of his stepsons Tiberius and Drusus over the Vindelici, and for this purpose urged him to add, after a long interval, a fourth book of odes to the former three. After reading his sermons, in which he found no mention of himself, he complained in these terms, "'You must know that I am very angry with you, because in most of your works of this description you do not choose to address yourself to me. Are you afraid that, in times to come, your reputation will suffer, in case it should appear that you lived on terms of intimate friendship with me?' And he wrung from him the eulogy which begins with, "'Come tot sustinius, et tanta negotia solus, res italias, armis tuteris, moribus ornis, legibus emendis, in publica commodi pecum, si longo sermone moro tua tempora, Caesar, Epist. 2. 1. While you alone sustain the important weight of Rome's affairs, so various and so great, while you the public wheel with arms defend, adorn with morals, and with laws amend, shall not the tedious letter prove a crime that steals one moment of our Caesar's time? Francis. In person, Horace was short and fat, as he is described by himself in his satires, and by Augustus in the following letter. Dionysius has brought me your small volume, which, little as it is, not to blame you for that, I shall judge favorably. You seem to me, however, to be afraid lest your volume should be bigger than yourself. But if you are short in stature, you are corpulent enough. You may, therefore, if you will, write in a court, when the size of your volume is as large round as your paunch. It is reported that he was immoderately addicted to venery, for he is said to have had obscene pictures so disposed in a bedchamber lined with mirrors, that whichever way he looked, lascivious images might present themselves to his view. He lived for the most part in the retirement of his farm, on the confines of the Sabine and the Tiburtine territories, and his house is shown in the neighborhood of a little wood, not far from Tiber. Some elegies ascribed to him, and a prose epistle apparently written to commend himself to Mechanese, have been handed down to us, but I believe that neither of them are genuine works of his, for the elegies are commonplace, and the epistle is wanting in perspicuity, a fault which cannot be imputed to his style. He was born on the 6th of the Ides of December, 27th December, in the consulship of Lucius Cata and Lucius Torquatus, and died on the 5th of the Calends of December, 27th November, in the consulship of Caius Marcius Censorinus and Caius Asinius Gallus, having completed his fifty-ninth year. He made a nuncupatory will, declaring Augustus his heir, not being able, from the violence of his disorder, to sign one in due form. He was interred and lies buried on the skirts of the Esquiline Hill, near the tomb of Mecanus. M. Aeneas Lucanus, a native of Corduba, first tried the powers of his genius in an encomium on Nero, at the Quinquennial Games. He afterwards recited his poem on the civil war carried on between Pompey and Caesar. His vanity was so immense, and he gave such liberty to his tongue, that in some preface, comparing his age and his first efforts with those of Virgil, he had the assurance to say, And now what remains for me is to deal with a gnat. In his early youth, after being long informed of the sort of life his father led in the country, in consequence of an unhappy marriage, he was recalled from Athens by Nero, who admitted him into the circle of his friends, and even gave him the honor of the quaestorship, but he did not long remain in favor. 
Smarting at this, and having publicly stated that Nero had withdrawn, all of a sudden, without communicating with the Senate, and without any other motive than his own recreation, after this he did not cease to assail the emperor, both with foul words and with acts which are still notorious. So that on one occasion, when easing his bowels in the common privy, there being a louder explosion than usual, he gave vent to the nemistic of Nero. One would suppose it was thundering underground, in the hearing of those who were sitting there for the same purpose, and who took to their heels in much consternation. In a poem also, which was in every one's hands, he severely lashed both the emperor and his most powerful adherents. At length he became nearly the most active leader in Piso's conspiracy, and while he dwelt without reserve in many quarters on the glory of those who dipped their hands in the blood of tyrants, he launched out into open threats of violence, and carried them so far as to boast that he would cast the emperor's head at the feet of his neighbors. When, however, the plot was discovered, he did not exhibit any firmness of mind. A confession was wrung from him without much difficulty, and humbling himself to the most abject entreaties, he even named his innocent mother as one of the conspiracies, hoping that his want of natural affection would give him favor in the eyes of a parricidal prince. Having obtained permission to choose his mode of death, he wrote notes to his father, containing corrections of some of his verses, and having made a full meal, allowed a physician to open the veins in his arms. I have also heard it said that his poems were offered for sale, and commented upon, not only with care and diligence, but also in a trifling way. THE LIFE OF Pliny. Plinius Secundus, a native of New Como, having served in the wars with strict attention to his duties, in the rank of a knight, distinguished himself also, by the great integrity with which he administered the high functions of a procurator for a long period, in the several provinces entrusted to his charge. But still he devoted so much attention to literary pursuits, that it would not have been an easy matter for a person who enjoyed entire leisure, to have written more than he did. He comprised in twenty volumes an account of all the various wars carried on in successive periods with the German tribes. Besides this, he wrote a natural history, which extended to seven books. He fell a victim to the calamitous event which occurred in Campania. For, having the command of the fleet at Misenum, when Vesuvius was throwing up a fiery eruption, he put to sea with his galleys for the purpose of exploring the causes of the phenomenon close on the spot but being prevented by contrary winds from sailing back, he was suffocated in the dense cloud of dust and ashes. Some, however, think that he was killed by his slave, having implored him to put an end to his sufferings, when he was reduced to the last extremity by the fervent heat. End of the Lives of the Poets End of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars 